Chapter 501 News When Serdak led the convoy to leave the village of Wall, a white line just lit up on the edge of the horizon of the deserted Gobi Desert. Until we crossed the Paglos Pass, the red sun appeared at the edge of the earth and sky, standing at the highest point of the mountain pass. You can still see a group of people under the dead trees at the entrance of the village in the distance. Old Sheila, Natasha, Rita, Little Peter and Aphrodite. Yes, the succubus Aphrodite stayed in Wall Village this time, although she betrayed the King of Sin, a Mazdan, and had her wings cut off by her tribe. She was still a succubus after all. Discovering her true identity would probably bring some unnecessary trouble to Serdak. So Aphrodite offered to stay in Wall Village. Serdak and his party led six carriages filled with sulfur or through Oak Ridge and finally arrived at the city of Halanza before the city gate closed. However, Serdak was not in a hurry to enter Haranza with six four-wheeled carriages this time. The hotel outside Haranza had a larger courtyard. The buildings in Alinsa are extremely compact. If you want to find a hotel that can park six four-wheeled carriages at the same time, there are not many places to choose from. Moreover, the cost of accommodation in the city is much higher than that of hotels outside the city. And it is cannibalistic. Modulitum's entry into the city would also cause panic among the residents of the city. So Serdak decided to let the ogre and six carriages stay outside the city. Early the next morning, Soldak rushed to the White Elephant Trading Company with six four-wheel carriages, sold all the sulfur or to the White Elephant Trading Company, paid the coachman a commission, and then took Andrew. Samira and Gulitam came to the Helanza guard camp to report. As a group of four people walked on the street, the residents of Helanza City cast surprised glances at the ogre. In recent times, the ogre Gulitam has long been accustomed to this kind of surprised and fearful eyes. He could only pretend that he did not see the crowd of people around him. In the morning, Serdak bought a bag at the White Elephant Trading Company. A good dried salted fish. This was a nearly 30-pound mackerel. The whole dried fish exuded a salty smell, which put the ogre Gulitam in a good mood. He kept this fish along the way. Dried fish in hand. Half-elf archer Samira still covered her face tightly with a hood. She wore a salamander leather armor and carried a forest bow on her back. Many people envied the exquisite leather armor she wore. But no one noticed what was hidden under the hood. Beautiful face. Andrew, who was wearing a full-coverage Helanza guard camp armor, was more like a guard camp knight than Suldak. He was riding a horse on the street, and pedestrians on the street took the initiative to avoid both sides, giving Andrew a chance, an unprecedented sense of superiority. A group of four people walked through the streets of Helanza city and walked into the courtyard of the guard camp. Some knights from the guard camp took the initiative to say H, low to Serdak. Serdak asked casually and found out that Viscount Emmett had led the knights of the guard camp, who went to the Maka plane three days ago to return to Helensa on a magic airship. Serdak took the horse to the stable. Then he took Andrew, Samira, and Gulitam into the main building of the guard camp. Walking into the rest area of the support squadron, I said H, low to the knight on duty of the support squadron. When I learned that the squadron leader Carl was there today, I opened the door and walked into Carl's office. I happened to see Carl sitting on the chair behind the desk wearing riding boots with his feet raised high on the table, chatting and laughing with a staff member. The door to the room was suddenly pushed open. The female staff member, who was having a lively chat quickly put away her frivolous smile, adjusted her uniform and skirt in a panic, and then slipped out of the door with a pile of documents in her arms. Walking into Carl's office, the two hugged, Carl said to Soldak, I'm counting the days, and it's time for you to arrive in Helanza City. Has the journey been smooth? Serdak nodded. Let's go to Captain Sauron to say H, low. And by the way, go through the induction procedures for your security team members, Carl said lazily, holding his good brother's shoulders. Captain Sauron, this time I brought it back from the Maka plane. Carl sat opposite Captain Sauron and pushed the three applications over. The resumes of Samira and Andrew were written on the application form. Captain Solon rubbed his forehead, waved his hand to Carl and said, Andrew, Samira and Gulitam. The names of these people make my ears tingle. I heard that one of them is a foreign ogre. If it is any brigade in Helanza City, I will they will not agree to their application for employment. But if you want them to maintain law and order in the deserted land, the employment conditions can be relaxed appropriately. He glanced at Soldak, who was standing behind Carl, and said to him, Since both Carl and Emmett strongly recommend it, then I can do something special here, but I won't do it next time. The establishment of the security team in the deserted land outside the Paglos Pass has been agreed upon for a long time. 
and the recruitment of Andrew and Samira have been recommended by the captain of the support squadron, Carl, and approved by Viscount Emmett. Although this the three people did not meet the entry requirements for the guard camp. But Captain Sauron just looked at the application and signed his name on it readily. After more than two months of rest, Captain Sauron's injuries have basically healed. His only regret is that he missed the plane war in the Maka plane. Instead, this Count Emmett took advantage and made a very significant mark on his resume and merit book. Carl is the squadron leader promoted by Captain Sauron. So he has a very close relationship with Captain Sauron. Captain Sauron leaned back on his chair. He had gained weight in the past two months while recovering from his injuries. He looked at Serdak again and said with a smile, You did a good job this time. Night, Serdak. This time the Hellanza guard camp was praised by Marquis Luther. All the knights who went to the Maka plane will have half a month of make-up leave. And there will also be corresponding rewards. Reward? And your reward is a bit special. You have to wait patiently until there is no new notification from above. It is likely to be delayed. But being late also has its benefits. After leaving Captain Solon's office, the next thing was much simpler. First, they went to Miss Flora of the guard camp personnel department to go through the formal entry procedures. Only with Miss Flora's signature, the three of them could start from the guard camp every month. The battalion receives a fixed salary. Later, Carl led them to the underground warehouse of the guard camp and received the standard equipment issued by the guard camp from Gwendolyn. Samira received a brand new alloy bow from the weapons warehouse. Soldak and Carl made an appointment to meet at the Three Bears Barbecue Restaurant in the evening, and then took Samira, Andrew, and Gulitam out of the guard camp and went directly to the Knight Academy in Helensa City. The war in the Maka Plain caused him to miss the winter final exam of the Knight Academy. However, since he has become a first-class knight, it is impossible for the Knight Academy to hold his graduation certificate from the Knight Academy. When they arrived at the Knight Academy, Soldak asked Samira, Andrew, and Gulitam to wait for him at the street-facing open-air restaurant opposite the Academy gate. He ordered some Helensa special pine nut cakes and other refreshments for the three of them, and then entered the Knight Academy. He did not go directly to the teaching office of the Knight Academy to apply for graduation, but found assistant coach Pablo. Seeing Serdak standing in front of him wearing a magic pattern structure, assistant coach Pablo was surprised, crossed his hands on his chest, and asked with envy, Knight Serdak, I heard that you did you go with the guard battalion to participate in the war on the Maka plane. Yes. Soldak, wearing the earth shield magic pattern structure, stood in the office of the third year school department and attracted much attention. Assistant Professor Pablo quickly pulled Soldak out of the office and said excitedly, This victory in the war on the Maka plane is well done. Beta province needs such a big victory to boost the morale of the army. He looked at Soldak seriously and said, I haven't seen you for two months and you are already a construct knight. This time you return to the Knight Academy. You have been in the Academy for six months, and you are here to apply for graduation. Of? Soldak replied directly. That's right. Assistant Professor Pablo nodded and said, The Dean just told me the day before yesterday that if you come to the Knight Academy to complete the graduation procedures, I want to see you. Serdak didn't expect that the Dean wanted to see him, so he asked Assistant Professor Pablo, The Dean wants to see me. Do you know what's going on? Assistant Professor Pablo shook his head vigorously and whispered to Soldak. Since the dean personally came forward, it should be a good thing. In the dean's office, Assistant Professor Pablo stood on the soft velvet carpet with a smile on his face. In addition to Assistant Coach Pablo, there is also Instructor Milono in the office. Although Instructor Milono was Serdak's instructor, Serdak rarely saw him even when he was taking cultural classes at the Knight Academy. Therefore, the two were not familiar with each other. So the two just looked at each other. He averted his gaze at a glance. The dean stood up, walked to Serdak, looked at him with a smile and said, Only war is the best criterion to test whether a knight is qualified. In view of your outstanding performance in Wazimra City in the Maka Plain. Well done, Knight Serdak. Congratulations on graduating with honors from the Knight Academy. After speaking, the female assistant beside him handed a roll of parchment to Serdak. Serdak stretched out his hand to take it and said respectfully, Thank you, Mr. Dean. The Dean's eyes almost squeezed together when he smiled. He combed his slightly sparse hair with his hands and said with a big belly, Although you have only studied in the Knight Academy for just six months. After all, you are from the sea, a knight who graduated from Lanza Knight Academy. So I want to frame your sketch and hang it in the Academy's Hall of Fame. Are you willing? It's my honor. 
Cernak didn't expect that the dean would see him for this matter. So he quickly replied that there would be no loss anyway. When the dean heard that Suldak readily agreed, he sat back on the armchair and said, Well, I have a meeting to attend, and Pablo will help you with the rest. Cernak took Kubalama back to the dormitory to collect some gifts. He heard cheerful footsteps coming from the corridor. Soon, the sound of discussion came from next door. Cernak recognized that it was Lena and Nedra's. Hearing the sound, he put his belongings into the magic waste bag, looked at the empty room, and locked the door. The key to this dormitory still needs to be returned to the dormitory administrator downstairs. But before that, he needs to say goodbye to these two neighbors who get along well. He walked to the door of the next bedroom, reached out, and knocked on the open door. In the room, Lena and Nedra were discussing around a book when they saw Soldak suddenly appearing outside the door. Both girls looked. I was overjoyed and almost yelling with excitement. Sardak chatted with the two girls for a while and then explained the purpose of his visit. He was saying goodbye to the two girls. Lena didn't expect that Sardak would get the graduation certificate from the Knight Academy so quickly. She opened her mouth slightly and said in surprise, Ah, Knight Sardak, you want it so soon. Have you graduated? Soldak nodded, shook the key in his hand, and said to the two girls, I have packed up the room, and I will hand over the key later. Nedra, who was next to her, suddenly looked melancholy and said in a low voice, I'm really reluctant to let you go. You haven't taught us the skinning technique yet, Sardak said to the shy girl. Nedra has done a great job. You have learned the theoretical knowledge very well. What you lack is practical experience. You can only keep trying during the experience. Only with practice can you become a qualified skinner. The three of them crowded on the narrow terrace at the end of the corridor, looking at the east area of the Knight Academy. Soldak asked the two girls, By the way, what are your plans for the future? I mean after graduation. I plan to join an adventure group after graduation and travel around while I'm young. Lena said cheerfully, It seems that it should have been thought of long ago. I'll probably get married. I'll probably follow the family's arrangements. Nedra whispered, Knight Sardak. What about you? Sardak looked in the direction of Wall Village and said, If nothing else happens, I will serve as the peace officer in the deserted land outside the Paglos Pass. If you want to go to the deserted land, you can come to me anytime. Lena did not expect that Sardak would become the sheriff of the desolate land and said, Ah, do you really want to go to such a remote place? Soldak nodded slightly and said, Actually, my home is over there. After saying a few blessings before saying goodbye to the two girls, Soldak waved his hand, turned and walked along the corridor of the dormitory building towards the stairs. Just when Serdak was about to walk down the stairs, Lena caught up a few steps and shouted to Serdak. Oh, by the way, Knight Serdak, I almost forgot to tell you that while you were out on duty in the guard camp, there were always two young female swordsmen coming to the academy to see you. They don't seem to be from Holanza. Soldak was stunned for a moment, stopped and turned around and asked, Lena, do you know their names? Lena and Nedra looked at each other, then shook their heads at the same time. Nedra added, Instructor Darcy Christie seems to know them. Soldak nodded, turned around and walked down the stairs without asking any more questions. Chapter 502 Meeting In the dim stable, a bug slowly climbed up along the pillar. The ancient Bolai horse that followed Serdak from the battlefield stood silently in the stable eating the fodder in the manger. Since its leg was broken on the training ground two months ago, it has been raised in the stable for nearly two months. The Gubwa horse snorted in boredom and swept away the flying animals around it, but with its ponytail. A few flies seemed to be thinking about how long this boring life would last. Suddenly, a familiar figure flashed in Gubalai Ma's sight. He raised his head alertly and saw Saldak walking towards it from outside the stable. It began to scratch the ground, snorted, and swung its ponytail to welcome Serdak's arrival. Serdak walked into the stable and immediately saw the horses that had fought together on the battlefield. He walked up to it, and Gubalai Ma put his head into Serdak's arms and licked his face with his wet tongue. Serdak hugged it affectionately and rubbed its soft mane with his hands. The broken leg has been healed, and even because of the strengthening scroll, the leg is stronger than before. There are several blood-stained magic lines on the edge of the scar, just like the pattern on its original skin. A stable manager brought Serdak's saddle cover and put it on the exquisite saddle. Serdak found that this ancient Bolai horse was much stronger than before, and the original buttonholes on the saddle's buckle were no longer there. Once it fit, I let it go a couple of inches, and then just managed to tighten the buckle. 
The Gubala horse couldn't wait to get out of the stable. Soldek led it for two laps in the running track in front of the stable. Seeing that its body seemed to be moving, he turned over and sat on the horse's back. Old man, I'm here to pick you up. Let's go home. Serdak leaned over and said in its ear. Gubarama seemed to understand Serdak's words. It shook its head, neighed, and ran towards the gate of the night training ground. The guard standing at the door quickly opened the door and performed a standard nightly salute to Soldak. The streets of Valencia City seem a bit narrow, and many alleys are impassable for magic caravans. Therefore, some nobles still maintain the habit of riding horses when going out. Andrew, Samira, and the Ogre Gulitum were waiting outside the academy. Andrew and Samira were standing against the wall. Perhaps it was because in Wazimra City, the Maka natives and the poor people of the empire were already hostile. Due to the relationship, the two of them seldom communicated with each other. Samira was carefully calibrating the bow string of the alloy bow. The back of the alloy bow was polished very smooth, and the handshake was inlaid with cork, which looked very delicate. Andrew wrapped the axe he was carrying behind him with linen strips. Looking from the outside, he could only see the rough outline of the axe. The ogre sat on the floor leaning against the corner. Only by sitting here would he not be so eye-catching. When he saw Serdak walking out of the night academy on horseback, the ogre was stunned. Let's go! Let's take you to try the best barbecue in Helena City. The ogre Gulitum stood up from the ground in an instant. And his strong body, like a mountain of meat, immediately scared away several passers-by. Due to the ogre Gulitum, everyone could not eat in the lobby on the first floor of the restaurant. The restaurant manager was worried that Gulitum might frighten the guests dining in the lobby. So he politely asked Carl to agree. The group's dining location was changed to the backyard on the first floor of the Three Bears restaurant. And they ensured that the environment there was also very good and clean, and that no one would break in and disturb them. In early spring, many vines and trees have not yet sprouted their buds, making the yard look somewhat desolate. The restaurant manager asked several waiters to place two large dining tables in the courtyard, and hired two chefs to be responsible for the barbecue dishes here. He also recommended grilled whole beef ribs and whole steaks to the ogre Gulitum. Outside the spine, these roasts take a little time, but it doesn't stop the ogres from enjoying their dinner at all. The most distinctive thing about Three Bears Barbecue Restaurant is that you order first when you enter. And many of the barbecues are placed on the grill and are already cooked. So the ogre first ordered a batch of medium rare steaks. The steaks here the size was just right. And the ogre took one bite at a time and ate the roasted meat for 10 people in one sitting just after the dinner started. Carl glanced at Serdak with some sympathy. After all, Serdak's promise to Gulitum was to have enough food. But now it seems that the ogre has such a big appetite. Even if Serdak will all the salary given to the ogre by the guard camp was exchanged for food, which was probably not enough to fill his stomach. Carl glanced at Andrew and Samira next to him, and thought to himself, fortunately, there are finally two normal ones. There was a grilled fish and a plate of fruit salad on the dinner plate in front of the half-elf archer. When she bent down to eat the fruit, she opened the linen hood, and the delicate elf-like profile appeared in front of Carl. In front of him. Carl almost forgot that he was still cutting barbecue with a table knife in his hand. Later, Carl also discovered that Samira's ears were obviously different from those of Els, and the background color of her eyes was light red. This should be a symbol of the fallen woman, the bloodline of the fallen Els. Soldak stepped on his foot hard under the table, which made Carl, who was looking at Samira in a daze, wake up. Carl realized that he might have just lost his temper. So he quickly picked up the wine glass and took a sip of the golden apple. Drink, taking the opportunity to hide his embarrassment. Then he shifted his gaze to Serdak's face and asked him, Have you finished everything at the night academy? Serdak nodded. Carl cut open the steak on the dinner plate and cut it into very neat cubes. Then he put the piece of meat into his mouth. While tasting the tender and juicy beef, he asked Soldak, When are you going to go back to Wall Village? Soldak said, There are still some things to deal with tomorrow. If everything goes well, it will probably be the day after tomorrow. Carl nodded. He knew that Serdak still had some friends in Helanza City. And he might have to say goodbye. He said to Serdak. The security team can still receive an activity fund. Don't forget to go to the guard camp to collect the money before you leave. Are there any activity funds? Serdak asked in surprise. Carl said matter-of-factly. Of course. Your security team needs to have a formal office location outside Pedro's Pass. Of course. You have the final say where you choose it. But the security camp will give you a resettlement payment. That's really good, Serdak muttered. After dinner, it was completely dark. 
Soldak led everyone to the Garden Plaza Hotel. The landlady is still at the reception desk, probably calculating the income and expenditure accounts. She does the calculations very carefully, checking every record twice. Serdak opened the door and walked in, saying H, low to the hotel owner who was sitting in the lounge area drinking tea. When the hotel owner saw the ogre following Serdak, he jumped up from the sofa in fright, asked Susaldak with a horrified look on his face. Night, Susaldak. Is this also your friend? Yes. It's best to arrange a spacious room for him on the first floor. If it's on the second floor, I'm worried that he will trample on the floor of the hotel on the second floor, Saldek said with a smile. When the hotel proprietress heard someone pushing the door and walking into the hotel, she quickly put down the account book in her hand and prepared to stand up to receive the reception. When she saw that the person walking in from the outside was Saldek, she immediately asked kindly, Oh, night, Serdek. I haven't seen you for a long time. I heard that the guard battalion went to participate in the plane war? Yes, in the past two months. I have been performing tasks outside with the guard battalion, Serdak replied. The hotel proprietress looked at the people behind Serdak, then gave Serdak four sets of keys and said, The room number is written on the key plate. If you need hot water, it's best to tell him in advance. She did not say the last two sentences to Serdak, but to the three companions behind Serdak. When she saw the cannibal, she was not frightened like the hotel owner. Instead, she curiously talked to the cannibal. The demon looked at each other for a while, then smiled at the ogre before looking away. She held a small folding fan in her hand, fan twice casually, and sneered at Suldak. This friend of yours is so strong. After saying that, he glanced at the ogre twice more, then twisted his plump hips and led a few people towards the empty room in the hotel. It will be good if you come back. I hope those thugs will restrain themselves or simply leave Helensa. Recently, the security in the city has been very chaotic. I heard that people often die in the slums. While she was chattering, she pushed open the door of a room on the first floor. This room on the first floor was very spacious. The ogre stooped and walked into the room. Instead of sitting on the bed, he sat directly on the floor and looked at the furnishings in the room curiously. The bright sunshine outside the window printed lines of light on the floor, and these light lines slowly crawled onto the bed. Beatrice was awakened by a dazzling ray of sunlight. She lazily stretched out her white arms to block the sun. Her arms were dazzlingly white under the sunlight. At this time, she saw Hathaway wearing a nightgown, sitting on the wooden stool of the dressing table, reading a letter seriously. Letter from home. Is it urging you to go back? Beatrice asked seriously. Hathaway sighed, put the letter in her hand into the jewelry box, turned to her close friend and said, Beatrice, I think we should go back. Beatrice sat up from the bed, pulled the sling on her shoulders and looked out the window, saying, Yes, the war in the Maka Plain is almost over. The two looked at each other speechlessly and smiled. Hathaway handed Beatrice a glass of hot milk on the table, just as he was about to say, Drink it while it's hot. Someone outside the bedroom door knocked softly. Door. What's going on? Hathaway asked directly. She didn't open the door, nor let the maid standing outside the door come in. The maid quickly said, Miss Hathaway, Someone is looking for her outside. Hathaway was a little strange. She and Beatrice didn't have many friends in Alinsa City. She didn't know who would come to visit her early in the morning. According to aristocratic etiquette, such visits would usually be greeted in advance the day before. So as to avoid there is no preparation here. It's Mr. Knight, the maid said in a low voice. This is a very exquisite villa next to the long street on the west side of the Magic Tower. It is located at the intersection of the wealthy area and the gathering place for magicians. Some magicians can often be seen in the nearby villa area. So the security aspect has always been very good. Saldak stood beside the low shrub wall at the gate, looked at Hathaway and Beatrice running out of the door, and smiled at them. Beatrice ran out of the house first in her thin pajamas and bare feet, and she threw herself into Saldak's arms desperately. Saldak patted Beatrice's bare back in the cold wind, nodded to Hathaway who ran out behind, and freed up one hand to open to Hathaway, like friends they hadn't seen for a long time. Hathaway hugged Soldak reservedly and then quickly separated. Beatrice seemed very excited. She invited Soldak into the villa, and the three of them sat down on the sofa in the living room. The maids brought warm milk tea. Soldak took the initiative and asked, When did you two come? Beatrice and Hathaway sat across from Soldak. Beatrice's face was covered with red clouds, and she smiled and replied, It has been more than two months. We have spent the entire spring in Alinsa City. 
Serdak did not expect that they had lived in Halanza city for so long, thinking that they had failed to find him several times before. He said apologetically, Sorry! The guard battalion has received a temporary assignment and has not been in Halanza city recently. Hathaway sat on the sofa and remained silent. But Beatrice was very talkative. She smiled at Soldak and said, I didn't expect you to join the guard camp. Hathaway, and I thought you would join the adventure group. By the way, how did you find this place? We never left an address. I am now a knight in the guard camp of Halensis City. It will not be difficult to investigate two foreign noble ladies in Halensis City, Serdak said. Beatrice glanced at Hathaway, and then boldly said, Mr. Knight, as the landowner of Halensis City, can you take us around Halensis City? Soldak thought for a while, and then agreed. This is my honor. Beatrice pulled Hathaway and ran up the stairs quickly, saying, Knight Serdak, you may have to wait for us for a while. This little moment from Beatrice's mouth made Soldak wait for more than an hour. Just when the maid brought the seventh cup of hot tea to Serdak, the two ladies were wearing tight-fitting leather clothes. A walk down the stairs. Actually, Halensa is most beautiful in the autumn, when the oak forests all over the mountains and fields are covered with acorns. The scenery is the most beautiful. Soldak, Hathaway, and Beatrice walked out of the villa, and a magic caravan parked outside the door. Chapter 503 Choice In the center of the garden square of Aranza City stands a Baroque-style bell tower. This bell tower is built on a solid granite base and is entirely made of bluestone. It is the tallest building in the garden square area. The four sides of the bell tower are carved with exquisite giant reliefs, each of which tells a glorious history of the city of Alanza. It is said that there used to be a dragon nest on the stone cliff at the southern end of the Pagros Mountains. A red dragon was entrenched here and often attack humans in the southern part of the Pagros Mountains. In order to resist the red dragon, the people here built pedestal castles everywhere and invested heavily in installing some giant crossbows on the arrow towers of these castles. But even so, they still could not stop the intrusion of the red dragon. Duke Newman summoned the Bena swordsmen and organized three dragon hunting operations. Finally, in the last dragon hunting operation, Duke Newman killed the red dragon with a Quelsera sword in his hand. Officially due to that battle, the southern foothills of Mount Paglos were completely reduced to scorched earth. The place where the red dragon had been fought has now become a desolate land, and the dragon's nest has been burning for hundreds of years, covering the area within a hundred miles. A thick layer of volcanic ash is what the Halanza people call Pimple Mountain. Standing on the observation deck of the bell tower, holding onto the railings, she looked out at the pale blue mountains outside the city. The cold south wind blew away Hathaway's golden and soft long hair. She stretched out her hands to gather her long hair and tied it with a the handkerchief was tied into a refreshing ponytail. And his green eyes looked in the direction of Serdak's finger, trying to cross the five ridges to see clearly which mountain pass Serdak mentioned. According to Serdak, as long as you cross the mountain pass, you can see the village of Wall on the edge of the deserted land. She and Beatrice stood side by side. And Beatrice looked at Suldak with admiration, not hiding her fiery gaze. Beatrice had already figured out Suldak's family situation during the chat. He not only had a wife, but also a son. Thinking of this, Hathaway became a little depressed. And her heart, I wonder, if my trip to Alinsa was too impulsive. Seeing Beatrice's happy face, Hathaway felt confused. She couldn't see the future clearly, and she couldn't be as straightforward and casual as Beatrice. She still had to take care of her family. Feeling that she didn't know how to convince her father and get his support, the three of them then went to the Temple of Liberty in Alinsa City. However, this magnificent temple was now completely ruined. Many of the gold-painted reliefs on the surrounding walls were seriously damaged. There is only one watchman in this temple now. Soldak showed the guard camp knight badge and took out ten silver coins to persuade the old man to open the door. The courtyard of the temple is paved with bluestone slabs. But the gaps between these bluestone slabs are now overgrown with weeds. The holy grail-shaped water-spraying stone sculpture in the middle of the courtyard is covered with a thick layer of bird droppings. And there is a thick layer of bird droppings on the top of the petal-shaped sculpture. And surprisingly there is a bird's nest. When I walked into the auditorium, I found that the Statue of Liberty inside had collapsed. And the hand representing freedom fell into a pile of rubble. The condition of the temple in Beta City is better than here. At least there are still a few priests. Hathaway stopped in front of the statue and said, All the valuable things in the temple have been emptied. Even the benches in the auditorium only have a few broken legs. There was originally a silver basin filled with holy water in front of the high platform. 
But that platform now, there is only a dark hole left. And the silver basin has long been lost. I didn't expect that the temple here would be in such a dilapidated state, Beatrice said, standing next to Hathaway. Naturally, there was nothing to visit in the completely abandoned Temple of Liberty. The three of them walked around casually and walked out of it. Before leaving, the old man standing guard at the door smiled obscenely at Soldak and showed a look that said, I understand you. Time passed very quickly, and in a blink of an eye, Soldak had been walking around the city with Hathaway and Beatrice for most of the day. The three of them randomly found a restaurant on the street of the Magic Tower. After enjoying a dinner, Serdak showed his courtesy as a landlord and planned to end today's trip. The Magic Caravan parked in front of Hathaway and Beatrice's temporary residence. Soldak declined the invitation to sit inside and bid farewell to the two women. Will you write to me? Beatrice stood at the door and asked Soldak with some reluctance. Serdak nodded. When you come to Benna City, will you come to see me? Beatrice asked again. Soldak nodded again and said, Yes. Beatrice smiled, but her eyes were filled with sparkles. She took a deep breath to prevent tears from falling down so easily. Serdak mounted the ancient Bolai horse and waved to the two women. Then the rapid sound of horse hooves sounded, and Soldak's figure quickly disappeared on this long street. After taking a shower, Beatrice lay on the soft bed wearing a thin nightgown. There was a sheepskin diary in front of her, and she held a quill in her hand. While writing in the diary, she told Hathaway said, Hathaway, how do you think we can convince the people in my family to allow me to marry a knight? Facing Beatrice's question, Hathaway said very speechlessly, How could I know? She was taking care of her hedgehog crystal lion leather armor. Tight leather armor needs to be coated with some grease in spring. If it is not maintained for too long, the leather will harden. Once the leather of this kind of tight leather armor hardens, the movements during combat will be affected. Therefore, as a swordsman, you must first learn to take care of your own leather armor. Beatrice lay on the bed, supporting her chin with one hand, and asked with a troubled expression, Hey, Hathaway, if I succeed one day, can we still be best friends? Hathaway was slightly startled. It seemed that she had never thought about this problem. Now that she thought about it, joining Beatrice was really willing to let go of everything she had. It seemed that it was really possible. She suppressed the rising feeling in her heart. Feeling irritated, he turned around and held Beatrice's round face, pressed his fair forehead against hers, and said to her, Of course, we will always be best friends. Beatrice breathed a sigh of relief, and her eyes became much brighter. She jumped up and hugged Hathaway like a female leopard. The two rolled on the big bed, and Beatrice stared at the sea. With her green eyes, Sevi said extremely seriously, Then we agreed. No matter which one of you or I get what we want one day in the future. We are not allowed to be angry with the other. I'm not planning to marry him. Hathaway said against her will, avoiding Beatrice's gaze. A cold little hand reached out from her collar. Hathaway struggled for a moment and asked Beatrice. Hey, Beatrice, what are you doing? Beatrice smiled and said, Let me touch your heart. Do you dare to say what you just said again? Don't make trouble. Hathaway pushed Beatrice's hand away and whispered with a blush. After leaving the alley, Soldak scratched his hair vigorously to expel some unrealistic thoughts from his head. After living in the city of Valenza for nearly half a year, he has a deeper understanding of this society. For example, there is an invisible but insurmountable wall between the nobles and the common people. Although he is a first-class knight, it only belongs to civilians with a little privilege. When passing the magic guild, Serdak pulled the reins of the horse. He thought that he was about to leave Valenza and should visit Scholar Ferdinand before leaving. Thinking of this, he jumped off the horse and led the horse towards the magic tower. After handing the horse to the guard at the door and reporting the name of Scholar Ferdinand, Serdak successfully entered the magic guild. In Serdak's impression, Scholar Ferdinand rarely leaves the magic tower, and he can be found every time he comes here. This time Serdak visited Scholar Ferdinand. As expected, he was staying in the mage tower, and he seemed to have just completed a magic experiment. He was exchanging some experiences during the experiment with several magic apprentices. The young magicians around him, the apprentice quickly recorded the words of Scholar Ferdinand with a look of admiration on his face. Scholar Ferdinand saw Serdak push open the door and walk in. He waved to the magic apprentices surrounding him, indicating that the exchange of ideas was paused. Then he walked up to Serdak and greeted him on the sofa in the rest area. Sit down. A female magic apprentice brought two cups of green tea, which made Soldak wonder whether after drinking this cup of tea, he would become like a firefly, 
and a section of intestines in his stomach would also emit gleaming lights. Green light. He smiled at the female magic apprentice, but did not dare to try. Scholar Ferdinand did not hesitate, took a sip, and then asked Serdek, Why do you have time to come to my place? Soldak told Scholar Ferdinand that he had participated in the plane war in the Maka plain some time ago. And Scholar Ferdinand said with a look of realization, No wonder I haven't seen you for a while. Lance, that guy seems to have also participated in this plane war. We met several times in Wazimra City. He was in the magician investigation team, Serdak said. Scholar Ferdinand seemed to have thought of something. He sat up straight and looked toward Soldak and asked curiously, By the way, have you used the strengthening scroll I gave you last time? How do you feel? Has your physique improved a bit? Soldak touched his nose and said, Well, it happened that the legs of my horse were broken. Its four legs were broken on the battlefield in the Warsaw Plain. I am worried that it will be difficult to recover if it is broken again. So I just used it. For a moment, all the sounds in the laboratory seemed to disappear. Scholar Ferdinand and his magic apprentices stared at Soldak in disbelief. Scholar Ferdinand pointed at Soldak and said sadly, You actually gave a precious magic strengthening scroll to your war horse? It turns out that it works very well. Serdak replied honestly. Scholar Ferdinand's complaints came to an abrupt end. And he couldn't wait to ask. Tell me about the situation. Soldak said to Scholar Ferdinand, That horse is downstairs. Do you want to take a look for yourself? I think its legs have undergone certain changes. Before Serdak could finish speaking, Scholar Ferdinand stood up and said, then what are we waiting for here? Take me to see it quickly. Scholar Ferdinand took several magic apprentices and carefully inspected the ancient Boli horse for a long time before returning to the mage tower with satisfaction. According to Scholar Ferdinand, this magic enhancement scroll was very successful. The only uncontrollable thing was that there was excess magic power in the scroll, which stimulated some kind of benign mutation in the fractured leg of the war horse. This can fully prove that the design of the magic strengthening scroll is completely feasible. After hearing what Scholar Ferdinand said, Serdak secretly wiped the cold sweat from his forehead, thinking that it was a good thing that the scroll was not used on himself. The scars on the body are already scary, but it would be the worst if countless blood vessels bulged somewhere on the body. Serdak then discussed some popular knowledge about magic pattern breeding clothing with Scholar Ferdinand. Scholar Ferdinand told Soldak that the reason why the Imperial Magician's research on magic pattern clothing has been at a standstill is mainly because of the lack of understanding of the magic pattern of life. Magic pattern clothing not only affects the carrying capacity of warriors, there are strict requirements. Whether the attributes of the life magic pattern match the warrior's own attributes is also crucial. If the fusion effect of the magic pattern reproduction equipment and the recipient is poor during the implantation process, it also means that the reproduction equipment has failed. Once the implant fails, it will not only affect the health of the recipient, but may also endanger the life. In addition, the life magic pattern is something that many magicians can only meet but cannot seek. There are even fewer books on the magic pattern of life, and only a few magic scholars are interested in academic research in this area. At present, the books of the Magic Guild only contain some test data on the black magic pattern, but this dark element will corrode the body of the recipient. Once the implantation process fails, the recipient may become a madman, or may leave traces on his body. The injury is irreversible. So the Magic Guild prohibits Black Striped Magic Skin from being used as Magic Striped Magic Skin. The Black Striped Magic Skin seized from the battlefield can only be used for academic research. Serdak originally wanted to tell Scholar Ferdinand that he had successfully implanted a magic pattern colonization suit on an archer. Hearing what Scholar Ferdinand said, he hesitated a little. After thinking about it again, he decided not to talk about it for the time being. Moreover, regarding how to obtain the magic pattern of life, Serdak felt that it was not like what Scholar Ferdinand said. So difficult. Before leaving, Serdak said that he had completed his studies at the Knight Academy in Alinsa City and was about to serve as the sheriff of the deserted land outside the Paglos Pass. He would go to the deserted land. Scholar Ferdinand didn't say much about this matter. He only said that if you don't want to stay in the guard camp, you can join the Magic Guild. When Serdak left the Magic Guild, the sky was already filled with stars. Chapter 504 Magic Pattern The drizzle fell on every corner of the mountain city of Alanza. The stone roads on the streets, the gray tiles on the roofs, the clock tower towering on the garden square, and the oak ridge outside the city. The man in black who came out of the white elephant trading company put his hood over his head. The cold wind blew into his neck. He tightened his collar, revealing thin and slender fingers. 
he walked to the door of a magic grocery store and said dryly to the voice of the store, Please give me a copy of the Imperial City Magic newspaper. I want the latest one from last month. The shop owner walked out of the room and handed him a magic newspaper. Before the shop owner could tell the price of the magic newspaper, he placed the seven silver coins he had prepared on the wooden table at the door of the shop, stuffed the magic newspaper into his arms, held his collar with one hand, and walked into the drizzle. Middle. There were only a few pedestrians on the street, and a magic caravan sped away from the street. He coughed slightly and turned into a narrow alley. The end of the alley is connected to a back street. There is a back street between almost every two main streets in Alinsa City. Domestic garbage is usually piled on the back street. Every morning, the night watchman will gather these domestic garbage before the street lights go out. Clean it up. He leaned against the shadow in the corner of the back street and lit the pipe. Brought it to his mouth tremblingly. Took two strong puffs. And then coughed violently. As the violent coughing suddenly stopped, he leaned down, bending his waist into the shape of a shrimp, and fell silently into the garbage. The walnut pipe inlaid with gold wire in his hand rolled down on the mud. On the ground, tobacco shreds were scattered, and sparks flew in the wind. A maid carried a bucket of garbage and walked to the back street. Just as she was piling garbage in the corner, she saw a stiff corpse lying in the garbage heap. She was so frightened that her face turned pale. She fell down on the dirt and screamed. A hysterical scream. Not long after, several knights from the guard camp of Alensa City gathered around the garbage dump in the back street and launched a series of investigations on the body. Almost at the same time, Soldak walked into the White Elephant Trading Company. He bypassed the lobby on the first floor and climbed to the second floor. Stopping in front of a wooden door, he adjusted his leather armor before knocking on the door. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Please come in. The calm voice of Magician Dale came from the room. Serdak opened the door and walked in. The tall magician raised his head, greeted Serdak warmly and said, Night, Serdak. Why are you here? Everything goes well recently? Serdak walked into the room and saw the Dale magician reading a magic book. He walked to the opposite side of the Dale magician and said with a smile, Everything is fine. Serdak asked straight to the point. Magic Dale. This time, I came to the trading company mainly to buy some saltpeter. Is there such a material in the trading company? Magician Dale had the burly figure of a northern man. There was a hint of surprise on his face, and he said, Saltpeter is a magic material used by ice magicians to assist in casting spells. It is stocked in many magic grocery stores. Many scroll-making masters like to grind saltpeter into powder and add it to pure white ink to increase the power of ice magic scrolls. This total magic very few people will use the material. But our firm happens to be engaged in this aspect of trade. Then, he shouted into the next room. Miss Linda, call manager Joey for me. If he's not here, ask the manager on duty to come over. A sweet voice immediately answered. Okay, Magician Dale. Magician Dale leaned back on his chair, pinched his eyebrows with his hands, and said, Night, Serdak. Are you here to trade sulfur or a white elephant trading company? Serdak said, That's right. Magician Dale, this time I brought six carts of sulfur ore. Magician Dale showed a true expression on his face and asked Serdak again. From last winter to now, our trading company has received 15 loads of sulfur or one after another. Such a large amount of sulfur or should not be the trophies brought back during the adventure. Do you own a small sulfur mine? Serdak answered calmly. Yes, I happen to find a small sulfur open pit mine in my night territory. Magician Dale asked in surprise. Is your knighthood in the southern mountainous area of Mount Paglos deep in the deserted land? Soldak nodded. It's over there. It seems that it is no secret that Pudu Mountain has sulfur mines. Soldak thought to himself. Magician Dale nodded and said calmly. Although it's not a good place, there are indeed sulfur mines. Then he crossed his hands, supported himself on the desk, and said to Soldak. I think we can sign a framework agreement. I can purchase the sulfur or in your hands at a price better than the market price but you must guarantee this part of the sulfur ore. Priority will be given to our business. A flash of lightning flashed in one of Mage Daler's eyes from time to time, and he saw Serdak's trump card at a glance. Serdak smiled bitterly and said, I came to you just to discuss a deal with you. In addition to some saltpeter, I also want to ask you to help purchase some. As he said that, he took out a sheepskin from his arms. The purchase details of a large amount of steel bars and thin steel wires were clearly listed on the paper. He pushed this request in front of the magician Dale. 
Manager Joey walked in from outside the room at this time and said to Magician Daylor, Sir, are you calling me? Then, his eyes fell on Serdak, and he quickly greeted Serdak. Hello, Night Serdak. Magician Dale directly handed the purchasing details to Manager Joey and asked him, How long will it take to prepare all the goods on the list? Manager Joey took a rough look at the above content and said, It will take about a month. And the steel materials need to be customized from the blacksmith workshop in Benna City. Arrange it as soon as possible. I need the best price and the fastest speed. Magician Dale waved his hand to Manager Joey and said, Okay, sir, as you ordered, we will do it right away. Manager Joey immediately put the parchment into his arms, saluted and said, Then I wish us a happy cooperation. Magician Dale said to Soldak, Happy cooperation. Serdak stood up and responded. On his purchase list was a purchase order for steel bars with an amount of up to 500 gold coins. In addition to paying the first deposit, Serdak's subsequent payments would be deducted from sulfur ore. The first level storage in Wall Village after the completion of the reservoir. A large dike for the secondary reservoir will be built immediately. The length of this dike is almost twice the length of the primary reservoir dike. Therefore, the steel keel required for the cement embankment has become the current priority purchase. S. Material. Not long after, Soldak walked out of the White Elephant Trading Company and met up with Andrew, Samira and Gulitam who were waiting outside the trading house. Soldak then took the six four-wheel trucks in the village to the sea. At the Lanza Free Market, at this time, the price of cassava in the free market had nearly doubled from half a month ago. At the request of the old village chief, Soldak bought some wheat bran and some low-priced beans. The old village chief believes that these cobalt slaves are currently engaged in physical labor digging river channels. Eating cassava, which has a certain degree of toxicity, will greatly affect the progress of the digging. Therefore, the old village chief proposed that Serdak purchase a batch of wheat bran and beans in Halinsa City this time. When there was a famine in Wall Village, the villagers often ate these two foods, along with some tree rice. The multigrain porridge that comes out is much better than cassava. Serdak loaded six carriages according to the old village chief's instructions, and then left the city of Halanza with six four-wheel trucks. Two days later, Hathaway and Beatrice boarded the magic airship bound for Benna City and quietly left Halinsa City. After the victory in the war on the Maka Plain, Marquis Luther became a new member of the upper-class nobility of Benna Province. Not only did he receive praise from Duke Newman, but the members of Marquis Luther's family were also thoroughly investigated by many powerful families who wanted to form alliances. In order to convey the signal of alliance, some letters of visit and engagement letters piled up on Marquis Luther's desk like snowflakes. Among them are some engagement letters that hoped to marry the daughter of Marquis Luther. In a letter written to his daughter Hathaway, Marquis Luther clearly stated that he had found an outstanding young nobleman for his daughter and hoped that Hathaway would consider it carefully. This was one of the reasons why Hathaway hurriedly returned to Benna City. On the way back to Wall Village, Soldak was sitting in a four-wheel truck. He took the opportunity to open Cyrus. Hickok's magic notebook saw Celia Cooper closing her eyes and concentrating in the pages of the book. Under the dazzling sunlight, Celia Cooper's figure instantly dimmed a lot. Celia Cooper let out a mental scream, and Soldak hurriedly closed the magic notebook. Serdak placed the magic notebook in a shadow and opened it again. Only then did he see Celia Cooper looking furious, complaining to Serdak in the cage of the book pages. Her figure on the page also became darker. Soldak, you definitely did it on purpose this time. Celia Cooper roared loudly at Soldak. The communication between them does not rely on sound. But on the spiritual level, it looks like Serdak is sitting in a four-wheel truck and looking through a magic notebook. Sorry, Celia Cooper. Soldak also felt that he was a bit reckless this time and quickly expressed his apology. However, Celia Cooper on the page only gives Soldak a dim back view. Soldak scratched his head and asked, Miss Celia, what can I do to make you feel like you were before? Celia Cooper turned around and communicated with Soldak. Huh? Only the soul fire of the undead can restore some strength to me. After all, I also belong to the soul form. Soldak knew that soul fire could strengthen Celia Cooper's soul but there were almost no undead near the city of Helensa, he said with some embarrassment. Well, there are no undead near Helensa. How is it possible? There will always be some lost souls where the dead are buried. They cannot ascend to the kingdom of God, and they cannot enter the underworld of the dead, Celia Cooper said to Soldak. Soldak touched his nose and asked Celia Cooper, You mean the cemetery? 
That's it. Serdak thought for a while, and found that the two cemeteries outside Helensa City were not in this direction. There seemed to be only mass graves of local villagers on the top of the mountain, outside the mountain pass. Although I didn't really want to go. I thought that if I needed help with Celia Cooper in the future, my relationship with her wouldn't be too tense. So I had to bite the bullet and said, Okay, when passing through the Paglos Pass, I will take you to the top of the mountain for a walk, hoping to get some unexpected results. Seeing that Suldek agreed to help her collect soul power, Celia Cooper's expression became less ugly. Asked Suldek, What do you want from me? Serdak then talked to Celia Cooper about some issues about magic pattern colonization. He was a little confused about these issues. Scholar Ferdinand did not give Serdak some definite answers. Now Serdak asked again Celia Cooper proposed. You just want to talk to me about this? Celia Cooper scratched her hair irritably and asked Soldak. Serdak nodded. Aren't you an expert in this area? Celia Cooper's face just didn't say how do I know. But then, she pondered for a moment before saying to Soldak. Although I don't understand how you did it. In fact, this matter is actually far from as simple as you think. Whether it is the inscription master of the Magic Guild of the Green Empire or the great magician of our Black Magic Hermitage. No knowing how many magicians spend their whole lives trying to figure out how to obtain the magic pattern of life and then provide high-quality magic pattern substrate for magic pattern breeding equipment. Obviously at this point, you are already ahead of the vast majority of magicians. After so many years, apart from knowing that the magic pattern of life is composed of rune words, how many people have actually seen the rune words? The fact that you were able to successfully implant a piece of magic pattern clothing into that half-elf girl shows that you have a certain understanding of magic pattern clothing. And I am not a scholar in this field of magic. I am better at the matrix composition of space magic. I can't give you any better advice on this. Celia Cooper's last words. Soldak finally heard something useful. And listened to her. In my opinion, your biggest advantage is that you can find some very complete life magic patterns. Serdak knew that he could see the life magic pattern contained in the monster's body because he had the eye of truth. After chatting with Celia Cooper for a while, she saw that Celia Cooper looked tired. This kind of communication was very draining on her mental energy. Soldak decisively told Celia Cooper. He said, Have a good rest and see you later. And then closed the magic notebook. Serdak called Samira over again and checked the magic pattern implanted in her right arm. He found that the magic pattern of the power of the demon ape was fused with her arm, leaving only the right shoulder. There were cyan lines. If you didn't look carefully, you wouldn't be able to see any traces of the great demon ape's magic skin. It felt like a delicate tattoo was drawn on her upper arm. Chapter 505 Hope in the Eyes of the Cobalt Slave Andrew was very envious of the magic pattern implant on Samira's arm, and had privately expressed to Soldak that he would be willing to have the magic pattern implant implanted if given the opportunity. However, Magic pattern breeding equipment is not something that can be obtained just by thinking about it. The most difficult thing to obtain is of course the magic pattern clothing itself. A piece of magic beast leather with natural magic patterns is worth a lot of money. This thing is almost extinct in the market. Magicians have been trying to explore the field of life magic patterns for so many years. However, magic scholars, including many great magicians, are unable to grasp the laws of the magic pattern of life. This kind of magic pattern created by nature is still quite mysterious to human magicians. Andrew has awakened the berserker soul. And the magic pattern breeding equipment he needs must be strength or physique oriented. In fact, as an archer, Samira's magic pattern breeding equipment that is most suitable for her should be the magic pattern for agility. However, because her body cannot withstand the impact of the burst of blood power, Serdak uses the power of the great magic ape to Siong's magic pattern not only greatly enhances strength and explosive power, but also has a double strike effect. The magic pattern clothing with this attribute is more suitable for Andrew. Samira still kept her old habit of wrapping her right arm tightly with a strip of cloth. She rarely showed the magic patterns on her arm. This time, Serdak also wanted to see how well the powerful magic pattern of the great demon ape was integrated with her arm. So he asked her to untie the bandage on her arm. Now it seems that Samira has been completely integrated. Got this magic pattern clothing. The situation is not bad. You should have fully mastered the power of this magic pattern breeding costume, Serdak said to Samira. The half-elf archer glanced at Serdak indifferently, and silently wrapped the bandage around his right arm again, wrapping it all the way to the palm of his hand, and tying a knot above the middle finger. She is very aware of the current condition of her body. Her right arm has not hurt since the implantation of the magic pattern cloth. This is enough to show that Serdak could not help but heal the hidden injury on her arm. 
This magic pattern cloth also allowed her to he has the power to control the power of the elf blood in his body. When Samira was in Wazamala City, she had heard someone mention how expensive the magic pattern armor was. She knew that the magic pattern armor on her arm was probably more precious than those so-called magic pattern armor. It was true. To do the math, I'm afraid it will cost me my whole life. Facing the cold wind, she glanced at the blue sky. She was a little envious of the kite flying freely in the sky. She jumped lightly to the highest point of the truck, took off the alloy bow from behind, drew the bowstring and aimed at the falcon in the sky. There is not much meat on the plucked skeleton of this kind of harrier, and the meat is old and poor. Few people are willing to eat it. Samira wants to shoot it down from the air simply because after seeing it, she feels a little bit in her heart. Accurate. At this moment, a male pine pig burst out of the oak forest. This male pine pig was as strong as a rhinoceros, with a half-meter-long black mane growing out of its back as high as a mountain peak. The corners of its mouth were nearly exposed. It has gray tusks one foot long, and the fur on its body is covered with a thick layer of pine oil. Over time, the pine oil accumulates and forms a thick layer of hard scab on its body. It moved its huge body and rushed out of the oak forest. It stood on the roadside and roared towards the carriage of the second four-wheel truck in the convoy. The huge blood-filled eyes were staring at the dozen or so big fat pigs in the carriage. And its strong rear was constantly rubbing against an oak tree next to it, shaking all the time. Serdak was a little speechless. He didn't expect to encounter such a male pine pig in heat on the way back to Wall Village. He was so overwhelmed by sexual impulse that he broke out from the depths of the oak forest and stopped the four-wheel truck. It seems that he must have taken a fancy to the fat pigs in the truck. A male pine pig unexpectedly appeared in the oak forest, which frightened the coachman in Wall Village. They stopped their four-wheeled carriages one after another, not daring to anger the male pine pig too much, for fear that it would resemble a tank. The same pine pig crashed over and smashed the four-wheeled carriage to pieces. If Serdak hadn't been in the convoy, the villagers might have abandoned the carriage and fled. Although this kind of pine pig is huge, it is not a magical beast and can only be regarded as a large beast. Before Soldak and Andrew could rush over with the guy, Samira, who was standing on the roof of the carriage, suddenly turned her bow and arrow and aimed it at the panting pine pig. Soldak only felt a faint light on Samira's arm, and an arrow turned into a white light. It cut through the air with a whooshing sound and shot into the left eye socket of the pine pig covered in pine oil. In an instant, a small streak of blood burst out from the skull of the pine pig, and then the sharp steel arrow cluster emerged from the other side of the pine pig's skull. The pine pig didn't even have time to launch a charge. It staggered forward two steps and collapsed on the forest road covered with dead leaves. Before the coachman could react, they heard the ogre Gilladam cheering, threw off his big feet, and chased after him. He steadily carried the nearly thousand-pound pine pig on his shoulders and walked three steps at a time, walking out of the forest. He said to Samira with a silly smile on his face. Tamira, what a big wild boar. He knew that the half-elf archer was not interested in the meat of any beast. So this arrow was not shot for herself. Samira ignored the ogre, just pointed at Serdak, and left. He jumped off the truck, got on his horse, and ran towards the front of the team without even looking at the pine pig. Serdak's attention at the moment was not on this huge pine pig. He rubbed his eyes hard, wondering if he had seen it wrong. Because at the moment Samira shot the arrow, he seemed to see a green tree vine emerging behind Samira. Although this green vine, the tree vine flashed behind Samira. But Serdak still saw it. Is that her power? Serdak had never seen Samira show off her power. It was probably because she had not reached the first level of strength. Her excellent archery skills were entirely due to her awakening the power of the elves' blood. Unexpectedly, Samira Law actually succeeded in being promoted to a first level archer. And with one arrow, he easily hunted down a large pine pig that the villagers would never dare to think of. The ogre walked to Serdak and asked Serdak, who was sitting on the four-wheel carriage. Captain, how about we have this for lunch? Serdak frowned and said to the ogre, The roast is not done yet. Why don't we hurry up and try to get back to Wall Village before dark? And then we can cook a large pot of delicious broth in the village. Wouldn't it be better served with crispy scones than grilled meat? Okay, okay, then let's go quickly. The ogre touched the saliva hanging in the corner of his mouth, and he couldn't wait to return to Wall Village. He kept following the team, walking slowly as if the ogre golem was full of strength. He strode to the front of the team with a huge pine pig on his shoulders. Knight Serdak bought back a large amount of supplies from the city, which has long been accustomed to the villagers in Wall Village. 
The villagers even knew clearly that the old village chief would distribute these materials fairly. And all villagers in Wall Village would have their own share. In the central square of the village, fragrant broth is boiling in five large pots. Several village women who are the best at making scones in the village are gathered around the stove, making scones on several stone slabs. There are already bamboo baskets beside them. There was a tall stack of scones. The ogre sat next to him, silently waiting for his share of dinner. At this time, Serdak and the old village chief Bright happened to walk into the cobalt slaves' work shed at the entrance of the village. Nearly 800 cobalt slaves sat silently in the work shed, enjoying boiled pumpkin and multigrain cakes with a light salty taste. Several villagers were carrying a large wooden barrel, filling the large wooden bowls of these cobalt slaves with boiled soft and sweet pumpkins. This group of cobalt slaves were extremely quiet while eating, and there was only a clear sound of chewing in the work shed. When Serdak saw the villagers carrying buckets of boiled pumpkins into the work shed, he asked the old village chief strangely, Where did you get all those pumpkins? In spring, everything comes back to life, and pumpkins are also a rare food for people in Wall Village. The villagers of Wall Village prefer to go into the mountains of Oak Ridge in late autumn to collect chestnuts and cassava for winter storage. Few people want to store pumpkins. This is mainly because the villagers cannot guarantee that the pumpkins will still be edible after a whole winter. However, neighboring villages have large cellars to store such vegetables. The reason is also very simple. Because several neighboring villages have large cellars. This kind of large cellar and magic sealing box can store magic scrolls and prevent the loss of mana of the scrolls. The large cellar itself has a simple magic pattern array, which can keep the food in the cellar fresh and extend the storage time. However, this large cellar has the cellar is expensive to build and can only be built with the efforts of the whole village. Wall Village originally had such a large cellar, but after the magic pattern array was damaged, it has never been able to rebuild it. It's not the surrounding villages. I don't know who took the starch out of the village. When talking about this matter, the old village chief looked angry. And then he said, Many people in the neighboring villages heard that we in Wall Village can extract starch that is finer than wheat flour. And they all wanted to exchange it. Give it a try. In this season, what these people can get is really limited. The only things that can be exchanged for food are rotten pumpkins in the cellar. However, I think it is also possible to use starch in exchange for some pumpkins to improve the food for these cobalt slaves. Not bad. Just change some. Serdak asked, Has our method of extracting starch been spread? The old village chief bright waved his hands and said firmly, No one knows yet. If anyone dares to leak this secret, I will break his legs and drive him out of the village. This is probably the most severe method of disposal in the old village chief's mind. The succubus Aphrodite, who was following Serdak, couldn't help curling her lips. Her face was hidden behind the black veil. No matter what expression she made, no one would see it. She lived a very leisurely life in Wall Village these days. She would climb to the bare ridge alone every day. Sometimes she would sit on the hillside for the whole day. Sometimes she would go far away. But she would definitely be there in the sky. Haitian returned to Wall Village. She never spoke to anyone except old Sheila, Rita and Natasha. People in the village only knew her as a follower of Serdak. At this time, the old village chief walked to the center of the cobalt slave shed. He asked a young man behind him to throw a large piece of pork on a wooden tray to a group of cobalt slaves sitting around for dinner. The nine cobalt slaves stared at the oily fat pork in the wooden basin with wide eyes. For a moment, they did not dare to reach out. The smell of meat spread to the entire work shed. Many cobalt smelled the smell of meat and followed the smell of meat. Turn your head and look this way. The old village chief stood beside these cobalt slaves, hit one of the cobalt slaves on the shoulder twice with a short stick, showed a look of relief on his face, and shouted loudly to the other cobalt slaves in the work shed. Their team has performed the best in the past few days. They dug the river channel quickly and well. This piece of leg meat is their reward. When the old village chief said this, the cobalt in the slave shed began to discuss among themselves. It was obvious that this piece of meat had an extraordinary appeal to the cobalt slaves. The old village chief arrogantly said to these cobalt slaves, As long as you work hard here, you will not only be able to eat multigrain pancakes and pumpkin porridge, but also be rewarded with this kind of delicious meat on a regular basis. And I want you to make a promise. As long as you dig this channel, and you will have three days rest. The discussion among the cobalt slaves grew louder. Aphrodite leaned behind Serdak and whispered in Serdak's ear. Originally, I thought that only we succubi were good at bewitching people. But I didn't expect that you, the village chief, would do the same. She squinted her eyes 
and looked at the old village chief bright. There was a faint fragrance floating on her body, and the warm breath she exhaled made Serdak's ears itchy. Samira, who was standing nearby, glanced at Aphrodite with some dissatisfaction, and Aphrodite closed her mouth and distanced herself from Serdak again. Serdak saw that the cobalt slaves in the slave shed were no longer what they used to be. Their expressions were full of malaise, decadence, numbness, and confusion. Although they were still depressed, they were still sitting around on the reed mats in the shed tiredly. But Serdak could see a glimmer of hope for future life in their eyes. This bit of hope should be brought to them by the old village chief. The old village chief has recently secured a lot of benefits for these cobalt slaves. He tried to reduce the frequency of cobalt eating cassava, and more often advocated that they eat some multi-grain porridge mixed with wheat bran. Now he has added boiled pumpkin to the recipe. Apparently it gave these cobalt slaves a feeling that life could slowly get better, and a desire for future life gradually grew in their hearts. Following the old village chief out of the work shed, Serdak looked back at the cobalt slaves in the work shed and felt that they might have really changed. Chapter 506 Ordinary Life Everyone in the village knew that a group of cobalt slaves dug an artificial water channel on the edge of the river bend downstream of Wall Village. The main purpose of this canal is to drain the large amounts of rainwater collected from the surrounding mountains in a timely manner when the rainy season comes. The tidal flat of the river bend forms a swamp every year due to abundant rainfall in summer. This swamp occupies a large area downstream of Wall Village. In the low valleys and depressions, a large number of reeds and red thatch grow here. Countless reeds and red thatch grow, wither, and finally rot completely, becoming fertilizer for this tidal flat over the years. The old village chief Bright also summoned the villagers of Wall to manage this tidal flat, but they were put on hold due to the huge amount of work. Soldak wanted to turn this fertile tidal flat into good land for growing wheat. And finally, the main thing is to block the abundant rainwater that gathers from the surrounding mountains before the rainy season, and to divert the rainwater to the entrance of an underground river. The artificial river now dug by the cobalt slaves is a diversion canal. In addition to this canal, the old village chief also plans to build a low flood control dam outside the reclaimed tidal flat. After nearly a month of excavation, the cobalt slaves have dug a nearly 5 kilometer long river near Wall Village. Since the deposited silt is less than 2 meters, after the cobalt slaves hollowed out the silt in the river, it was revealed there is a limestone rock formation at the bottom of the river. If you want to further break through this part of the rock formation, not to mention the huge amount of work, you will also need a stone pick to dig out the rock formation. Serdak stood on one side of the embankment, watching a group of cobalt slaves lift limestone blocks from the river bottom to the edge of the embankment to build a stone wall. A dozen villagers from Wall Village were building a stone wall on the limestone. Cement slurry was poured into the gap to form a flood control dam that was nearly one meter above the ground. Then he asked the old village chief Bright, Uncle Bright, do you think this canal can drain away the rainwater collected from the surrounding mountains? In a year with heavy rainfall, this drainage channel may not be enough. However, in the past few years, the rainfall in the deserted land has been less than a year. If calculated based on last year's rainfall, this drainage channel must be more than enough. Old Village, the wrinkles on Chong Bright's face relaxed. Managing this tidal flat was a long-cherished wish that he had not been able to fulfill for so many years. Now seeing these cobalt slaves digging out the river channel bit by bit, the Old Village Chief was filled with emotions. According to the Old Village Chief's estimate, the canal will be dug to the entrance of the underground river in two months. Soldak wants to widen the river by 10 meters. This is not difficult. These cobalt slaves are digging the tidal flats. The siltation rate on the ground is not slow. But Soldak still wants to dig the river channel one meter deeper. The limestone rock layer has already been dug at the bottom of the river. If you dig further, you can only chip away at the stones bit by bit. Watching the excavation of the channel, the progress has slowed down and the old village leader Bright is still a little anxious. Soldak pointed to the other side of the flood control dam and said to the old village chief Bright, We can plant some willows on both sides of the embankment of this canal in the future. What's the point of planting willows? It's better to plant some chestnut trees and oak trees, and then harvest rice and oak nuts in the fall. What's the use of willow trees? Old village chief Bright cursed in his heart. Of course, he didn't know that someone wanted to plant willows by the river out of some kind of sentiment. Although he didn't agree with it very much, he didn't necessarily oppose it. He was thinking about other things. Little duck, are you really not going to add this place to your territory? Mayor Bright didn't understand that Suldak had spent huge sums of money to renovate the village of Wall, build a reservoir, 
and dig river channels on the tidal flats to open up new wheat fields. But he was unwilling to classify this land as his own night territory. For the villagers of Wall, of course this is good, but Serdak is of no benefit. The old village chief Bright felt that he still needed to have a serious talk with Serdak about this matter. Serdak smiled nonchalantly and said, The boundary markers of my territory have been erected. On the territory of Helensa, my territory almost covers the entire Pussy Mountain. In addition to being uninhabitable, it is also difficult to live there. Yes, in addition to owning a sulfur mine, there is a large amount of volcanic ash accumulated in the territory. These volcanic ash are first-class building materials. After the construction of the village's reservoir is completed, I am also planning to sell these volcanic ash cement to Hylon. Go to Seiching. Whether it is building a house or building a city wall, there is no material more suitable than this cement. Soldak pointed to a pile of volcanic ash cement not far away and said to the old village chief, Although the land here in Wall Village is very good, it is even if I own this night territory and a large area of new wheat fields. Even if all the wheat produced in these wheat fields is ground into wheat flour in the future, how much profit will it bring to me? Chief Bright saw a strong reservoir dam being built with his own eyes. Of course he clearly understood how convenient this volcanic ash was. After adding a special kind of lime powder, it was actually possible to build a stone as solid as a rock. Well, but he never considered the aspect of volcanic ash can also be sold for money. Can those volcanic ash everywhere be sold for money? The old village chief looked at Serdak in surprise. Of course, you also know how strong the reservoir dam made of Potsalana cement is. These Potsalana cement can not only be used to build the walls of Alinsa City, but also can be used to build stronger houses. In Alinsa City, there are also many half-stone and half-timber lofts. If built with this kind of volcanic ash cement, it can be at least two floors taller. If such a good building material is very cheap, it will even cost less than using wood. There must be someone willing to buy. In this regard, Serdak is still somewhat confident. The old village chief Bright hesitated for a moment, but couldn't help but say what he was holding in his heart. He reminded Soldak, I have no objection to widening the channel of this canal, but the limestone layer at the bottom of the river needs to be dug out. I am worried that before the rainy season arrives, this drainage canal may not be able to communicate with the underground there. The river has completed the last step of connecting. And moreover, Manpower is still needed to open up the tidal flat. Serdak walked down the river embankment, stood in the river covered with limestone, and said to the old village chief, I am going to let the villagers open up that tidal flat. The land there will be cleared in a few days, and then you must personally divide this land for everyone to avoid unnecessary disputes. Are you not going to take this land? Village chief Bright was completely confused by the young man in front of him. Serdak shook his head and said, My night leads over the Pussy Mountain. Although I have a good personal relationship with tax collector Bird, when the tax is collected in the autumn, this wheat field will inevitably have to pay taxes to the empire. If the tax is distributed to everyone, given the poor subsidy bill introduced by the city hall, this part of the tax will probably only be a symbolic collection. The old village chief Bright thought in his heart, maybe this is the vision of the night. After Soldak led the security team back to Wall Village, Andrew and Samira took on the duties of the security guards and began patrolling the 19 natural villages in the deserted land, and began to draw new maps of the deserted land. Map. The two of them rode ancient bow lie horses around these villages, and already had a general understanding of this barren and barren land. There is a lack of supplies here. These villages are far poorer than they thought, and most of the villagers have never seen much of the world. They can't even tell the difference between a guard camp knight and a tax collector. Andrew, thinking he was a tax collector, jumped up in fright, when he saw Andrew appearing from a distance. At first, Andrew thought he had encountered a gang of bandits. When he rushed over, he realized that these villagers who had fled were poor villagers who could barely afford cereal porridge. The overgulidum follows the carriage pulling volcanic ash into the depths of the barren land every day. He went to the depths of the deserted land. Of course, not for the volcanic ash, but to hunt the gray rock iguanas living in the Gobi Desert. The ogre was almost obsessed with a braised lizard tail dish. This season was not the best time to hunt gray rock iguanas. If ogres want to eat this delicacy, they have to go deep into the deserted land to hunt in person. Only the succubus Aphrodite has the easiest life. What she likes to do most every day is sit on the ridge and bask in the sun. The villagers all knew that she was Serdak's retainer. Serdak brought back a mithril-plated mask from the city of Helinsa. It was a mask that was polished as smooth as a mirror, except for the holes for a pair of eyes. 
everything else was extremely smooth. She liked it very much. She wore a mask on her face almost every day. And she never said H, low to the villagers. At most, she occasionally followed Serdak around to watch the excitement. So much so that the people in the village were used to her presence. But they didn't dare to approach her. And no one would take the initiative to provoke her. At the end of the month, Charlie took five villagers to the sulfur mine in the rocky area and exchanged Luke and five other villagers stationed there. The bottom of the secondary reservoir in Wall Village has finally been leveled. And the grouting of the waterproof layer at the bottom of the pool has begun. 24-wheeled carriages in Wall Village are continuously transporting volcanic ash to the reservoir construction site. The bricklayers on the construction site are busy until late every day. And even Rita and Natasha, who are responsible for cooking for the bricklayers, have to come back very late. Serdak has been selecting sites for the deserted land security team outside the Paglos Pass in the past few days. In the end, the old village chief Bright made the decision and designated a piece of land upstream of the village near the edge of the fifth level reservoir dam. Land. Soldak plans to build a three-story villa along the mountain here. The specific architectural drawings will be carefully discussed several times with Celia Cooper. This magician who is good at space magic also has some experience in architecture. Several brief discussions gave Serdak some very useful suggestions. But what Serdak didn't expect was the visit of Lance. The law enforcement team of the Helensa Magic Guild. Little Peter stood on the hillside, pointed at a black shadow in the sky, and shouted excitedly to Serdak. Toldak! Look! That man can fly! Serdak asked the group of bricklayers around him to continue. While he walked to Little Peter's side and looked at the black shadow in the sky against the dazzling sunshine. When the magic harpoon became clear enough, Serdak finally saw clearly the magician riding on the harpoon. The magic harpoon circled in the sky above the reservoir, then plunged down and landed next to Serdak. A young magician wearing a beige magic robe jumped down from the magic harpoon handle. Serdak went up to him and hugged him, and then said kindly, Lance, why do you have time to come to my place? I came here specifically to see you this time, Lance said to Soldak. Then he saw little Peter standing next to Soldak with a timid look on his face and asked Soldak, Is this your son? Serdak smiled and nodded. Lance took two steps toward little Peter, squatted down in front of him, and reached out from his arms to take out an exquisite wooden box. Serdak thought the wooden box was a music box. Lance opened the lid of the wooden box, and a dancing fireman appeared in the wooden box. Little Peter looked at the little fireman in the wooden box with great surprise. He could even feel the scorching temperature of the little fireman. He wanted to reach out and take it, but he didn't dare. He looked at Serta with some hesitation. Like Graham? Serdak nodded to him encouragingly. At this time, Lance had already recovered the wooden box and handed it to Little Peter. Thank you, Little Peter said in childish words. Lance smiled and said to Little Peter, You should call me Uncle Lance. Thank you, Uncle Lance, Little Peter said again. Remember, you must not play with this box in the dead grass or firewood. Lance reached out and touched Little Peter's head and warned him. Soldak walked up to Lance and signaled to Little Peter that he could go over there to find old Sheila. And then turned to look at Lance and asked him, What happened to you coming here all the way? Do you know the Dale Magician from White Elephant Trading Company? Lance asked bluntly. Yes, I have some business dealings with Magician Dale. I discovered an open pit sulfur mine in the Knight's territory. Almost all the sulfur mine recently was sold to the White Elephant Trading Company. Serdak answered truthfully. It turns out it was because of Brimstone that you chose the night leader in that useless place, Lance said with a look of surprise on his face. Pay attention to your quality. You are an excellent magician noble. You shouldn't be so rude, Serdak countered to his friend. Huh? Okay, let's talk about business. I will go to other places to investigate later, Lance said. We suspect that this Daler magician has some kind of connection with a group of space magicians. This the group of space magicians collectively rebelled against the Green Empire Magic Union a few years ago. Is it the Black Magic Hermitage? Serdak broke into a cold sweat behind him. Lance shook his head and said, It's not the Priory. It's another illegal space magic organization. In order to find the secret of space magic, these space magicians came into contact with some taboo magic publicly announced by the Empire Magic Union. So you know, sometimes those who don't follow the rules are always vulnerable to rejection. Chapter 507 Traces of the Rebels According to the news from the Magic Union of Bena Province, a great magician from this organization quietly sneaked into the city of Valenza. Our law enforcement team is currently secretly investigating this matter. Having said this, 
Lance took out a magic portrait from his arms. A magician stood lifelike in the portrait. Lance pointed at the magician in the portrait and introduced Soldek. His name is Armin Ives. The bounty on the wanted poster from the Magic Guild has reached as high as 30 magic crystals. It is said that several demon hunter organizations are looking for traces of him because he is good at space. He is a magician, so he escaped several rounds of arrests against him. This time, there were clues that he came to Alensa City and met with a rebel liaison. Although the magician of our law enforcement team, who is responsible for tracking the matter, did not pursue it, we found Arvid's whereabouts. But we found clues about the rebel liaison in the city of Alanza. The dark red magic robe is covered with strange magic patterns. A wand inlaid with seven gems, surrounded by several lightning bolts. Looks extraordinary, Serdak said to Lance in surprise. There are still rebels in the Rebel Green Empire? This is really the first time I've heard of this. Lance nodded and said, That's it. Even during the period when the Empire was at its most stable, there were still some rebel forces appearing in various places. Some forces usually occupied a certain small plane and then cut off the portal with Roland Continent. It is not uncommon for such organizations to be organized in such a small plane. And most of these rebel organizations are related to this magical organization. Soldak motioned for Lance to continue. A week ago, we received news from an informant that the rebel liaison actually showed up at Baixiang Trading Company. However, not long after he left Baixiang Trading Company, he died in the back alley of a shopping street and was later killed by a man. The maid who went out to take out the garbage found that by the time our people arrived, the body had already been completely cold and there were no clues left, Lance said to Soldek. We suspect that this matter has something to do with Magician Dale. Dak, on April 17th of this month, did you go to White Elephant Trading Company? Serdak thought about it for a moment. And that day happened to be the last day he stayed in Helensa City. He nodded calmly and said, Yes, I went to see the Dale Magician and signed a contract with White Elephant Trading Company regarding sulfur. Mine contract? Lance asked. When you were at Baixiang Trading Company, did you see a foreigner wearing black clothes and a thin face? Soldak recalled it carefully and said firmly, No. There was some disappointment in Lance's eyes. And he patted Soldak on the shoulder and said, If you have any clues about this, remember to write to me. Seeing that Lance didn't ask any other questions, Soldak asked in shock, Well, you flew here just to ask me these questions face to face? Magician Lance nodded seriously. It's a matter of great importance. And every piece of information must be carefully checked. He pulled out the magic handle from his magic waste bag, let it float in front of him and straddled it, and hurried away on the magic handle without even drinking water. Of course, the arrival of the Lance magician could not be concealed from the old village chief Bright. By the time he arrived at Soldek's side, Lance had already flown into the sky without a trace and stood alone on the foundation stone. Looking at the clouds in the sky, he sighed sincerely. This young magician really spends all his time at work. When he came to Wall Village, he left without even having a drink of water. The security team's house was built according to Serdak's design drawings and construction methods. The foundation was paved with strips of limestone. And then the gaps in the rock blocks were filled with volcanic ash cement slurry. Currently, only the foundation part has been completed. The old village chief, Bright, was very busy every day. Whether it was the tidal flat drainage channel construction site or the reservoir construction site, there were a lot of trivial matters waiting for him to coordinate. So he stayed with the security team for a while and then left. Soldak walked under the shade of the tree, took out the magic notebook from his arms, and asked Celia Cooper on the page. Celia, do you know the magician Armid Ives? Celia Cooper was sleeping in the magic notebook. Soldak opened the pages and woke her up from her sleep, which made her boss unhappy. She stretched out in the pages of the book, glanced at Soldak through the railing, and said, He is a great space magician who is proficient in space magic and building magic teleportation arrays. It is said that the double door teleportation array in Durba province was designed by this great magician himself. But it seems that he later studied it because of the forbidden magic of another dimension was tracked down and wanted by the magic guild of the Imperial City, and later joined the Dark Moon Gate. Dark Moon Gate? Soldak repeated. Celia Cooper nodded and said, Well, it is a magic organization composed entirely of space magicians. Since the Green Empire has a complete inheritance of fire magic, more than half of the top management of the Empire Magic Union are fire magicians. They exclude magicians from other factions. Therefore, a few decades ago, 
a collective defection of space magicians broke out in the Green Empire Magic Union. The Dark Moon Gate, a magic organization, was to resist the Magic Union at that time, and a temporary magic organization. This magic organization has several magicians who are proficient in teleportation circles. After some noble lords plan to occupy a certain plane, if they plan to break away from the rule of the Green Empire, they usually come to the Dark Moon Gate and ask them to seal the teleportation circle. Door! Cut off all ties with the Green Empire. They found me once. When Margaret, Cyrus Hickok, and I were preparing to copy the Devil's Gate. But they didn't accept their invitation. After listening to Celia Cooper's explanation, Soldek realized that the Dark Moon Gate was actually an illegal organization and was on the opposite side of the Green Empire Magic Union. No wonder the Magic Union would look for them whenever there was an opportunity. This group of space magicians is in trouble. As for the rebels who betrayed the Green Empire, they have probably been closely watched by the Imperial Intelligence Department. As expected, three days later, the security team of Paglos Mountain in Aranza City received a message from the guard camp. It was said that two Imperial rebels escaped from Aranza City overnight. They hid in Oak Ridge at night. And that they if you want to leave Bina province as soon as possible, you will most likely want to cross the deserted land and then go north along the Paglos Mountains. Although this road is difficult to walk, it is the most stable way to leave the country. Mainly because the Paglos Mountains are like a north-south beacon, lying across the territory of the Green Empire. After receiving the news, Serdak quickly unfolded the map of the desolate lands jointly mapped by Andrew and Samira, and circled the area bordering Oak Ridge and the desolate lands with red lines. Serdak analyzed these two the rebels were unfamiliar with the desolate land, and their advance route would not stray too far from the mountain roads. In the past few days, Andrew has been riding two horses, patrolling the Gobi Desert alone in the deserted land. The full armor he wore was too heavy, so he had to switch to another horse after riding for a while, so that he could both horses maintain their strength. Half-elf archer Samira doesn't need to be so troublesome. And Samira, who has elven blood, is naturally close to nature. She can communicate with her mount superficially, so she can ride a horse and roam around in the deserted land. Visit. Andrew and Samira investigated the whereabouts of the two rebels and notified 19 villages to take precautions. Since they were absconding rebels, in order to keep their whereabouts secret, they would inevitably do something to kill and silence them. Because the villages had taken precautions in advance, the two rebels were discovered by the villagers when they sneaked into a village to steal food, thus exposing their whereabouts. When Soldak received the news, Andrew and Samira were still out on patrol. The territory of the desolate land was quite large. Andrew and Samira had to stay outside for nearly a week every time they went out. Returned to Wall Village once. He knew that this kind of thing could not wait. So he took the ogre ghoul item, who was about to follow the four-wheeled carriage into the depths of the deserted land, and chased him in the direction mentioned by the villager who reported the news. The four-wheeled carriages transporting volcanic ash have carved a bare road in the Gobi Desert. There are basically no sharp gravels on this road. The villager led the way on an ancient bolai horse. After all, the horse was fast. In the afternoon, the villager took Soldak and the ogre ghoul item to the small mountain village called Yuta by the locals. After the villager returned to the village, he asked the two rebels in detail about their escape route, and then walked into the deserted Gobi Desert again, in the deserted land in early May. The temperature difference between day and night is huge. The temperature is extremely low at night, and during the day, a scorching sun shines overhead, evaporating the only layer of moisture on the surface. Riding a horse on the rolling Gobi Desert, at a glance, there were yellow gravels everywhere. This place is located 10 kilometers north of Pudu Mountain. The route chosen by the two rebels was to avoid it as much as possible. As long as you bypass the smoky Pudu Mountain, it will not be so desolate, but it will go deep into the mountains where monsters are rampant. Before Serdak left, the old village chief repeatedly warned Serdak that he must not enter the depths of the Paglos Mountains. The villager walking in front stopped. Serdak looked at him doubtfully. He pointed to a hillside in front of him on the left. Serdak looked over intently and saw two people wearing earth-colored linen cloaks on the hillside from a distance, leading the horse on foot. The ogre ghoul item followed Serdak all the way and caught almost nothing except a gray rock iguana. Seeing these two travelers leading their horses on foot, I immediately became energetic. Serdak took the lead and chased the two rebels, and the ogre ghoul item did not fall behind. The two did not conceal their whereabouts at all, so that the other party discovered the attempts behind them very early. After catching up with Serdak, the two rebels were very alert. 
when they saw Serdak catching up. They did not hesitate to get on their horses and flee towards the north. The two rebels did not ride horses along the way in order to keep their two horses with sufficient strength when escaping. So at first they ran very fast. And the distance between them and Serdak was getting farther and farther. However, the endurance of these two horses was very average. Gradually, as the sun was setting, the speed gradually slowed down. The warhorse Serdak is riding is his old buddy. Since its broken leg was strengthened by the magic scroll of Ferdinand Scholar, its physical fitness is much better than that of ordinary ancient Bolin horses. The ogre Gulitum only cares about whether the rebel's two horses can be eaten, and has been following Serdak steadily. No matter how fast Serdak's horses run, the ogre can rely on two pad foot catches up. When he was still a hundred meters away from the two rebels, the ogre Gulitum bent down and picked up a stone as big as a frisbee from the ground. He took a deep breath while running and held it. The hand on the edge of the stone stretched back, then held in a breath and threw the stone violently. The stone was like a spinning flying saucer, whizzing towards the rebels in front. By the time the rebels realized something was wrong, the stone had already hit the right rear thigh, and the sharp stone suddenly opened a long wound on the horse. A neighing sound almost knocked off the rebel on horseback. Seeing that the situation was not good, the two rebels immediately ran away in two directions. Serdak pointed to the ogre Gilidim's injured horse, and signaled him to take charge of the rebel. He quickly chased after another rebel. Originally, Serdak thought that the rebels were all powerful first-tier warriors. As soon as they made contact, Serdak felt that the rebel had little fighting power. However, he still tested it very cautiously and swung his sword to fight with him. The rebel fought hard once, and the craftsman's heavy sword in his hand cut off the rebel soldier's long sword. Soldak sat upright on the horse, then waved the dwarf chain shield in his hand, knocking the rebel off his horse. Down. These actions were done in one go, and the rebel was subdued with almost no waste of effort. Looking back at Gulidum, the ogre had already begun to look for ropes everywhere, clumsily tying the rebel tightly. Two horses were seized this time, although one of the horses was injured in the hip. With Serdak, I believe that the horse's injury will heal soon. The village of Val was in dire need of horses, so Serdak decisively refused the ogre's request to taste horse meat. Subsequently, Serdak brought the two rebels back to the village of Wall and sent someone to send a message to Carl in the city of Aranza, telling him that the two fleeing rebels had been captured. Serdak locked the two rebels in a wooden cage next to the cobalt slave shed at the entrance of the village, and asked Luke, who was responsible for managing the group of cobalt slaves, to help guard them, before Soldak could go home and have a good sleep. Luke, who was responsible for guarding the two rebels, caught up with Soldak and said, Dak, those two people want to talk to you saying he wants to make a deal with you. Serdak waved his hand to Luke and said, Ignore them for now, and let them calm down. Otherwise, they don't know what conditions they are going to offer. What qualifications do they have to negotiate with me now? Chapter 508 Taking Advantage of the Night There was only a dark sunset glow between the mountains, and a few stars lit up in the night sky. The last rock bird also got into its nest on the mountain cliff. The village of Wall, hidden in the ravine, lit up with sparks. The cobalt slaves returned from the river embankment to the work shed at the entrance of the village, covered with stars and moonlight. Dragging their exhausted bodies, they lined up silently, holding large wooden bowls in their hands to receive tonight's cereal porridge from the cook. This may be a rare time for them to relax during the day. After dinner, they can lie down in the work shed covered with reed mats and sleep until dawn. The multigrain porridge in the big wooden barrel is very thick. In order for the cobalt slaves to be fed, the simple cook of Wall Village cooked the multigrain porridge mixed with a large amount of wheat bran and beans until it was very soft. This was also the reason of the old village chief Brett. On the orders of the cobalt slaves, the cobalt slaves dug river channels and reclaimed river bins and tidal flats. As long as it was for Wall Village, the village cooks must do the logistics well. Most of the overseers in the village who were responsible for guarding these cobalts would eat a big pot of rice in the slave camp and then go home slowly feeling their stomachs, although the food at home is better than that in the slave camp, who has never suffered from poverty. During the famine, sometimes people didn't eat as well as these people did. Now the living conditions are a little better, but no one has forgotten the hard days in the past. The big pot rice in the slave camp is not unpalatable. If you are full here, you will save a meal at home. This group of cobalt slaves saw the overseers, who had been watching over them all day eating from a pot with everyone. During the day at the river construction site, 
although these overseers were wandering around with whips. The ends of the whips really fell on their compatriots. But there are very few times. Occasionally when you are tired. You will be allowed to rest on the slope of the river embankment for a short while. When you have no strength. You will occasionally see the supervisors catching up from behind. You think you will be whipped. But when you wait instead. He stretched out a pair of rough hands to drag the stone slabs hard. And walked through the most difficult section of the river embankment road. A crescent moon hung on the dead branches at the entrance of the village. After the kobolds finished their dinner. They were allowed to take a cold bath or something like that by the river downstream. And then laid down in the work shed groaning. There was no kobold. People are willing to break this comfortable life. Even some kobolds lying in the work shed will feel that except for the lack of freedom. This kind of slave life is actually pretty good. Two rebels were imprisoned in a wooden cage next to the work shed. Luke was responsible for guarding the two rebels at night. When he saw dinner starting in the slave camp, he silently brought two bowls of multi-grain porridge from there and put them in, in a wooden cage. Then he held a spear with a white wax pole and sat honestly three meters away from the wooden cage, staring at the two rebels with wide eyes. The two rebels were beaten up by Serdak and Gulitum. They both suffered varying degrees of injuries. The bruises on their faces silently showed their disgraceful record. They lay on the horse like sacks. On my back, the bile in my stomach almost came out. At this time, there was a gurgling sound in my stomach. Luke and Charlie are the leaders of the younger generation in the village. Compared to Charlie, Luke is not as smooth and flexible. But he also has some advantages. The skin on his body has been tanned by the vicious sun. And his lips are a bit thick. At a glance, People will think that he is a poor boy from the ravine who has never seen the world. At this time, Luke is also holding a half bowl of multigrain porridge. Drink and make chirping sounds from time to time. Seeing that the poor boy in front of them actually drank the multigrain porridge so deliciously, the two rebels couldn't hide the joy in their eyes when they looked at each other. The two communicated silently with their eyes for a moment and then moved towards the edge of the wooden cage. Although their hands were tied with hemp rope, it did not prevent them from holding the wooden bowl. Perhaps they were hungry. So the two rebels were very satisfied with the multigrain porridge cooked with wheat bran and beans. Although the rough wheat bran scratched their throats, they would feel it if they occasionally encountered a soft and waxy bean. An indescribable feeling. The kobolds in the slave camp have all gone to sleep. The two rebels leaned against the wooden cage and fell asleep with their eyes closed. It was not until the last light in Wall Village went out that one of the rebels opened his eyes. His eyes were a bit sharp, and his companions across from him felt his gaze. They also woke up from their false slumber. They secretly glanced at Luke with their peripheral vision, and found that Luke was like an alert weasel, staring at the wooden cage with big eyes in the dark night without blinking. In the dark night, the village guard standing outside the slave camp slept more soundly than the cobalt slaves in the work shed. This gave the two rebels a glimmer of hope. Maybe the young man would sleep later. They were stunned. So they looked at each other, and continued to close their eyes. It wasn't until he opened his eyes for the third time to secretly observe Luke's rebels, and found that the young villager was sitting three meters away from the wooden cage holding a spear like a stone sculpture that he gave up completely. So he quickly launched a second escape plan. A rebel pretended to be asleep. His hands were trapped. He leaned on the edge of the wooden cage, and turned over in the cage with a very uncomfortable movement. By chance, a silver penny fell out of his arms. It slipped out, glowing silver in the night, and rolled into the gap under the wooden cage. Such a shiny silver coin was very conspicuous at night. And Luke saw it, but let the two rebels lie in the wooden cage with their eyes half closed, their hands and feet ready to pounce at any time. And they want to subdue Luke at once when he touches him to pick up the silver coins. Only by subduing the guards of the wooden cage can they find a way to escape from here. What they didn't expect was that Luke just glanced proudly at the silver coin in the gap of the wooden cage and remained unmoved at all. So the first half of the night passed like this. The two rebels began to pray that the villagers who came to take turns in the middle of the night would not ignore the silver in the cage like this proud villager. Heavy footsteps sounded, and the earth trembled. Then a mountain of flesh stopped in front of Luke. The ogre Gulatum squatted next to Luke and said to Luke, Then go to sleep. Well, Andrus said that you have a lot to do tomorrow, and we will keep an eye on you for the rest of the night. Luke looked at the ogre showing his white teeth. Even though he had been with him for so many days, he still felt a little frightened every time he saw him. Luke stood up, knocked on his legs that were numb from sitting, and said to the ogre, Then I will go back. You have to take care of him. I will bring you wheat cakes tomorrow morning. To eat chicken. 
I want to eat stewed chicken. The ogre made his demands on Luke. Still eating? Look at how many chickens there are left in the village since you came to our village less than two weeks ago. Luke complained to the ogre and then said, Not in the morning. Tomorrow morning if nothing happens. Follow me into Oak Ridge. Almost all the pheasants are flying out there now. If you are lucky, you may be able to trap a few back. Okay. So, you are such a good person. The ogre praised him with satisfaction. Then Gulitem folded his hands on his chest and sat on the edge of the wooden cage, staring at the two rebels with his bell-sized eyes and licking his lips with his rough tongue from time to time. The two rebels who were locked in the cage wanted to use the silver ingot under the cage to turn over. Unexpectedly, an ogre who couldn't help drooling when he looked at them came and leaned against the cage. He closed his eyes in complete despair, lifting the white and smooth arm pressed against his chest. Serdak sat up from the bed, stretched his neck and glanced at Zigna lying on the upper bed. The little girl curled up and held the magic notebook. After sleeping soundly, Serdak gently took the magic note out of Zigna's hand, carefully placed it on her pillow, and then helped her pull the thick blanket before lying back on the bed. Although this house was only renovated last year, its biggest drawback is that it is too small. There is only one room. Although Zigna is still young, Serdak feels that this is still inconvenient. There was only a little bit of residual charcoal left in the fireplace diagonally opposite, and there was uneaten white bread on the table. Although their lives had changed with the help of Soldak, Selina did not do it every day to eat this kind of luxurious white bread. Only when Soldak stayed here for one night, would he be willing to take out the treasured white bread to entertain him? Her eyes, as deep and blue as lake water, opened, her gentle gaze full of admiration, silently looking at the strong man lying quietly beside her. The sexy and bright lips pursed slightly, and the corners of the mouth inadvertently raised in an upward arc, stretching out her arms to gather her fluffy golden hair behind her head. She looked at Soldak with her blue eyes. She curled up lazily on the bed like a Persian cat. Soldak gently stroked Selina like a brocade. His smooth back whispered to her. Life here will gradually get better. I know. Selina responded softly, with a hint of softness in her voice. Soldak was slightly startled by his determined tone, and then asked, How about I help you build a warmer house? I listen to you and wait until the water reservoir project in the village is completed. You can build my house wherever you want. Selina looked at him with a smile. This look made Soldak feel guilty for a while. He still didn't have the courage to bring Selina and Zigna to old Sheila openly. He was worried that he might be kicked out of the house. Zigna on the upper bunk turned over, and the sound of even breathing came again. Selina sat up slightly, supported her body with one hand, and rested her head on Soldak's chest, as if listening to his heartbeat. Dak, I want to try something. What's up? Soldak stroked her slender face with his hands. I want to try to spread the teachings of the Dark Goddess to those cobalt slaves. Since I am the messenger of the Dark Goddess, if I have the chance, I think maybe I should do something. Delina whispered to Serdak. Those kobolds? Serdak was speechless. But when I think about it, although these villagers living in the deserted land are far away from the city of Valenza, they are a group of believers of the Statue of Liberty who have not been affected the most. They have not received the blessings of the goddess before. Now the priests and priests in the temple the goddesses are all gone. So naturally it won't affect the villagers' faith. They are all used to it anyway. Well, I found that they can understand the Green Empire language. And their intelligence is not as low as imagined. I want to use the simplest teachings to make them believe in the dark goddess Selene. Selena said seriously. Okay, what do you need me to do? Have you ever thought about how to get them to accept the teachings? Or, before dinner every day, let those cobalt slaves listen to you talk about the glorious history of the dark goddess. Serdak asked very cooperatively. That's not necessary. As long as you agree. That's fine. Seeing that Soldak didn't object, Selina smiled sweetly. When she smiled, the stars in the night sky would look dim, and she stretched out her white arms to hook around Soldak's neck. Signa stared at the magic notes on the bed with her eyes wide open, looking a little speechlessly at the magic notes that turned automatically on the bed. The magic notes stayed on the last page, and the pages exuded a dim light. It was already so late, and Soldak and Selina, who were sleeping in the lower bunk, were still very dishonest. Celia Cooper looked at the Daughter of Darkness lying on the bed like a kitten in front of her. She leaned her body against the corner of the page of the magic notebook. She sighed softly in her heart, and a ghost appeared on the page behind her. There was a blank space. 
Celia reached out and drew two random strokes on the blank space. And a magic symbol appeared in that position. This magic symbol belongs to a syllable in the ancient Elvish language. Celia Cooper quietly made a series of mouth movements to Zygna, seeming to teach her the correct pronunciation of the ancient Elvish language, and then began to speak seriously. Tell the specific application of this syllable in certain places. At present, most of the spells in the Green Empire Magic Guild are recited in ancient Elvish. So the necessary condition for becoming a magician is to learn a foreign language. Ancient Elvish. Signa followed Celia Cooper's silent recitation. And she was even able to copy the symbol perfectly with her fingers. A trace of darkness condensed into this magic symbol in front of her. Although Celia Cooper knew that Zygna's learning ability was not very strong, she still felt that she had underestimated Zygna for her ability to master a syllable of ancient Elvish language. Since Zygna discovered the existence of Celia Cooper that night, she used the power of the Dark Goddess to set up a cage to trap Celia Cooper in the magic notebook. In the Green Empire, both civilians and nobles have a chance to awaken their magic when they reach the age of 12. Once the magic pool in the body is awakened, it means becoming a magician noble. If you want to make some changes in your life, the fastest way is to become a magician. Even if she is a saint who comes to the Roland continent from the Dark Goddess. Signa pursed her lips slightly and signaled Celia Cooper to teach her the next syllable of the ancient Elvish language. The whole night passed quietly like this. Chapter 509 Hypnosis One meter of sunshine at dawn restored the village of word to vitality again. The cooks are the first ones to get up in the village. They are divided into two groups to prepare breakfast for the Cobalt Slave Camp and the secondary reservoir construction site. The food in the two places is very different. The bricklayers at the construction site, they ate scones and chestnut porridge. But in the slave camp, they only had multi-grain porridge mixed with a lot of wheat bran. And they could only eat pumpkin pie once in a while. When the sun emerged from the mountain ridge, the kobolds in the slave camp rushed to the river bend and tidal flats to dig mud on the river side. A day of heavy work has also begun on the construction side of the reservoir. Now the waterproof layer at the bottom of the secondary reservoir has been basically completed. The bricklayers dug a deep trench nearly two meters wide at the edge of the reservoir. After the steel materials are delivered to Wall Village, a kilometer-long keel will be woven into the trench. And then volcanic ash cement and sand and gravel will be poured. This will be the second life support line in Wall Village. Serdak has only one requirement for this embankment. That is, it is strong. Even if the most violent flash flood breaks out upstream of Wall Village, this embankment will never be destroyed by the flash flood. An old tiled general who came to where village from Gouda village to work squatted on the edge of the foundation, staring at the large land below that was being vacated for the construction of a third-level reservoir. He took a puff of a pipe that choked his throat and kept talking. I know I'm mumbling how much will this cost. His bronze forehead was full of wrinkles. And he looked at this huge project with cloudy eyes. He could foresee that the life of Wall Village would gradually get better because of this reservoir. At least in the dry season of spring and summer. The villagers here would they will not have to worry about irrigation. The dug trench is waiting to be put into the steel keel. This part of steel alone is not something that the mountain people in the remote countryside can afford. Nearly 300 people are busy on this construction site every day. Not counting the villagers of Wall, who drive horse-drawn carriages day and night to transport volcanic ash back from the depths of the desolate land. They have invested so much manpower and material resources that the old bricklayer seems to have a building in front of him. A huge sky lake. This artificial lake will surround most of the valleys upstream of Wall Village. In fact, the old craftsman had no idea that the cost of the first-level water reservoir alone made the old village chief Bright stomp his feet in distress. Although most of it came from Serdak's pocket. This way of burning money, this was still unacceptable to the old village chief who was used to being poor. Fortunately, the open pit sulfur mine in the rocky area downstream of the lava river at the foot of Mount Pudu has produced some output, which finally gave the village some extra income. With this income, it first purchased 24 wheel carriages, and later a carpenter's workshop was built. And there is still a large sum of money on the village's books. The old village chief plans to use this money to invest in the construction of a secondary reservoir. The old village chief had a very optimistic forecast for the reservoir project. He thought that the second level reservoir would continue to be built at the same scale as the first level reservoir. Unexpectedly, the second level reservoir was actually larger than the first level reservoir. Several times, the little extra money the village had invested in the water reservoir project only produced a small splash. Only now did the old village chief finally understand the design of the reservoir that Serdak drew on the parchment. Those hand-drawn curved dikes were not out of proportion at all. 
as shown in the picture. The next three levels the reservoir will in turn be several times the size of the secondary reservoir, continuing to enlarge according to this proportion. This step reservoir will have five levels in total. Old village chief Bright really doesn't know how much money he has to invest in this reservoir that is comparable to a large lake in the sky. And just as Serdak planned, he built the Hellanza Guard Camp and the deserted land security center at Paglos Pass on the edge of a cliff a few hundred meters away. He also told Charlie and Luke that the villa was a lakeside building. When you go out in the future, you will see a large lake with rippling blue waves. And the garden will be filled with flowers. Because of this, the bricklayers in other villages knew how much benefit this huge reservoir would bring to Wall Village. But no one imagined that they could build a reservoir in their own village. Many craftsmen in other villages thought that this was the night of Serdak developing and building his own knight's territory. However, some people still can't understand that the canonized knight is not a hereditary noble. In the future, this part of the territory's assets may not fall into the hands of his son Peter. At the beginning, even the old village chief Bright thought that Serdak would classify Wall Village as a knight's territory. Unexpectedly, Serdak silently chose the knight's territory in Pussy Mountain and is currently investing huge sums of money to build a large number of foundations. Wall Village, which has facilities, actually still belongs to all Wall Villagers, including the artificial canals dug in the downstream tidal flats and the hundreds of acres of wheat fields that will be opened up on the edge of the tidal flats. These also belong to Wall Village. Industry The old village chief stood at the height of the reservoir construction site. Looking at the sparse thatched houses in Wall Village, he had lived for most of his life, and he had never seen a second person with such courage and broad-mindedness as Serdek. Young Knight. Although Soldak has never fought for Old Sheila in the village. When the villagers see Old Sheila now, in addition to taking the initiative to greet Old Sheila with a very low posture, their eyes are more of respect. It was like seeing those noble nobles in gorgeous clothes. The life of Old Sheila's family has not changed much. They still live in the old house that they have lived in for decades throughout the winter. Natasha and Rita, like other women in the village, still go to work every morning cooking breakfast for the bricklayers at the reservoir site. Rita! Rita! A village woman not far away shouted to Rita, who was carrying water. Coming! The carpenter workshop in the village installed a water wheel at the gate of the first level reservoir. This water wheel drives the stone mill. A group of women grind a large amount of cassava into a white pulp next to the stone mill. The white pulp is processed repeatedly by filtering and rinsing the sediment. A large amount of water starch can be obtained. After drying, the starch formed is more delicate than wheat flour. For more than half a month, the starch produced in Wall Village has been filled with nearly a hundred flour bags. The old village chief did not distribute the starch, but planned to send it to Alinsa City to sell it and exchange it for some. Whole wheat flour or beans would also work. In short, after hearing Soldak say that this thing might be sold for money, the old village chief began to strictly prohibit the villagers from eating this thing. But obviously these people do not include the succubus Aphrodite. Today, no one in the village of Wall knows her true identity. They only know that she is a follower of Serdek. Her two devil horns are hidden in her thick hair, and a mithril-plated flowing mask on her face added a layer of mystery and danger to her whole aura. Although some people in Wall Village had seen Aphrodite, but no one talks about her beauty. The breakfast that the succubus Aphrodite prepared for herself was the stew invented by Serdek. She put the crystal-clear cubes into a frying pan with a layer of butter and then a faint fragrance wafted out from the yard. Aphrodite, Andrew stood outside the yard and shouted towards the succubus, who was preparing breakfast in the yard. At present, the succubus Aphrodite, Samira, Andrew, and Guidem have moved out of Soldek's house. After all, the yard is a little smaller, and their work and rest time affects the family's normal life. So they can we rented a courtyard in the village in the name of a guard camp. The owners of the house were an old couple. They received a rent of eight silver coins every month, and they happily lived in their son's house. Aphrodite stood up, glanced at the indigenous warrior Andrew, slowly put the delicacies in the pan onto a plate, pressed a stone slab on the stove in the yard, and walked out of the yard. Since moving into Wall Village, no one has ever looked for me in such a formal way. Aphrodite suddenly felt that this seemed good. She put on a mithril mask before going out, and then looked at Andrew expectantly. Andrew brought Aphrodite to the entrance of the village. The succubus saw Serdak and the ogre waiting under the tree at the entrance of the village and asked Soldak expectantly, Are you going out for adventure? We don't have this plan yet. If you get tired of staying in the village, you can go out for a walk with Samira. 
Serdek said to Aphrodite. The succubus seemed to have almost no other activities these days besides climbing to the top of the mountain and sitting quietly. Aphrodite seemed to understand what Serdak was thinking. She shook her head slightly and said to Serdak, This kind of life is actually very good, but occasionally I feel a little bored. If you can, lend me the books you brought out from the ruins of the city. Her face was hidden under the mask, and Serdak couldn't see her expression. Okay, I can't understand what these books are written on. You can choose from here. Serdak said and took out a few books from the magic pocket. Those books were obtained in the city ruins. Serdak turned in the books about space magic when he visited Walmart. But he still kept the rest of the books he brought out from the library. The succubus Aphrodite glanced at Serdak, flipped through the books, picked one at random, and asked him, Why did you ask Andrew to call me? Serdak pointed to the wooden cage next to the slave camp where two rebels were imprisoned. The two rebels were still sleeping soundly in the cage and the bright morning sunshine did not affect them at all. I want you to ask them for me, Serdak said to Aphrodite. What do you want to know? Aphrodite's eyes flickered. Serdak thought for a moment and realized that he really didn't have anything to ask. So he said, You can just ask. It's estimated that someone from Helensa's city will come to hand over to us tonight. I don't want to comment on their situation. I don't know anything, and I don't want to hear their lies. Aphrodite made a gesture and said to Serdak, I know. Leave it to me. Serdak did not stay at the entrance of the village. He was going to go to the river on the tidal flat. He heard that the excavation progress of the cobalt slaves had slowed down. There were large pieces of limestone in the river in front. It took a lot of money to clean up the limestone. Time! And the progress was very slow. He wanted to measure other places to see if it was feasible to divert this artificial water channel. When they woke up, the two rebels found that it was already daylight. The slave camp was actually quiet and all the kobolds were gone. The two rebels looked around in the wooden cage. This time, the person guarding them turned into a woman wearing a silver mask. Although the woman was wearing a loose black robe, she still could not hide her proud face. Figure, although they couldn't see the woman's face, the two rebels still felt as if a fire was burning in their lower abdomens. They licked their lips. They had not drank water all night, and their lips were dry and cracked. One of the rebels stood on the edge of the wooden cage and bravely asked Aphrodite, Is there anything to eat? Aphrodite sat on a stone not far away and shook her head slightly. Then can you give me a drink of water? The rebel begged Aphrodite with a bitter look on his face. Aphrodite still shook her head and did not speak. Don't you want to ask me something? The rebel couldn't help but said. The succubus Aphrodite stood up and approached the two rebels step by step. Seeing her graceful figure, the rebel couldn't help but swallowed his saliva. After getting closer, Aphrodite reached out and took off the mithril mask, revealing her voluptuous and beautiful face. For a moment, the two rebels almost forgot to breathe. They only heard a vague voice in the spiritual world. Looking at my eyes, you are sleepy. You feel tired. You are drowsy. You saw the desolate land. Earth, you and your companions want to cross the Gobi and head north along the Paglos Mountains. Where do you want to go? Hypnosis is the black magic that Aphrodite is best at besides charm. The rebel was unprepared and fell into a state of stupidity. He said with a confused look, Let's go to the depths of Mount Paglos to find a cemetery, to find the sword of Quelsera. Where is the tomb where the sword of Quelsera is hidden? Aphrodite continued to ask. I don't know, the rebel said. Aphrodite did not continue to ask, but changed the topic. How many people do you have in your organization? The rebel replied, About a few hundred people. Where do you live? The rebels replied, It is in the foothills north of the San Carlos Plains. Only by escorting people can they cross the burning plains. By the time the two rebels woke up again, it was completely dark. The cobalt slaves in the slave camp's work shed seemed to have already had dinner. This time, no one brought them anything to eat. The meal was the same as last night. I had been sleeping all day, and I didn't even drink a sip of water. It felt like there was a layer of sand stuck in my throat. When the two rebels saw a strong warrior sitting across from them, they were a little hesitant to ask him for water, so they could only huddle in the cage and endure, until the sound of horse hooves came from the silent night. From far to near, a five-man night team from the guard battalion arrived at Wall Village and stopped at the entrance of the village. When Andrew saw that they were wearing the same clothes as himself, he stood up from the ground and waved to them. Chapter 510 Holy Seal what Serdak didn't expect was that the 19 that rushed to Wall Village to pick up the two rebels this time was not from the Haranza guard camp. 
but the escort team of the Bina Provincial Intelligence Agency. The night squad showed Andrew a letter of authorization signed by Captain Sauron. Even so, Andrew still found Soldak to confirm it personally. The team of knights responsible for escorting the transportation were waiting quietly at the entrance of the village. The knights wore cold visors on their faces and standard full coverage armor on their bodies. They did not explain anything to Serdak at all. They wore them on their chests. Wearing a silver intelligence agency badge. The long sword on the waist with lightning and wind runes. And the knight spear engraved with bronze magic patterns hanging on the saddle. This escort team is even better equipped than the Helenta guards. Camp. A piece of paper signed by Captain Sauron stated the vague reason. These rebels are related to some secret events in the northern provinces. They will not be tried in the city of Alanza, but will be escorted directly from Bena province to San Carlos province. Night shrouded the desolate land, and a dry and cold north wind blew from the back of the ridge. The night commander of the escort team glanced at Suldak, took the rebels trapped like rice dumplings from Andrew's hands, and pulled them both together. They were tied to horses and two knights held the reins of the two horses, and left silently along the only village road leading to the mountain pass. The escort team did not stay in Wall Village. These knights escorted two rebels, and left Wall Village at night. Captain, do you think they are rebels in disguise? Why are there no knights from our guard camp leading the way? When the escort team left, the attentive indigenous warrior Andrew expressed his doubts. Serdak stood at the entrance of the village, looking at the temporarily modified wooden cage and thinking about how to transport it to the security team upstream of the village. This wooden cage was made by the carpenter's workshop in the village. The workmanship is very good, and it is quite strong. There is almost no fault except that it is not painted. Soldak kicked the oak pillars on the wooden cage with his feet, raised his head, and said to Andrew, If they are really a group of rebels, with a letter of authorization signed by Captain Sauron, then I will admit it. Samira, the half-elf archer standing in the shadow of the corner, came out and said, They should be the knights of the Bena Provincial Intelligence Agency. I saw their eyes hidden behind the masks. Their natural sense of superiority towards the local army. That it's something the rebels can't imitate. The cobalt slave camp has become quiet. And the cobalts went to bed early after a busy day. Serdak waved to Andrew. Samira and Gulitaman said, Okay, go back and rest. This is a task completed by our security team. You all did a good job. When the group of people took advantage of the darkness and walked towards the village, the indigenous warrior Andrew said to Soldek, Oh, that's right. Captain, I heard from the hunters in Guda village that a group of bandits have crossed the desert and have been operating near the edge of the desert on the west side of the deserted land recently. They may also want to rob some supplies here. Soldek stopped and told Andrew, Tomorrow you and Samira will patrol the area and look for traces of the bandit group. Got it, Andrew said. Dawn. Serdak sat cross-legged on the bed, a beam of holy light filtering through from the ceiling, covering his whole body. Countless lit nodes are like stars in the night sky, forming a nebula that is constantly rotating in Serdak's body. Those sacred auras make this nebula covered with a faint halo. Serdak is from this nebula is constantly drawing power. The nodes in the upper body are almost completely lit up. The countless nodes are like a nebula, wrapped in the sacred aura. This nebula takes Serdak's body as the central axis slowly rotating, and constantly infecting Sir. The node at Duck's waist and abdomen. Serdak takes some time every day to draw the sacred breath into his body and try to light up more nodes. As the sacred power continued to accumulate, Serdak felt that the power in his body was growing every day. Although warriors with magic perception can practice both magic and martial arts, and their own combat power is much stronger than ordinary warriors, because they can sense the existence of magic elements, Warriors like Serdak cannot if a practitioner wants to break through level 20 and become a second level powerhouse. He not only needs to feel the appropriate fighting spirit, but also needs to have an affinity for this type of magic to the level of elemental body in order to break through the shackles of level 20. Previously, Serdak was tested at the Knight Academy to have level 15 strength. And now, he has experienced the plane war in the Maka plane. His strength must have increased slightly. He can feel this, but whether after breaking through to level 16, he didn't know much about it. So he could only wait until he had time to go to the Night Academy to take a test. Now Serdak can use the holy power in his body to release the holy light technique very easily. However, this power of holy light does not seem to be of great help in combat. It can cure diseases and save people. Serdak has not yet felt that it is suitable for him. A fighting spirit. Talking about fighting spirit is actually not suitable. Fighting spirit is what a warrior understands. 
If you are a swordsman, it should be called sword energy. According to Darcy Christie, a second level great swordsman can emit out of body sword energy by swinging his long sword, just like the wind blade of a wind magician. But it is much more powerful, especially in close combat. Throw out the sword energy unexpectedly, causing a fatal blow to the enemy. In fact, Serdak still learned a lot of knowledge during his time at the Knight Academy. In terms of knights, it should be called the Holy Seal. This is the watershed between the second turn knight and the first turn knight. However, for Serdak, simply understanding the Holy Seal may not be enough to complete the second turn, because he can sense holy breath. So the affinity of the holy system must reach a certain level so that you can possess the body of holy light. Only by meeting these two conditions at the same time can you successfully break through the second level and become a great knight. For Suldak, there's still a long way to go. Speaking of, there are not a few real great knights in the entire city of Valencia. Not even Captain Sauron of the guard camp. Suldak looked outside the house from the open window and saw little Peter standing in the yard, holding a small round wooden shield in one hand and a Roman short sword car from oak in the other hand. Working hard. Ground slashing. The soft hair stuck to his forehead and became wet, and his breathing was uneven. Suldak walked out of the room, stood in front of little Peter, and carefully corrected his breath. On the battlefield, any detail you don't pay attention to may cause you to get injured. Serdak actually wanted little Peter to learn archery from Samira, so that he could join the Long Archer Regiment when he served in the military in the future. The Archer Regiment was much safer on the battlefield than the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment and the Heavy Cavalry Regiment. But little Peter also has his own ideas. Now it seems that he prefers Shield Warrior. Chapter 511 Investigation Team It was already three days after Suldak heard the news that the Knights team of the Bena Provincial Intelligence Agency was attacked in Oak Ridge. The escort officer of the intelligence agency was ambushed by unknown persons on his way back to Alinta City. Not only were the two rebels killed, but even the escorting night team did not make it out of Oak Ridge alive. The personnel responsible for the response in Alinta City when we found the place where the battle took place. It turned out to be a mountain call less than 15 kilometers away from the city of Alanza. Even at such a close distance, this night team failed to reach the city of Alinta. It is estimated that the opponent used thunder to kill the entire escort night team. After investigation by the Magic Union Law Enforcement Team, a large number of electrical magic traces remained at the scene of the incident. Preliminary judgment should be that a great mage who is good at electric magic took action himself. At the same time, the security team in the deserted land outside the Paglos Pass also received an investigation order from the Haranza Guard Battalion, ordering Serdak to cooperate with the Bina Province investigation team to collect evidence on site. A week later, an investigation team from Bina Province came to the village of Wall. It was an investigation team composed of 15 nobles and knights. The leader of the investigation was Viscount Frank who was from Bena City. He was a senior investigator of the Bena Provincial Intelligence Agency. With two assistants and two magicians from the Bena Province Magic Federation Law Enforcement Group and a night squad from the Helensa City Guard Battalion. The captain of this night team happens to be Carl Caseman. As the captain of the response squadron, Carl is familiar with most of the areas outside Helensa City. So Captain Sauron asked him to be responsible for receiving the investigation team and serving as the team's guide. Carl was riding in front. When he crossed the Paglos Pass, he stopped at the pass and looked up at the wooden crosses on the top of the mountain. At some point, there were several corpses hanging on the wooden crosses on the top of the mountain. Although Serdek had already understood it from the written report pass from the security team to the guard camp. But when he actually stood at the mountain pass and looked at the corpses of the bandits, he had another feeling. The last time Carl came to Alenza City was during the Harvest Festival. At that time, Wall Village had begun to build a reservoir upstream of the village. This time he came to Wall Village again, only to find that the reservoir in his original memory was only roughly the outline of the first level reservoir has been completely completed. And even the second level reservoir has a very clear outline. This visual impact is still quite big for Carl. Outside the village, on the river bend tidal flat, a group of cobalts are busy digging an artificial water canal. A low flood control dam less than 2 meters high has been built around this canal surrounding hundreds of acres of river bend tidal flat. Villagers set fire to a large area of reed grass on the tidal flat. Clearing wasteland is the first step in reclaiming this tidal flat. Soon, the old village chief Bright will personally divide the land here. Serdak led all the members of the security team to wait under the dead tree at the entrance of the village. Currently, the only official members of the security team are Captain Serdak, 
Team members Andrew. Samira and Andrew. When Carl jumped off his horse, the knights from the guard camp who came with him greeted Serdak one after another. This is Knight Serdak, the sheriff of the deserted land outside Paglo's Pass. Carl was very smooth talking and could rattle off this list of names in one breath. He introduced them to Viscount Frank. This Viscount Frank is a middle-aged aristocrat, wearing tight-fitting soft sheepskin armor and leather breeches. He sits upright on a handsome green-scaled horse. He holds the horse's reins with one hand and jumps flexibly from the horse's back. When he got down, he handed the horse's reins to the assistant who caught up behind him. Carl introduced to Soldak. This is Viscount Frank, a senior investigator from the Bena Provincial Intelligence Agency. This is a magician from the Bena Provincial Magic Union Law Enforcement Group. This time, Viscount Frank came to the security team specifically for the purpose of investigation. Regarding the attack at Oak Ridge 10 days ago, Captain Sauron told me that you must do your best to cooperate with Viscount Frank's investigation. When Carl was making the introduction, the senior investigator, Viscount Frank, kept looking around with a straight face. And finally his eyes fell on the ogre. And his eyes were slightly surprised. Then he said to Carl and Soldak, Then let's start now. An assistant brought two chairs for Viscount Frank and placed them under a dead tree at the entrance of the village. Viscount Frank asked Soldak to sit down opposite him. He stared at him with hawk-like eyes and said, Knight Soldak, please tell us the whole process of how you captured the two rebels. In as much detail as possible. Serdak sat down at the entrance of the village. A group of half-year-old children from Wall Village squatted in a row from a distance and looked here curiously. But no one dared to run over. About half a month ago, our security team received a notice from Halansa City, ordering us to pay close attention to two rebels who had fled from Halansa City. According to intelligence, these two rebels it is possible to cross the desert and go north along the Paglos Mountains, leaving the province of Bena, said Soldak. This Count Frank asked seriously. There are only four people in your security team now. Serdak turned his head and glanced aside. Andrew, Samira and Gulitam were all standing aside. And then said, Yes, our security team has a full strength of five people. But due to the time it took to form it's short. Only four people at the moment. This Count Frank nodded and asked again. How did you discover these two rebels? Could it be that they sent people to guard the Paglos Pass? Serdak said truthfully. It was not us who discovered these two rebels, but a group of Yuta villagers living here. The two rebels were exposed when they entered the village to steal food, and then ran away. Come here and report to me the specific process. This is it. He narrated the arrest process in one breath, and took two sips of water during the process. This Count Frank sat there and listened quietly without interjecting any questions. After Soldak finished speaking, this Count Frank asked Soldak, you mean the two of them were locked up in a wooden cage at the entrance of the village for a day and a night? Yes, Soldak said. Did the two rebels say anything? This Count Frank asked again. No. This Count Frank was silent for a while, and then asked Soldak again. Can I see that cage? Sure. After Soldak finished speaking, he led the investigation team along the path of Wall Village towards the upper reaches of the river. The wooden cage where the rebels were imprisoned was carried outside the security team's premises by the ogre Gulitam, and it had been covered with a layer of varnish. At this time, the wall of the security team's new premises has been erected, and several bricklayers are setting up plywood on the wall. According to Soldak's description, after weaving the iron mesh on the roof, they will immediately use potsolanic cement. Grouting was done, and everything looked shabby. Carl poked Soldak, pointed at the building, and asked him in a low voice, is this the place your security team is building? Serdak nodded and said yes. Carl stepped forward, touched the already wet wall, and asked curiously, What kind of stone is this? And why is it one piece? Serdak pointed to the piles of volcanic ash outside and replied, This is not a stone, but made of mud synthesized from volcanic ash. Carl saw Viscount Frank standing next to the wooden cage looking a little impatient. So he didn't ask any more questions. This Count Frank's two assistants checked around the wooden cage. After more than half a month, the wooden cage was painted with varnish. All traces had been eliminated, and no useful clues could be found at all. This Count Frank called Andrew to him again and asked him, Your name is Andrew? Yes. Andrew nodded and answered simply. This Count Frank asked, Did you notify the villages in the deserted land to be on strict guard against those two rebels? Yes. It's my duty, said Andrew. This Count Frank touched the oak cage with his hand and asked Andrew, Are you the last guard to guard the two rebels? 
Are you also the first to see the knights escorting the team? Andrew answered honestly. I was responsible for guarding the two rebels during the day on the second day. They were very honest at the time. It was sunny and warm that day. They lay in the cage and slept almost until night because they woke up a little late. Which caused me to miss dinner at the Cobalt Slave Camp. A little later, the escorting knights came to Wall Village along the dirt road at the mountain pass. And I even waved to them on my own initiative. This Count Frank stared at Andrew with a sharper look. However, this indigenous warrior who crawled out from among the dead on the battlefield, especially the one who had awakened the berserker soul, had no feeling at all in the face of this Count Frank's mental oppression. This Count Frank asked the half-elf archer again. Samira? The half-elf archer standing next to Andrew said on the spot. I was out on patrol at the time and didn't know any of the details. This Count Frank stood in front of the ogre and Gulitem stared at him with wide eyes being stared at by a powerful ogre. People who were not strong enough in their hearts simply did not dare to look at it. In particular, this ogre was wearing simple armor and carrying a large bone-crushing mallet behind his back. He looked very vicious no matter how he looked at it. This Count Frank touched his chin implicitly. He looked at the ogre and asked him, Gulitem, you and Knight Serdak entered the Gobi. Can you describe the fighting situation at that time? Gulitem immediately became energetic. He still vividly remembered the battle scene at that time, especially the process of throwing a piece of stone cake with his hand and knocking a rebel off his horse. He described it vividly. This Count Frank did not come to think of it. The ogre who looks the most stupid and clumsy is actually the most eloquent one. He sat there talking and spitballs were flying everywhere. Moreover, his memory was very good and he could describe every detail clearly. In some places, some subjective emotions and psychological descriptions of the ogre Gulitem are added. So that at the end, this Count Frank had to interrupt Gulitem, who was eloquently telling the whole process. With the next question, this ogre who likes to reason with people also likes to tell stories. This Count Frank asked him again, Are you responsible for guarding the rebels at night? Oh, that's right. To be precise, it should be the second half of the night. The person guarding them both in the first half of the night was Luke. He, this Count Frank decided not to give the ogre a chance to continue, and then asked, Is Luke also a member of your security team? The ogre Gulitem shook his head and said, No, it's a young man from the village. Later, this Count Frank asked some people in the village, Luke, Chief Bright. After a round of investigation and questioning, it was already dark. Village Chief Bright was already in the village, preparing a room for dinner and rest for the investigation team. Wall Village is a remote area. Although the village is undergoing major construction projects, the temporary residence used to host the investigation team is the home of the old village chief Bright. The conditions are a bit difficult, but it is the best house in the village. Usually, Wall Village welcomes many seasiders. The largest official in Lanza City is Tax Collector Bird, who also lives in the old village chief's house. There were a lot of people accompanying him this time. The knights from the guard camp set up two tents in the open space outside the old village chief's house to protect this Count Frank's safety. This Count Frank and his two assistants stayed at the old village chief's house. And the old village chief and Luke warmly entertained him throughout the process. No one expected that Serdak, as the only knight in Wall Village, would live in a two-room mud house. Standing in the old village chief's yard, he had a sweeping view of the entire village. Looking at Serdak, the roof of his house was covered with thick red thatch, and everyone's eyes were full of surprise. They didn't expect that a knight officially canonized by the Green Empire was said to be so shabby. The two magicians who followed him throughout the whole process remained silent. At this time, they looked at Serdak with some curious eyes. This Count Frank stood in the yard of the old village chief's house and said to Soldak, I want to go to the Gobi scene where the two rebels were captured. Soldak, can you still find it? Soldak said, Yes, Lord Viscount. He may not be able to find that place. But the villager in Yuta village will definitely be able to find it. No one is more familiar with this desolate land than the residents here. This Count Frank nodded and said to Soldek. Okay, we will set off tomorrow morning. Everyone should go to bed early tonight. It wasn't until Soldak and Carl left the old village chief's house and the old village chief Bright began to arrange a room for this Count Frank that this Count Frank asked Luke, who looked very honest and honest. At night Soldak's house? Are you very poor? Luke nodded and shook his head subconsciously. Then he quickly explained. Their family was very poor before. But after Dak retired from the army, the situation at home suddenly turned around. He learned a superb skinning skill and often skinned black demons on the battlefield. 
and saved a lot of money. After returning to the village, he also spent his own money to build a reservoir in the village. After hearing Luke introduce the situation of Serdak to the investigation team, the old village chief turned around and hit Luke on the head with his pipe and angrily said, What nonsense are you talking about? The village also paid some money out of pocket. Most of the money he spent to build a reservoir came from the output of his open pit sulfur mine in the Knights' territory. Luke touched the big bag on his head a little aggrievedly, not daring to say another word. Chapter 512 Gunpowder Gravel Everywhere The horse's hooves trample on the ground, immediately kicking up a cloud of dust. The dry wind blowing from the desert takes away the last bit of moisture in the deserted Gobi Desert, and the water element in the air is very thin. The guide of Yuta village wrapped himself in a rough linen cloth, leaving only his eyes exposed. He rode an ancient bolai horse and walked in front. He would only eat some food and water before dawn, and would not eat any more throughout the day. In this dry spring, many villagers do this in order to save food. Recently, a group of bandits came to the Gobi. In the past, when there was a food shortage every spring, the bandits would risk crossing the desert and come to this area to rob homes. Of course, this group of bandits also knew not to drive the villagers to a dead end. Otherwise, they would be killed next spring. You won't be able to find anything. But the appearance of these bandits often makes the lives of the villagers, who are already struggling for food and clothing even more difficult. A week ago, a group of bandits were hunted down by Andrew and Samira in the Gobi for three days. Finally, they retreated into the desert in embarrassment after losing their troops. The bodies of the dead bandits were now hanging on the wooden cross at Paglo's Pass. Dozens of vultures came and circled back and forth over the mountain pass. The reputation of the vigilantes in the wasteland beyond Paglo's Pass now spreads from village to village. The investigation team entered the depths of the deserted land. In addition to Viscount Frank and two assistants, they were accompanied by two magicians, Carl and nine knights from the rescue squadron, Soldak's security team, and a group of people from Yuta Village. Name Guide This was not the first time that Carl entered the desolate land. A group of people from the guard battalion rode horses and looked at the Knights of Serdak from the highest point of the rock slope. Pussy Mountain was at least 50 or 60 kilometers away from here. Only on a clear day can you see the Pussy Mountain hidden under the billowing smoke. But now, in everyone's sight, they can only see the gray clouds piled up in the sky in the distance. Like a majestic mountain range. Only in windy weather can the volcanic ash from Mount Pudu be blown here. During the dry season between spring and summer, not a drop of rain fell here for two consecutive months. Even if you dig three feet into the Gobi, it is difficult to dig out moist water vapor. The group came to the scene where Serdak fought two rebels and found some residual black blood stains on some gravel. The ogre saw the stone he threw from a hundred meters away, shook off his big feet and ran over with a few steps, picked up the stone, and told Viscount Frank about the fierce battle scene at that time. Viscount Frank squinted at the desolate land, as if the battle scene at that time was replaying in his mind. The two magicians, who had barely said anything along the way, jumped off their horses, took out a few magic crystals from their magic pockets, and placed a magic pattern array on the stone ground. Then they placed the hexagonal magic crystals on the ground. The crystal was placed in the center of the magic circle. Two magicians stood on both sides of the magic circle and input a little magic power into the magic circle. The entire magic circle began to operate. The magic crystals in the center of the magic circle were filled with magic elements of various colors. Although I don't know what the two magicians are doing, I can generally guess that they are conducting some kind of magic detection. This Count Frank's two assistants began to collect some bloody stones at the scene, and also surveyed the general scope of the fighting venue. The group stayed here for most of a day, and the two magicians finally completed the magic test with tired faces. The two magicians told this Count Frank with great certainty that no abnormal state of magical elements was found here. This Count Frank lowered his head and thought for a while. Everyone waited aside, and no one disturbed his thinking. When he raised his head again, this Count Frank's expression softened a lot. At least when he looked at the security team, he no longer had the cold eyes. He said to the security team in Soldek, Thank you for your hard work these two days. Cooperate. Then he turned to Carl next to him and said, Then, Captain Carl, let's go to the next survey point. Okay. This Count Frank. Carl agreed readily. The investigation team then left this desolate land without stopping, knowing that this group of people had crossed the Paglos Pass in the distance. Serdak breathed a sigh of relief. After all, there was not only a messenger of the Dark Goddess in the village, 
but also a succubus from the flaming H. L. No matter who is exposed, it will be a disaster for Serdek. Soldak waited for nearly a month. And the White Elephant Trading Company finally sent the second batch of steel and a large bucket of saltpeter powder to Wall Village. The old village chief, Bright, directed a group of villagers to unload bundles of thumb-thick steel bars from the four-wheel carriage. These steel bars will be used in the main dam of the secondary reservoir. The foundation of the secondary reservoir embankment was officially poured a week ago. Steel bars protruded from the cement foundation. A group of bricklayers used iron wire to weave a network of embankments on these thumb-thick steel bars. The front and rear sides of the embankment, the long wooden boards were propped up by the carpenters. And only after the foundation of the river embankment was stronger. The embankment of the secondary reservoir would be further poured. Thirteen four-wheeled carriages were loaded with this kind of steel and drove into the village. Only then did the old village chief know that Suldak had invested a large sum of money in this reservoir. Dak, can you exchange the sulfur produced by the open pit sulfur mine in your territory for these steel materials? Of course. Soldek said to the old village chief very confidently. The old village chief watched a group of villagers move the steel materials from the car in a hurry and said with a melancholy look, I heard from Charlie that the sulfur mines in the rocky area are almost exhausted with a large amount of sulfur or transported to Alinsa city for sale. No one knows the value of this yellow crystal mixed in the rock better than the old village chief Bright. Serdak smiled faintly and said, No problem. Pudu Mountain is not just a river of lava. When the sulfur or in this rocky area is mined out, I will take them to another place. Pudu Mountain is as big as. There will definitely be no shortage of sulfur ore. What he is considering now is not the secondary reservoir. In this transaction, Soldak has even ordered the steel for the third level reservoir. What he wants to consider is that it is at least larger than the secondary reservoir. 20 times the size of the fourth level reservoir and the even larger fifth level reservoir. Looking at Serdak's plan now, the entire reservoir occupies almost a large area of the entire upper reaches of the valley. Once this reservoir is completed, it will become a huge artificial lake hanging above the villagers' heads. That's good. In fact, I have to say that this reservoir is already very good. As long as the reservoir is filled with water in the summer, it can definitely survive the dry season in the following spring. We don't need to make it bigger. The reservoir? Let me tell you. When we level this land, we should build a luxurious knight's manor. Now that you have become a knight officially canonized by the Green Empire, you should also pay attention to your own dignity. Old village chief Bright said to Suldak earnestly. But Suldak shook his head and said, This is not enough. By this time next year, there will be at least several hundred acres of land in the River Bend tidal flat that need irrigation. And Wall Village will not always be able to irrigate. With such poverty, this place will become richer little by little and more people will be willing to move to Wall Village. Seeing that he could not speak about Serdek, the old village chief Bright could only shut up and stood on the embankment watching the lively scene at the secondary reservoir construction site. Night, Serdek. The batch of magic materials you specially ordered from Magician Dale has arrived. A person in charge of the White Elephant Trading Company, who was responsible for the delivery came to Serdek and saluted him respectfully, and said, then he weighed behind him, and two store clerks carried an oak barrel wrapped with straw ropes. Carefully placed it in front of Soldak. Then Pride opened the cork on the oak barrel and removed the cork from the barrel. He picked up a little white powder and handed it to Soldak. The person in charge of the commercial bank tried his best to smile and continued. Magic Daylor asked me to tell you that you must use it with caution. This thing is not safe. It is very dangerous for people who are not familiar with it. Serdak nodded and replied gently. I know. Please convey my gratitude to Magician Dale for me. After saying that, he took out two silver coins from his arms and gave a silver coin to the person in charge of the trading bank. The head of the trading company's eyes lit up. He quickly took it in his hand and praised Soldak very humbly. What a generous knight you are! In the next few days, Soldak went to the foot of the mountain outside the village to set up a marching tent. Then he drove everyone away. And even he blessed himself with the divine blessing body. The most indispensable thing in Wall Village is charcoal and sulfur. After preparing the carbon powder and sulfur powder, Soldak started mixing black powder outside the marching tent. He seemed to be alone. But in fact he was not. Still carrying the magic notebook with her. Celia Cooper stayed with Soldak throughout the process. Introducing him to the uses of various glassware and basic knowledge of potions. Serdak began to pour some charcoal into the cup. Filling it with sulfur while stirring it. In the last step, 
He filled in a certain proportion of niter powder. Soldek has done this modulation process dozens of times. In fact, even if you know a little about the formula of black gunpowder, you will find that it is not as simple as you imagine when you actually start making it. After the gunpowder is debugged, it is more like a firework that can explode with strong flames. Tie the parchment paper tightly into a cylinder and seal both ends with yellow mud. But this large firecracker still has no power. Are you sure you still want to match it like this? Celia Cooper saw Soldak repeating the previous method and couldn't help but complain to him from the page. Soldak wiped his hands on his apron and said seriously to Celia Cooper, I don't know what's wrong, but I know that this should be almost successful. This thing is not considered magic. This thing is more like hex technology. If we really want to classify it academically, it should be physics and chemistry. He is still full of affection for Celia Cooper, no matter what aspect of knowledge. Whenever Soldak asked, he would always hear some advice from Celia Cooper. Celia Cooper had a strange look in her eyes, supported her chin with one hand, and muttered behind the black fence of the book page, I find that I can't understand you more and more. Soldak stopped what he was doing and said to Celia Cooper, What's wrong? I know how to make black gunpowder because I got the formula for making black gunpowder. I just don't know some of the tiny details. I just failed to use this thing to its maximum power. Celia Cooper curled her lips and said to Soldak, That's not what I'm referring to. I've seen many great potions masters. I'm not interested in potions. I'm talking about some of your practices. What are you doing? Building such a large reservoir in Wall Village and not classifying the land here as night territory is not as simple as building a house. With such a large investment, what exactly do you want to get? Soldak lowered his head again, stirring the gunpowder in his hand, and said, I am just fulfilling my promise. By the time Rita delivered food to Soldak in the evening, Soldak had already discovered a small flaw and made some improvements. Just outside the tent, Soldak put on a gorgeous fireworks show for Rita. Rita was so shocked that she couldn't speak for a while. She just kept saying regretfully, It's a pity that Natasha and little Peter are not here. Boom. There was a loud noise. And the limestone blocking the river channel was blown to pieces. A group of kobolds stood on the embankment of the artificial water channel, looking at the cracked limestone in the river with horrified expressions. The huge limestone did not explode into pieces, but instead formed huge bulges, which were covered with cracks. Dense cracks. It was also after dozens of experiments that Serdak tested the amount of black gunpowder. After the explosion, a group of cobalt slaves walked down the riverbed tremblingly. They used pickaxes to dig out the loose rocks. Two cobalts worked together to use a wooden stick to lift the rocks to the embankment on the shore. Several bricklayers were working on it. These stones were used to build a low flood control dam and the gaps in the stone walls were filled with volcanic ash mud, with gunpowder to open the way. The two biggest roadblocks on the river were finally eliminated by explosives. 800 cobalt slaves poured down the river embankment at the same time, and their footsteps sounded like a silent drum on this land. After nearly a month of captivity, these cobalt slaves were able to eat two full meals every day. Although the labor intensity at the artificial ditch construction site was a bit high, it did not affect the bodies of these cobalt slaves to recover little by little. And they became very strong. A large amount of gravel was carried up from the bottom of the river. And the cobalt slaves did not need to rest. And they cleared this section of the river in one go. They are just a little afraid of the loud noise. But they are almost familiar with it these days. Chapter 513 Old Sheila's Heart After entering June, there has not been a single drenching rain in the desolate land. In the wheat fields around where village, the seedlings are already knee-high, and the mountain valley is a lush green scene, although the rainy season has not yet arrived. Because the reservoir was built in time before winter last year and filled with water throughout the winter, this year's dry season is considered the best year for the village of Wall. The water pool in Bago Pasture has completely dried up. The rattlesnake grass and thirsty grass on both sides of the ditch have been eaten up by the yellow sheep, leaving only the rhizomes under the soil. There is not much wheat left from last fall's harvest after a long winter, and then a long dry season. This year's drought has become more serious. Many villagers from other villages have gone to Alenza City to seek livelihood. Some skilled bricklayers and stonemasons have also gone to Wall Village to build flood control dams for reservoirs and artificial drainage channels. There are many villagers who go over Paglo's Mountain into the Oak Ridge to dig wild vegetables and cassava. Some women are worried about leaving their children at home to starve. So they usually take their children into the mountains to dig wild vegetables. When passing by the entrance of Wall Village, many people would stop and look into the village. 
they wanted to take a good look at the reservoir under construction. Today, this stream in Wall Village is one of the few streams with clear water flowing in the deserted land. Villagers who pass by here will fill their dry water bladders by the stream, then lean over and drink to their full content before continuing over the mountain pass and into Oak Ridge. A group of children from Wall Village were sitting under a big tree at the entrance of the village. Old Sheila would bring little Peter here to sit here every day. When she saw the old and young hungry villagers marching towards Oak Ridge, she would think of herself. If Serdak was lost at that time, Lily would be in trouble in the future. Ta is getting married again, and I am afraid that she will take little Peter to join the army going to Oak Ridge to dig wild vegetables. Life is always full of hardship and helplessness. Old Sheila would hug little Peter tightly at this time. Little Peter, who was held in old Sheila's arms, stared wide-eyed and refused to be idle for a moment. He looked curiously at the slave camp not far away. He wanted to check out the mysterious house surrounded by reed mats with his friends and wanted to know how the cobalt slaves lived. Several times I almost got in, but was stopped in time by the adults in the village. The adults warned these naughty naughty children that those cobalts will eat any kind of meat, and their favorite food is children. The sun was shining warmly on his body. Little Peter showed the Daywood shield and wooden sword in his hand to his friends, making those children very envious. A few old people sitting at the entrance of the village were chatting under the tree, and the topic always turned to Serdak. The old man asked, When Dak comes back this time, he won't leave again. Right. A tall figure appeared in old Sheila's heart and said in a calm voice, He is now a knight in the guard camp of Alensis City. As long as the plain war mobilization order is issued from above, he may go to the battlefield at any time. Another old man said with sour envy in his tone. Yes. Little Duck is the first knight to step out of our village of Wall. Old Sheila didn't want to talk about this. And her eyes fell on the brown-haired woman walking out of the wasteland not far away. Her hair was in a mess. She had a swaddled baby on her broad shoulders. And there were two more beside her. The older one holding the smaller one. The woman walked very slowly. Her skirt was a little torn. And her skinny thighs were exposed when she walked. Her face was a little yellow with hunger. And the child on her back was holding a piece of thin wicker in her hand. And she was crying loudly while putting it in her mouth. The two younger ones, who were as thin as a stick, followed the woman. Although it was very difficult to walk. They gritted their teeth and endured it. And walked forward silently. Their clothes were a little wet. And they had obviously drank water by the stream. Hearing the child's cry, old Sheila stood up from under the tree and walked towards the family. Which village are you from? Old Sheila was standing on the side of the road. Her back was so hunched that she had to tilt her head to chat with the woman. Yuan Gang Village. The woman stopped and said to old Sheila. She shook the child behind her, trying to coax him to sleep. At least, she wouldn't feel too hungry in her dream. As long as she climbed over another ridge, she might be able to find some wild vegetables. But the child refused to sleep, no matter what, and cried more and more. Come from so far away! Old Sheila looked at the child and stretched out her hand to tease him. The woman nodded reluctantly. Where is the child's father? Old Sheila asked casually. Died on a plain battlefield. The woman turned her head and quietly hid the bitterness on her face. The child on her back suddenly stopped crying. The woman looked back in surprise and saw old Sheila taking out a piece of chestnut flour multigrain cake that was so crispy that it fell into pieces from her arms. She divided the cake into two halves and stuffed it into the cake with a gentle look on her face. There were two children next to the woman. The older girl looked shy and wanted to refuse. The younger child stretched out his dirty hands early and held half of the pancake in his palm. His eyes were shining. Staring at the a piece of grain cake gave off a strange brilliance. The youngest child on the back grabbed a piece of snow white baked wheat cake with both hands and stuffed it into his mouth. The smaller child held the half piece of multigrain pancake and ran to the woman. His eyes were obviously full of desire, but he still stood on tiptoes and handed it to the woman, whispering, Mom, you eat? There were tears in the woman's eyes, but she toughened her heart and said to the younger child, Nani, we can't take grandma's cake. If we eat grandma, we will starve. If we endure it any longer, we can climb over the ridge ahead. There are a lot of green wild vegetables behind the mountain. Old Sheila reached out and touched the child's face that was flushed by the wind and said slowly, A multigrain pancake is nothing. You can endure hunger and walk there. But the two little ones are already too hungry to have the strength. No, you have no right to refuse for him. This is for the child. After saying that, he stuffed the remaining half of the grain cake into the arms of the older child, 
then turned around and walked back to the dead tree at the entrance of the village. The woman stood at the entrance of the village and saw old Sheila sitting under a dead tree. Then she silently continued towards the mountain pass with her two children, one large and one small. The old people were sitting under the trees chattering. I don't know how long it will take for it to rain. It's almost June. It rained heavily in late June last year. Damn years. Damn plain wars. Dusk. Sunset. Birds looking for food in the wilderness are returning to their nests one after another. Some villagers slowly climbed over the mountains and walked home. There are not as many wild vegetables in Oak Ridge as you imagine. If you want to dig more wild vegetables, you have to go deeper into the mountains. The cobalt slaves dragged their tired bodies back from the river. After washing themselves, they waited honestly by the big iron pot in the slave camp. The aroma of beans from the multi-grain porridge cooked in the iron pot wafts far away. When women returning from Oak Ridge Pass by Wall Village, the eyes of some of the children following them will always look toward the slave camp involuntarily. After washing up by the river, a group of cobalt slaves sat outside the slave camp and ate cereal porridge in silence. We cook a lot of multi-grain porridge because occasionally Wall Villagers come here to mix it with the porridge. Just to save a dinner, the wheat bran in this kind of multi-grain porridge is a bit harsh on the throat, but it is definitely not unpleasant to drink. The cook who is responsible for dividing the porridge will only make sure that each cobalt slave gets a large bowl, and the remaining grain porridge will not be too strict. It is not impossible for the villagers to drink the porridge if they want. If the cook feels that the porridge is not enough, she will add some water to the pot and mix it casually to make another big pot. Of course, this situation cannot be seen by the old village chief. Otherwise he will really curse. Rita and Natasha exchanged jobs with women in the village and went from the reservoir construction site to the slave camp to cook porridge. The main reason was that the women in the village felt that the food at the reservoir construction site was better. After all, the cook can still have a working meal every day. Among the women in the village, Rita and Natasha are probably the only ones who don't care about this dinner. Old Sheila took little Peter and sat on the big rock next to the slave camp, waiting for them to finish work. Andrew and Samira led the horses back from outside the village. They patrolled the deserted land every few days. And this time, they went out for nearly a week. When Andrew saw little Peter eagerly watching the cobalt slaves drinking multi-grain porridge and licking his lips from time to time, he squatted in front of little Peter, reached out and hugged his shoulders and asked with a smile, What? Our little knight hasn't had his dinner yet? Little Peter shook his head, reached out and patted the small cloth bag he was carrying indicating that the bag contained food. Then why are you still drooling while watching the cobalt slave eat dinner? Little Peter replied crisply. Uncle Andrew, I just want to know what is cooking in the pot. They eat delicious duck. Andrew touched Little Peter's head and said seriously, That's not delicious. Are you really going to try it? Hearing what Andrew said, Little Peter became a little hesitant. Samira from behind came over, took out an apple from her pocket, and gave it to Little Peter. Andrew and little Peter made an appointment to test his homework tomorrow morning. And then, they led the horse and walked back to the village. It wasn't until the two left that the kobolds in the slave camp breathed a sigh of relief at the same time. The villagers could not feel the strong murderous aura emanating from the two men. But their noses could smell the smell of blood. Whether it was the butcher carried behind Andrew's back, or the arrow pot hanging on Samira's waist, all have this strong aura. After dinner, the kobold slaves will go into the work shed to rest. Their happy-go-lucky character is easily satisfied no matter where they go. There is still a little bit of multi-grain porridge left in the big iron pot. Rita and Natasha are going to scoop out the porridge and give the big iron pot a good scrubbing. The day's work is over. The two were chatting about what to eat for dinner. Soldat came back for dinner tonight. Natasha wanted to make the dinner more sumptuous. Little Peter sat on the side and gnawed on apples. Apples can still be eaten in this season. Yes. There is only the half-elf archer under Serdak in the village. Old Sheila came to Rita, bent down and picked up a large wooden bowl from the large wooden basin, and handed it to Rita. You want to eat this? Rita's eyes widened, looking at the big wooden bowl in Old Sheila's hand, and pointed with a spoon at the almost cold multi-grain porridge in the iron pot. When Old Sheila faced Rita, she didn't have any scruples in speaking. She glared and said to Rita, Can't I hold a bowl without eating it? I didn't say that, Rita muttered then filled a large wooden bowl of multigrain porridge for old Sheila. Natasha, who was busy at the side, quickly came over and said to old Sheila, The porridge is a bit cold. How about I warm it up? Old Sheila waved her hand and said, That's good. After saying that, 
He walked towards the entrance of the village under the moonlight. Under the dead tree outside the entrance of the village. A sallow-looking woman with a thin body was holding a child in her arms. And there were two smaller ones beside her, sitting quietly. There, old Sheila walked over with a big wooden bowl and handed it to the woman without saying a word. A large bowl of multi-grain porridge is enough to feed a woman and several children. After the woman thanked her, she distributed the porridge to the three children. After the three children were full, she poured the remaining porridge into her stomach in one go. Then he left Wall Village under the moonlight. It wasn't until the woman and the children walked away that Rita, who was hiding not far away, stood up, raised her eyebrows, and said dissatisfiedly to old Sheila, Hey, what do you want to do? Old Sheila didn't even raise her head, walked toward the slave camp with an empty wooden bowl, and said casually, Can't you see? But this is against the rules. Rita expressed her position to old Sheila. Old Sheila stopped, turned to Rita and asked, Just because I asked you for a bowl of porridge? You're going to make things difficult for us, Rita said. Old Sheila raised her head, stared into Rita's eyes, and asked her, What can be difficult? Rita said rationally, If others follow your example, how can we refuse? Why refuse? Old Sheila pushed the wooden bowl in her hand to Rita and asked. Rita said, There is only so much porridge. Whoever eats more is destined to eat less. If too many people are like this, what will the cobalt slaves who dig rivers for us eat? Old Sheila said very dissatisfied. They just ate some leftovers. Will anyone be hungry? Have you forgotten the days when you were hungry? The dispute between old Sheila and Rita continued at the dinner table. The candles on the table kept dripping wax oil onto the candlesticks. Little Peter looked at the candles on the candlesticks in a trance. He wanted to pick out the one that kept beating with a knife. Of flames. Natasha sat aside and did not dare to interrupt. Seeing that the staple food basket on the dining table was still empty, she took out a basket of white bread from the kitchen. Dinner was fried steak. The steak was very tender and only medium rare. If this kind of meat is overcooked, it will lose a lot of juice and become smaller. Therefore, the barbecue eaten by the villagers is basically only medium rare. There was a glass of golden cider in front of Serdak. And Natasha silently put a piece of white bread on his plate. Serdak cut the fried meat on the plate and distributed it to everyone's plate. Then he smiled at old Sheila and Rita and said, Don't argue. In fact, this matter can be solved very easily. I have been doing this for a few days. I'm also discussing this matter with Uncle Bright. Chapter 514 Wall Village Meeting the most difficult season in the deserted land is actually June. In Soldak's memory, June is the season when all things grow and prosper. But for people in the barren land, before the rainy season arrives, life and poverty continues. Even cassava is more expensive this year than in previous years. There are nearly 7,000 people in the 19 natural villages in the deserted land. Only half of them can fill their stomachs. The remaining half of the people who can afford to go out to make a living have also left the deserted land. The remaining elderly, children, and women are unable to leave the barren and barren land. And there is no one to help them. Their family members who are seeking a living outside cannot bring back food in time. Or there are no such family members at all. And some people will starve. At this time in previous years, some people in Wall Village would go to Oak Ridge to dig wild vegetables to satisfy their hunger. Wall Village has changed a lot this year. All the villagers who are willing to work have made some money although the wheat produced at home is not enough to eat. As long as they live a more careful life and mix it with some chestnuts, pumpkins, multi-grain beans, etc., they can survive the long there will still be some surplus food left after winter, even if some families have eaten up all their grain reserves. As long as they are not lazy and are willing to work on the reservoir construction site, they can still get something to eat. Soldak, Luke and some respected old people in the village gathered at the home of the old village chief Bright. Aunt Bright made lemon tea for everyone. The room was full of people. Luke and several young people in the village crowded in. In the corner of the living room. Everyone was busy making tea for everyone and chewing roasted pumpkin seeds. Life is not so hard. And the wheat in the fields does not grow poorly due to lack of water. The villagers all have confident smiles on their faces. And even when they chat, they become much more humorous. Serdak sat next to the old village chief. And almost everyone looked at Serdak and the old village chief. Seeing that the people had almost arrived, the old village chief knocked the pipe in his hand hard. Tuck, tuck, tuck. The oak pipe hit the edge of the wooden bench, making a series of muffled sounds, and the living room immediately became quiet. The village chief, bright, looked around the living room, and then said, 
Nearly all of you here are parents of various families in the village. It was Shout Dak's initiative to invite all of you here today. From now on, Wall Village, no matter what matters are discussed inside, this method will continue. And everyone can gather here to discuss anything. One of the young people leaning in the corner stood up and bravely asked, Uncle Brett, you mean that if you don't care whether something is fair or not? Right. We can object to the decision? Chief Bright's eyes widened, and he shouted angrily, How dare you? The young man was so frightened that he immediately retreated into the crowd, not really daring to stand out again. There was a burst of laughter in the living room. It was my idea to invite everyone here today, Saldek said, and the living room suddenly became quiet, and everyone turned their attention to him. Serdak leaned on his chair and said to everyone, I plan to build a children's home in the village to take care of children. It will provide three meals a day for free. In addition, I will teach the children some imperial language, basic combat skills, and life skills, common sense, etc. Children who cannot be taken care of in the village can be sent to the children's home, which can also free up the women who take care of the children at home and participate in the production and construction of the village. Hearing what Serdak said, the surrounding villagers began to talk about it. Serdak raised his voice and said, Whether it is the construction site of the reservoir, the artificial drainage channel, the land reclamation on the tidal flat, or the carpentry workshop, the village's fleet, or the starch workshop, we need more manpower. And as long as they are willing to come out to work, they can I can earn a living. An old man sitting next to Bright Village Chief opened his eyes, looked at Suldek and asked, Little Duck, are you telling the truth? Whoever's child can be sent to this children's home? Not only will he help take care of it, but he will also give him a stutter every day. Suldek glanced at Uncle Bright. When he first mentioned this matter to him, Uncle Bright was opposed to it. Although he frowned this time, he did not object. Suldek nodded and said, That's exactly it. A middle-aged man stood up. He was one of the only hunters in the village who was good at hunting gray rock iguanas. What he was best at was finding the hiding places of gray rock iguanas. At this time, he seemed a little excited and asked Soldek, Can you also teach them imperial language and combat skills? Serdek nodded and said, Selena can teach you imperial language. I will arrange for members of the security team to take turns teaching you combat skills. The villagers seemed a little excited and asked one after another, How old do you have to be before a child can be sent to the children's home in the village? Soldak thought for a moment and said, Children under eight years old can come here to stutter. As soon as Soldak finished speaking, the living room exploded. Everyone did not expect such a good thing. And they all discussed whose children were qualified to enter the children's home. The old village chief Bright frowned, turned to Soldak and said, A seven or eight year old boy can't eat as much as an adult at one meal. Duck, this is too much of a burden on our village. Should we lower the age limit? Many seven and eight year old children in the village can help adults pull weeds in the wheat fields, which is at least half a labor force at home. Soldak was also worried that if the children's home was made too big at once, there might be some flaws. So he said, Then it will only be for those under six years old. Seeing that everyone was talking lively, Luke, who was huddled among the young people, suddenly stood up and said to Soldak, Dak, I haven't had time to say anything since I came back this time. The living room became quiet again. Everyone in the village knew that Luke and Charlie were the directors of the sulfur mine. He and Charlie had the most weight among the young people in the village. Luke hesitated for a moment and said, The open pit sulfur mine in the Pudong Mountain Rock area has almost been mined. Charlie went there this time and planned to explore the area outside the rock area. He saw that there were there is no such thing as an open pit sulfur mine. And once the open pit sulfur mines are mined out, we simply cannot sustain the current huge expenditure. The villagers in the living room couldn't help but look at each other. They didn't expect that the duck that was about to reach its mouth would fly away soon. After all, the current situation in Wall Village is like this. In addition to Serdak paying for it out of his own pocket, this open pit sulfur mine is also another economic pillar. Now that the sulfur in the mine is about to be exhausted, the family really can't accept it. Serdak waved his hand to Luke, indicating that he didn't need to worry and then said, In a few days, I will go to Pussy Mountain to conduct field exploration in person. How can such a big volcano only have a land of sulfur? The good news is that when I went there last month to erect boundary markers, I found that there were still several stone remains left by the lava river. Although the sulfur mines there are not as concentrated as the rocky area, the entire lava river is full of sulfur deposits. Rivers are everywhere. Hearing what Soldek said, the tense atmosphere in the living room 
suddenly relaxed again, seeing that everyone accepted the proposal. Serdak continued, This is what I think. Now is the time when there is no work, and people in other villages are not having a good time either. I can't control adults, but as a paw sheriff of the Badlands of Grow Pass. Speaking of this, Serdak's voice became louder. I don't want any children in my jurisdiction to starve to death because they don't have enough food to eat. If there is no milk and oatmeal porridge, it's okay to have a sip of multigrain porridge. Having said this, Soldak tapped the guard battalion knight medal on his chest with his hand, and several villagers, who wanted to object immediately swallowed their words. Aunt Brett and Charlie's wife ran over again and refilled the water for everyone. Soldak paused for a moment and then said, So I think that this children's home in our village can recruit children from the 19 natural villages in the entire deserted land, especially those who are young and cannot eat. The villagers in the living room immediately started shouting, How many children will we have to take in? Our village won't be destroyed. That's right. Little Dak, you can't do this. Wouldn't it be a drag on all of us? I just had a few full meals and forgot about everything. How many people are starving in the deserted land? Can we all handle it? The old village chief Bright wiped his face vigorously. When he heard everyone saying this, he didn't even think about cursing. What a bunch of short-sighted fools. The old village chief sighed and thought in his heart. Soldak did not expect so many people to object. The reason for everyone's opposition is not wrong. They are worried that starving children in other villages will usurp everyone's vested interests. Serdak had already decided on this matter. He was silent for a moment and then said, This money does not come from the village. The sulfur mines in the rocky area are jointly developed by me and the village. But if I find the sulfur mines in my night territory later, it will be my industry. I will take a portion of the income from these industries. Money to pay for this expense. Just as the old village chief expected. When Soldak said this, the doubts and objections in the living room disappeared again. But they didn't know that some of the mine dividends that belonged to them had also disappeared. Perhaps it was those few words that made Sernak determined to separate the subsequent development of the sulfur mine from the village. After all, even the miners who mine the sulfur mine were a group of cobalt slaves. Since Soldak paid for it out of his own pocket and it was beneficial to everyone, the villagers naturally no longer objected. But some villagers secretly thought angrily, why can children from other villages also enjoy this kind of benefit? Someone questioned, what to do with those children who live far away from home? Should we still let them live in the village? Serdak said casually, there are many projects in the village this year. We need manpower everywhere. And we have to take care of our own wheat fields. The artificial ditch on the tidal flat has almost been dug. But the field surrounding the middle has not been cultivated. Those who are willing to send their children to for the needy households here. We can arrange something for them to do in the village. Which can at least give them something to eat. I think we can also build some reed mat work sheds. Although these work sheds cannot stop the heavy rain. They can at least accommodate people. The rainy season is here and it's time for them to return to the village. The old village chief sat aside and interjected. The wasteland on the tidal flat is not unplanted. The water in the reservoir above has bottomed out. In order to ensure the irrigation needs of the wheat fields in the village, the water sources available on the tidal flat are very limited. It is so dry now. The pits can raise a cloud of dust. And there is no moisture in the ground. Making it impossible to grow other crops. Serdak said casually, You can choose some drought-resistant crops. And the tidal flats are originally low-lying lands. So the drought should not be that serious. I will solve this matter. The old village chief said again, Duck, there are places that need to spend money now. Should we postpone building a third-level reservoir for a while? Serdak shook his head and said firmly, The project cannot be stopped. And don't think about whether the money bag can hold it. This time the plane war in the Maka plane was victorious and we advanced support troops have gained a lot. The advantage is that if the third level reservoir is not built at this time, once the rainy season comes, it will probably take at least September to restart the expansion project of the reservoir. It is best to build the fourth level reservoir this year, so that if there is a fourth level reservoir before winter, it will at least ensure that the tidal flat will be irrigated during the dry season next year. The old village chief nodded and said, The village's cassava starch has already opened up a market in the market of Halensicking although the price is not as good as that of wheat flour. It can still bring us a good profit. Hearing that there was such an income in the village, the originally resentful villager suddenly became happy again. Serdak told the old village chief Bright, the artificial water channel has been opened to the entrance of the underground river. But before the rainy season comes, I plan to continue to widen and deepen the river channel. 
the deeper and wider the river channel will be. And when the rainy season comes, it will be able to withstand even if there is more rain. Those cobalt slaves can't be idle anyway. We have to find some work for them. The villagers quite agree with this. Yes, we must not let those cobalt slaves idle. Serdak continued. And I want to dig a large lake at the entrance of the underground river to enhance the water storage capacity. Otherwise, once the rainfall exceeds the discharge capacity of the underground river, water logging is likely to occur. This time I bought a batch of tomato, onion, and cabbage seeds from Baixiang Trading Company. We can plant these seeds in advance before the heavy rain comes. It is estimated that it will not take much water to cultivate these seedlings. Once the rainy season arrives, we will just transplant these seedlings directly into the fields, which can shorten the growth cycle of crops. The villagers looked confused. They couldn't understand anything about seedlings or production cycles. After actually discussing so many things, the old village chief bright rubbed his wrinkled forehead. I'm getting older and have a bad memory. I can't even remember some of the previous things. I keep thinking in my heart, little duck, how come you have so many ideas at once? Chapter 515 Lava Land During this time, Serdak has been staying in Wall Village. The young magician Lance came to Wall Village with two colleagues and visited Serdak. It is said that the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Team has recently been looking for magic members of the Dark Moon Gate organization. Carl was also very busy during this time. The Green Empire rebels infiltration into Bena province made the High Council very angry. This group of rebels organized a home invasion and assassination operation in Bena City. It was said that they stole a very precious treasure from a noble's home. And the rebels broke up and escaped from the city of Bena. Although some rebels have been captured back to Bena City, and some rebels died during the capture. The noble lord's most precious treasure has never been recovered. The High Council of Bina Province believes that the exposed rebels are just the tip of the iceberg. This matter involves the interests and safety of the nobles, and should be taken more seriously. Therefore, the guard battalions and city defense battalions throughout Bina Province are extremely busy. Carr spent the spring traveling around the countryside with his support squadron of knights. In contrast, the daily life of the security team in the deserted land outside Paglo's Pass is much easier. Andrew likes to ride horses around in the wasteland. There are flat Gobi deserts and wasteland everywhere. There is little green on the ridge. And only barren wheat fields are exposed around some small mountain villages in the ravines. As the old village chief Bright said, there is not much water left in the first level reservoir upstream of the village. Although spring water is continuously injected into the reservoir every day, it is still unable to make ends meet. Currently, there is the stored water can only be used to irrigate wheat fields on the edge of rivers and streams. The main embankment of the secondary reservoir has been completed. And the three gates of the secondary reservoir are currently being constructed. As for the bottom of the third level reservoir, most of it has been paved. In the future, volcanic ash and lime powder will need to be continuously transported in to further prevent water seepage on the ground at the bottom of the reservoir. After the river bay tidal flatland was cleared, no crops have been planted yet. It may be necessary to wait until the rainy season before planting some crops such as onions, tomatoes, and cabbage. Serdak had prepared the seeds. Tapioca starch has appeared on the free market in Helensa City. The current sales of this starch are pretty good, and it is still very cost-effective to exchange it for whole wheat flour. The formula of gunpowder has always been in Soldak's hands. He only said that the second-level earth-type magic scroll earth fissure that Serdak bought from the magic shop in Helensa City shattered the limestone in the river. Celia Cooper came up with this idea for Soldak. According to Celia Cooper, the magical effect of earth cracking is very similar to the effect caused by this explosive. Under the auspices of the old village chief Bright, the children's home has been built in an open space 50 meters away from the cobalt slave shed at the entrance of the village. The children's home is adjacent to the creek flowing out of the village. The main body of the house is made of oak frames. A layer of exquisite reed mats was spread outside. What concerned the villagers most was the stove built outside the welfare home. Because the children's home provides three meals to the children for free. And this is the most attractive feature. In addition to Wall Village, Selena is currently responsible for the daily work of the children's home. There was chestnut porridge in the morning, oatmeal porridge for lunch, and occasionally a fried stew. In the evening, there was broth and wheat cakes. The amount was not much, but at least it was enough for the children. In addition to the children in the village, the children's home also takes in children from other villages passing through the village. When women who go to Oak Ridge to dig wild vegetables pass by Wall Village, those carrying children will be invited by Old Sheila. 
advised them to keep their children in children's homes. At the beginning, some people were still skeptical about this matter. Only the villagers of Wall Village happily sent their children to a children's home. There are only 23 children in Wall Village who meet this age limit. A week later, those poor people who went to the oak forest and the mountain pass to dig wild vegetables truly understood what the children's home was about. The number of children in the children's home instantly increased by more than a hundred. And the number of women helping Selena take care of these children also increased to six people. This move by Wall Village immediately made Wall Village the most famous village in the deserted land. Soldek sat at his desk, wrote a reply to Hathaway, put the letter into an envelope in a brown paper bag, and glued the envelope with melted gum. I just wait for the coachman from the carriage house in Halinsa City to come to Wall Village to deliver cassava and entrust them to take them to Halinsa City. The carriage house has a mailing service for letters, but the postage is much higher than Serdek thought. It was much more expensive. A letter sent to Bena City actually cost one silver coin and 53 copper plates. Dak, we have to go. Luke's shout echoed outside the courtyard. Soldak stuck his head out of the window, waved to Luke outside the wall, and promised. Come right away. He handed the written letter to Natasha and asked her to give it to the coachman at the carriage shop. Then with Natasha's help, he put on the magic pattern structure of the earth shield and rode Gubwa. The horse walked out of the yard. Luke was already waiting at the door with his team of people on ancient bolai horses. When they saw Soldak coming out on horseback, several young people behind Luke straightened their waists unconsciously. I don't know why. At that time, he already had some prestige in Wall Village. The team walked along the village road towards the village entrance, and the villagers they met along the way moved to both sides of the road. When passing by the temporary residence of the security team, Serdak called out to the ogre Gulitem and the indigenous warrior Andrew outside the yard. Both of them were waiting at the door honestly. When they saw Serdak appearing, they hurriedly joined in. To the team, ogres rarely have the opportunity to leave Wall Village. So this time, they followed Soldak into the Pussy Mountain area of the deserted land and they seemed particularly excited. The night before his departure, he asked a woman in the village to sew a face towel for him, covering almost all of his big face below his eyes. He couldn't wait to put it on his face before leaving Wall Village. The ogre treats every trip as a picnic, thinking about how to catch the gray rock iguanas hiding deep in the rock crevices. Andrew happened to be returning from patrolling outside this time, and caught up with Soldak, who was about to enter the night territory of Pudu Mountain. He planned to follow Soldak into the area of Pudu Mountain. He rarely came to this area, mainly because of Pudu. The area within a few dozen kilometers of the mountain was shrouded in thick volcanic ash. The volcanic ash fell from the sky, almost turning this area into a dead land. Not only the villagers in the deserted land will not enter this area, but also the bandit groups that are rampant in the desert will not enter here without permission. After all, Pussy Mountain is the night territory of Serdek. Andrew wanted to get familiar with the surrounding environment at least familiar with the locations of the various boundary monuments. So he followed Serdak into Pussy Mountain. Samira was not in Wall Village. A highly aggressive black panther appeared in Oak Ridge. Within three days, it bit several villagers who were digging wild vegetables in Oak Ridge. Most of them were women and half-year-old children. Samira after Mila heard the news. She entered Oak Ridge almost overnight, probably preparing to hunt the leopard. The succubus Aphrodite has no interest in the lava land. She can be found everywhere in the Flaming H. L in places more dangerous than the Pussy Mountains. She finally left the H. L. Now the last thing she wants to smell is the smell of sulfur. How can she go to the Pussy Mountains? Suffer. Serdak and his party met at the entrance of the village with a carriage convoy heading to the mines in the rocky area to transport sulfur ore and walked into the deserted land. It is already the end of June and the monsoon blowing from the southeast these past few days already has a moist smell. When passing by Bago Grassland, Soldak actually saw a group of villagers from Wall Village building a reservoir at the bottom of a dry pool in Bago Grassland. The four-wheeled carriage that drove out from the depths of the desolate land was filled with volcanic ash. When it passed by Serdak's convoy, everyone greeted them familiarly, entering the land covered with volcanic ash. The world here is almost a dead land, with all plants and animals cut off from life. Under Soldak's strict request, even the horses wore masks. The four-wheeled carriage was loaded with daily necessities. The road had already been carved into two clear ruts. It was almost unnecessary to identify the direction. As long as you kept walking along this road, you would reach the sulfur mine at the foot of Pudu Mountain. When Serdak arrived at the sulfur mine, the 200 cobalt slaves were still alive and kicking. 
judging from their condition. They are far more alive than the kobolds in the slave camp in Wall Village. Obviously, they are more adaptable to the harsh environment here than humans. Serdak discovered that the noses of the kobolds have a special structure that can block the noise here. A volcanic ash. Apart from the lack of food and water, there is nothing bad about this group of kobold slaves. The level of mining in the sulfur mine in the rocky area is far more thorough than Soldek thought. All the protruding rocks in the rocky area have been turned over by these kobold slaves. They even dug out this underground river of cooled lava. The hot lava gurgled out from a slope. And it was at the lowest point in the rocky area. In places, they piled up into large black magma rocks. Soldek rushed to the sulfur mine with supplies. And Charlie was already waiting at the mine. Half a month ago, Charlie took two young people from the village on horseback to wander around Pudu Mountain, trying to find a new open pit sulfur mine. No sign of a sulfur mine was found at the foot of the mountain within a dozen kilometers. Charlie told Soldak that they climbed along a river of cooled lava to the mountainside of Pudu, and saw some sulfur deposits beside a river of lava flowing with hot magma. These sulfur deposits were attached to some on the raised rock wall. It is like stalagmites growing against the rock wall. The sulfur or reserves there are almost ten times that of the sulfur mines in the rocky area. This is the reserve estimated conservatively during the first exploration. Then move the sulfur mine over there. Four-wheel trucks can transport the materials here. Except for the sulfur mine. All other materials should be transported over there. Soldek said. After hearing what Soldek said, Luke immediately arranged for people to collect all the reed mats and dustproof gauze from the mine shed and load them into the four-wheeled carriage. The faces of Charlie and the other two young men were so roasted that a layer of skin exploded. And the new skin exposed inside became obviously much redder. In just one month, Charlie became black and thin. Soldak asked Charlie, Is this time very hard? Not only do you have to manage 200 cobalt slaves, but you also have to ride a horse around, running around looking for sulfur deposits. Charlie smiled, showing a row of neat white teeth, and replied to Soldak, Actually, it's not bad. Just walking all the way up the river of lava, which is even more scorching than the vicious scorching Sunday. Then he looked at the pile of sulfur mines on the side and added, As long as there is a harvest, any effort is worth it. How's the situation in the village? Counting the days. It's almost time to rain. Charlie asked Luke, who was walking over. We haven't set off yet. This time, duck. Luke told Charlie about Serdak's establishment of a children's home in Wall Village. In this regard, Charlie turned out to be more farsighted than the old village chief. Two hundred cobalt slaves lined up in a neat line and headed towards the new mining area. Three four-wheeled carriages were loaded with supplies and followed the team. All the mined sulfur or was left here. Just waiting for the four-wheeled carriages to return and then return here to load the carriages. Charlie rode his horse and followed Soldak. And after a long time he said, It's okay for us to have a hard time. Life has always been like this and we haven't survived it the same way. But our children must not live such a hard life in the future. I have been thinking about how to let them enter the John John College before they turn 16. Now this goal seems to have been achieved suddenly, and we can actually do better. And things are really good right now. Hearing what Charlie said, expectations for the future also appeared on the faces of Luke and other young people. The mining conditions in the new mining area are even worse than those in the sulfur mine in the rocky area. The entire new mining area is located halfway up the Pudu Mountain. There is a meandering lava river flowing down from the top of the mountain. And the magma rocks have accumulated to form a high path. In the river, the sulfur is on the stone walls on both sides of the lava river. If you want to mine these sulfur mines, you have to get close to the hot lava river. It seems very dangerous. Fortunately, there are cobalt slaves. According to Luke's plan, the mining camp was originally planned to be built halfway up the mountain. But this matter was vetoed by Serdek. Soldek set up the mining camp at the foot of the mountain. Every time he entered the open pit mine, he had to walk on the mountain road for at least an hour. In addition, Soldek also asked Luke to ride a horse every time he went out. He was worried that this would a restless river of lava will erupt and swallow up a large area of surrounding mountains. The bed of this river of lava is too high. Two or three meters higher than other places. If the magma in a river overflows, it was spreading along the high slope in all directions. To everyone's surprise, the cobalt slaves could actually walk quickly on the hot rocks. They didn't seem to be afraid of the heat. Just when Soldek, Charlie and Luke were standing on the edge of the cliff of the lava river halfway up the mountain, exploring for sulfur or reserves. A salamander just showed its head in the lava river below. 
and its red body was actually soaked in in the lava. And actually swimming in the lava. This rare sight made the three of them a little stunned. The ogre Gulitum also noticed something unusual here in the distance. He rushed over and found that Serdak was not in any danger. Instead, a salamander was swinging in the lava river under his feet. Big tail. Swimming in the river. Spewing hot lava from its mouth from time to time. Gulitum's eyes lit up immediately. Chapter 516 Night in the Rain The southeast monsoon from the endless sea is finally bringing some moist air. Since the morning, it has started to rain lightly in Alinsa City. The continuous drizzle makes the mountain city look brand new. The street trees on the street are washed by the rain and reveal a new green. The lavender lilac trees are blooming on the streets. There is a faint smell of lilac flowers in the drizzle. A magician in magic robes walked quickly through the corridor and boarded the magic caravan in front of the steps beside the fountain. The magic caravan slowly drove out of the manor, drove out of Maple Leaf Avenue in the wealthy area, and merged directly into the traffic on Central Street in Alinsa City. When passing through the city gate, the magic caravan was stopped by the city gate guard. The driver jumped down from the charioteer seat and chatted with the city gate guard. The black carriage door was pushed open from the inside. A mage wearing a black magic long-distance running body leaned out of the carriage and glanced at the city gate guard. The city gate guard immediately stood up straight and faced the magician. Okay, salute. Then the magic caravan quickly passed through the city gate, followed the winding mountain road to the northwest, and drove into Oak Ridge. A knight wearing gray hard leather armor stood on the mountain. There was a black horse standing next to him. The hard leather armor had a piece of armor inlaid in some important places. He touched the sword on his waist with his hand. Looking anxiously towards the direction of Alinsa City through the oak forest with sparse branches and leaves. A small group of knights was waiting in the woods. These knights set up tents in the forest clearing covered with thick leaves. The horses beside them were covered with a layer of waterproof felt. Several knights lay in the tents to rest. A magic caravan appeared on the mountain road opposite. In the drizzle, the knight on the top of the mountain saw the wolf head flag on the magic caravan. He quickly called to the knights, who were resting in the tent behind him, and took the time to pack up the tent. Not long after, a team of five knights rushed down the hillside and caught up with the magic caravan among the mountains. Braving the drizzle, the five knights followed the magic caravan and continued to move forward along the mountain road. Later, some knights walked out of the woods at Oak Ridge from time to time. They followed the magic caravan obediently. And soon they formed a cavalry squadron of 50 people. This group of knights did not wear any family emblems or knights' emblems on their chests. The armor on their bodies looked patchwork. Many broken places were patched up with some hard armor pieces. The hard leather armor was surrounded by a gray linen cloak. Looks more like a group of travelers. The magician opened the window and asked a knight commander who was approaching the carriage. How many people will your leader send this time? The knight commander immediately replied. A total of three cavalry squadrons have been dispatched. And currently only one cavalry squadron has arrived in Helensa City as scheduled. The magician nodded and said to the knight commander. No matter whether we can find clues this time, we must fight quickly. Then you will pass through the deserted land and enter Paglo's Mountain to stand by. Yes. Lord Gordon. The knight commander agreed. Magician Gelding glanced at the knight commander and asked, Have you ever found out who stole that thing? The knight captain replied, We haven't determined who it is yet, but the two of them are still very suspicious. Since they were not found on them, it is very likely that they were lost or the knights of the security team obtained them. Magician Gurdon waved his hand impatiently and said to the knight commander, I'll ask the villagers along the way later how far away Wall Village is. This is the first rain since June in the barren land. Despite the rain, there are still many poor villagers who go to Oak Ridge to dig wild vegetables. They not only dig wild vegetables, but also catch small beasts in the forest, pick dried red fruits on the trees, some fresh sweet grass roots in the soil, etc. A big, skinny hand struggled to reach a horizontal branch from under the tree. The other hand tremblingly picked off the dried fruit from the top of the tree and stuffed it into his mouth eagerly. The red fruit was dry and hard and difficult to chew. It must be held in the mouth and eaten slowly. The man stood on the branch and climbed higher to the top of the tree. He wanted to pick a few dried red fruits hanging on the treetop. The drizzle made the tree branches slippery, and the rain wet his linen clothes, making him feel a little cold. A heavy night spear stretched out from under the tree branch and was placed on the villager's shoulder. The cold blade scared him so much that he almost fell off the tree. The villager tried to move his body to the left from where the knight's spear was pointing. Suddenly, the knight under the tree unceremoniously stabbed him down from the tree with a spear. 
the villager fell from a tree more than two meters high and fell firmly to the ground. The knight in hard leather armor had a straight face and clamped the war horse between his legs. The horse took two steps forward, the knight hanging the spear next to the saddle. He leaned over and reached out to pick up the villager from the ground, put him on the horse, and rode the horse towards the mountain road. The knight brought the villagers to the front of the magic caravan and fell to the ground in front of the magic caravan with a thud. The villagers sat on the muddy ground, which was very muddy from the rain. They hugged their injured shoulders and looked at the magic caravan in panic. The door of the magic caravan was pushed open, and the magician named Gurdon poked his head out, looked at the villager with disgust, and asked, How far is it from Wall Village? The villager trembled and replied, It's not too far. Over the Paglos Pass is the village of Wall. Magician Gordon frowned slightly and looked up at the mountain pass not far away. I heard that there is a security team with a guard camp in the village? Do you know? Magician Gurdon's cold eyes, like a falcon, fell on the villagers. The villager felt that his whole body was penetrated by some kind of force. He must have sat unmoved in the muddy water and replied, Lord Magician, are you asking Lord Knight Serdak? Magician Gordon nodded and said, It turns out his name is Soldak. Yes, I'm just looking for him. He glanced at the mountain pass in the distance and said to the knight commander beside him, Let's go! The knight captain quickly waved the sword in his hand to the knights behind him. The knight who captured the villagers asked, Lord Gordon, what should he do? In the drizzle, the magic caravan rolled forward slowly, and a cold and ruthless voice floated from the carriage. Now that you have seen my face, kill me! In the drizzle, the muddy mountain road was covered with blood and the body of a skinny villager slowly stiffened in the cold rain. On the mountains, Samira gave the fresh meat cut from the Black Panther to the villagers, who were watching curiously. This group of villagers in the deserted land were digging wild vegetables in the mountains, and happened to see her hunting a Black Panther. While Samira was peeling the skin, several brave villagers gathered around and looked at Samira with great envy. Pull? Many villagers in other villages know this taciturn Samira. But few have seen her face and no one knows that she is a half-elf. Samira hid her face deeply under her hood, and all the rainwater that fell on her body hid her and rolled down along the cloak. As a half-elf, she didn't like the flesh and blood of beasts. So after collecting the Black Panther's skin and fangs, she cut the Black Panther's body open, divided it into several pieces, and distributed them to the villagers nearby. The villagers did not expect to get a piece of fresh leopard meat, and they were overjoyed and thanked them one after another. Samira remained silent as always. After putting away the leopard skin, she prepared to return to Wall Village. She had been in the mountains for five days in order to hunt this black panther. Just as she was about to walk down the mountain, she saw a villager in tattered clothes running in the woods. The villager ran up to Samira in one breath. Without waiting for his breath to catch his breath, he shouted to Samira, Lord Samira, there is a group of knights over there who killed people. They are not the knights of the Halanza guard camp. Samira's body tensed up instantly, and like a cheetah, she quickly ran through the oak forest in the direction pointed by the villagers. When she stood on the mountain ridge next to the mountain road, she happened to see the group of knights crossing the Moon Paglos Pass. Sure enough, as the villager said, those knights did not have standard armor on them. They were wearing linen cloaks. It can be seen from the posture of the horse that each of them is a warrior who has experienced hundreds of battles. In the drizzle, Samira vaguely saw a magic caravan. On the mountain road at the foot of the mountain, a villager was lying in a pool of blood. A bad premonition welled up in Samira's heart, and she ran quickly along the mountains towards Wall Village. When crossing the Paglos Pass, the rebel knight commander looked at the wooden cross at the top of the mountain in the drizzle and thought for a moment. The village of Wall in the mountain valley is extremely eye-catching even in the rain. The rich green in the valley is the strongest color in this desolate land. Fifty knights lined up from the mountain pass. Like a big net, Surrounding the village of Wall, Magician Gurdon opened the car window and looked at the village of Wall in the rain from a distance. At first glance, the reservoir in the upper reaches of the valley looked like a mountain city standing in the rain, which made the magician's eyes show a hint of surprise. He did not expect that this barren land could actually have such a rich village. Fifty knights on horseback approached the village of Wall as if facing a powerful enemy. The barren land received the first rain in June, and many villagers, who had gone into the mountains to dig wild vegetables rushed back. They did not want to miss the opportunity to sow seeds after the rain. The rainy season has finally arrived. It won't be long before many places in the deserted land will turn green. Although it won't be able to fill the stomachs of the villagers for the time being. 
This rain will make the villagers no longer need to dig wild vegetables over the mountains and ridges. Buckthorn grass and thirsty grass will appear quickly. These villagers never expected that the group of knights coming up from behind would actually harvest human lives like the nightmare knights in the underworld. They caught up from behind with knight's spear in their hands. The knight's spear in their hands was suddenly raised. An unsuspecting villager was stabbed in the back by the knight's spear. And the whole person was picked up by the knight behind him. Ah! Amidst the screams, his body fell heavily to the gravel-covered ground. It was this scream that made other villagers in the rain look here. Before they could see the situation in the rain clearly, they felt a sharp pain in their bodies. Their bodies flew up uncontrollably. And they couldn't breathe. They violently when he coughed. Blood spurted out from his throat. And then he fell heavily in the rain. Fifty knights continued to cover up the village of Wall. Selina looked up at the leaking reed sheds. And her heart was full of resentment towards Soldak. This guy had never considered rain at all. Drops of rainwater kept dripping through the reed mats of the shed overhead. The children in the shed gathered together and hid in a dry place under the care of several women in the village. But as the drizzle continued to fall, the children in the shed where there are fewer and fewer dry places. The simple wooden door of the children's home was suddenly pushed open from the outside. And the old village chief Bright walked in with a group of villagers. He looked up at the simple shed that was constantly dripping with rainwater and said to Selina, This simple shed is not protected from the rain. We have to organize people to move the children to the carpenter's workshop in the village. He turned to a villager behind him and ordered, Go and notify old L in the carpenter's workshop and ask him to move all the woodwork and lumber in the workshop outside and free up the house for me. Got it. Uncle Bright. The young villager agreed and immediately turned around and got into the rain. The villagers in Wall Village have already gone to the children's home and are taking their children home one after another. The old village chief Bright picked up a child from another village in each hand, hid them under his cloak, and said to the villagers brought behind him, Everyone, follow me. Let's send these children to the carpenter's workshop first. Take shelter from the rain. The villager behind reminded, But Uncle Bright, what should we do with the volcanic ash stored next to the canal and river embankment? The old village chief frowned, gritted his teeth and said, It doesn't matter if you're a little late. Just do as I say. Yes. Mayor Bright had great authority in Wall Village. And the villagers did not question him at all. They picked up the children in the children's courtyard and walked quickly towards the village's carpentry workshop. Selina stayed at the back, carefully counting the number of children for fear of forgetting any. Hidden in her skirt, Signa looked in the direction of Yamaguchi, with a hint of worry in her eyes. Not long after the old village chief Bright led a group of villagers out of the children's home. A group of knights slowly emerged from the rain at the entrance of the village. At this time, the cobalt slaves in the slave camp felt the murderous intention in the rain first. They stood up from the work shed in panic and looked out through the work shed uneasily. The two village supervisors who were guarding the entrance of the slave camp saw the cobalt slaves acting strangely. They quickly threatened the cobalt slaves with leather whips and warned them to be more honest. Before the two village supervisors could finish their words, they both of them also heard a series of rapid rumbles of horse hooves. The village overseer followed the panic gaze of the cobalt slave and saw a group of knights galloping in the rain their horse hooves crushing countless water splashes on the ground. The two village supervisors couldn't understand why they were still holding heavy knight spears in their hands. Chapter 517 Arrows in the Rain The village overseer at the gate of the slave camp scolded the cobalt slaves, put on a raincoat made of reeds, and walked into the rain to wave to the knights. It's raining so hard. Come here and take shelter. When the knight in the rain heard the shouts of the village overseer, he immediately clamped his stirrups hard and the blue-gray war horse under his crotch immediately jumped up like an arrow. The overseer's rain-stained face showed a flattering smile, and he transformed into a licking dog. Before he could say the next sentence, a cold night spear pierced his face, and the rain-stained blade had a trace of bright light, until the cold night spear tore into the chest. The village overseer didn't even realize how the knights of the Green Empire pointed their weapons at unarmed civilians. The body went stiff for a moment, and the village supervisor was kicked away by the knight, and fell into the muddy water. The knight drew his big spear and rushed towards the slave camp. The iron hooves of the war horse broke through the reed mat of the slave camp. A nest of cobalt slaves fled in panic. The height of these cobalt slaves was generally between 1.2 and 1.4 meters. Because of its short stature, it can pass under the horse's belly flexibly. Several knights broke through the slave camp at the same time. The work shed was torn apart, and the 800 cobalt slaves were howling like ghosts like a group of loaches mixed into the ditch, running around in the rain. 
Only a few bodies of cobalt slaves were left in the collapsed work shed. The knights who came after them did not hurt a few cobalt slaves at all. They looked at the cobalt slaves running away and quickly chased them around. The two knights used large iron spears to open up the reed mats in the children's courtyard room and found that there was no one inside. The knight captain at the front of the team wiped the rain off his face and stopped the knights chasing the cobalt slaves. Pointing in the direction of Wall Village, he said to a group of knights, Don't worry about those cobalts. Let's take control of this village first. Everyone, follow me and attack. Attack! A group of knights followed the knight captain and raised the big iron spears in their hands and hit it with the knight's light shield, making a bang 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 impact sound. Fifty knights broke through the rain and crossed the dead trees at the entrance of the village. A knight raised his spear and pierced the wooden board hanging on the tree with Wall Village written on it. The already rotten wooden board instantly broke into several pieces and scattered in the muddy water. The old village chief led the villagers and had just moved a group of children to the carpenter's workshop when they heard the howling of the cobalt slaves at the entrance of the village. Village Chief Bright's first reaction was that the cobalt slaves in the work shed had blown up the camp, and the two villagers guarding the slave camp were probably in serious danger. The old village chief grabbed a hoe from the farm tool stand in the carpenter's workshop and shouted to the villagers in the yard. I'm afraid those cobalt slaves are going to escape. Everyone, follow me. Selena and six women are counting the children. When the villagers heard the old village chief's call, they immediately came out of their shelters and gathered around the old village chief. Everyone picked up the guy one after another and walked towards the entrance of the village. The village chief of Bright patted a young man on the shoulder and said loudly to him, Jill, go and call the people at the construction site and bring them with you. Don't let those cobalt slaves enter the village. Yes, Uncle Bright. The young man turned around and ran away, fearing that he would be unable to catch the cobalt slave in time. The village road was extremely slippery in the rain. The old village chief rushed to the entrance of the village first. Halfway there, he saw a group of knights coming towards him. The knights galloped through the rain. The old village chief stood in front of everyone and shouted into the rain. Where are you from? Before Mayor Bright could finish his words, the knight at the front had already rushed in front of the old village leader. The horse's front hooves were raised high, and the spear in his hand pierced the old village leader's chest from top to bottom. Come! Village Chief Bright was on guard in his heart, but his body was unable to react in time. He only had time to turn slightly sideways before the spear pierced his collarbone. He was like a harpoon stabbed by a spear, his body trembling slightly in severe pain, and blood gushed out from the wound. He only held the spear with one hand, and the hoe in the other hand fell to the mud. The villagers behind him roared when they saw the old village chief being stabbed by a knight's spear, then struck the knight's thigh with a lumber axe in his hand. Although he was wearing hard leather armor, the knight on horseback still did not dare to resist the axe thrown by the villager in anger, and quickly waved his shield to block the axe. The villagers who rushed up from behind took the opportunity to snatch away the old village chief and the thick knight's spear. A knight from behind rushed up on horseback, and chopped off the head of the villager holding the axe with a sword. The head fell on the slope and rolled far away, falling into a mud pit. At this time, the corpse of the villager holding the axe fell softly, with a plop sound, and countless mud flowers splashed out. Seeing more knights rushing up, the villagers holding farm tools quickly supported the old village chief and retreated. The moment they rushed up, three more villagers were stabbed by the knight's spears. Several strong villagers tried to kill the three with hoes. A knight fell off his horse. The knight swung his sword and cut off the wooden poles of several farm tools. The long sword in his hand cut the throat of a villager with his backhand. The killing was started by the first few knights. And screams could be heard from the entrance of the village. To far away. In the rain, the half-elf archer Samira hid her body in the low-lying wheat field by the stream. She saw the village chief Bright being stabbed by a knight's spear not far away. Unexpectedly, it turned out to be the worst situation. This group of knights actually came to Wall Village. Samira knew that Serdak had gone to Pussy Mountain deep in the deserted land in the past few days, and had also taken away the Ogre Ghoul item. The indigenous warrior Andrew did not know if he was there either. At present, the only person in Wall Village who can fight seems to be himself. There was a wry smile on the half-elf archer's face, thinking that he was able to survive by chance in Wazimra City because of Serdak's best efforts to save him. It was also because of Serda that he could draw the alloy bow with his arm. The money he left at Wazimala Welfare Home was enough to maintain the normal expenses of the home for three years. Three years later, a new group of children in the orphanage grew up. Thinking of this, she stretched out her hand 
and pulled off the bandage wrapped around her right arm, revealing the magic pattern clothing power on her upper arm. Her right arm was obviously thicker than her left arm, due to being bandaged for a long time. The right arm was dazzlingly white in the rain. She half crouched in the wheat field filled with muddy water. The cold rainwater poured into her salamander leather armor, making her very uncomfortable. She held the alloy belt tightly in her hand, took out four arrows with one hand, and aimed at the people rushing towards her. The knight at the front slowly opened the alloy bow in his hand. At this moment, a twining ivy appeared on her white arm, and the halo of magic lit up from the magic pattern clothing. A trace of magic aura leaked out of her arm, wrapping the arrow like a cocoon of light. She let go. The arrow shot through the rain. Countless raindrops shattered in the air, and the feathered arrow penetrated the neck of a knight. The tip of the arrow emerged from the other end. Chapter 518 Join Forces The knight fell from his horse. He pinched his neck tightly with both hands. His face flushed because he couldn't breathe. He struggled to pull out the sharp arrow that penetrated his neck. But he couldn't pull out the two barbed arrows with his hands. Sharp arrow. A knight next to him jumped off his horse and leaned down to help. He only bit over slightly. And felt a strong wind blowing against his cheek. He felt his ears were slightly cold and a sharp arrow flew through his ear. He subconsciously touched his left cheek, and blood flowed out from the base of his ear. The blood immediately covered his palms. The knight wanted to shout a warning to his companions, but another sharp arrow followed and hit his forehead. The tip of the arrow passed through his head. The knight stretched out his hand slightly, but it was too late. Issue a final warning. Attention everyone! There is a sharp archer in the village! The knight captain held up the knight's light shield and shouted in a drizzle, while barging his horse to kill in the direction of the arrow. More than a dozen knights followed him, forming a sharp charge formation. It was obvious that these experienced knights had cooperated with the knight commander countless times on the battlefield, and they were extremely smooth when changing formations. An arrow flew over from the rain curtain. The knight commander was well prepared and raised his knight's light shield to block the flying arrows in front of him. Boom sound. The feather arrow penetrated the light shield, and the knight's arm felt heavy. The tip of the arrow actually penetrated the iron light shield. He didn't expect the sharpshooter on the opposite side to have such strong arm strength. Through the drizzle, he vaguely saw a figure emerging from the wheat field, like a fiery red cheetah, galloping along the field ridge to the stream. The slender curves turned into countless colors in the rain, and she turned out to be a woman. When he was slightly distracted, an arrow hit Ching Lin Ma's skull. The arrow penetrated the brain. The Ching Lin horse's front hooves softened, and it fell down on the village road. The knight commander used the inertia to throw forward. Fortunately, his body balance was excellent. The moment he landed, he took a few steps forward before standing firmly on the mud road in the rain. Several knights around him passed him and chased the red figure. The knight commander turned back and glanced at the war horse that was foaming at the mouth. He saw that the arrow was deeply embedded in the head of the war horse. There was almost no possibility of saving it. This war horse had accompanied him all the way from the north. When he reached the Bena province, it was already his closest companion. He swore to take good care of it. But unexpectedly, he was shot to death by a shameful arrow in the first battle. The knight commander wanted to look up to the sky and roar. But his little sense allowed him to restrain his thoughts. He could not bring any negative or extreme thoughts to his knights. He walked back with an angry look on his face. Stood in front of the fallen warhorse. Pulled out the sword from his waist. And pierced the horse's heart with the sword ending its remaining life. Knights kept riding behind the knight commander, chasing some era. A knight brought a war horse from behind. The knight commander remounted his horse and found that the red figure in the rain had crossed the river. He raised the knight's spear high in his hand. A flash of lightning flashed across the sky. Samira crossed the river in embarrassment, and thunder rumbled from the dense dark clouds in the sky. She didn't expect those knights to be so sharp. She only had time to shoot three arrows, while lying in the wheat field before she was discovered by the knights. The group of knights was extremely decisive. They quickly changed direction and rushed towards her. At first glance, they were a group of well-trained cavalry, even more elite than any heavy cavalry she had ever seen. Samira knew that if she didn't run, she would have no chance. So she crossed the wheat field and the river in the village without looking back. She wanted to run out of the village, but she couldn't run as fast as the war horse. She could only use the complex terrain in the village to deal with a group of knights. Wherever it leads the knight, it's a disaster. Samira gritted her teeth and ran towards the temporary residence of the security team. Aphrodite looked out the window at the drizzle. Open the window. Reach out your hand. And catch the cool raindrops falling from the sky. 
Wall Village looks particularly peaceful in the rain. She took off the mithril mask on her face and let the raindrops fall on her face. Feeling the refreshing coolness of the drizzle on her face, the succubus stretched out her tongue and licked the raindrops that fell on her lips. The raindrops were a bit sour. This was the first rain she had experienced since arriving in Wall Village, and she seemed to be able to hear the surrounding environment's desire for this rain. Whether it was the few weeds that survived under the wall or the completely dried up seed buckthorn on the hillside, the rain brought vitality to the desolate land. Her delicate, and beautiful face somewhat eclipsed the cloudy sky. She leaned against the window, rolled up her sleeves, and stretched her whole arm out of the window. She feels the breath of early summer, but there was a lot of noise coming from outside the yard, including shouts, screams, the neighing of war horses, and the sound of gold and iron, waking up the succubus Aphrodite from the dream she had spun. She looked outside the courtyard with some annoyance, unable to see clearly what was happening in the village but she could conclude that something must have happened in the village. She hesitated, picked up the mask and put it on her face, and was about to push the door open and rush out to see what was going on. I saw a fiery red figure climbing over the wall. The half-elf archer Samira appeared in the yard. The succubus Aphrodite quickly asked her, Tamira, what's going on outside? Samira made a careful gesture to Aphrodite. Before the succubus Aphrodite could comprehend it, a knight broke through the courtyard door behind him. The horse's hooves crushed the thin wooden door and rushed into the courtyard. The knight was all wet, holding the knight's spear in his hand and stabbed Samira without hesitation. The half-elf archer reached the eaves with one hand and nimbly ran to the ridge. The spear pierced the air, and the sharp edge of the iron spear pierced the earth wall of the house, and flying clods of soil splashed onto the face of the succubus Aphrodite. The succubus Aphrodite did not dodge. Her deep eyes stared at the knight on the horse, and her eyes met the knight. Suddenly it was like seeing an endless sea of stars and the knight on the horse. The knight was in a trance for a moment, as if he saw countless fire rain falling from the cloudy sky. Large meteorites smashed the earth into holes. The mottled earth was cracked with countless cracks. Magma and flames were rolling in the cracks. The end of the world was coming. The knight was so frightened that he howled loudly. He pulled the reins of the horse and tried to escape from the desperate situation. Fear. The succubus Aphrodite shouted in the sweetest voice. Samuel S. Mila had just stood firm on the roof when she saw the knight chasing behind standing in front of Aphrodite with dull eyes. She pulled out the dagger without hesitation, jumped on the knight's horse like a female leopard, and slit the knight's throat with the dagger. Samira bent down and stretched out her hand to Aphrodite. Aphrodite grabbed Samira's hand and used her strength to jump onto the horse's back. She sat behind Samira and hugged her waist tightly. Samira pulled the reins of the horse, and the war horse headed towards he jumped forward, knocked open the thin earth wall, and ran out of the courtyard in a few steps. How did you mess with the Imperial Knights? The succubus Aphrodite was a little embarrassed in the rain. The rain wet her long dark hair, exposing the two curved devil horns on her head. The half-elf archer was covered in blood. He handed the horse's reins to Aphrodite, flipped backwards flexibly on the horse, changed positions with Aphrodite, and sat astride the horse's stock, facing the back. The knight who was catching up fired three arrows in a row, and green vines appeared on her right arm again. The first arrow she shot turned into a large net woven by vines, completely covering the knight who was catching up behind her, immediately causing the knights behind to flip over. Samira said loudly, They are not imperial knights. Let's go to the reservoir. More knights rushed into the courtyard temporarily rented by the security team, and the low and thin courtyard walls were instantly raised to the ground by the knight's horses. Every time Samira shot an arrow, two feather arrows flew out. The knights who were chasing behind were caught off guard and were shot by these feather arrows. The alloy bow was considered a standard weapon of the Green Empire and had a certain lethality against these knights. But this group of knights also learned a lot. They raised the knights in their hands and blocked them in front of them, fighting Aphrodite and Samira. The knight's spear pierced Samira several times. The most dangerous one was when it passed through her ribs and opened a half-foot-long gash in the salamander leather armor. Fortunately, the salamander leather armor was tough enough, allowing Samira time to react and avoid vital parts of her body. Even so, the spear still left a shallow wound on Samira's waist. Samira swayed on her horse, and several more knights chased after her. Several knight spears stabbed at the two of them at the same time. With Tassimat, at the critical moment, a statue of the demon god appeared above Aphrodite's head. The demon god's eyes shot out a beam of light, covering the body of the succubus Aphrodite. 
Aphrodite recited the magic spell, and the sound spread around like a sound wave. After hearing the sound, the knights chasing behind him actually fell asleep on their horses. Sleeping Cloud? The black magic released by the succubus Aphrodite is far greater than that of Cyrus. The power unleashed by Hickok's black magician at the gates of Helensa Knights Academy was much greater. Even Samira almost fell off the horse. Aphrodite touched Samira's translucent ears from behind. The half-elf archer woke up instantly. She wanted to shoot an arrow at the knight behind her. But unfortunately, the war horse jumped and the arrow flew out under the turbulence and hit the knight's chest. The knight also woke up from the severe pain. He even he didn't have time to pull out the arrow. So he dropped the knight's spear in his hand and began to slap the sleeping companions around him desperately to wake them up from their sleep. Aphrodite turned her head, waited for Samira, and said to her, Let's go quickly. The succubus Aphrodite didn't know what kind of magic she had cast. The eyes of the horse underneath her were blood red, and black blood was flowing from its mouth, nostrils, eyes and ears. The horse actually exploded with its ultimate potential carrying two women at high speed in the rain. The knight behind him couldn't catch up. At this time, Samira saw a group of villagers pouring down from the upstream reservoir. They were running towards the village with sledgehammers, pickaxes and other tools in their hands. Seeing a group of knights chasing the succubi Aphrodite and Samira, the villagers rushed towards the knights without any hesitation. Aphrodite wanted to lead the knights to the reservoir. Only the dam there could render the knights' horses useless. Once these knights lost their horses, Samira's archery and her own black magic would have greater influence. Advantage. If you want to counterkill this group of knights, there is no chance. After all, they are not constructed knights. She knew Samira thought the same thing. But at this time, Samira saw two familiar figures in the crowd. They rushed towards the knight bravely along with the crowd. The two sides collided in the central square of the village. The villagers holding farm tools in their hands were not in any way. Opponents of these well-trained knights a row of villagers in front suddenly fell under the spears of the knights. The knights were also very anxious, seeing that they were about to escape after killing more than a dozen of their fellow sharpshooters and magicians. They waved their swords like crazy, trying to fight their way out of the siege of hundreds of villagers. At this time, Samira patted the succubus Aphrodite on the shoulder, her voice a little cold, but extremely decisive. Wait! It's Rita and Natasha! Turn around quickly! We have to save them! Her eyes looked at the one-sided battle in the village square, and her voice became hoarse. Do you want to die? Aphrodite pulled the reins and asked Samira without even thinking. The horse stood there like nails. The rain quickly washed away the blood that burst out from its body, and the ground was bright red. What's so scary about death? After saying that, Samira jumped off the horse. She jumped forward and ran up a courtyard wall. The alloy bow in her hand fired arrows one after another. The shiny magic pattern clothing on her arms flashed with magic fluctuations. Samira's arrows immediately attracted everyone in the square. The gazes of most knights. The succubus Aphrodite was so angry that she almost cursed. She gritted her teeth, pulled the reins of the horse fiercely, and chased after Samira. When she heard that the kobolds in the slave camp were bombing the camp, Rita asked old Sheila and little Peter to hide in the house. And then she and Natasha, whose legs were weak from fear, rushed down from the reservoir construction site with hundreds of villagers. From the entrance of Xiangsuan. In the rain, I saw a group of knights chasing Aphrodite and Samira. I was so excited that I rushed forward with the villagers. The reckless villagers finally learned a lesson in blood. These knights are not the bandits in the desert. They have a stronger will to fight. They cut down all the villagers in the front row with almost a single encounter. These knights kill people like like cutting wheat. When Natasha and Rita saw the blood spurting out in the rain, their legs became weak with fear. Rita was better. Natasha almost fell into the muddy water. Surrounded by some panicked villagers, Rita dragged Natasha among the panicked crowd and dragged her into the carpenter's workshop nearby. At this time, three knights followed the crowd on horseback and rushed into the carpentry workshop. The knight spears in their hands stabbed the young villagers guarding the door. Rita watched the young man fall in front of her. The young man named Gil had confessed to her with a playful smile yesterday morning. Rita's face was extremely pale. She stared at the man with the mask on his head. The knight threw the sickle in his hand. The sharp side struck the knight's hard armored arm. And the knight's eyes were attracted by Rita. Just when he raised the knight's spear and wanted to pierce Rita's body. Natasha who was beside Rita pushed Rita hard. And the two of them awkwardly avoided the knight's shot. The knight raised the knight's spear again. But saw a more beautiful woman standing at the door of the carpenter's workshop. 
Selena saw the knight in the rain raising his spear, while Rita and Natasha fell into the muddy water. Unable to escape at all, she closed her eyes, and the shadow of the dark goddess Selene appeared behind her. Then she opened her eyes suddenly, and a dark purple hexagram array appeared under her feet. The shadow of the goddess Selene waved a whip shadow towards the horse's back. The knight on top drew away. Mental whipping. The knight on horseback was defenseless, and was disturbed by the dark magic. He fell off the horse. A villager hiding in the yard promptly sent the pickaxe in his hand, and smashed the knight's head. Chapter 519 Contract Summoning The desolate land is adjacent to the southernmost tip of the Pagalos Mountains, and is located northwest of Alinsa City. It is the most barren land in the entire Bitta province. Across the desolate land and heading west, you will find the largest desert area in the Bitta province. It is inaccessible, with only a few thieves groups hiding in the depths of the desert all year round to avoid being pursued by the Imperial Cavalry. Every spring, the residents of the deserted land will be invaded by desert bandits. The people living here know how to deal with those bandit groups. And the people here are brave. Bandit groups dare not attack a certain village easily. Only during the dry season of late spring and early summer, when adult laborers go out to make a living, would they sneak across the Gobi Desert and rob the village of the last bit of food. However, the enemy wall village faces this time is not a group of bandits in the desert. They are a group of well-trained knights with sophisticated weapons. A group of villagers just rushed up and suffered a big loss at the hands of these knights. The central square of Wall Village suddenly became a mess. There were still a group of villagers using the village's low courtyard walls and thatched huts to fight with these knights. Many people some were injured and some died. The villagers who were stabbed to death by the knights fell on the village square in the rain. Their blood and mud mixed with water. There were also some injured villagers who were rescued by other villagers. The knight commander in this cavalry has been chasing closely behind Samira. He saw with his own eyes 16 of his companions fell under the sharpshooter's alloy bow, especially when she joined a female magician. Her combat effectiveness increased a lot, and they chased her all the way to the village square. The chaotic scene in front of him also made the knight commander frown slightly. There were only 50 knights in the attack on Wall Village this time, and nearly one-third of the knights were lost in the blink of an eye. Thinking of this, the knight commander raised the knight's sword in his hand high, and a shadow of a knight holding a spear appeared behind him. Then the shadow turned into a force and injected into the body of the war horse beneath him. The war horse the speed of sprinting forward suddenly increased, and the knight captain left an afterimage in the village square. Charge. The long sword in the knight commander's hand was pointed at Samira from a distance, making Samira feel as if a sword light fell on her back. At this time, two more knights followed the knight in front and rushed into the carpenter's workshop. Samira saw that after the previous knight rushed into the carpentry workshop, he suddenly fell off his horse for some unknown reason and was smashed in the head by a villager who jumped out from the side. Then two knights broke into the door and the villager fled into the workshop in a hurry and the door of the workshop collapsed instantly. Samira shot two arrows at the two knights as the magic patterned armor on her arms lit up. The arrows turned into a flash of white light passing through the rain curtain and instantly piercing the backs of the two knights entering through their chests before she could turn around in time. Samira felt that she was being targeted from a distance. A knight on a horse turned into an afterimage and rushed toward her. A shadow of green vines appeared behind Samira. The alloy bow had just been drawn halfway when the knight rushed in front of her and slashed at her neck with the long sword raised high in his hand. Samira could not escape, and a strong wind brought by the war horse blew the hood of her head open, revealing her beautiful and pure elf face. The succubus Aphrodite, who was chasing after Samira on horseback, saw the knight commander turning into an afterimage in the rain and rushing towards Samira. Under the charge of the opposite knight, neither charm nor fear could save Samira. Aphrodite inspired the last bit of potential of the blue-scaled war horse and rushed straight towards the knight commander. At the moment when she was about to hit the knight commander, the succubus Aphrodite jumped from her horse towards the reed stack next to the carpenter's workshop, and her body crashed into the hay stack. Aphrodite then jumped down from the hay stack, dodged a fatal shot from a knight, the knight commander was about to kill Samira with a sword, but he was violently knocked away by the blue-scaled horse that suddenly rushed towards him with blood flowing from its seven orifices. The knight commander fell out involuntarily. He adjusted his posture in the air and turned his body, put an elbow on the earth wall behind him, and the earth wall suddenly collapsed in the rain. However, he took advantage of the force of the shock and bounced up like a cannonball, holding the sword in both hands. He raised it above his head and pointed towards Saw. Mira slashed again. 
the two horses collided with each other, making a muffled sound of flesh and blood exploding. The green-scaled horse Aphrodite was riding had its neck broken, while the horse the knight commander was riding fell crashing into the muddy water, making a miserable sound. Nang. The alloy bow in Samira's hand finally charged up, and an ivy-like arrow shot out from her hand, turning into a net of vines to cover the knight commander in the air. The knight commander cut through the vine net shot by Samira with one sword, but he didn't expect that there was a sharp arrow following the vine net. At this time, it was too late to resist, and the knight commander shouted violently, and unexpectedly stand up with your strong chest and face the arrow. The arrow turned into a stream of light and hit the knight commander's chest. A piece of golden armor appeared on the hard leather armor on the knight commander's chest. Under the flow of magic power, the fatal arrow bounced away. The knight commander landed in front of Samira, raised his sword and chopped off her head. Samira gritted her teeth, raised the alloy bow in her hand, and held the sword cut by the knight captain. The magic pattern on her right arm glowed again, and the alloy bow in her hand was cut with a huge gap by the knight commander's sword, and it was completely scrapped. The knight commander didn't expect Samira to be able to block the slashing sword, and looked at Samira, who was squatting on the ground in shock. At this time, a group of knights surrounded Aphrodite on the reed stack. More than ten knights held knight spears in their hands and pressed towards Aphrodite step by step. The phantom of a magic contract appeared above the head of the succubus Aphrodite. She stood on a tall reed stack, and the mithril mask covering her face fell somewhere. Her long horns were exposed in the rain, with a sneer on her face. She said coldly to the knights approaching around her, Do you think you can win this way? Then she recited a long series of spells. These knights had all suffered from Aphrodite and were a little afraid of her black magic, so they couldn't help but take a step back. Stop her quickly! It's a contract summoning circle! A voice shouted in the rain in the distance. Before the knights could react, a shadow came out of the void behind Aphrodite. Gulitam raised the bone-crushing stick in his hand and smashed the head of the salamander in front of him with one blow. Then he let go of the salamander's tail that he was holding tightly in his hands, and hurriedly put out the flames ignited on his body. The lava fire had burned the ogre's arm with large blisters. The ogre Gulitam didn't care about the burns on his body, and strode from the bank of the lava river to the battlefield. Here, Serdak and the indigenous warrior Andrew is fighting with three salamanders. Serdak held up the dwarf chain shield, and every time the salamander attacked him, a flash of silver light would burst out from the shield. Shield of Blessing the two salamanders also realized that the battle situation was not good, and they could not hurt Serdek. So they wanted to escape back to the River of Lava. But their retreat was blocked by Serdek and could not return to the River of Lava. Andrew was a little embarrassed. The full armor was stained with hot lava, and the cloak on his body was burned to only half. But the salamander on the opposite side was even more embarrassed than him. As the ogre joined the battlefield here, he cooperated with Andrew to deal with the injured salamander. Gulitam shouted naively. Andrew, didn't the captain say that the leather should be kept intact as much as possible? How could you cut all the holes in a good piece of salamander skin? Andrew dodged the salamander's bite and shouted at the ogre. Shut your mouth. It's not just to let you eat one more bite of meat. Help you stop one more. He wants to escape back to the lava. Of course, I have to stop it in the river. Good brother. Well done. The ogre gave Andrew a thumbs up and smiled. As he spoke, the salamander in front of Andrew was caught off guard and received a stick from the ogre on the back. Before its giant tail could sweep over, the salamander received an axe from the ogre on the top of its head. The butcher in Andrew's hand was wedged deeply into the skull of the salamander, causing the salamander to die on the spot before it could spit out a mouthful of lava fire. Charlie and two other young villagers stood aside and watched the battle from a distance. They were also responsible for taking care of Soldak and Andrew's horses. They were all dumbfounded when they saw the ogre's unreasonable and brutal fighting style. Under the absolute power, not even the salamander could stop the ogre's full blow. This made them want to see how the ogre fought on the battlefield. This big man was usually lazy in the village and almost ate all the fat chickens in Wall Village. He was often despised by the young people in the village. Now seeing him smash a salamander to death with a stick, the previous disgust immediately turned into admiration. Cernak wears the earth shield magic pattern structure holds a dwarf chain shield, and has the blessings of God's blessed body and blessed shield, and can easily face two salamanders. In response, he saw that Andrew and Gulitam had already freed their hands, and then he pulled out the artisan sword from his waist and launched an attack on one of the salamanders. The battle lasted for a short while before all four salamanders in the lava river were killed. 
After killing these salamanders, Serdak did not dare to neglect, and immediately started the sacrificial ceremony to give himself the true eye. He took out the skinning knife from his arms and began to peel off the four precious salamander leathers, except for one of them. Apart from a few cuts made by Andrew's butcher's axe, the other three salamander skins remained relatively intact. In addition, Serdak also saw a life magic pattern with a red flame magic pattern on the forehead of the largest salamander. Serdak quickly put down his work and took the lead in killing the salamander. The life magic pattern on the head was peeled off and carefully put into the magic sealing box. Before he stood up to skin the last salamander, he felt a force of contract generated above his head, and he seemed to feel Aphrodite's call. Later, Serdak discovered that a six-pointed star formation appeared under his feet, and an endless void appeared in the center of the formation. His body also turned into a shadow in the formation, and a powerful and irresistible pulling force sent him away. Entering the void was like walking through a portal. When he walked out of the void, he saw a rainy world in front of him. Wherever he looked, rain and blood were mixed together, and the surrounding scenery was extremely familiar. Then he found himself standing on a haystack next to the village square. At his feet were a group of knights who were watching eagerly, holding knight spears, and were about to charge forward. There were no badges on the chest of those knights. Not far away, he saw Samira kneeling on one knee in the rain, being forced into a very awkward situation by a knight holding a long sword. Soldak, Aphrodite turned around and shouted. No matter how slow his reaction was, Serdak understood that this was Aphrodite using the power of the magic contract of equality and symbiosis. But how could she summon herself? Isn't it usually the case that human mages summon demons to fight? Without any time to think, Serdak jumped down from the reed stack. The dwarf chain shield in his hand deflected the two knight spears that were stabbed, and a ball of silver light burst out. The craftsman in the other hand the sword dented the helmet of the knight in front of him. Blood burst under the helmet, and the knight fell off his horse, with a halo of power lighting up under his feet. Serdak took a few steps forward, raised his shield, and hit a war horse on the head. The war horse neighed and fell down suddenly, and the knight on the horse also fell far away with the war horse. Aphrodite followed from behind and recited a magic spell to a knight who rushed up. The knight was raising the knight's spear towards Serdak, but paused at the moment when the spear thrust out. Serdak turned around and threw out the dwarf chain shield in his hand, knocking the knight off his horse. Soldak wore a set of earth shield magic pattern structure and rushed into the battlefield like a god of war, immediately causing chaos in the village square, seeing Samira being forced into a corner by the knight. The alloy bow in her hand had already been broken into two pieces. Samira! He shouted at the half-elf archer, and threw the craftsman's sword in his hand from a distance of more than thirty yards. The knight commander only felt a strong wind roaring by his side, and had to give up the thrust of his sword and raise his shield to meet it. A heavy sword stabbed hard on the shield in the knight captain's hand, cutting a gash on his arm. Then in his sight, a knight with a magical light shining on his body rushed towards him. He held a blood-red crescent in his hand, and before the knight commander could react, the blood-red crescent had been chopped off on the head. The knight captain hurriedly raised his sword to parry. The long sword in his hand made a crisp sound, and a gap the size of a soybean appeared on the edge of the blade. A huge force came from the long sword, and the knight commander was forced to take a step back. Serdak raised his sword and struck again. The knight commander took a step back again. This time, more than one cut was broken on his long sword, and the entire blade was broken. There were slight cracks on them, and the foot that stepped back stepped deeply into the muddy water. He saw the knight's insignia and the guard battalion insignia on Serdak's chest. The silver imperial emblem reminded him vaguely that he was once an imperial knight but now all the glory was gone. The knights in the square are coming here. Chapter 520 Battle of Wall Village In the rain, Serdak held a blood-red crescent and chopped down the rebel knight who rushed to support him with a sword. The succubus Aphrodite followed Serdak. She stretched out her hands to tie up her loose hair to cover the two devil horns on her head. The black robe was soaked by the rain and clung tightly to her body. Her deep eyes seemed to have infinite gravity. The knights could not help themselves when looking into her eyes. Samira struggled to stand up from the muddy water. The alloy bow broke into two pieces and was thrown to her feet. She picked up the forest bow that she was reluctant to throw away. She stared coldly at the group of knights opposite and stretched out her hand in the forest. There were three arrows on the back of the bow, and the salamander leather armor had several scars, most of which were caused by the knight commander. When the villagers of Wall saw Serdak appearing in the village square, they gathered from all over. 
This group of villagers had all kinds of weapons, including axes, hammers, sickles, and hoes. They formed a torrent in the square and gathered behind Soldek. The knight captain threw away the shattered knight's sword, pulled out the craftsman's sword inserted into the light shield with his backhand, and looked at Soldek standing in the rain with a solemn expression. Facing a constructed knight like Serdek, the knight commander felt a very strong sense of oppression in his heart. He wiped his face with the back of his hand and reached out to stop his companion, who was about to rush forward. The two sides faced off in the rain in the village square. Rita and Natasha stood in the yard of the carpenter's workshop and saw Serdek fighting the knight in the square through the wall. Rita couldn't wait to rush out, but Natasha held her tightly. Natasha, why are you pulling me? Rita tried to break away, but found that Natasha was holding her tightly and couldn't get away. She didn't know Natasha had such strength. Natasha whispered, Don't go out and cause trouble for him. Rita gave up her struggle and turned back to glance at Selena, who was guarding the door of the carpenter's workshop. It was this woman who had saved herself and Natasha just now. She obviously should be grateful. But she could not say those words of thanks. The women in the village all said that she was a woman with bad luck. She was often isolated. But now it seems that she is not so annoying. Three dead knights were lying at the gate of the workshop. The next two knights were shot to death by Samira. The three captured war horses were tied up in the yard by the villagers. The children were hiding in the carpenter's workshop house. Selena and a group of villagers blocked the door to prevent the rebel knights from rushing in from the outside. The blood-red crescent moon in Serdak's hand actually emitted a faint white steam-like sword light, and his entire body armor exuded a sacred aura. The knight commander walked out of the crowd, raised his hand high, signaled the knights around him to stop, and walked towards Soldek alone. Behind him, a shadow of a great knight holding a knight's spear appeared. The shadow was incomparable. Solid. The spear pointed at Soldak from a distance. Serdak was not to be outdone at all. And the shadow of a two-faced and four-armed god and demon appeared behind him. The two took two steps to run. And the blood-red crescent moon and the craftsman's sword collided. Although the level of the knight commander seems to be higher than that of Serdak. Serdak, with the help of the magic pattern structure and the knight's halo, completely overwhelmed the opposite knight commander in terms of strength. Every time he took a step forward, the blood-red crescent in his hand struck firmly on the craftsman's sword. Every time Serdak swung his sword, he took a step forward, and the knight commander could only be forced to parry and take another step back. Who are you? The knight commander asked. Serdak answered loudly. Chera Serdak of the deserted land of Paglos Pass in the city of Aranza. Soldak! Soldak! The group of villagers behind him also shouted his name along with Serdak. And the sound was deafening in the ravine. The knight commander didn't believe Serdak's self-introduction, and stared at him coldly and asked, A construct knight is actually hiding in a small mountain village as a peace officer, and he also has elf archer followers and magic pets. The succubus Aphrodite stood behind and cursed in her heart. Who is the demon pet? Your whole family is the demon pet. Any questions? Serdak pressed down with his sword. This time the knight had no way to retreat. He could only hold the sword with both hands to block Serdak's heavy blow. The blood-red crescent pressed the craftsman's sword on the knight captain's shoulder. The sharp sword the blade cut through the hard leather armor of the shoulder pads, leaving a bloody mark on his shoulder. Serdak pressed the knight commander and asked, And who are you? The knight commander gritted his teeth and tried his best to block Soldek's sword. His breath was a little short, but he still stubbornly announced his name. Algernon, a soldier of the Freedom Resistance Army. Only then did Serdak realize that the group of knights in front of him and the two rebels captured a month ago turned out to be the same group. Rebels? He asked. The knight commander stared at Soldak with an angry look on his face, obviously unwilling to admit that he was a rebel. The sky was overcast, and it rained nonstop. A magic caravan drove slowly on the muddy village road. The magic caravan had just entered the village square. The coachman saw the blood and rain mixed in the square, almost staining the ground red. He was so frightened that he immediately stopped the carriage jumped off the carriage in a panic and fled out of the village desperately. Magician Gurdon slowly pushed open the carriage door and he unfolded a magic scroll. The energy released by the scroll turned into a hexagram array. As the spell sounded, a pale golden magic shield appeared on his body. Drizzling rain. Land on the magic shield and slide down the shield wall. He turned to look at the coachman who was trying to escape from the village and said underestimating. Trash! He casually hooked his fingers and drew a lightning magic pattern between his fingers. A lightning arrow shot out from the hand of the magician Gurdon and fell on the coachman instantly. 
There was just a crackling sound. And the coachman fell down. Covered in charcoal. Magician Gurdon held up his magic shield and walked to the center of the square in the rain. Looking at less than half of the rebel knights left. He said in a cold voice with a gloomy face. You knights are really unreliable. No wonder you can't deal with that half-footed knight. Old Wall, who had already stepped into the coffin, was driven out of Sloy by the means arranged before his death. Huh? The group of knights behind the knight captain glared at Magician Gurdon. But no one dared to stand up and oppose his words. The electric magician Gordon smiled coldly again, standing among the knights. He looked deeply at Samira and the succubus Aphrodite, and then stopped talking. Arcs of electricity were generated between his fingers, and a magic array was quickly drawn in front of him, followed by another spell. Samira had been alert to the movements of the group of knights opposite. When she saw a magician walking into the crowd, she kept staring at the magician. When she saw him starting to draw a magic circle, Samira asked the magician open the forest bow and shot two arrows in succession. Unfortunately, the knights on the opposite side were also on tight guard. They were holding knights' light shields. Under full vigilance, Samira's arrows were completely blocked by the shields. Aphrodite's charm and fear are close-range magic that can only be effective face-to-face -face and cannot affect the crowd on the opposite side. At this time, the magic array of magician curtain had been drawn. As a bolt of lightning fell from the sky, the entire village square suddenly lit up. Click! A bolt of lightning fell on Serdak, arcing across his body. At the same time, the earth shield on the magic pattern structure appeared. It was three earth yellow shields with rock patterns. They were constantly rotating around Serdak's body. Most of the arcs were blocked by the earth shield. Blocked, but there were still a large number of electric snakes rushing toward Serdak. The blessing shield on Serdak's arm reappeared blocking some arcs again, and only a trace of arc was injected into Serdak's body. It just made him feel slightly numb all over. Serdak looked at the crowd of knights on the opposite side alertly, only to find that there was a magician wearing a black magic robe among the crowd opposite, and there was an arc of electricity running on his fingers. Magician Gurdon was also surprised. He did not expect that the construct knight in front of him was unprepared and escaped his second level lightning magic without any damage. Magician Gurdon did not dare to neglect and once again drew a bolt of lightning, which fell on Soldak's head. The lightning did not want the fireball to have any traces. It hit Soldak again with a click sound, but was still quickly eliminated by the earth shield and blessing shield. Sernak could feel that the earth shield around his body might break at any time. He swung his sword with all his strength. Knight Commander Algernon parried with all his strength. Sernak took the opportunity to kick Algernon to the ground. Then he turned his eyes to the magician Gurdon and rushed towards the crowd of knights. Knight Commander Algernon wanted to stand up and stop Soldak, but he felt a sharp pain, as if he had been torn apart by five horses. Waves of sharp pain passed into his mind, making his body suffocate slightly, and the tendons all over his body, they were all twitching uncontrollably, and they couldn't hold the craftsman's sword in their hands. He seemed to be aware of it, and looked towards the door of the carpenter's workshop. He saw a beautiful woman with blonde hair and blue eyes standing there, with her hands clasped in front of her chest in a praying posture. Algernon couldn't keep up with Soldak. The knights beside the magician Gurdon raised their shields to face Soldak, but were chopped down one after another in a pool of blood by the blood-red crescent in Soldak's hand. By the time Soldak rushed in front of magician Gurdon, magician Gurdon had already drawn the third magic pattern array. This array condensed a huge ball of lightning light in front of him. The moment Serdak rushed forward, the ball of light exploded in front of the magician Gurdon sending lightning everywhere. Countless small electric arcs were connected like chains around Serdak, instantly forming a huge cage to bind Serdak. Serdak struck the lightning cage with his sword, and countless arcs of electricity immediately rushed towards his body along the sword. The arcs of electricity were scurrying around his body, and Serdak decisively stopped his hand. Samira and Aphrodite saw Serdak trapped in the electric prison, and quickly moved towards Serdak. Samira's arms flashed with light, and the arrows shot by the forest bow were extremely it was fierce, but was blocked by a group of knights holding up their shields. The magician Geldon threw out a bolt of lightning, which fell on the succubus Aphrodite, knocking her to the ground immediately. Lightning magic is the most restrained magic of the succubus family besides the sacred magic. The magician Geldon pointed at Suldak, who was trapped in the electric prison, and shouted to the knight commander, Algernon, kill him quickly! Although the knight commander was in severe pain, his tenacious willpower still allowed him to stand up from the muddy water. He walked quickly towards Serdak with the craftsman's sword in hand. In order to maintain the lightning prison, 
Magician Gurdon was channeling all his magic power. And at this moment, he had no energy left to kill Serdak. Magician Gurdon knew that the other knights around him could not break through the lightning prison at all. And the only person who could give Serdak a fatal blow in the light prison was the knight commander Algernon. Seeing Algernon striding over, Soldak had a sneer on his face. The demon god's phantom appeared again behind him. And at the same time, the eyes on the god's face opened slightly. Then the demon god's phantom's head turned slightly in one direction, looked at Serdak, and stretched out four arms to hold him down. Serdak was closely guarding him. Serdak released the power contained in the shirt, and the electric light on the cage was instantly suppressed to an extremely weak level. Although he was still unable to break out of the cage, Serdak recovered from his paralysis. He stood in the cage, reached out, and took out a finger bone from the magic waste bag. It was a bone whistle made of a piece of the middle finger as white as jade, with a trace of blood in the middle. Serdak didn't care about anything else when he bit it. He put the bone whistle on his lips and blew hard. Call out. The bone whistle made a long, sharp and piercing sound. The sound broke through the sky, as if it formed a sharp arrow and punched a hole in the clouds above. In an instant, countless dark clouds filled up the holes. A bloody door appeared behind Serdak. On the door were carved countless flowers competing to bloom. The flowers were covered with endless corpses. The sky was covered with clouds. The vast land in the distance was covered with corpses. Skeletons, zombies, ghosts, corpse witches, bone dragons, and other undead creatures of the undead race. The bloody door slowly opened, and a crystal clear white bone arm was pushing the door open. Count Fonak wore a noble headdress and a gorgeous dress and walked out of the bloody door. His face had turned into a skull, and the shadow of his life face was vaguely visible. He first saw Serdak in the lightning prison, and then his eyes fell on the magician Gurdon among the knights. Without any communication, Fornak's ghostly figure disappeared instantly at the bloody gate. When he appeared, he was just behind the magician of Gurdon. The sickle in his hand was at the moment when the magician of Gurdon turned around past through his chest. The blood gushing from the chest of magician Gildan was quickly sucked into the bone side and Magician Gelden's soul was also grabbed out of his body by one hand of Count Fonak. The soul shadow took a breath and sucked the soul of the Magician Gurdon into its mouth. The lightning cage around Serdak was eliminated. Count Fornak's body disappeared again. When he appeared, he had already come to Soldak's side. He smiled and said to Serdak, Didn't you agree to meet me for afternoon tea when you have time? Why are you so embarrassed when you first come to see me? Soldak said to Count Fornak with great gratitude. Count Fornak, I... Okay. Everything will be over. Count Fornak put his hand on Soldak's shoulder and was burned by the sacred breath of his body. He quickly retracted his hand, then raised his head and looked at the he looked up at the sky with gray clouds and said with a sigh on his face, Fortunately you chose a rainy day and didn't let me appear directly in the sun. It seems that you have a lot of things to do. Remember to be prepared when you call me next time. Some refreshments. That's how hospitality should be. After Count Fornak finished speaking, he glanced at the stunned rebel knights around him and asked Soldak, Can you handle these by yourself? Seeing Soldak nod, in full view of everyone, Count Fornak slowly walked into the bloody door. The bloody door then slowly closed. Chapter 521 Fighting for Life The rain finally stopped. The air has a fresh smell after the rain and is also mixed with a faint smell of blood. The battle in the central square of Wall Village finally subsided and the last night fell in front of Serdak. Serdak kicked away the knight in front of him, who was still resisting until his death, and pulled out the blood-red crescent moon from the knight's chest. The knight's eyes were blank and his pupils were dilated. He fell on his back and fell into the muddy water. He looked towards the north, exhaled his last breath before dying, as if his whole body was relieved. The knight commander was the first to be killed by Serdak after the death of Magician Gurdon. With the cooperation of the villagers, 50 rebel knights left 47 corpses in Wall Village. The warhorses brought by the knights are scattered throughout the village. But a dozen of them are completely dead. The only way to deal with them is to drain the blood from the horses' bodies, skin them, and leave them to eat. Meat. For the villagers of Wall Village. These horse meat is also a rare and delicious meal. Soldak dragged his exhausted body and saw Rita and Natasha in the carpentry workshop on the edge of the village square. The two of them were helping Selena take care of more than a hundred children in the children's home. He seemed busier than himself. The number of dead and injured villagers in Wall Village has not been completely determined. The rain covered up many things. The dead villagers were lying on the door panel, covered with a piece of white linen cloth. 
parked in the open space on the other side of the grain field. Their family members gathered around. Women covered their faces and cried. And the elderly stood aside silently. Many people in the village were injured. And some of the craftsmen who rushed to help at the reservoir construction site were killed by the rebel knights. And many more were injured. Serdak first treated some seriously injured villagers. His holy light technique gave the injured villagers hope of living. Three rebels escaped from Wall Village on horseback. But they did not escape towards the Paglos Pass. It is estimated that they will not survive for long in the barren and barren land. This barren land is too barren for outsiders to survive. Survive here. The half-elf archers chased after the knights in the rain. And there would probably be an endless battle. These knights completely angered Samira. Serdak wiped the blood on the corpse of a rebel knight with the blood-red crescent moon. Put it back into the scabbard. Took out the holy light torch and gathered it in his hand. The holy breath condensed into one with the blessing of the holy light torch. A group of white fireworks. This group of fireworks is full of healing power. Making it easier for him to cast the holy light stone. Only at this moment did the villagers of Wall Village clearly realize why Serdek, who had grown up slowly in their eyes, was canonized as a knight. Standing in the square, he had become so different. Serdak had never shown his power in front of the villagers before. But now, the villagers knew that Serdak was a construct knight. They had seen him wearing that gorgeous and exquisite armor before. And in the eyes of many people what showed was envy. But now this group of people looked at him with more reverence. He half crouched next to a villager who was leaning against the wall. This villager had a penetrating wound on his abdomen, which was pierced by a knight's spear. He bled a lot, and his intestines could be seen through the wound. The wound had become white from the rain. He saw Serdak put the holy light torch close to his abdomen, and the sacred aura coming from the holy light torch made him feel a little warm. He slowly shook his head at Soldak, indicating that he was no longer okay. Please don't give up until the end. Serdak treated the wound extremely skillfully and sewed up his stomach with a needle and thread before saying to him. The villager looked at Soldak weakly, and a hope of living came into his already desperate heart. I am a paladin. I have treated countless soldiers who were more seriously injured than you on the battlefield. They all survived in the end. Whether they can persevere now depends not on me anymore, but on here, Sue said. Erdek pointed to his heart. Aphrodite has been following Serdek. She cannot be too far away from him. Otherwise the contract summons will fail and Serdak will be sent back to the original summoning place. The succubus Aphrodite also showed some powerful power in the battle just now. Many villagers dared not approach her. While Serdak was treating the villagers, a young man ran up to him panting and shouted to him. Soldak, go and see Uncle Bright. Uncle Bright is about to give up. Only then did Serdak notice that the old village chief had never appeared at the scene. It turned out that he was seriously injured. He quickly stood up asked the young man that the old village chief was at home, then rode a war horse and rushed towards the old village chief's house. Before leaving, he did not forget to tell the injured villagers to go to the old village, waiting outside the elder's house. Aphrodite caught up from behind and stretched out her hand to Serdak, obviously intending to ride on the same horse with him. Soldak hesitated for a moment, then stretched out his hand to pull her onto the horse. The succubus sat sideways on the horse, hugged Serdak's waist tightly with both hands, and whispered into his ear, We can't leave too far. Otherwise the summoning power of the equal symbiosis magic contract will fail and destroy you are sent back to the original place of summons. The black robe on Aphrodite's body was still a little damp. Although Serdak was wearing a full set of earth shield magic pattern structure, the two of them were so close that he could still clearly feel the fire of the succubus. Spicy carcass. How could you summon me? Serdak finally found the opportunity to ask this matter. Aphrodite smiled charmingly. Although her skin was a little dark, she could not hide her charming face. She said, This is the power of the equal symbiosis magic contract. If you are a magician, you can summon me at any time. Serdak was a little confused about the magic contract. When he bought this magic contract scroll in the magic grocery store, the shop owner didn't tell him that this magic contract scroll also had this function. Now speaking of it, no matter no matter what, it seems that I have made a profit. Does this magic contract still have the power to summon? Serdak felt that he should ask Aphrodite, who was better at magic. So he said, Aphrodite hugged Serdak from behind, closed her eyes, and felt the unprecedented throbbing in her heart. When Serdak asked this, she casually said, Of course, but this contract puts a little extra emphasis on the interpretation of equality. Serdak looked at the chaotic wall village and thought, Fortunately, Aphrodite summoned him back, 
otherwise the situation in the village would have turned out to be unknown. Thinking of this, he secretly felt happy about it, and said to Aphrodite, Well, fortunately you summoned me back. No matter what, my heart is full of gratitude for this. Aphrodite felt very keenly from Serdak's words that he didn't pay too much attention to this matter. Nor was he unhappy. Then he secretly patted his turbulent chest and asked tentatively, Then if I encounter danger in the future, can I still call you like this? Serdak was riding on horseback and asked in shock, Do I still have the right to refuse this matter? Aphrodite whispered guiltily. Of course, if you object in your heart, the summoning is likely to be invalid. After all, this is a magical contract of equal symbiosis. Serdak thought about it in his mind and thought that after all, he had signed a magic contract with Aphrodite, and it seemed that both parties could summon each other. The reason why he could not summon Aphrodite was because he was not a magician. After having this preconceived idea, Serdak said readily, Well, as long as I don't have anything too important at hand, I am still willing to help. Aphrodite's heart warmed slightly. When she heard Serdak say this, she felt that the roots of her wings became a little itchy. She secretly pressed her face against the armor on Serdak's back and whispered, I knew you wouldn't refuse. I have a very strong feeling that I seem to have been deceived by your rhetoric. Serdak couldn't see Aphrodite's face, but could feel her joy. So he said casually, Aphrodite smiled knowingly, covered her mouth with her little hand, and whispered to Serdak, We are equal to each other, and there is no deception. Soldak grabbed the reins, jumped off the horse, looked up at Aphrodite, stared into her penetrating eyes with suspicion, and said, But your smile doesn't need to be so obvious. Right. Aphrodite quickly followed and slipped off the horse. She blinked at Serdak without saying a word and signaled him to go in and save people. Mayor Bright was lying on the bed at home. In addition to his old wife Aunt Bright, there was also Charlie's wife guarding the door. Serdak strode in from the door and heard the old village chief's weak cough. Aunt Bright saw Soldak and hurriedly came up to him and said to him with a sad face, He has been waiting for you to come back. Soldak walked to the bedside and saw Uncle Bright, who was pale due to excessive blood loss. When he saw Soldak, his originally dull eyes became much brighter, as if he was injected with some kind of energy again. Strength, struggling to sit up from the bed. Soldak held down Uncle Bright's hand and said to him, Don't think about anything now. Wait until you wake up. Now you need to close your eyes and have a good sleep. Aphrodite came up from behind, stared at Uncle Bright with a pair of eyes as magnificent as purple gems, and said, Sleep. Night is coming. Duriel's body blocks the sun. She seemed to be singing, and after saying less than three sentences, Uncle Bright fell asleep in the sound of her voice. Serdek glanced at Aphrodite. Aphrodite seemed to know what he was going to say. So she said, Don't worry. Even if the time comes, I will have a way to summon you back. Seeing that Serdak was hesitant to speak, Aphrodite had a proud smile on her lips. Uncle Bright was seriously injured. The knight's spear penetrated his shoulder blade, injured the right lung lobe, and then emerged from the left abdomen. The organs in the chest and abdomen were damaged to varying degrees. This was tantamount to a death sentence for ordinary villagers. And the linen sheets on the bed were stained with blood. Serdak sat down by the bed, first carefully examined the wounds on Uncle Bright's body, then took out needles and thread and a hemostatic bandage, and with the help of the succubus Aphrodite, removed the wounds on Uncle Bright's body, stitch it up, and then use holy light for treatment. Holy light is a very magical magic, no matter how severe the injury is. Some of it will be healed. During this period, Soldak invited Aunt Bright and Charlie's wife out of the room. He did not carry Aphrodite behind his back, but directly arranged the sacrificial ceremony in the room and then looked at Aphrodite's extremely curious eyes. Then, he summoned the statue of the devil in front of the simple altar. He took out A.H. L. Dog head in a lime jar from his magic pocket and dedicated it to the devil. Suddenly, two beams of light fell on the village chief and the village leader bright one after another. On Serdak's body, divine protection. The eye of truth. For village chief bright, it is impossible for him to recover from such a serious injury based on his own physique and potential. Even if Serdak possesses the holy light technique, it will not be possible. But he is blessed with the blessed body the blessing effect gives him temporary strong recovery and vitality. So he still has a good chance of surviving under the treatment of holy light. Seeing that Uncle Bright's complexion had returned to Rosie, and that although his lungs were injured, his breathing had become smoother. Soldak breathed a sigh of relief. He used his true eyes to carefully examine the hidden dangers in the old village chief's body. 
under the vision of the eye of truth. All matters have two blurred lines of reality and illusion. Just as if the succubus wings still exist in the illusory shadow of Aphrodite. At this time, he did not notice that Aphrodite was slightly absent-minded looking at the demon's face on the statue of the demon, walking out of the bright village chief's house. Many villagers were waiting outside the bright village chief's house. Even old Sheila and little Peter were standing in the crowd, anxiously waiting for news from Chief Bright. Serdak jumped onto a millstone and shouted to the villagers in front of him. Uncle Bright's injury is not serious. When the villagers heard what Serdak said, they all breathed a sigh of relief. Some even clasped their hands in front of their chests. As if praying to the goddess, Serdak raised his hand again to signal the noisy crowd to be quiet. He said loudly to all the villagers present. In addition, I would like to announce the village's decision to everyone. All the people who died in the Battle of Wall Village will be compensated by Wall Village. Of course, some of these people bravely fought in this battle. They will receive a greater reward. Their parents will be taken care of by Wall Village when they grow old. Their children will be sent to the Junior War College of Alinta City when they reach the appropriate age. All the injured people will. These words immediately caused an uproar among the villagers. Everyone did not expect that Serdak would make such a decision. Everyone's previous battles were for survival. But after Serdak said these words, the next battle may be for Wall Village. Next, I will treat all injured villagers. Please abide by the principle that serious injuries are better than minor injuries. Serdak finally said, Serdak was busy until dark. During this period, Aphrodite summoned four consecutive contracts. Serdak even brought back some fresh salamander meat from the lava river in Pussy Mountain. When Serdak returned to Pussy Mountain, the danger lurking in the lava river here was completely eliminated, and the ogre and Andrew were waiting quietly on the bank of the lava river. Chapter 522 Magic Crystal All the discomfort caused by traveling through the void quickly disappeared from Serdak. Standing on the bank of the lava river, Serdak packed his luggage and put all the precious magic materials on the salamander into the magic waste bag. Charlie called a four-wheeled carriage from the foot of the mountain loaded all the meat of the four salamanders into the carriage and prepared to transport them back to Wall Village. The meat of the salamanders was very tender and could be found in the market of Alinsa City, sold for a very good price, although they can swim in the hot lava river when they are alive. After death, the salamander meat can still be sizzling and oily after being marinated, skewered and burned on the fire. This river of lava continues to the top of the mountain because Wall Village was attacked by rebel knights. The Serdak team gave up their plan to continue exploring to the top of Pussy Mountain. Charlie and two other young men had already learned from Soldak that the village had been attacked by rebel knights. They were eager to know what was going on in the village and at home. When Charlie heard that his father was seriously injured, he wanted to rush back to the village right away. Soldak hurriedly returned to the temporary camp downstream of the Lava River. Luke had already led the Cobalt slaves to build a new camp at the foot of the mountain. At the foot of Pussy Mountain, there is a kind of shale suitable for building houses. This kind of shale can be seen everywhere nearby. The cobalt slaves brought a large amount of shale and built three roofless houses next to a cliff. The roof of the work shed was covered with a layer of reed mat and then covered with a dustproof cloth. In just half a day, a minimalist temporary camp for the sulfur mine was built. Luke installed the water-gathering rune board on a shady rock wall. Under the rune board, a stone trough was placed to collect water. The gem base in the center of the rune board was inlaid with a magic crystal. As the fragments and magic flowed, this water-gathering rune board continued to gather water droplets into the stone trough. At this moment, the stone trough was already filled with less than half of the water. The mining camp is located downstream of the lava river, and this area is full of underground rivers of lava. The so-called underground river of lava looks like a piece of black rock from the surface. Occasionally, smelly green smoke will rise in some places but underneath these black rocks are like blood vessels, hiding rivers of lava. If you accidentally step on these black rock sh, ls, you may fall into the hot magma. So it is very dangerous here. Of course, lava underground rivers also provide people with convenience. The biggest advantage of this kind of underground river is that you don't need to make a fire to cook. You only need to find a smoky gas hole on the nearby black rock ground and use a hammer to open the gas hole. You can see the lava flowing a foot below. Just place a large iron pot firmly on top of the hole to boil water. Cook rice and make soup. The cobalt slaves seemed very peaceful. In fact, as long as they were given food, these cobalts didn't mind digging sulfur mines here. Hearing that some changes had occurred in Wall Village, 
Luke also wanted to return to Wall Village immediately. However, the newly built mining camp needed someone to stay behind. Hearing that the village chief Bright was seriously injured, he asked Charlie to return to Wall Village. He took the initiative to choose to stay in camp. Then Serdak and his party rushed back to Wall Village overnight. A rain washed away the blood in the village square, although some of the traces left after the battle were still vivid in our minds. The slave camp work shed and children's home at the entrance of the village have completely collapsed. A group of cobalt slaves with nowhere to escape chose to return to Wall Village after a long circle in the rain. Now they are all sitting quietly in the slave camp work shed. On the ruins of, the rebel knights killed several cobalt slaves, which seemed to have no big impact on them. The rebel knights destroyed many earthen walls in the village, lifted off some roofs, and trampled many wheat fields by the stream. Even the dead tree at the entrance of the village was not spared. There was a broken knight's spear stuck in the trunk. The wooden plaque in Ertsuin was also smashed into pieces. Villagers from other villages have picked up the children from the children's home one after another. With the arrival of the rainy season, the villagers' hard days are coming to an end. When the ravines are covered with green grass, at least the 19 villages in the deserted land will no longer have children. People will go hungry again. The children's home in the village suddenly became much deserted. And even the children in the village came to eat there every day. Selina moved the children's courtyard to the carpenter's workshop next to the village square. She built a simpler awning here, hung a wooden board on the outside of the earthen wall, and wrote some imperial words on it with charcoal to teach children in the village learn Chinese. The injured villagers finally waited for Serdek and his party to return to the village. Everyone looked expectantly as Serdek arrived at the village on horseback. Serdek waved to the villagers, jumped off his horse, and cast the holy light spell on the village square. During the healing process, Andrew, as Soldek's assistant, was responsible for rebandaging wounds and correcting broken bones. From time to time, one or two heartrending screams could be heard from the central square of the village. Andrew, who has extensive experience in bone setting, knows that if a broken bone is connected crookedly, even if it heals in the future, it will be disabled. It is better to reconnect the bone before the bone seam heals. With Andrew's help, Serdak felt much more relaxed. He only needed to focus on using the holy light technique to treat the injured villagers. Charlie rushed home non-stop. When he opened the door, he saw the old village chief with his upper body covered with bandages sitting on a recliner, being fed broth by Aunt Bright with a spoon. He couldn't help but stand at the door with a look of astonishment. The old village chief recovered quickly from his injuries. Under the protection of the blessed body, he was able to get out of bed on his own by the third day. This speed of recovery simply frightened the family. However, except for the fact that his injuries healed very quickly, there was nothing abnormal about his body. So the family gradually put their hearts back in their stomachs. It has been two days since Samira left Wall Village, and there has been no news. Only 34 of the horses left by the rebel knights survived. 16 horses were cut into horse meat, and each villager received a large piece of horse meat. Serdak initially did not agree with eating these war horses. As a knight, these war horses are their closest companions. Many cavalry battalions have unwritten rules not to eat horse meat, and they will not eat it even if they starve to death. Companion, this is the basic virtue that a knight needs to have. But the villagers of Ware Village have no taboo in this regard. They can count the days on both hands that they can eat meat throughout the year in Ware Village. It is basically impossible for the villagers to give up eating horse meat. Serdak let them divide the horse meat. Eat. In the past two days, even the big iron pots in the cobalt slave camp have been boiling large pieces of bone soup. Cobalt slaves have no psychological burden on these war horses. Like other subhuman races, they prefer to eat the internal organs of animals, believing that the internal organs are richer in fat and the meat is more tender. Not many gold coins were found from these rebel knights. The most valuable thing they had on them was this set of hard leather armor. In addition to the hard leather armor, the weapons of the rebel knights were also pretty good. Whether they were knight spears, long swords, the knight's light shields were all very sophisticated. As for the corpses of the rebel knights, the angry villagers hung them on crosses at Paglo's Pass to be exposed to the sun. This resulted in hundreds of scavenging vultures circling over the Paglo's Pass. The tidal flats were reclaimed from the river bend outside the village. Moistened by the rain, all the land was filled with sufficient water. Of course, the hard-working people of Wall Village would not miss such a rare opportunity to sow seeds. Serdak came from Alenza, the seeds brought back from the city were planted on the newly reclaimed land. Rainwater flowing from various hillsides flows into this drainage channel with a width of 15 meters. 
and then is discharged into an underground river 10 kilometers away. In previous years, all it took was one rain to turn this place into a vast swamp. This drainage channel now blocks a large amount of rainwater on the hillside from the tidal flat. And this large tidal flat has been turned into hundreds of acres of fertile farmland. This sudden rainfall stopped the construction site of the reservoir upstream of the village. The construction site was in a mess. The volcanic ash transported back from the depths of the barren land was soaked by the rain and turned into lumps of hard limestone. This hard block of limestone needs to be calcined and ground again before it can be turned back into potsalanic cement. It is of course impossible to build a kiln for calcining cement under the current conditions in Vol Village. So the volcanic ash that was so painstakingly transported back from the depths of the desolate land was completely wasted and became worthless. The bricklayers on the construction site have left Wall Village one after another. After the first rain falls, they will rush back to the village to farm. Otherwise, they will not be able to sow in time, which will affect the autumn harvest. The land in the barren land is barren, so the villagers will not miss this best planting opportunity. The main body of the police station built on the stone cliff in the upper reaches of the village has been completely completed. As long as the main beams are erected on the roof, the raptors can be laid on the tripods. Serdak does not plan to cover the roof with thick red thatch. He wants to pay the roof with on the first floor of blue tiles. A terrace should be built outside the skylight of the attic to overlook the distance. This kind of fish scale square green tiles can be bought in the workshops of Alensa City. Most of the buildings in Alensa City are like this. It is paved with this kind of green tiles. Serdak handed over the business of purchasing green tiles to the carriage shop in Alensa City. The news that Vol Village was attacked by rebels soon spread to the city of Aranza. Both the Aranza Guard Camp and the Magic Union Law Enforcement Group sent people to learn about the specific situation. The person responsible for investigating the matter was Serdak. My friend, as long as it is a security issue outside the city, the guard camp cannot bypass Carl Casement. As for the Magic Union Law Enforcement Group, Lance Magician was sent again this time. So the matter quickly calmed down, and the loot captured in Wall Village was preserved to the greatest extent. Of course, most of the Electric Magician Gurdon's personal belongings were taken away by Lance. The Magic Guild would not let such a person whose strength is infinitely close to the Great Magician's personal belongings be left outside. As for the Magic Guild, the specific compensation can only be determined after the specific value of these personal items is appraised. Serdak heard from Carl that this group of rebels also attacked a noble manor in Benna City. How they sneaked into Haranza City was unknown. Serdak sat on a chair by the window, glaring helplessly at the succubus Aphrodite across the square table. Aphrodite gave him a charming smile, seeing that Serdak was not moved at all. Her charming face suddenly fell, and she lowered her head like a child who had done something wrong. There is a magic crystal in the shape of a key on the desk. This magic crystal was obtained from the magician Gildan and was secretly kept by the succubus Aphrodite. Now Serdak is sure that the magic crystal is from the magic guild. Those magicians should be looking for this magic crystal. Just now, the succubus Aphrodite injected mana into this magic crystal and saw a shadow cast by the magic crystal, like a broken corner of a three-dimensional map. Although Serdak didn't know where is this. But no matter how stupid he is, he can guess that there are some secrets hidden in this magic crystal. The magicians of Gurdon belong to the magic organization. Dark Moon Gate! If they knew that this magic crystal was still in their hands, they would definitely try their best to get back this magic crystal. Serdak did not want to be beaten by a group of people. A mage who is good at space magic is thinking about me. Recently, rebels coming to the north have appeared one after another in various parts of Bina province. They probably came for this thing. They took the risk to sneak into Bina province and made the intelligence agency personnel in Bina City rush around all day long. They were so busy worried. Serdak certainly did not want this group of rebel knights to attack Wall Village again. This magic crystal actually fell into his hands. And Serdak rubbed his forehead with his hands. How about we hand over this magic crystal to the Hellanza Magic Union Law Enforcement Team now? Andrew sat at the door and suggested to Soldak. He also knew that this matter was a bit troublesome. The attack by rebel knights that Wall Village experienced a few days ago was probably related to this. Well, I will personally send this magic crystal to the Magic Guild. In short, this trouble cannot be left in our hands. Soldak nodded and said decisively. Aphrodite heard that Serdak wanted to hand over the magic crystal to the magic guild and hurriedly covered it with her hands. Remember when you asked me to interrogate those two rebels? Aphrodite said to Serdak. Of course Serdak remembered. But not long after, the two rebels died while being escorted back to Halanza City. He was busy building Wall Village. 
so he didn't interfere with the matter. The succubus Aphrodite blinked and said, I used hypnosis on the two rebels at that time. They told me that the reason why they walked through the deserted land and entered Pagalo's Mountain was because the rebel organization wanted to looking for a secret place in the Pagalo's Mountains. I think the answer may lie in this magic crystal. This trouble seems to be bigger than expected. No, I'll leave immediately. This magic crystal can't stay with us. With that said, Serdak was about to pick up the magic crystal from the table. Aphrodite was a little reluctant. So she held down the magic crystal with her hands. Each of them held one end of the magic crystal. And with a little force, this a piece of magic crystal that looked a bit old actually cracked. Chapter 523 Nobles Aphrodite stared innocently with her big eyes and quickly retracted her hand. The half-broken magic crystal fell on the table with a clatter. The crystal was carved into the shape of a key. And one end is now a crystal ring. The other end turned into a crystal straight plate with two serrations inside. And the new cracks were clearly visible. Okay. You can make up your mind on this matter. Anyway. I have handed over the magic crystal to you. It's up to you to decide. I suddenly remember that there seems to be something to do. So I'll take the first step. The succubus Aphrodite smiled at Soldak with a guilty look on her face. Turned around and walked out of the security center in Wall Village. Serdak rubbed his forehead. Hesitating whether to hand over the magic crystal that was broken in half. If you hand over this crack magic crystal, you may hand over the magic crystal and be interrogated by the magic union. Once the magicians who are investigating this matter know that the magic crystal was broken from their own hands, I'm afraid that it will be difficult to break away from the relationship by then. Think of this. Serdak reached out and put the two broken magic crystals into his magic waste bag, then stood up and walked out of the police station. During the recent period, the construction of the third level reservoir project at the reservoir construction site has been suspended. The cobalt slaves found some granite from a hill outside the village. They dug out some stone strips from the granite. And these stone strips will be used. Come and pave the village road in Wall Village. Wall Village is high in the north and low in the south. The village entrance is at the lowest point. And the village's water reservoir is located at the highest point in the village. Serdak has long wanted to build a road in Wall Village that can accommodate two four-wheeled carriages traveling in opposite directions. Now that he has cheap labor like cobalt slaves, he wants to lay this road with gentle slopes on both sides and the stone pavement of the drainage ditch. It becomes much easier. The cobalt slaves are now digging drainage ditches on various roads in Wall Village to prevent the village from having several temporary creeks when heavy rains come. Whenever it rains, the rapid water of such creeks will mix with a large amount of sand and gravel. It also caused considerable damage to Wall Village. Soldak has planned the streets of Wall Village. And the new roads in the village can allow at least two four-wheeled carriages to drive side by side. When Johnny was riding back to Paglo's Pass, he inadvertently glanced at the top of the mountain, which immediately made the hairs on his body stand up. There is a row of wooden crosses on the top of the mountain, and the corpses of rebel knights are tied to each wooden cross. A group of scavenging vultures circled over the wooden cross. As a messenger who specializes in delivering letters to nobles, Johnny is familiar with any place in the territory of Helensa City. He also knows that the desolate land is the most barren land in the entire Helensa City. He had never had such a creepy feeling when he passed by here before. The news that Wall Village was attacked by a squadron of rebel knights has spread in the city of Alanza. But after all, it is not as good as seeing it with your own eyes. As for the Knight of Serdek, he had mentioned it many times from a group of friends in the Helensa guard camp. Friends in each guard camp praised the Knight of Serdek. Johnny whipped the stallions but twice with a whip, urging it to pass through the mountain pass faster. Walking out of the mountain pass, you can see the Wall Village in the distance, which is very different from what you remember. An artificial canal was actually built downstream of the river bend, surrounding a piece of green farmland. If Johnny remembers correctly, here it was supposed to be a tidal flat, but now it actually looks more like a farm. Johnny rode his horse to the dead tree at the entrance of Wall Village. There was a stone tablet erected with three words clearly written on it, Wall Village. Johnny saw a work shed that could accommodate hundreds of people at the entrance of the village. When he approached Wall Village on horseback, he found a group of cobalt slaves paving the road in the village. Looking around, there was actually a high wall built upstream of the village. Under the guidance of the villagers, Johnny saw a tall knight standing in the village square, pointing at a drawing on the table, discussing something with a group of people, looking only at the valuable magic pattern structure on his body. Johnny recognized him as Soldak at a glance. Someone on Serdak's side also saw Johnny and looked at him curiously. Johnny rode over 
looked at Serdak and asked, Are you the knight of Serdak? Soldak took two steps forward from the crowd, nodded politely, and said, That's me. What do you want from me? Johnny jumped off the horse and looked carefully at the knight's badge on his chest before handing him a package, and said, I have a letter from you. He handed a letter with a noble emblem on the seal to Serdak. Soldak received the thick envelope, cut it open with a peeling knife, took out the letter inside and read it quickly. Only then did he know that the letter was from Marquis Bernard Christie. Dear Baron Soldak, don't be too surprised to see me calling you this. Yes, under the joint recommendation of the Lords of Bena Province headed by Marquis Luther, you have been personally conferred the title of Third Baron of the Green Empire by Emperor Charles the Great. The highest honor for a commoner is to become a knight. Of course, you are the exception. A knight who has the ability to perceive sacred magical elements and can practice sacred magic. Therefore, you are very lucky to become a magician noble. If you have time, please come to the Hallanza City Hall. You need to do it as soon as possible. Go through relevant formalities and discuss matters such as the barony. Bernard Christie. There is also the seal of the Marquis at the signature. Soldak felt that there were some other things in the paper bag. So he rummaged through it again and pulled out a Warcraft leather noble certificate. In addition, there was a barren badge mixed in the package. It is said that according to the past practice of allocating territories among magician nobles, this barren territory will be allocated to a small and barren plain. This small plain was not worth conquering by the knight's army. So some noble lords organized some cavalry to go there to clear up wasteland. After Soldak became a canonized knight, he owned a knight's territory in a deserted area on the outskirts of Holanza City. Now that he has become a third-class baron, the original territory will become larger. Serdak needs to go to the Knights of Alensa and redemarcate a territory. According to Marquis Christie, if Serdak doesn't mind that the land in the Badlands is barren and sparsely populated, he can set aside his barony in the land between the Badlands and the Paglos Mountains. Of course, if you are not satisfied with this land, you can also open up a small plain. What kind of barony you can obtain depends entirely on your own strength. The Green Empire promulgated the 3. 3. For inch territory distribution law to open up territories. Small lords with strength can lead their armies to the new territories and carve out a world for themselves. Chapter 524 Consideration Serdak was clearly past his adventurous years and had no interest in war. Wall Village is located on the edge of the deserted land outside Paglos Pass. Even so, it is not so peaceful. Serdak completely gave up the opportunity to choose a small plain to open up wasteland. Regarding the location of the territory, he decisively narrowed the choice to the city of Alanza. He didn't want to expand his territory. But Serdak still hesitated for a whole night about whether to choose the land in the suburbs of Alanza. He actually thought about whether he should take Funa to the land now that he had such a good opportunity. He carved out a piece of rich land near Earl Crone's manor and became his own barony. There are three main reasons why he hesitated. The first reason is that Serdak is currently working hard to build Wall Village. And all his family property is here. Once he abandons this place, the losses will be immeasurable. The second reason is that the knight leader on the other side of Pudu Mountain discovered a lot of sulfur mines. If he wants to continue to mine the sulfur mines in Pudu Mountain, he cannot go too far from here, and he must expand his territory as much as possible. Only in this way can we ensure that all the sulfur mines in Pudu Mountain are in our hands. The third reason is that neither the succubus Aphrodite nor Selena can withstand the investigation of the Magic Union Law Enforcement Team. They should stay away from Helensa City. So in the evening, Serdak asked old Sheila for advice. While Natasha was washing dishes in the kitchen, she took the time to make a pot of lemon tea for Soldak. Rita wiped the dining table carefully. The rag in her hand was a bit sticky and could not be cleaned no matter how hard she washed it. When I was poor and hungry, food didn't have so much grease. So I didn't have to worry about washing dishes and wiping the table. Those bowls and plates had to be rinsed with hot water at the end and the last bit of food left at the bottom of the bowl was swallowed together with the soup. Here, you can now eat meat every day. Those bowls and plates are always covered with a layer of oil, and even the tables are harder to clean than before. Soldak held the tea tray, stood at the door of old Sheila's room, and knocked gently on the door. Old Sheila's voice came from inside. Come in! When Soldak walked into the room, old Sheila was sitting up from the bed and motioned for him to sit down by the bed. Little Peter was sleeping soundly on the wooden bed opposite. What's wrong? Duck. Old Sheila asked, staring at his face. There is always so much in her eyes. Serdak wanted to give her a cup of tea. 
Old Sheila waved her hand and said, As we get older, if we drink tea at night, we will be even more unable to sleep. Serdak put down the teapot in his hand, and then said, Today, a messenger sent news that I can still get some territories. I am considering where to choose these territories. Old Sheila didn't expect Seldak to say this. So she just asked casually, Is there anything that is difficult for you to choose? Serdak expressed his thoughts. The land on the outskirts of Halanza City is richer and more valuable. But the desolate land is also very good. And some valuable sulfur mines have been discovered on the Pussy Mountain. If the mining continues, it can bring a lot of wealth. But it is too far from the city of Halenza. In the future, Little Peter will go to the Lenta War Academy. So? Old Sheila became much more awake after hearing Little Peter's name. Seldak continued, I think if there is a manor outside Helensa City, it would probably be a good choice. Old Sheila stared at Seldak and asked him, Do you want to hear my opinion? Yes, Seldak said. Old Sheila glanced at Seldak again, then closed her eyes, and the room became silent. After a while, Old Sheila opened her eyes and said, I'm used to living here. So I hope you can choose your territory here. I know I'm selfish. I think this way entirely because of Peter. I think the child may not be as good as you in his life. You are a magician noble. The title of noble cannot be passed down. Once you are old and gone, these lands will be taken back by the Green Empire. Those fertile lands, if it is Pudu Mountain, the situation may be different. It is a place that no one wants. No one is fighting to occupy it. Maybe little Peter can live a good life a little longer. If it wasn't about little Peter, old Sheila would rarely talk to Soldak so much. Then I understand. After saying this, Soldak stood up and walked out of old Sheila's room with a teapot in hand. Once the matter was settled, Soldak felt a lot more relaxed, and he began to think about how to re-establish boundary markers around Pussy Mountain. Old Sheila looked at Soldak's leading figure and gave little Peter a loving look. The changes in Wall Village have been rapid but it still seems to be unable to keep up with Serdak's pace. Little Peter was lying on the bed opposite, breathing evenly, his young face full of the beauty of tomorrow. Johnny the messenger didn't sleep well last night. He sat up from the bed and stretched, and all the joints in his body made a click-click sound. He rubbed his sore neck with his hands and jumped out of bed with bare feet. The floor was actually covered with a flat layer of gray volcanic rock. There was no soft velvet blanket, which he could understand but there was not even a fine-grained oak floor. It's a bit unreasonable. The ground was a little cold and uncomfortable to step on, so he quickly put his boots on his feet. After searching around the room, there was not even a mirror except for a basin of water in the corner. He walked to the water basin and saw the haggard face floating in the water basin, with bags under his eyes and black circles like a clown in a circus. Wall Village looks pretty good from the outside, but there are two different feelings when you move in. The houses in the village are still adobe houses. And the beds are also hard wooden beds. They just put a bit of a scratchy reed mat on the bed. Lying on the bed is not as comfortable as sleeping in a tent. But in order to create a feeling of being an excellent person, messenger, Johnny could only grit his teeth and live in this house. What displeased him the most was that the village women here actually rejected him last night. Even though he took out a reward of five silver coins from his arms and gave them to them. Those village women actually looked disgusted and walked away without looking back. The conditions here are so difficult. I didn't expect Baron Soldak to be born in such a mountain village. Johnny opened the door and walked into the yard. He happened to see a graceful woman walking in from the outside holding a basket of fruits and wheat cakes. There was a faint smile on her delicate face. Especially those green eyes. His eyes actually have an indescribable charm. As if there are hundreds of thousands of stars hidden in them. She was wearing a long skirt with a waist, and her slender waist and straight and slender thighs made her look half a head taller than Johnny. Even in the city of Valenza, such a tasteful woman is rare to see. Johnny stared at the woman's face infatuatedly, his eyes a little unmoved. But the woman did not say H, low to Johnny, but turned back and said with a smile, Duck, the messenger is awake. Johnny suddenly woke up when he heard Soldak's name. The woman took out a stack of wheat cakes, a clay pot of broth, and a plate of lantern fruits from the basket, and said to Soldak, I'm going to the children's home. If you come to my place for dinner at night, you must tell me in advance. One sound. After saying that, the woman kissed Soldak on the face before walking out of the yard with her long skirt in hand. Soldak walked into the courtyard and asked Johnny, Johnny Messenger, are you going back to Alanza City today? 
Johnny quickly stood up straight and said, Yes, Baron Soldak. The Marquis is still waiting for your reply. Do you want me to bring a message to the city for you? Soldak took out a letter from his arms and handed it to Johnny, and then said to Johnny, Please help me forward this letter to Lord Bernard Christie. Johnny glanced at the envelope and saw that the seal had been coated with glue. Then he raised his head and asked Soldak, Have you decided where to choose your territory? As far as I know, few people can do this to you. You can only choose your own barony. Soldak nodded to Johnny and said, I plan to choose the barren territory in the Pussy Mountain area deep in the desolate land. If possible, I would like to expand slightly to the desolate land area on the basis of the original Knight territory. I will place the wall village here let's deal with the matter and visit Marquis Bernard in person in three days. Johnny's eyes were dull. He predicted several answers in his mind, but he never expected that Cernak would choose this way. Doesn't he know how many people in Helensa City are eyeing Phonic Manor and Hull Manor? Doesn't he know that as long as he owns either of these two manors? He has a ticket to the upper aristocratic circle of Helensa City? Johnny found that he didn't know what to say. Originally, no matter what decision Soldak made, he had to say some words of congratulations. But now, the rhetoric I prepared was actually useless. Johnny could only say cryptically, Baron Soldak, there are still a few days left anyway. You might as well think about it again. If you don't plan to choose a small plane for your territory, there is now a large area of vacant land around Earl Phonix Manor. Hoyle Manor there are some good options nearby. And anywhere is better than the middle of nowhere. Serdak stopped at the door of the room and said, Johnny Messenger, I will seriously consider your suggestion. After watching Soldak leave, John took out a silk handkerchief and carefully wiped the sweat on his forehead. I don't know why, but as long as Serdak stands next to him, it seems that the air around him is freezing. Johnny's mission of delivering the letter was successfully completed. He didn't care whether he could make it back to Helensa City that night and left Wall Village quickly. Affected by the southeast monsoon of the endless sea, after entering July, the deserted land has completely entered the rainy season. The plants here start to grow wildly during the season, and you can see a hint of green everywhere. There are no steep mountains on this side of the deserted land, only some undulating slopes at most. Standing on the top of the cliff in the deserted land, you can see the scenery more than 10 kilometers away at a glance. After a spring's management of the river bend and swamps in front of Wall Village, large tracts of tidal flats have turned into fertile farmland. The rainwater flowing down the hillside merges into the canal. This artificial canal is like a shining necklace, half a circle around the swamp. The old village chief only stayed at home for a month before he stood on the embankment of the artificial canal with a cane. What he was most worried about was that there would be several heavy rains in succession. The rainwater would exceed the flow of the artificial canal, and the excess rainwater would overflow the embankment and rush into the village just now. A fertile field where crops are planted. The fertile farmland transformed from this tidal flat is more fertile than imagined, and any seeds that grow will be larger than the plants in the fields in the village. The old village chief was wearing a linen coat and holding a cane. He pointed to the hundreds of acres of fields surrounded by this dike, and said to Serdak beside him, It won't take long before this field will be covered with tomatoes. When talking about this land, the old village chief's eyes were full of smiles. He said to Soldak, In the past, these vegetables were rarely grown in our village. It's not that we didn't like to eat these vegetables. There was too little land that could be cultivated in the village. The wheat that was grown on that land was not even enough to eat. What's more, you can't grow these vegetables that can't be stored until winter. I prefer pumpkins to tomatoes which can be stored for a long time in the winter if they are put in the cellar. The old village chief stood on the embankment next to the canal, pointed to the depths of the swamp and said, Duck, I think we can lengthen this artificial canal a little longer, if we can include the swamp over there. The swamp in front of us has now become a swamp, with reeds and red thatch almost covering the entire water surface. It is relatively easy to develop the tidal flats outside the village, because the terrain of the tidal flats is relatively high. As long as artificial ditches are dug to intercept and divert the rainwater flowing down the surrounding hillsides, a piece of fertile land can be obtained. But the swamps are all low-lying land. If you want to drain the rainwater from the swamps, the artificial ditches you need to dig will be deeper, and the amount of work will be doubled. Serdak has no plans for this yet. The old village chief only had the idea of transforming the swamp due to a sudden impulse. Serdak took a step forward, bent down and picked up a piece of rock shale from the embankment and threw it out. The rock shale, he quickly selected, stirred up dozens of water splashes on the river. He straightened up and patted the soil on his hands. Said, 
Uncle Bright. There is news from Alensa City. What's the good news? Is there a big order for sulfur mine from the trading company? The old village chief asked casually. I was granted the title of Baron of Alanza City by His Majesty Charles. Soldak said calmly. The old village chief's hand holding the cane shook violently. And he looked at Soldak in astonishment. You said you became a noble? Yes. Soldak nodded and smiled faintly at the old village chief. It is said that because of the achievements of the Maka Plain, Marquis Luther of Bena City jointly submitted the letter to His Majesty Charles in the name of the lords of Bena Province. I applied, and after waiting for more than two months, the news came here that I had been granted the title of baronet. The old village chief looked at Soldak again and asked him, The Marquis Luther and other lords recommended you to become a baron. Does he want to turn you into his direct descendant? Did he have any hints to you? For example, did he ask you to join his army? I don't know. Probably not. Soldak shook his head. He didn't know exactly what Marquis Luther wanted. He only said, I have only met Marquis Luther a few times. And the words we talked to were all different. I can count them all on one hand. And since the war on the Maka Plain ended, there has been no news there. Do you think I should take the initiative to visit? The old village chief asked again. Didn't he let you join his army? Maybe you need to do something else. Soldak shook his head again. Chapter 525 returned to the city. Gerald, the head of the law enforcement group of the Magic Union of Alinsa City, was sitting in the conference hall. A group of young magicians from the law enforcement group under his command were sitting casually around the round table, looking like they were holding a symposium. There are several cups of tea and several pages of documents and manuscripts on the table. There are three wooden trays in the middle of the round table. One of the trays contains a blood-stained magic robe. The other wooden tray contains a wand. The middle wooden tray there is a magic waste bag inside. These magic items are the stolen goods that Lance brought back from Wall Village. Hearing that the guard camp knight Soldak had killed the Dark Moon Gate magician Gurdon in Wall Village, the Hellanza Magic Union Law Enforcement Group immediately dispatched Lance Magician to Wall Village and brought him to Wall Village. Gordon took back the magic items with him, claiming that he was looking for clues to the Dark Moon Gate from these magic items. Everyone knows that a magician's personal package is like a treasure, and every magic item is very valuable. There was some noise in the room, and the young magicians were sitting around the round table talking. Someone stood up leaned forward, reached out and opened the magic pocket, and rummaged with curiosity. Is this the magic pocket of Magician Gelden? But when he found that the magic pocket was empty, he withdrew his hand. A magician next to him was flipping through the manuscript on the table. After hearing what he said, he asked, The electric magician who defected from the magic union for twelve years? The magician who rummaged through the bag sat back in his seat and said, That's the one. Magician Gurdon is very famous in the circle of magicians, not because of his high level or strength, but because he caused quite a stir when he defected from the magic guild in the imperial capital. Before defecting, Magician Gurdon was the captain of a wanted team of the Imperial City Magic Union Law Enforcement Corps, like many outstanding magician elites. After graduating from the Royal Academy of Magic with honors, Magician Gurdon was competed by various forces in the empire. In the end, the Imperial City Magic Union Law Enforcement Corps offered more generous terms, winning the joining of Magician Gurdon. This electric magician had been working conscientiously for the law enforcement group before defecting to the Magic Union. After completing a mission, the Magician Gurdon returned home and found that his wife was actually having an affair with his teacher. In a rage, he killed the two of them directly on the bed. In addition, he also killed the teacher in one breath. The several magic assistants around him were also involved in a major case in the imperial capital at that time. No matter where you go, scandals always seem to be the most talked about thing. The other magicians at the conference table immediately became energetic. One of them, a magician with acne on his face, said to the rummaging magician, I heard that the Imperial City Magic Union sent a team of elite magicians to hunt him down everywhere. Some hunters the demon also had a wanted warrant for him and I was still in my third year at the Bay Magic Academy in Pales Tina Province. The rummaging magician reached out and touched the bloody magic robe again, curled his lips, and said with a look of disdain, The news of his death was a bit sudden, and he died in an unknown village. The person who killed him was actually a group of knights from the guard camp. It felt like a joke. When did our knights from the Helensa guard camp become like constructors? Are you like a knight? He casually picked up a catalog of magic pocket items on the table, and read it carefully. Frowning, he said, Didn't the Bena Province Magic Guild say that the magic crystal is in the hands of the magician Gurdon? 
but it's not in the magic pocket. Only then did everyone know what he was looking for. The magicians around the conference table were silent. When the pimple-faced magician saw no one speaking, he raised his head and said, Could it be that the magic crystal is not on him at all? Those reports are just smoke bombs. And the direction of our investigation is wrong at all? A magician opposite continued. It's also possible that he hid it or destroyed the magic crystal before he died. The rummaging magician then said, Of course, it cannot be ruled out that it was obtained by those guard camp knights. Especially the group of guard camp knights who fought in Wall Village. I think it is necessary to investigate. The magicians in the law enforcement group were suspicious of Serdak, which made Lance, who was sitting next to the magician Gerald, very unhappy. Those doubts about Serdak were ultimately pointed at him in a very subtle way. He didn't want to say anything just now, and was preparing to announce the magical items carried by the magician of Curtin at the beginning of the meeting. These topics discussed before the meeting started made him lose his previous good mood. Just when he was about to retaliate, Magician Gerald patted his hand gently, signaling him to calm down. Magician Gerald then closed the magic notebook in his hand, then raised his head and looked at a group of unruly magician elites under his command, and only said, Okay, let's get started. Before the meeting starts, I would also like to remind you not to make any assumptions without conclusive evidence. Do you think we don't have enough conflicts with the guard camp? The rummaging magician rushed to say, Sir Gerald, we have just analyzed that the item is likely to be in the hands of the knights in the guard camp. Gerald's face darkened, and he shouted to him, That's enough. You have previously analyzed that it is impossible for the magician Gurdon to appear in Helensa City, and Samoa from the Black Magic Hermitage must die. But what happened later? How about it? Why did our Magic Guild law enforcement group start to act like those astrologers? Relying on divination and guessing? After magician Gerald said this, the rummaging magician's face turned blue and red. Then Magician Gerald ordered Lance next to him. Inform the Magic Guild of Bena Province that Magician Gurdon died in Helensa City. Lance agreed. Okay, Lord Gerald. After reading the file handed over by Carl Casement, Captain Sauron shook his head repeatedly and asked him accusingly, How on earth did you become the squadron leader? Hundreds of rebel knights sneaked into the territory of Aranza, and the entire emergency rescue squadron did not find any clues. It was clear that the Constantinople guard camp had passed on conclusive information before. You still haven't found any clues. So you have to wait for this group of rebels to gather together and attack a village before you take action? Carl sat in Captain Sauron's office and complained. Not every village happens to have a Serdek. What can I do if those rebels break into pieces and sneak into the city of Alinsa? They have gathered in Oak Ridge and can attack any village. How can we stop them? Live? Sauron looked up and glared at him. Carl immediately stood up straight and said loudly in front of Captain Sauron, I will monitor the situation outside Helensa's city more closely. Captain Sauron nodded and asked, Has the location of Magician Gurdon been found in Helensa city? Yes. Carl replied, Where? Sauron didn't expect that Carl would actually gain something. He thought that Carl would be so beaten down by Serdak that he would lose motivation in everything he did. Carl leaned into Captain Sauron's ear and whispered, Marquis Manor. Captain Sauron's expression changed and he asked, Have you found any useful clues? We found the magician of Dahl, who had been missing for two weeks in the dungeon of Marquis Manor. Carl said, Oh, have you figured out what the relationship between this Dale magician and those northern rebels is? Carl quickly opened a piece of parchment that he carried with him and said, I found out that this Daler magician once worked for an old noble family in Sloyd province. But just five years ago, this noble family the wealthy family was actually involved in a rebellion. Many nobles in the entire Sloik province were implicated in this incident. Shortly after that incident, Jing Yu Ailey succeeded the Duke of Sloik province and became green. She is currently the only female Grand Duke in the empire. After taking office, Grand Duke Jing Yu deployed her iron-blooded tactics and led the northern army to fight head-on against the ice and snow tundra barbarians. She has now recovered a large area of land on the north bank of the Bin Ma River. Rumors say that she is a member of the Green Empire, the most ferocious Grand Duke in the North within 200 years. This parchment is covered with briefings from various magic newspapers, and there are also lines of delicate and beautiful text on the briefings. The aristocratic family that Magician Dalo worked for was directly destroyed, but it seems that the White Elephant Trading Company is a branch of this old aristocracy, and these rebels rushed to Aranza City to seek funding from the White Elephant Trading Company. Carl read what's on the parchment. Captain Sauron grabbed the parchment and looked at it seriously. While watching, he said, 
I also heard about the rebellion in the north. My legion was preparing to reinforce the north. At that time, the magic airship was almost crowded at the airport. Just the day before boarding, the higher-ups ordered all reinforcements returned to their respective stations. The northern border is the northern gate of the Green Empire. It has always been guarded by the North Wind Legion on the south bank of the Galloping Horse River. Those rebels are said to be knights from the Sloyd City Guard Camp and the Intelligence Agency. The room became quiet. Captain Sauron and Carl looked at each other. They couldn't understand. How could a guard battalion of knights have the courage to break out a coup? What's the situation over there in Serdek? Captain Sauron asked again. Some villagers died in Wall Village. But the 50 rebel knights were also hanging neatly at Paglo's Pass. It is said that the battle was fierce. His half-elf shot more than half of them by himself. Rebel. Carl said with some envy. He also wanted to have one or two such attractive and capable subordinates. Captain Sauron waved his hand to Carl and said, Let Suldak report the battle damage. In such a battle, there is no reason why the armor and weapons will not be damaged. Just go and talk to Wing Olin. Actually, I have already brought back the damaged weapons. Carl chuckled and said to Captain Sauron, In mid-July, the mountain city officially enters the hot summer. The day Serdak rushed back to Alensa City, he returned to the guard camp to report. Walking into the gate of the guard camp, you can feel the enthusiasm of the knights in the guard camp. Even some squadron leaders from other brigades came to say H, low to him, when they heard that Suldak had returned to the guard camp to report on his duties. Captain Sauron asked in detail how the rebel knights attacked the village, and expressed that he would write down a lot of things for Serdak in his credit book. Ms. Wingolin, who managed the guard camp warehouse, took the initiative to wait at the door of the main building of the guard camp and notified Suldak to pick up new weapons from the logistics department. This kind of treatment made other knights particularly jealous. Serdak's broken dwarf chain shield was handed back to the logistics department. Ms. Wingdolin took out a round shield from the arsenal. The entire round shield was made of magic black iron. Although it was not a piece of magic. It is armor. But it is very heavy to buy. The surface of the shield is drawn with a palm. And there is an eye in the palm. The shield is inlaid with golden patterns. It is said that the appearance of this shield is imitated from the epic shield of Moses' blessing eye. Ms. Wingolan handed the shield to Serdak and at the same time took out a battle longbow from the arsenal. Although this bow did not fit Samira's fighting style, it was a rare one. The battle longbow is all green, and the back of the bow is polished like a sharp blade, which can fight the enemy in close combat. According to Ms. Wingdolin, this battle longbow is also an imitation of the epic longbow painting of Withering. But it is said that this imitation was also made by a famous craftsman. After leaving the guard camp, Serdak went to the underground trading market of Aranza City and sold some of the salamander meat. Someone saw Serdak selling salamander meat and offered to buy Sir at a high price. Due to the salamander leather in Dark's hands, Serdak also sold two salamander skins. Serdak sold nearly 70 gold coins for the fresh salamander meat alone. In addition, there are two pieces of precious salamander leather. The complete salamander leather was sold for nearly 100 gold. The other salamander leather was seriously damaged and only sold for 40 gold. It can be seen that hunting Warcraft is a very profitable thing. Otherwise, there would not be so many adventure groups flocking to it and venturing into the mountains and swamps all day long. The sale of these Warcraft materials alone earned Serdak more than 200 gold coins. This time, in addition to Warcraft materials, three carloads of sulfur or were also transported from Wall Village. This time, Serdak did not see Magician Daler at White Elephant Trading Company. He heard that Magician Daler was ill. That night, Soldak stayed at the hotel next to the Garden Square. The hotel proprietress stood at the bar and greeted him familiarly. Soldak chose the quieter attic on the top floor of the hotel. When the proprietress handed him the room key, she also went behind the back of the hotel owner and gave it to Sue for free. Erdak presented a plate of biscuits and a pot of honey tea. The proprietress carrying the biscuits and honey tea climbed up the wooden stairs in front of Serdak, her round and plump buttocks swaying in front of Serdak's eyes. Soldak declined the kind invitation from the landlady. Lying on the wooden bed next to the attic, Soldak was thinking about how to tactfully express his desire for the land around Pussy Mountain when he went to the city hall to meet Marquis Bernard tomorrow. Chapter 526 Dawn of Alanza City In the hottest period of summer, even a wisp of breeze blowing in the face is warm. Only during the short period of time when dawn and night alternate can you feel a sense of coolness in the mountain city. At this time, people were still immersed in sleep. 
Only some night watchmen could be seen on the street extinguishing the streetlights and then working with horse-drawn carriages to transport the city's domestic garbage to the outside of the city. Those on park benches and street bushes, the homeless people along the low walls were chased away by the vigilantes. And these urban facilities no longer belong to them during the day. The night watchman completes the last bits of work, ending a hard day's work before the first rays of sunlight shine over the city. In the early morning, the city streets become clean and tidy. The first people to get up are always the street vendors serving breakfast. They quickly occupied every street corner in the city and silently prepared delicious food in the morning light. In the city of Aranza, scones and oatmeal are always the main themes on the citizens' morning tables. Of course, some people are willing to try some vegetable soup, fried steak, fried fish and mixed chips. When summer comes, there will also be a variety of fresh jam spread on crispy scones, which is considered the most popular breakfast in Alinsa City. This summer, a new type of food quietly landed in Alinsa City. In the beginning, it was circulated among the carriage drivers in the carriage shop. It was a new type of flour that was very white and delicate. Coachmen called it starch. They boiled the starch into a paste in an iron pot and cooled it into a cold cake. This cold cake was originally fried in a pan until browned and eaten. The creative Halanza people redefined this food. They directly cut the cold cake into thin slices and topped it with sweet and sour jam. This way of eating became popular in the city. Popular. It's just that the new type of white and delicate flour is not easy to buy and can only be purchased occasionally on the free market. Serdak got up from the bed, wearing only a pair of linen shorts, and walked to the terrace next to the attic with his upper body naked. He raised his hands and stretched in front of the rising sun. His whole body was covered with extremely horrific burns. Scars. These scars almost cover the whole body. And the fire in the fragments of memory seems to have taken away the most important thing from him. Serdek rubbed his head, looked down at his belly with an extra layer of fat, turned around and took out the blood-red crescent and the brand new buckler from the wall, stood on the terrace in a defensive posture, and began to repeat basic movements of parrying and slashing while seated. This level of practice won't improve strength or fitness, but it will enhance body memory. During his stay in Wall Village, he neglected his morning exercises, and his body had begun to gain excess fat. However, Serdak found that these scars did not seem terrible in the eyes of others. Many veterans who came off the battlefield where there are scars all over his body. But the only ones on his body are some burns. Occasionally, when Natasha hugged him from behind, she put her face against his back and asked him about the battle. Serdak always replied calmly. I forgot. Natasha thought that Serdak didn't want to recall that nightmare experience. But she didn't know that Serdak had really forgotten it. Sweating profusely, feeling that every group of muscles in the body was completely activated, and the fat all over his body began to burn. Serdak stopped. He held the terrace with both hands and looked out to the city. Alensa City is a mountain city. All buildings are built on the hillside. They are low in the south and high in the north. Therefore, as long as you get on the roof, you can get an extremely broad view. From this hotel in the Garden Square, you can see the oak trees all over the mountains. The city of Alanza is the most beautiful in this season and it is usually cloudy and rainy, so it is difficult to have such good weather. Mrs. Cohen, the proprietress of the hotel, was wearing a thin nightgown and carrying a plate of green wild fruits on the terrace. The material of the nightgown could not cover her breasts. A pair of proud car lights in front of her. Her eyes were a little provocative and fell on sewer. Serdak generously took the fruit plate from Dak's body, turned around and said H, low to Cohen, the hotel owner who was cutting alfalfa next to the stables and the inner courtyard and raised the fruit plate in his hand. Mrs. Cohen rolled her eyes at Soldak, raised her white pointed chin, turned around and left the attic terrace, facing the boss's wife who always made all kinds of teasing. Soldak felt that it was probably because his attitude was not firm enough. On the terrace on the top floor, Serdak began to think about whether to change to a hotel next time he came to Alinsa City. But the only place he was most familiar with in Alinsa City, apart from the night academy and the guard camp, was this hotel. He is the kind of person who likes to be nostalgic. He really doesn't want to change this comfortable hotel if he doesn't have to. Serdak entered the sea of spiritual consciousness, mobilized the sacred aura in his body, and was about to light up more nodes in his waist and abdomen, but encountered obstacles. If his body is compared to the universe, below the second abdominal muscle is the lower half of the universe, where all the nodes are not lit. Countless lit nodes on the upper body of the body are shining brightly among the stars in the sea of spiritual consciousness. 
But this extremely bright sea of stars seems to be only half now. His lower body cannot light up any star in any case. And the two spaces seem to be distinct. There is a dividing line. In that space, everything seemed to be turned upside down. In that half of the void spiritual sea, Sirdak's consciousness could roam freely. But everywhere was dark and chaotic. And his consciousness wandered. It took a long time to find a dark star in a secluded corner. It was a dark purple node. If it were not close, the star seemed to be completely integrated into the darkness. Just as he was approaching the dark star, countless emotions of fear, hatred, and destruction that grew in his heart were quickly absorbed by the dark star. Countless scenes of killing on the battlefield flashed through Serdak's mind instantly. Just like it's a terrifying slideshow. The sea of spiritual consciousness kept echoing, Tassimat, 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 when everything outside the dark star turned dark purple. The star closest to the dark star emitted a lavender light in the endless darkness. Serdak had a look of astonishment on his face. He had no idea what was going on with his spiritual consciousness. The aura training methods he learned in the Junior Knight Academy were completely inapplicable to him. Serdak felt as if his training was like entering a certain place. A bottleneck. He woke up from meditation and found that there was no change in his body. So he breathed a sigh of relief. After taking a cold shower and eating a simple breakfast, Soldak left the hotel on horseback and headed to the Hellanza City Hall. This time when they came to Alinsa City, Neither Andrew nor Samira accompanied them. The main reason is that Serdak is worried that Wall Village will suffer another attack like that more than half a month ago. After all, until now, the rebel knights who sneaked into the territory of Halansa City have not been cleared away. For this matter, Halansa the Lanza Guard Battalion has sent out ten knight squadrons one after another. But those rebels are used to life in the mountains and forests. At the same time, they are more alert and better at hiding than the knights in the guard camp. Once encountered in the mountains, the guard camp had a large number of people, and the rebel knights took the guard camp knights in circles in the mountains. When the number of guards in the camp was small, they did not dare to get too close to the rebels. In order to ensure the safety of Wall Village, Serdak asked Andrew, Samira, Gulitam, and Aphrodite to stay in the village, and rush to the city of Helanza alone. The Helanza city hall and the guard camp are not far apart. The pace of life of residents here is relatively slow and many people are reluctant to get up early. When Soldak came to the door of the city hall, he saw many city hall staff hurriedly coming from all directions. Some people even carried bulging breakfast bags. When a group of people said H, Lo, they actually if we are not too busy with work after the invitation, we can have morning tea together. Seeing Soldak waiting outside early, the guard at the door told him tactfully that he could go to the cafe opposite to sit for a while. The normal office hours here are basically afternoon because those people have to work in at breakfast during morning work time. Soldak shook his head and said that he had made an appointment with someone and wanted to wait at the door for a while. Seeing that Serdak insisted on doing this, the guard ignored him. A gorgeous silver-encrusted carriage drove out of Christie's castle and arrived at the city hall not long after. Everyone who saw this carriage, whether they were nobles or commoners, took the initiative to give way to this gorgeous carriage. The carriage stopped at the door of the city hall. The coachman jumped down from the driver's seat and took the initiative to open the door. A young assistant walked out of the carriage. Then Soldak saw the figure of Marquis Bernard Christie. Wearing an exquisite aristocratic dress, he stepped out of the carriage, stood beside the carriage and paused for a moment, then climbed the steps and walked towards the door of the city hall. When passing the main entrance of the city hall, the assistant beside him quietly took a step forward, approached Marquis Bernard and whispered, My lord, that is Baron Soldak. Marquis Bernard Christie was slightly startled. He raised his head and looked towards the door of the city hall. He saw a construct knight standing quietly at the door. Bernard thought he looked familiar and couldn't remember where he saw him for a moment. Pass. Soldak was able to enter the side of Marquis Bernard Christie entirely because of the strong recommendation of Marquis Luther and a group of lords, who made an exception for His Majesty Charles to confer the title of Baron Soldak. Common people are promoted to nobles. Generally speaking, only magicians can enjoy such rights. Warriors who awaken their sense of magic along the way are rare, but not impossible. Demon swordsmen and demon archers often appear in elite battle groups. Because they have a keen sense of magic, they have an innate advantage in fighting. Generally speaking, their combat power is much stronger than that of ordinary warriors. But these alone do not enable them to obtain the title of nobility. Soldak was wearing a set of earth shield magic pattern structure and stood upright at the door of the city hall. Just looking at his piercing eyes as blue as lake water, 
Marquis Bernard suddenly felt good about him. He strode over and stood in front of Serdak, with a friendly smile on his face. He asked him in a gentle tone, Are you Serdak? Of course Soldak knew Marquis Bernard. The first time he met Marquis Bernard was at the dance invited by Darcy Christie. He stood up, performed a night salute to Marquis Bernard, looked straight ahead, and said word by word, Yes, Marquis Bernard. Marquis Bernard took Soldak into the office on the third floor of the city hall. A female secretary brought prepared refreshments and placed them on the tea table in the rest area. As soon as Soldak entered the office, Marquis Bernard asked him to walk to the sand table and continued. Your outstanding performance in the war on the Maka Plain has been transmitted to the Green Imperial Capital in the form of a written report. In front of His Majesty Charles, Marquis Luther's joint recommendation made you a nobleman. His Majesty Charles canonized you as a third-class baron. You must have known this news in advance. The main reason for calling you to Helensa City this time is look into the barony thing. The assistant handed a thin stick to the Marquis Bernard. Marquis Bernard pointed to a mountain range on the southern outskirts of Helensa Mountain City and said to Serdek, I heard that you don't want the territory on the small plain. So with my authority and ability, I can only let you stay in Helensa. We have chosen a territory on the outskirts of the city. This manor was once the private territory of Earl Hoyle. Since Earl Hoyle died in the accident last summer, most of his property is now inherited by his daughter. This farm is are you interested in taking over the land divided by Hull Manor? Although I don't know what concerns you have. I promise that there will be no trouble taking over this part of the land. Marquis Bernard Christie added another sentence. Grenfell Manor and Forneck Manor are also good lands. I heard Johnny say that you want to choose the baronial land in the deserted land because you want to expand the original territory of the Knights' territory. In my opinion, it seems that this move is unreasonable. The desolate land is remote, and the land is barren. If you want to operate it, you need to invest huge manpower and material resources. It is far less affordable than the existing manor in the suburbs of Helensa City. Comfortable. Marquis Bernard pointed to the two manor areas on the sand table with a stick and suggested to Soldak. Serdak picked up a small red flag from a wooden box next to the sand table, turned it to the northwest corner of the sand table, leaned over and planted the small flag on the pustule mountain deep in the deserted land. Smiling at Bernard the Marquis said, Your Majesty, if possible, I would like to get a territory here. Bernard Christie looked at Soldak with suspicion, unable to understand why he chose this way. Soldak explained to Bernard, Your Majesty the Marquis, I discovered a sulfur mine in this area. In order to ensure the ownership of this sulfur mine, I want to select the Baron here. Okay, as long as you think about it seriously. Seeing that Soldak insisted on this, Marquis Bernard nodded in agreement. Chapter 527 Defense Chief Serdak used a red flag to circle his territory on the sand table. The land area that a baron can own is about three times that of a knight. In addition to occupying the entire Pussy Mountain, a section of the southern foothills of the Paglos Mountains is also completely included in his territory. In addition, a large circle of desolate land around Pussy Mountain can also be regarded as Serdak's territory. It is said that there are still some people in the territory to which Serdak belongs. But just looking at the current conditions of the territory, the sky is filled with volcanic ash. There are no rivers and lakes in the territory. And even the underground rivers are filled with magma, which is not suitable for humans at all. Survive. Marquis Bernard Christie simply couldn't understand that he would give up the best manor on the outskirts of Alenza just for a sulfur mine that was not very easy to mine. This kind of idea may only be thought of by people who live in a deserted land all year round. He felt that Serdak must have a deep attachment and love for his hometown to make such a choice. Marquis Bernard Christie turned to the assistant behind him and said, Gallop, wait until you go to the knights and send them a copy of the information about the area occupied by Baron Soldak. When the assistant saw Marquis Bernard Christie click on a map that clearly marked the territorial area and stamp his seal, he immediately stepped forward to take the map and agreed. Yes, Lord Marquis. Marquis Bernard stood next to the sand table, pointed at the southernmost point of the Paglos Mountains with a thin stick, and said to Soldak, To be honest, I have been expecting someone to help me guard the gate to the northwest of Alenza. Here, it is located deep in the barren land, and at the southernmost point of the Paglos Mountains. Although it seems peaceful in the past few years, there have been incidents of monsters attacking the village in the past. He raised his head and glanced at Serdak. Seeing that his face was calm, he was obviously not worried about the monsters in the mountains of Paglos. He added, Although the conditions over there are a little more difficult, they are not without benefits. 
If you are willing the general is the only noble in this area who has chosen to hold the territory here. I hope you can take on the defense responsibilities of that area. Soldak did not expect that Marquis Bernard Christie would say this. He had always believed that the security and defense of Aranza City were the responsibility of the Guard Battalion and the City Defense Department. He did not expect that the local nobles would also be responsible for the defense of the region. Looking back, he realized that since he was the only noble in this area, he had the power to govern here. This kind of power is obviously not comparable to that of the security officer of the security camp. Speaking of it, he can be regarded as a small lord in this area. Although he is only a third-class baron, there are no other nobles in this area. Marquis Bernard Christie was worried that Serdak would not agree. So he said to him, Of course, I will allocate a certain amount of money from the defense budget of Halinsa to help you build up the defense there. Seeing that Soldak did not immediately agree, Marquis Bernard couldn't help but ask Soldak, Baron Soldak, are you willing to accept this appointment from the city hall? This is regarded as the formal appointment of Serdak as the local defense chief. Serdak thought that he was the police officer of the guard camp stationed in the deserted land, and it would be no big deal to accept the appointment from the city hall. He was accepting the appointment from two departments, but he was doing the same thing. Serdak stood up straight raised his chest and said solemnly, As the sheriff of the desolate land outside the Paglos Pass of the Helanza Guard Camp, it is my duty to guard the deserted land outside the Paglos Pass. Lord Marquis. Very well. Baron Soldak. Marquis Bernard nodded and finally said with a gentle smile on his face. He walked back to his desk, took out a piece of parchment from the table, scrawled a line of words on it with a quill, stamped it with a seal, and put the parchment on it. He handed the paper to Soldak and said, Defending the city of Helensa is the responsibility of every noble in Helensa. The city hall will have certain support for nobles who have made certain contributions. Baron Serdak, you now have the power to recruit retinues and private armies. However, the number of private troops cannot exceed one squadron. After speaking, he handed the parchment in his hand to Serdak. The writing on the parchment page was very sloppy. Apart from the number 500, Serdak couldn't understand what else was written on it. Marquis Bernard Christie said to the assistant next to him, Gallop, later you will take Baron Soldak to the munitions office to collect defense funds. It turned out to be a check. Serdak thought as he held the scrawl parchment. Marquis Bernard Christie said to Soldak, How to use this part of the funds is up to you. Although there are no strict restrictions, you are required to submit a financial statement every quarter to let the financial department supervision know that you will where the money is spent. Yes. Lord Marquis, Soldak replied immediately. Besides, if you encounter any difficult to solve problems, you can send someone to deliver a message to me. Marquis Bernard reached out and patted Soldak on the shoulder and said to him kindly. Next, at the suggestion of Gallup's assistant, Soldak bid farewell to Marquis Bernard. Marquis Bernard Christie asked Gallup's assistant to take Soldak to the finance department of the city hall and successfully received 500 gold coins in defense funds from there. The bag of gold coins was heavy in his hand. Assistant Gallup then told Serdak that as the defense chief of the desolate land and Paglos Mountains, Serdak had the right to purchase some affordable materials from the munitions department. Weapons and armor equipment are at least 20% cheaper than those on the outside market. Soldak came out of the city hall. There are many pedestrians coming and going on the long stone steps in front of the city hall. The square in front is also very lively. Many citizens are sitting on benches under the shade of trees. A group of children are running and playing around the fountain pool in the square. A familiar figure happened to pass through the crowd and came toward Soldak. She lowered her head, wore a set of tight crystal lion leather armor, and a pair of high-heeled long leather boots with hanging on her waist, an exquisite sword, and the gorgeous red hair is flying in the wind. She was strong and strong, walking on the long steps with her long legs, and without even looking at how hard she exerted herself, she passed the crowd around her. With her red lips and blue eyes, Soldak could spot Darcy Christie from the crowd at a glance. As if sensing Soldak's gaze, Darcy Christie suddenly raised her head and looked at Soldak at the top of the steps in surprise, not expecting to meet Soldak here at all. Her face was a little pale, her spirit was a little tired, and her eyeshadow was a little heavy. She hesitated before walking up, standing in front of Soldak, and raised her proud pointed chin. Long time no see, Soldak. Darcy took the initiative to greet Serdak. Ha! Huh? Long time no see. Darcy! Soldak smiled at her and asked. How are you doing lately? They haven't seen each other for half a year. 
and there seems to be a lot of distance between them. Darcy held her sword with one hand, looked around at the crowd casually, and said casually, It's okay. How long has it been since you came back from the Maka plane? Soldek said. About three months ago, I got my graduation certificate from the Knight Academy after returning from the Maka plane. Then I accepted the assignment from the guard camp and went back to the deserted land to serve as the peace officer there. Darcy nodded slightly, indicating that she knew. In fact, he didn't tell many details. For example, during this period, he accompanied Hathaway and Beatrice on a tour of Alinsa City, which she knew. For a moment, the two of them seemed to have nothing to say, and the atmosphere was a bit awkward. Just when Soldak didn't know what to say and was about to say goodbye to Darcy Christie, a young aristocratic man walked out from behind Darcy Christie, stood beside her, looked at Darcy intently and asked Rode, Who is this Darcy? Darcy was not in a high mood, and she didn't even have a perfunctory smile on her face. She replied calmly, Knight Soldak. Darcy introduced to Soldak. This is my fiancé, Baron Armand Bulwer, who works in the munitions department of the city hall. The young man showed a standard aristocratic smile on his face and said to Serdek, Hello, Knight Serdek. I have heard people talk about you. They all said that you are a member of the Helensa Guard Camp. A very great knight. Hello, Baron Bulwer. Soldak nodded and greeted him. Baron Bulwer smiled. It could be seen that he was also a proud nobleman, trying hard to show his magnanimity. He said to Soldak, You can call me Armand. His tone was somewhat condescending. Soldak glanced at Darcy Christie, and it seemed that their tempers were somewhat similar. After saying H. Lo, Baron Armand Bulwer took Darcy Christie into the city hall. Darcy held Armand's arm, her fiery red hair beating slightly with her steps. When Soldak walked down the steps of the city hall, Darcy Christie turned back with a sad look on her face, looked at Soldak's blurred back and sighed slightly. Soldak received 500 gold coins from the city hall and figured out how to spend the money. According to Marquis Bernard's wishes, he can form a private army. This private army is not responsible for the daily security of the deserted land, but is a private armed force stationed in the northwest of the city of Aranza. It usually accepts sea troops, deployed by Lanza City and responsible for guarding the northwest gate of Lanza City. To establish a private armed force, you must first recruit people, then purchase horses, weapons and armor, build barracks, etc. Recruiting manpower is the best thing for Serdek. He plans to recruit some experienced veterans from the 19 natural villages in the deserted land. They usually do not need to be stationed in military camps. They can also farm at home. It's just that when there is a war situation, they can be gathered together quickly, which is a militia mechanism. Serdak doesn't need to buy armor or weapons. The rebel knights who attacked Wall Village last time left behind a batch of hard leather armor, knight spears and swords. He plans to spend a sum of gold coins to buy them directly for himself. As long as the accounts are pretty, Marquis Bernard shouldn't care where these weapons and armor come from. If you have the opportunity in the future, you can apply to the logistics department for weapons and armor maintenance and repairs in the name of the Deserted Land Security Corps, which will save you a lot of money. In this way, the money for purchasing weapons and armor can be safely put into his own pocket, Soldak thought. In addition, Serdak also ordered a batch of affordable wheat flour from the military supplies department. This is a benefit that only the sheriff of Alensa City can enjoy. It is 20% lower than the price of wheat flour on the market. These whole wheat flour, they are all high-quality wheat flour shipped from southern provinces. Serdak was delayed in Alensa City for another two days for this batch of whole wheat flour. It was already four days later when we left Aquamarine City. Fifteen four-wheeled carriages carrying nearly 10,000 pounds of whole wheat flour and nearly 14,000 pounds of multi-grain wheat bran beans crossed the moat and drove into the mountain roads of Oak Ridge. Carl Casement was worried that rebels would rob these grain trucks along the way. So he led a group of knights from the rescue squadron outside the city to escort these grain trucks to the 5th Mountain Ridge before waving goodbye to Serdek. Serdek returned to Wall Village from Alinsa City and brought back a large amount of supplies as usual. But this time, the supplies were obviously much more than before. The main supplies were a large amount of whole wheat flour and miscellaneous grains, which the Green Empire did not lack. Food. In the past, people would starve because the people here were too poor, raising nearly a thousand cobalt slaves. These cobalt slaves consume nearly a thousand pounds of miscellaneous grains every day. These grains are only enough to feed the cobalt slaves for half a month. 
How to fill the bellies of these cobalt slaves is Sir's key. What Dak needs to seriously consider is that if it weren't for the income from the sulfur mine in Pudu Mountain, he really wouldn't be able to raise so many cobalt slaves. When he returned to Wall Village, Sirdak saw the old village chief standing under a dead tree at the entrance of the village, staring at a row of slave sheds that had been rebuilt not far away. This time, these cobalt slave sheds are no longer simple sheds simply fenced with reed mats, but are built with limestone blocks like city wall townhouses. These townhouses are like semi-arc city walls. Dividing wall. The entrance to the south of the village is completely blocked, and a parapet is built on the roof of the row house. Even the river in Wall Village has a long waterway, like a doorway built at the entrance of the village, with fence-style sluices on both sides. Since the last time the rebel knights attacked Wall Village, Serdek has planned to build a wall-like townhouse at the entrance of Wall Village to let the cobalt slaves live in it. If the village encounters a bandit group and when the rebel knights attack, this is the first line of defense for Wall Village. It can at least stop the cavalry from marching straight into the village. The old village chief has been complaining to Serdak recently that these row houses only need to be strong and do not need to be built too beautifully. The villagers haven't lived in this kind of house yet. But these cobalt slaves are getting a lot of advantage. Chapter 528 Those Unforgettable People In early July, the village didn't need so many cobalt slaves. So the old village chief arranged for Charlie to send 200 cobalt slaves to the Pudu Mountain Lava River Sulfur Mine to mine sulfur ore. Currently, there are less than 600 cobalt slaves left in Wall Village. And most of these cobalt slaves are mining limestone on the hills not far outside the village. The villagers of Wall Village drove four-wheeled carriages to transport the square stones from the mountains back to the village. They first used black gunpowder to blast apart large blocks of limestone. And then used mining picks and chisels to cut the limestone into rectangular stones. The row houses at the entrance of the village were built with the stones that these cobalt spent more than half a month digging out. Potsalana cement was poured into the gap. And it looked like a thick city wall from the outside. Soldak arrived at Wall Village successfully with 15 four-wheeled carriages. A group of villagers quickly rushed to the entrance of the village. Together, they unloaded the wheat flour and grains and stored them all in the newly built warehouse. Seeing that Serdak had brought so much wheat flour and miscellaneous grains back from Alensa City, the old village chief frowned and walked up to him and said, Why have you bought so much wheat flour again? We all have enough grain in our house to eat wheat until autumn. When mature, if the wheat flour is not well preserved, it will become moldy and prone to insects in the summer. Although you are now a noble master, you cannot waste food like this. Serdak touched his nose and explained to the old village chief, Uncle Bright, this time, I went to Alensa City to meet Marquis Bernard. We lack a local defense chief in the deserted land. He wanted me to form a defense force. So he planned for me to recruit some retired veterans from each village to form a militia battalion in the deserted land. I used the military expenses I distributed in exchange for these wheat flour at the military supply office. The old village chief was overjoyed. You mean that the Marquis Bernard asked you to raise a battalion of militia? But he immediately remembered that Serdak was currently the night captain of the Helensa guard camp and asked again, Don't you have a security team with a security battalion? Why do you need to form a militia battalion? Serdak was also somewhat confused about the duties and responsibilities of Aranza City. He only knew that the security team of the guard battalion was responsible for daily security matters. But the militia battalion was regarded as the local garrison and the local defense force. He said, the security team of the guard battalion is responsible for peacetime security. And the militia battalion is the defense garrison team. Mayor Bright frowned and said, Duck, we are all lucky enough to have survived the battlefield. We all have been on the battlefield, and we all know how cruel the battlefield is. I don't think anyone will be willing to join your militia camp. Cernak looked at the wheat flour on the carriage and said, That's why I will bring back these wheat flour. All veterans who join the militia camp will receive a certain amount of remuneration every month and temporarily reserve a bag of wheat flour. The old village chief's eyes lit up slightly, and he couldn't help but ask, Can we get wheat flour regardless of whether there is a war or not? Serdak nodded and said, Yes, and there will be no training in summer and autumn. We will only organize some outdoor training in deserted areas during the slack season in winter. Participating in these trainings will also provide additional living allowances. In fact, even if, if I don't organize this militia camp, when those bandit groups attack the village, the villagers will still have to rise up to resist. Wouldn't it be better if I provide some material subsidies here? In this case, try to take care of our wall village when selecting people. The old village chief told Soldak. Of course, 
if they are willing to join. They will be the first choice. But they will not all find people from the village. Each village must have people from the militia camp to grasp the situation in each village in a timely manner. After hearing what Soldek said, the old village chief nodded with satisfaction. Two carriages loaded with strips of limestone drove into the village. The old village chief hurriedly walked over with a cane, pointed to an open space in his hand, and shouted to the two villagers driving the cart, Pull the stones over there! Right! It's over there. The coachman who transported whole wheat flour came to Wall Village a while ago. When they came to Wall Village again, they saw that in just over half a month, a city wall of seven or eight hundred meters had been built at the entrance of the village. When they drove the carriage into Wall Village, they were also amazed at these stone houses. Entering Wall Village, the changes in the village are even greater. In addition to a large amount of building materials piled up in the village square, the village has actually built horizontal and vertical cement roads. These cement roads are very wide and have a flat road in the middle. It was large enough for two carriages to drive side by side. There were cement stone steps with gentle steps on both sides, and there were drainage ditches plastered with cement next to them. It rained continuously for the past two days. Most of the rainwater upstream of the village was collected into the reservoir, while the rainwater in the village flowed into the river along the drainage ditch. In the past, the roads in the village would become muddy during this season, but now that situation seems to have completely disappeared. These cement roads were built from the entrance of the village to the reservoir upstream of the village, neatly cutting Wall Village into countless regular strip areas. Some of these areas still have dilapidated thatched houses, and some thatched houses have been knocked down, and a new cement foundation was built on the original homestead. Sardak's Clay Timber Townhouse model stands on a wooden frame in a shed in the village square. This is a very common two-story foreign-style building in later generations. It also has an attic and a terrace on the roof, which looks unique and grand. Nowadays, this place has become a gathering place for children. Many half-year-old children in the village also like to use mud and would to build a model of a house like Soldek, and then proudly show off the townhouse model they made, because most of the houses in the village had to be demolished and rebuilt. There was a wave of discussion in the village, and everyone had some ideas of their own. The logs on the threshing floor are piled like a hill, and the village's carpenter's workshop has been using saws to break open oak boards day and night recently. There are many forest farms outside the city of Valencia. In addition to the acorn business, these forest farms also sell wood. Most of the trees growing in this mountain range are oak trees. So the price of oak trees is relatively cheap. Not long after the rebel knights attacked the village, Wall Village began a major reconstruction project. The reason was simple. The thatched houses in the village could not withstand the spears of the rebel knights and were completely shattered. Trying to repave the mud house with red thatch is not only laborious and time-consuming, but in the end, it will still be a thatched house that cannot withstand a night shot. It is better to tear it down and rebuild it. As for the cost of building these new townhouses, Wall Village and Soldak will still bear it together. Villagers do not need to pay any fees. In addition, villagers who are willing to work on construction sites can receive a salary of 100 copper coins every day. This payment makes the villagers highly motivated. So the renovation project of Wall Village proceeds very quickly. Almost every day there is something new happening in Wall Village. By the time Serdak returned from Helensa City, the foundations of several homesteads had been laid. The reason why Serdak wants to persuade the old Wall Village to jointly invest in rebuilding the Wall Village is mainly to convince the stubborn old Sheila. After entering the rainy season, the construction of the reservoir was temporarily stopped. So Soldak wanted to build a house in Wall Village. A month ago, Soldak told old Sheila that he planned to knock down the existing house in his family and expand it into a mansion. Old Sheila did not agree at first because she was unwilling to abandon the old house that she had lived in for so many years. She felt that as long as she still lived in the old house and could still lie on the wicker chair next to the fireplace, she could remember the difficult days in the past when she closed her eyes occasionally and those people hidden in her heart could occasionally appear in her dreams. She was afraid that when the house was gone, those memories would slowly fade away. There were some things she didn't want to forget. So she told Soldak that everyone in the village lived in thatched houses, and she didn't want to live in a new house. Serdak discussed with the old village chief to knock down the thatched houses in the village and rebuild them into brand new stone houses with wooden roofs, so that they would not have to worry about the roofs being collapsed by snowstorms in winter. A while ago, the rebel cavalry swept the village to pieces. The roofs of some thatched houses were removed and some walls of courtyards and houses were trampled down by the iron hooves of the horses. 
Now it is just a good opportunity to tear down and rebuild. Serdek's new manor was not built on the original site of the old house. After careful consideration, Serdek still felt that the old house should be preserved and left to old Sheila a place where she could still remember the past. Serdek's new house is located at the highest point of Wall Village. When the reservoir is completed, it will be far away from the police station. And there will be a vast pool of water 7 or 800 meters away. Seeing that the old house had not been demolished, old Sheila's stern face returned to normal these days. Soldak breathed a sigh of relief. He had nothing to do with old Sheila's stubbornness. But he had now completely integrated into the life here. There were many things here that he was unwilling to give up. He took his family to a piece of land that was leveled out by the new house. He held little Peter in his arms, pointed at the large piece of land in front of him, and asked him, Son, a big house will be built here. There will be there is a swimming pool, a loft, an observation deck, your separate bedroom, a reading room, and a training room. No matter what changes happen in the future, everything here will become a gift left by me. After hearing what Soldek said, old Sheila looked at him with a complicated expression. Natasha looked at him with infinite tenderness in her eyes. After walking around here, when everyone was about to leave the homestead, Soldek saw that old Sheila seemed to be muttering to herself. But he could not hear clearly what she was mumbling. The western-style building of the Public Security Bureau is the first new-style building in Wall Village. The entire main body of the building is completely made of volcanic ash cement. In view of Gilladam's special body shape, Serdak built a large bedroom for him in this police station. The building is complete and has a fence terrace on the roof. The exterior decoration of the entire building is a bit biased towards the Wasmara style. Samira even asked the bricklayers to use Patsalana cement to decorate the exterior walls with stone pillars. There are also cross arches like pavilions on the second floor terrace. The Patsalana cement is very malleable. And Samira also carved some stone pillars on the exterior walls. Vine decoration. Serdak comes to the police station. Half-elf archer Samira was carrying a bucket of paint, squatting on the second-story windowsill to paint the window frame with varnish. Her long legs were spread out on the windowsill, revealing a patch of white. Seeing Soldak walk into the police station, Samira jumped down from the windowsill with a paint bucket. Isn't there a painter in the village? Serdak asked Samira when he saw her putting the paint bucket aside. I happen to have nothing to do, so I let them go back. I think I can paint better than them. Samira answered while bending down to pour paint from a larger barrel. Seeing that her enthusiasm for work has not diminished and there seems to be nothing going on at the police station, Soldak walked into the house. As soon as he entered the door, he was at the front desk. After walking around the front desk, he walked into the lobby on the first floor. Inside this room facing some horse stools that have not yet been moved away. The four walls of the house have been painted with a layer of white lime powder. But it seems that the walls have not dried yet and the whole room is a bit damp. This will be the office area of the police station in the future. There is also a tea room and lounge next to it. Serdak walked through the office area and climbed up the stairs to the second floor. There are only six rooms and one public area on the second floor. These rooms will be temporary dormitories for members of the security team. In the future. Samira, Afu Rudy and Andrew are both moving here. Walking onto the terrace with a wide view. Serdak saw the succubus Aphrodite lying on a wicker chair and sunbathing in a cool silk suspender skirt. When she saw Serdak walking up, she waved casually, then lazily turned over and turned her back to him. In the hot summer, Aphrodite was dressed cooler than anyone else. The suspender skirt exposed a large area of dark skin on her back. There were two obvious scars on the base of her arm, where the wings were cut off. Although it was already it was completely healed. But the two bulges made her body obviously different from others. Her long hair was also loosely draped over her shoulders. The long dark purple hair was very smooth. And two devil horns were exposed from the hair. Serdak could even feel the magic aura condensing at the tips of the horns. Serdak reminded her. Aphrodite, please cover your wings. Don't expose them all the time. Challenging the vigilance and eyesight of the villagers. Aphrodite just turned her face slightly and waved her hand to show that she understood. Without seeing the ogre Gulitum or Andrew, Soldak walked down the balcony of the police station. Samira had exhausted all the initial novelty of the deserted land and was no longer willing to ride a horse to wander around the deserted land. The weather was hot and she had to cover her face with a hood and wrap her whole body in leather. In the middle of the nail, the sweat on the body is dried and become wet. And the leather of the nail is soaked with salt. And the taste is not pleasant at all. So Samira would rather hide in the police station 
and paint instead of patrolling under the vicious sun. Only Andrew is still diligent and wandering around in the deserted land every day. Chapter 529 Militia Camp Soldak spread the news about forming a militia camp. But the villagers' reaction surprised him. He waited in the police station for three days. Only three veterans with slightly disabled legs from Guda Village came and expressed their willingness to join the militia camp in Serdak. As for the villagers in Wall Village, so far no one is willing to join the militia camp. Even some villagers would stay away from Serdak when they saw him, fearing that Serdak would be blamed for recruiting militiamen. Serdak did not expect that the villagers would be so repulsive to the militia camp. He thought carefully for a long time before he discovered the reason. One is because the dark side of the nationwide military recruitment system has caused the villagers to lose their last bit of confidence in the army. It's just that Serdak couldn't figure it out. When the bandits attacked the village, these villagers all had the courage to fight. And some of them fought and died risking their lives to defend Wall Village. However, no one asked them to join the militia camp. Willing. Secondly, it happens to be the busy farming season. Many villagers were worried that farm work in the fields would be affected. Some villagers expressed their support to Soldak in setting up a militia. But not many people actually joined the militia. The villagers would rather go to the construction site in the village to earn a temporary salary of 100 copper coins a day. And no one is willing to join the militia camp. The old village chief did not tell everyone that there was almost no training in the summer militia camp. The old village chief was worried that if he said this in advance, Serdak would not be able to command this group of recruited militiamen during the summer season. Once some things become a habit, it will be difficult to change it back. When Soldak walked to the children's home of Wall Village, he saw Selina standing in front of a wooden board, teaching a group of children to practice writing letters with charcoal. Seeing Soldak coming, Selina asked the children to disperse and play around the central square of the village for a while. But don't forget to have lunch later. The children of all sizes dispersed in a hurry, and the temporary children's yard suddenly became empty and quiet. Serdak sat on a small wooden stool in front of the podium with some depression looking up at Selina, who was standing beside the podium. Selina folded her hands on her chest, with a gentle smile on her face, leaning her elbows on the podium and looking at Soldak. The situation at the children's home has improved, and they are basically children from the village. Because the children from other villages were far away and it was busy farming season, the adults had no time to send them over, so they had to stay at home. After entering summer, wild vegetables and some berries began to grow. So villagers from other villages did not need to send their children all the way here just for a bite to eat. The children's home was not disbanded because of this. Instead, Serdak often came here in person to teach the children basic swordsmanship and fighting skills. Selina put her face close to Soldak and asked him with a smile. Why do you always look so sad lately? Serdak rubbed his temples and complained to Selina. I really don't understand why the villagers reject the militia camp so much. Oh, it's because of this matter. Selina smiled. She knew that Soldak had been busy with this matter recently. After thinking about it, she comforted him and said, Everyone is busy building a house. Who knows? We'll run to join your militia camp at this time. This kind of sturdy and weatherproof house can probably be lived in for a lifetime once it is built. Who will run to you to join the militia camp at this time? Even Hyde. Not as good as. Serdak looked at the small buildings rising one after another in the village and said with a look of astonishment, is that so? Selina nodded with a smile, her plump figure showing a graceful outline under her long skirt, and whispered to Soldak, Otherwise you recruit me, and I will be your soldier. The ogre went to Bago pasture to herd sheep. He was worried that someone would steal the village's yellow sheep. After the rainy season came, the seed buckthorn grass and thirsty grass grew wildly for so many days in Bago pasture, and the entire hillside was lush and green. The yellow sheep in Wall Village eat from morning to night just to store up a thick layer of fat before autumn, so that they can survive the next winter safely. In recent times, Gulitem has eaten a lot of salamander meat left by Serdak. And unknowingly, Gulitem has grown in size. Serdak waited in Wall Village for more than half a month. Villagers from other villages saw that three veterans from Guda Village with some hidden leg problems joined the militia camp. Serdak actually did not refuse. Some veterans from each village who had retired from the battlefield with injuries came to Serdak was signed up and expressed his willingness to join the militia camp. Of course, not all types of veterans are recruited. Most of the veterans recruited are those who can be cured. The Green Empire has a universal military recruitment system. Male Empire citizens can join the army and serve four years of military service between the ages of 16 and 20. Once you have not joined the army before the age of 20, 
you will be forcibly recruited by the local law enforcement group. These men would be labeled by the military as people trying to evade military service, and as punishment for evading, they would be sent to the most dangerous infantry battalions with the highest death rates. Therefore, many civilian youths will join the army after their 16-year-old adult ceremony. There are also some aristocratic junior colleges who go to advanced warrior colleges to further their studies. These people enter the army and become the lowest level officers. This will avoid unnecessary casualties. In these villages in the deserted land, a group of young people are recruited into the army every year. Since the young people in the village have not received any formal military training, the regiments assigned are basically cannon fodder infantry regiments. Less than one third of the young people are able to return home from the battlefield alive every year. And among the less than one third of young people, there are some who are disabled. However, these disabled veterans who came back from the battlefield basically have minor disabilities. Some have broken fingers and toes, and some have severed tendons in their arms or thighs. The medical conditions on the battlefield are very poor, and there is no way to reattach them. Prompt and effective treatment of Sirocco will result in disability. As for those who had a leg cut off or an arm broken by the enemy, few people could come back alive once they were so seriously injured. Due to their hidden illnesses, this group of veterans are usually unable to help their families with farm work. I heard that the Serdak Knights in Wall Village has set up a militia camp here, recruiting veterans and giving them a bag of wheat flour every month. Rejecting veterans with disabilities, they came over to try their luck. Although these veterans are not very flexible, they have rich combat experience. Moreover, the hidden diseases that cannot be cured in the eyes of these veterans can still be cured by Serdak, who possesses the holy light technique. In nearly 20 days, the number of disabled veterans Soldak had recruited quickly reached more than 40. After the old village chief finished supervising the construction of townhouses at the entrance of the village and turned around to look at the recruitment situation in Serdak, he realized that the villagers of Wall Village were collectively stupid. Instead of actively joining the militia camp as promised, everyone went to the village construction site to earn money. When the old village chief heard the news, he was furious. He angrily ran to the central square of the village, summoned all the villagers, and cursed all the villagers, saying, you people are worse than the cobalt slaves at the entrance of the village. To be ignorant means to be poor all your life. Facing the furious Mayor Bright, many villagers stood in the crowd and lowered their heads in shame. Despite this, there are still few villagers willing to join the militia camp. But after all, there are a few. Chapter 530 Raging Flame A group of villagers who joined the militia camp took home a bag of whole wheat flour and prepared to receive formal training. However, they were told to gather at the security station of Wall Village at this time next month to receive next month's rations. Baron Soldak seemed to have forgotten when to train. There was a room in the police station with a row of brand new wooden racks. Serdak placed the worn-out hard leather armor of the rebel cavalry, knight swords, and knight's lances on the wooden racks. These weapons and armor were seriously damaged, although the hard leather armor was greased. But the mottled scars were still visible. These hidden wounds on the leather armor cannot be left behind after one or two battles. Serdak sat next to the wooden frame. He cleaned the blood on a knight's long sword, then wiped it dry, and finally wiped it repeatedly with a grease-stained rag before putting it back into the scabbard. He handled each knight's sword very carefully. Tuck, tuck, tuck. There was a knock on the door. Soldak raised his head and looked at the door of the room. Several veterans from other villages were standing outside tremblingly. He couldn't even call out their names. Oh, it's you. Come in. Serdak nodded to them. These veterans wore shabby linen robes. This linen robe looked like three big holes dug in a sack. After being put on the body, only the arms and head were exposed. They were sunburned dark red. There was a trace of embarrassment on his face, and his body was a little thin. He didn't look like a soldier on the battlefield. Serdak put down the sword in his hand and asked them, Are you having any difficulties? You might as well tell me and see if I can help. These veterans waved their hands repeatedly, and one of them bravely said, Master Serdak, we are all from Yuta village. Our village is a bit far away from here. We just want to ask when we will participate in the training of the militia camp so that we can prepare in advance to avoid being late. Only then did Serdak understand that these villagers came to Wall Village because they had a long way to go. So they asked Serdak about the date of the gathering for training. Well, actually I want to officially announce it next month. The militia camp currently does not have any training arrangements. All training will have to wait until after the harvest festival, Serdak said to these veterans. When several veterans heard the news, they thought they had heard it wrong. Are you serious? 
one of the veterans couldn't help but ask. I almost asked Serdak directly, could it be that by joining the militia camp, the only thing you can do now is to take home a bag of wheat flour every month? Soldak nodded very calmly. The answer is yes, he said. That's it for now. I'm just selecting a group of people to join the militia camp. And I haven't prepared any training for the time being. Then he reiterated what he said to all veterans. The only thing you can do by joining the militia camp is to receive a bag of rations every month to subsidize your family. This is your welfare. Don't forget to come here to receive the subsidy every month. The veterans who participated in the militia camps in other villages had some problems of their own if they were willing to join the militia camps. They were basically villagers who had lost part of their ability to work. And they usually lived in poverty and cold. They heard that the militia camp provided food subsidies and did not refuse the disabled. So they went to Wall Village to try their luck. Unexpectedly, these benefits were actually real. As for the villagers in Wall Village who participated in the militia camp, almost all of them were scolded by the old village leader, Uncle Bright. They didn't expect that the only thing the militia camp needed to do in its initial stage was to receive a bag of wheat flour every month. No wonder village chief Bright heard that the villagers were not so positive about this matter. So he scolded everyone and forced them to big guys join the militia camp. He did this so that everyone could receive free whole wheat rations. This bag of whole wheat flour was a very luxurious gift for any family in Wall Village. Unexpectedly, it was turned away by everyone. Many villagers in Wall Village are clever, but mistakenly clever. Everyone has thought about joining the militia camp and taking various actions, such as patrolling in the deserted city or setting up sentries everywhere, etc. But they have not come to think of it. Nothing needs to be done. Serdak has only one requirement for the members of the militia battalion when encountering bandits and rebel bandits attacking the village. You must remember that you are a militiaman in the deserted land, and you are willing to maintain peace in the deserted land. A person who can bravely face all evil forces. Seeing the veteran struggling to walk while carrying a bag of wheat flour. Soldak had a headache. He didn't think such a militia battalion could still have any combat effectiveness. He also retired from the battlefield and knew how cruel the battlefield was. He has lived in Wall Village for nearly a year. And he is more aware of how cruel life is in this barren land. That's why he didn't refuse. He was worried that because of his refusal, the last avenue for these veterans would be blocked. Standing at the door of the police station, he waved to the veterans who had walked out of the village carrying wheat flour and still couldn't help but look back. Maybe we can also help them heal their hidden wounds. It seems that there is still a long way to go before we can turn this ragtag group into a qualified militia battalion. After nearly half a month of preparation, just as August had just entered, Serdak finally completely transformed the magic pattern of life on the salamander's forehead into two palm-sized magic pattern clothes. Serdak opened the Eye of Truth and completely peeled off the life magic pattern from the salamander leather. Although it is not a power-oriented magic pattern clothing, Serdak can clearly feel the explosive and scorching fire elemental atmosphere on the magic pattern clothing. The eyes of the half-elf archer Samira also became a little hot because of this. He lifted his hood down and stared at the piece of magic pattern clothing on the table with his big, clear eyes. Without saying a word, Serdak could clearly feel Samira's desire for this magic pattern colonization outfit. The succubus Aphrodite held the teapot and poured a cup of lemon tea for each of the people in the room. Serdak sat at the table stretched out his hand to hold down the magic pattern clothing, and said to Samira, Samira, your carrying capacity is not enough to implant two magic pattern clothing at the same time, but it is really suitable for me. My intuition tells me that with it, I can shoot rockets. The half-elf archer looked at the magic pattern clothing eagerly. Serdak shook his head resolutely and said to her, There may be better ones in the future. Don't you think that with our strength, we can only hunt salamanders in the future? Samira gave up her position, with a look of regret on her face, allowing Andrew to come forward. The indigenous warrior Andrew seemed excited after all. He never expected that Serdak would have a second magic pattern breeding outfit so soon. Although it seemed to be a fire attribute, he didn't mind. As long as it could improve his with his strength, he can accept any magic pattern equipment with any attributes. Captain, I want this, Andrew said excitedly. The magic pattern structure has great appeal to any warrior. Now it seems that the magic pattern breeding equipment is no exception. Serdak patted Andrew on the shoulder and reminded him. Don't make a decision in a hurry. You can think about it again. This is obviously a fire attributed magic pattern clothing. For a warrior like you, the ultimate it would be better to use a power oriented magic pattern clothing. Like the one on Samira's arm. However, in order to save her arm, 
The magic pattern clothing is currently used on her body. You can wait a little longer. Or you can choose this one. Tell me when you think about it. Captain, I've thought about it. I want this one. Andrew made his choice without hesitation. Soldek nodded and said, Since you have decided, then prepare. Before the magic power on the magic armor is completely destroyed, I will implant this magic pattern colonization armor into your body. This piece of leather is too big. At one point, there's no way to implant it in your arm. Then implant it here. Andrew patted his chest very coolly and said, Captain, is there a name for this magic pattern clothing? Samira couldn't help but ask from the side. Raging flames. Soldak said without raising his head. After speaking, he patted Andrew and motioned for him to follow him into the room inside. With the experience of the first successful implantation, the process of implanting the magic pattern breeding equipment this time is simpler than the last time. Still started the sacrificial ceremony, summoned the statue of the devil, and then sacrificed the head of the age, L dog in exchange for the blessing power of the blessed body and the eye of true. With the blessing of the eye of true, Serdak has spent a whole afternoon implanting this raging flame magic pattern into Andrew's chest. As the last holy light spell fell on Andrew, he patted Andrew on the shoulder, indicating that Andrew could sit up. Captain, was it successful? Andrew asked expectantly. After asking, he looked down at the red magic pattern on his chest. He jumped out of bed, closed his eyes, and felt the burning breath in his body. As his mind changed, Andrew only felt a burning force pass through his chest and then pass through. The arm, and finally the palm of the hand suddenly felt warm, and a ball of flame appeared on the right hand. Andrew looked at his palms with excitement. During this period, news came that traces of salamanders had been discovered in the Lava River Sulfur Mine. Each salamander is a small fortune. Its own value even exceeds that of five carriages of sulfur mines. So Serdak did not hesitate to take the Ogregulatum and rush to Pussy Mountain to deal with the sulfur mine. A salamander. After the half-elf archer Samira got the imitation bow of the painting of Withering. She seemed to be keen on patrolling the deserted land again. Recently, she always went out on horseback to patrol. Often for nearly a week at a time. The sulfur mine on the Pudu Mountain Lava River has begun to be officially mined. 400 cobalt slaves can dig out a load of sulfur or every day. The cobalt slaves are very adapted to the hot and dry environment. They are not afraid of the volcanic ash flying in the sky. The fur on their bodies makes them less afraid of the scorching heat. So the mine work in the sulfur mine has been going smoothly. The only trouble here is that occasionally one or two salamanders emerge from the depths of the volcano. The cobalt slave miners here couldn't handle it. So Luke sent someone to deliver a message to Soldek. As plane wars break out frequently in various places, many previously inconspicuous workshops have begun to receive a large number of orders. Many workshops are making some fire scale bombs. The demand for sulfur in various places has surged to the point where raw materials need to be snapped up. The price of sulfur mines in various places is also rising continuously. Although the price increase is not as exaggerated as that of magic herbs, sulfur ore has risen three times in a row in the past two months. From three silver coins per pound to five silver coins per pound. At this time, some merchants in Helensa City finally realized the value of sulfur. There was no large-scale sulfur mine in Helensa City, but they were able to continuously supply sulfur mines to the magic market. They discovered that the sulfur in Helensa City was the source of the mine came from the deserted land. So many people ran to the deserted land, intending to find sulfur mines here. There are actually no sulfur mines in the Badlands. The only place with sulfur mines is the Pussy Volcano at the southernmost tip of Mount Paglos. Then these businessmen suddenly discovered that Pudu Mountain, which was a deserted land a few months ago, had actually become the territory of a certain noble. And the scope of this territory covered almost the entire Pudu Mountain and the surrounding areas. Seeing the newly erected boundary markers around them, the merchants who followed the mercenary group and the adventure group into the deserted land felt regretful. It's not that they didn't know that there was a sulfur mine in Pudwan Mountain before, but the price of the sulfur mine had been hovering around three silver. They opened a sulfur mine, hired laborers to mine, and rented four-wheel trucks to haul the sulfur mine to Holanza City. The total cost has exceeded the purchase price of the sulfur mine itself. So this is a money-losing business. But now when the price of sulfur mines has skyrocketed by two-thirds, many businessmen have realized that there is a business opportunity. But the volcano that was originally ignored has turned into a territory. Suddenly, a large number of adventurous groups exploring sulfur mines emerged in the cities in Bena province that bordered the Paglos Mountains. Except for Pussy Mountain. 
There are no other volcanoes at the southern end of the Paglos Mountains. But all the way north along the Paglos Mountains, many edge areas of the mountains have some hot springs full of sulfur smell. Following these clues, there really are some adventure groups found several sulfur mines with extremely low reserves. It was under such a situation that Serdak's territory came into the eyes of some caring people. During this period of time, there has been no movement from the Dark Moon Gate organization and the Northern Rebels. It is said that the Duke of Jingyu of Sloit province found the secret base of the rebels in the high mountains bordering the Purple Green Mountains in the northern part of the Burning Plains. This Duke of Jingyu gained an advantage in the battle against the barbarians last winter. And finally this summer, with his hands free, he sent out 20 light cavalry scout regiments to plow the entire Burning Plain. And finally found the last bit of rebel power hidden in the mountains and forests. And completely defeated the rebels. Lord Baron Serdak, I have a letter from you. A villager ran into the police station and delivered a letter to Soldak. Chapter 531 The Troubles of Life Two bricklayers were building a flower pond in the yard of the police station. The yard is paved with a layer of granite gravel, and pozzolanic cement is poured into the gaps between the gravel, making the yard very smooth. The bricklayers used granite to create several circles in the yard. Instead of building a fence around the yard, some lantern trees were transplanted. This kind of low shrub was most suitable for pruning into a low wall. The shrubs were also planted around the low wall. A row of chestnut and hawthorn trees. The magic notes on the desk have turned to the last page. Celia Cooper in the magic notebook is reading quietly across the railing. The book she was reading was discovered by Serdak from the ruins of an underground city on the outskirts of Wazamala City. It was a book left over from the goblin era. There are very few books with this kind of goblin writing in existence. It is said that many books were destroyed in the War of the Gods and the remaining ones were destroyed on the spot by the apostles of the gods. Now they are only in the hands of a certain great collector. Find some books with goblin writing. The scene at this moment is also quite strange. The two books on the desk are open to each other, and the parchment pages of one of the books are actually moving without any wind. Puff, 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 puff. The pages of the book kept turning, and Celia Cooper was fascinated by it. Sometimes she frowned. Sometimes she lowered her head in thought, as if she was completely integrated into the book. Soldak sat at the desk, took out a peeling knife from his arms, cut open the thick envelope, and took out a piece of letter paper with a faint fragrance from it. This is a reply written by Hathaway himself. The handwriting is beautiful and neat, and the last letter at the end of each line is deliberately drawn with a beautiful curve. It can be seen that the writer is very careful. Knight of Serdak, when I opened your letter, I was sitting on the terrace having afternoon tea with Beatrice, who loved the biscuits and cream puffs. Beatrice also wrote you a letter, which is enclosed in this envelope. I can't express my current mood. I'm sitting in front of my desk and can't wait to write you a reply. But before I sit down and pick up my pen, I see the daffodils blooming in front of the window. This is the happiest day for me in these days. The weather was clear and the sun was shining brightly. I should go to the garden and enjoy such a beautiful day. I hope you are in the same good mood as I am at this moment. How are you doing in Wall Village? I heard people say that it is the poorest land in the entire Bena province. I think maybe the products there are not too rich. If you need help, please write to me. Although the property that belongs to me is managed by the family, I can still mobilize some resources and hope to be able to help you. I've been a little troubled recently. I found that my father, who had always doted on me, suddenly didn't love me as much as before. He had never mentioned those things during breakfast before. But just at breakfast last Monday, he suddenly said to me, he felt that my life was incomplete and lacking before I found my other half. He talked a lot and said he knew many outstanding young people and wanted me to try to get in touch with them. I told him that I didn't like to be tied down and I wouldn't accept any compromise in my relationship. I wanted to fly freely in the sky like a falcon. After I told him what I was thinking, he not only didn't understand me, but also asked me to calm down and think about my current and future life. These days at home are really like years. But luckily I had Beatrice with me, so I could persevere. You described in your mind the interesting landforms and scenery of the deserted land. I am used to seeing the vast mountains and dense forests in the central part of Bena province. I really want to see you there. But I'm afraid that's not possible now because I'm grounded. I will not give in. I will fight for the power I deserve. When I regain my freedom, I hope to go to your place to relax. Hathaway Luther. Kindly reply. The ladies in every aristocratic and wealthy family seemed to face this problem. When Serdak was in Helensa Knight Academy, 
his two neighbors Lena and Nedra had similar troubles. But it was obvious that Lena was not prepared to make such a fierce resistance to her family. Born into aristocratic families, they have enjoyed a luxurious life since childhood. But this also means that they will have to contribute to the family in the future, either marrying with other wealthy nobles or attracting outstanding talents to join the family. This is what they need to contribute to the family. Obviously Hathaway does not intend to do this. She is making some rebellious moves at home in an attempt to win her own freedom. Serdak didn't know whether his reply should encourage her and support her fight to the end, or just comfort her and let her recognize the reality. He put the letter aside and took out another page of letter paper from the envelope. Compared to Hathaway's letter, Beatrice's letter is much shorter, and Beatrice's handwriting appears clean and neat. Dear Mr. Knight, Thank you for your letter. I am writing to you from Hathaway's home. Hathaway was in a bad mood recently. She was grounded and locked in the attic for two whole weeks. She could only sit by the window every day and look at the blue sky and white clouds outside. I stayed with her every day and lived in her family's castle. The two of us can chat, play chess, and occasionally compete with swords in the room to pass the boring time. Hathaway said she wanted to escape from here. But even if we left here, we didn't know where to go. If she did, could I go with her to you? Sincerely, Beatrice. Soldek scratched his head, wondering what kind of charm it had. He has clearly made it clear to them that he is married and has a gentle wife and a lovely son at home. No matter when the time comes, he will never abandon his family. These two aristocratic ladies, who are far away in Benna City, are still so persistent in writing letters to themselves. And they seem to be planning to come to Wall Village. They should be allowed to live in a deserted land for a few days to make them realize the barrenness and poverty here. And maybe they will shrink back. Soldak took out a piece of parchment paper from the desk and wanted to write a reply to them. But for a moment, he didn't know where to start. After much thought, I decided to write a reply urging Hathaway to try to compromise with her family. Miss Hathaway. Miss Beatrice. I've received your message. I hope you feel it's not that bad after reading my reply. I sympathize with your experience. But with all due respect, although some of the choices made by the family hope that you will make a certain contribution, they may also be the best answer to this multiple choice question. And your life may change as a result. Better. If you really want to fight, of course I am on your side. If you want to visit the wild lands on the northern edge of the Paglos Mountains, I welcome you. I hope you can see what kind of life the poor living at the bottom of society live every day. Perhaps only by seeing this can we feel the true meaning of life. A month ago, this place had just experienced a rebel cavalry attack. And many people died, including some brave villagers, all the rebels, and a dozen cobalt slaves. Girls here don't have time to think about who they will marry tomorrow. Their first priority in summer is to plant more food and store it to survive the long cold winter. In winter, they have to consider how to distribute food reasonably so that they will not starve to death in the harsh winter. You should come and take a look at these people who are struggling to make ends meet. And maybe you will feel that your current life is actually pretty good. If that sentence hurts you, please forgive me because I haven't read many books and can't express my inner thoughts in more beautiful words. Serdak on August 14th. 2,587 inch. Marquis Luther was sitting in his study with some annoyance. His desk was filled with documents waiting to be signed. He suppressed his annoyance and tried to concentrate on finishing the matters at hand. The Cold War with her daughter Hathaway has been going on for almost two weeks. And no one is willing to take the lead in compromising. Marquis Luther reached for the teacup on the table, only to find that it was empty. His seventh wife, Mabel, brought a cup of vanilla tea and walked in from the door. She was wearing a wasted and low-cut imitation palace dress, and the whiteness on her chest was ready to be seen. In the past, even if he was not in the mood, he would pretend to be amazed and look at it twice. But now, he was not in the mood at all. He waved his hand a little irritably and asked her to retreat. This Mabel was married to Marquis Luther through the marriage between the Solomon family and the Luther family. Although she was a young, beautiful, fair-skinned, graceful figure and good-natured aristocratic girl. Marquis Luther treated her like feel nothing, sitting alone in a chair. He felt a little exhausted both physically and mentally. A pair of hands on the shoulders. Why haven't you left yet? Thinking that the person was Mabel. He asked in a deep voice, with an unmistakable severity in his voice. Where do you want me to go? The woman behind him asked him in surprise. Marquis Luther discovered that it was his second wife Marianne, Hathaway's biological mother, and Marquis Luther's favorite wife. Marquis Luther rubbed his face with both hands. 
trying to eliminate the fatigue on his face. He cheered up and said, I thought it was Mabel. You know, she recently wanted to get a black-scaled horse from me. The sky kept nagging in my ears. But every one of those black-scaled horses was registered. It was impossible for me to pull one out of the military camp for her just because she wanted it. So I was annoyed by her. A faint smile appeared on Marianne's face. Her appearance was not absolutely beautiful. And she even had a few faint freckles on her face. But she had a unique temperament. You sat in the study all afternoon just for this trivial matter? Marquis Luther wanted to find an excuse at random. But found that he couldn't hide it from Marianne. So he said with some frustration. Well, of course not. I just want to be quiet in the room for a while. Marquis Luther rarely looked so depressed. Marianne's hand on his shoulder became stronger. And Marquis Luther closed his eyes. By the way, Hathaway told me that she doesn't like the young man you arranged for her. Marianne's gentle voice came from behind. What do you think? Marquis Luther asked with his eyes closed. With a faint smile on her lips. Marianne said, Of course I support you. Everyone in the family has their own obligations. Hathaway just couldn't figure it out for a while. I will enlighten her. Marquis Luther opened his eyes slightly, reached out, and patted the back of Marion's hand and said, Actually, I don't necessarily want her to make certain choices. I just feel that she should not miss it when she meets an outstanding young man. That's all. At least let's meet and get to know each other. Our daughter is so good. So we should find someone better. Do you think that young man is pretty good? Marianne stood behind Marquis Luther. Her eyes lit up, and she asked with some temptation. Not bad. At least, he is the most outstanding knight among all the knights I have ever seen. Marquis Luther nodded. Is he just a knight? Not a noble? Marianne asked in surprise. How could a noble lady like Hathaway marry a knight of unknown status? Marquis Luther smiled, made a reassuring gesture to her, and said, Now he is a noble. Jonah, Bugis and others jointly recommended him to His Majesty Charles. He is currently a baron. His performance in this plain war is outstanding. What's even more rare is that he has been working hard. Live up to the virtues of a knight. Marion slowly breathed a sigh of relief, but thought that Luther had wasted so many favors by recommending a knight as a noble, which was considered as an investment in this knight. Then he said, You recommended him to become a noble, and you also married your favorite daughter to him. You really think highly of him. Marquis Luther was noncommittal and only said, If you have the chance to meet him, you will know whether my judgment is correct or not. I believe you because I know how much you love our daughter. Marion got the news she wanted to know, lowered her head, kissed Marquis Luther on the forehead, and said, In the book opposite Celia Cooper, a pencil illustration suddenly appeared. The picture became a little blurry due to the age. When she first saw the painting, she saw the illustration of a two-faced, for armed demon god standing on the top of the holy mountain. He was holding a dove of peace and an olive branch in one hand, and a sword and shield in the other. This demon is almost identical to the one summoned by Serdak on the sacrificial altar. Celia Cooper was shocked when she saw this god and demon for the first time. She closed her magic notebook in an instant, and the notebook fell to the table with a snap. There was only a book filled with goblin words left standing on the desk, and the pages were turning in a very natural manner without the wind. Soldak was sitting on the desk opposite. He thought that Celia Cooper's sole body had been affected by some impact. He quickly put down the envelope in his hand and walked over to check it. He took the book with the elf writing away, putting it aside. I didn't find any illustrations in the book. He casually opened the last page of the magic notebook and saw Celia Cooper dazed on the railing, then said, I thought you were okay if something happened to you. After saying that, he immediately closed the book. After all, it seemed a bit rude to open the pages of the book without saying age, low in advance. Chapter 532 Summer Night The magic notes were reopened on the table, and Celia Cooper's figure reappeared. Soldak said to Celia Cooper, I thought something was wrong with you, so I opened the page. Actually, I found something that might interest you. Celia Cooper waved her hand behind the book railing and said, After saying that, Celia Cooper turned the book with Goblin writing back to the page with a hand-drawn two-sided forearm demon. Serdak saw the picture scroll sketch with pencil at a glance. The pencil drawing had become a little blurry. But the two-sided and four-armed demon statue stood in the center of the picture scroll. He asked in surprise. It says what is it? He originally thought that this two-faced. Four-armed demon was just an obscure god believed by the indigenous tribes of the Warsaw Plain. But he did not expect that this was also recorded in the goblin books. Celia Cooper leaned against the railing in the book. 
looked at the page very seriously, and said to Soldak, According to this book by a goblin scholar who studied the origin of the world and the doctrine of the gods. In the age of goblins, countless goblin great inventors created hex technology that belonged to goblins. They even used technology mixed with magic to create titans that were comparable to ancient giants. Once upon a time in the Dark Ages, an archangel named Daenerys fell in love with a female demon named Lilith and created a plane called Sanctuary in a corner of the world. In the countless years that followed, countless wars broke out in the Sanctuary plane until that dark civilization was completely destroyed. And even the legendary Sanctuary disappeared into the vast star field. This two-faced, four-armed demon god was also born after the Dark Ages. Although he looks like a demon god statue, he actually has two names, namely Anu and Tashimit. However, because he belongs to the gods and the dual identity of the devil has never been accepted by the gods of the kingdom of God. Later, the god who rules the dark world has become the dark goddess Selene. This demon god is worshipped by many primitive tribes in small plains. Many natives of the plain tribes believe that this demon god created them. However, this belief is not accepted by the gods in the kingdom of gods. Just like the goblins firmly believe in technology, the power can compete with magic and theurgy. These are heretical doctrines that are deviant. The goblins who created the Tata Giants wanted to fight against the gods. But in the end they failed miserably, causing the entire race to be lost in the dust of history. This book said that the explanation was only the name and origin of this demon god. The goblin scholar used this to demonstrate the feasibility of fighting against the gods. The goblins believed that there were also great differences among the gods in the kingdom of gods. And they also there are some gods that are not accepted by them. And these are the objects that the goblins need to unite with. Celia Cooper was proficient in goblin writing. After reading this page, she stared at Soldak. Serdak also did not expect that the two-faced and four-armed god and demon once controlled the darkness, but was later driven out of the dark realm. All this time, he only knew that by offering sacrifices to the gods and demons during the sacrificial ceremony, he could obtain six kinds of blessings. There are three types of blessings from God, body of divine blessing, shield of blessing, and eye of truth. The other three demonic blessings are rarely used, namely death and withering, death's whisper, and life's burning. He just felt that the effects of the last three blessings were more like black magic, so he rarely used the blessings of the golem. Now that he knew something about the origin of this demon god, he didn't expect that it was an ancient god from a long time ago. Celia, do you know why the goblins declined? Soldak sat on the chair and flipped through the book curiously. He didn't recognize a single letter of the goblin characters on it. Celia Cooper touched her chin with her hand and said in the tone of a magic teacher, The main reason for the demise of the goblins was that they were so powerful that they could threaten the gods of the kingdom of God at that time. So what the created titans had the power is even comparable to that of weak gods. And many goblins have no faith. They believe that the combination of technology and magic can interpret the power of the world's laws, which accelerated the world at that time to escape the control of the gods, causing the gods to make prophecies about the goblins. With a curse. No one talks about this very often, Soldek said. Celia Cooper said matter-of-factly. Of course, this topic was quite taboo in the past. Very few people knew about it. And even those who knew did not dare to say it. Because once these things were discussed, the temple with the fighting priests will come to your door soon. Even though the priests and priests in these temples usually have a pleasant appearance. When it comes to their taboos, their methods of dealing with heretics are more cruel than anyone else. The simplest way to die is to be burned at the stake. Then it doesn't matter if we discuss it here? Serdak asked in a low voice. Celia Cooper waved her hand casually and said, It's nothing now. Those temples are almost abandoned. The battle priests and priests have gone to no one knows where. Who has time to take care of these? Thinking of those ghost monkeys in the underground ruins. It is hard to believe that their ancestors actually created a civilization. Serdak sighed. It's a pity that those goblins have turned into ghost monkeys. Ghost monkeys are just a local term. Magicians call these goblins, who have fallen and degenerated into beasts as goblins. Celia Cooper said. After leaving the security station, Serdak was still thinking about the demon god. Now that he knew it was a god from ancient times, he wanted to try to communicate with the demon god. After more than a year of contact, Serdak felt that this god was very fair, and he would be rewarded as long as he offered sacrifices. Back home, before Rita had time to ask Serdak why he came back so early today, Serdak locked himself in the room first. In the past, when he lit up the nodes of his body through meditation, he would also when he is locked in his room, 
his family knows that he is practicing meditation. And no one usually disturbs him at this time. Seeing Soldak coming back, she locked herself in the room. Rita and Natasha, who came out of the kitchen, looked at each other and went about their separate ways. Serdak sat on the edge of the bed and sat quietly for a while. Recently, his body seems to have reached a bottleneck. The sacred aura fills his upper body. But it seems that there is a natural diaphragm in the chest and abdomen, completely blocking these sacred auras. In his spiritual sea of consciousness, there seem to be countless dark stars in the infinite void of his lower body, hidden in the darkness. He tried to light up these dark stars, but he never found an effective way. However, he had a vague feeling that the opportunity for breakthrough should be hidden in these dark stars. After thinking about it, a sacrificial ceremony was arranged on the floor of the room. As the faint blue flames in the four pottery bowls were ignited, the double-faced four-armed demon statue appeared in front of Serdak again. This time, no sacrifice was taken out from the magic pocket. He sat quietly in the center of the altar, closed his eyes, and let himself enter a meditative state. He was in the sea of spiritual consciousness. The spiritual power in his body was rippling outward like a tide. Sure enough, he was in the world of the sea of spiritual consciousness. Here, this demon statue also exists. And it looks many times taller than what you can see. Serdak stood in front of him. Like an ant standing in front of an elephant. A huge amount of spiritual power hit Serdak's sea of spiritual consciousness. Like a spiritual storm. Serdak felt that the countless bright stars in the spiritual world he had built suddenly dimmed. The entire void in the star field was replaced by a face of God with holes in his eyes. Serdak floated in midair. And behind him were countless lit stars. As the thoughts in Soldak's mind arose, the magical symbols replaced by the body of divine blessing, the shield of blessing, and the eye of truth wrapped in the mana flame appeared in front of Serdak one after another. Then a magic line rose above these three magic symbols. After the magic line went up two feet, three novel magic symbols appeared in front of Serdak. The flames of magic on these three magic symbols became even more intense. Although Serdak couldn't understand the meaning of these three magic symbols, a feeling arose from the bottom of his heart for no reason, which suddenly made his mind clear. Behind the three blessings of gods are more powerful blessings. And the way to obtain these three powerful blessings is also very simple. That is, Serdak needs to sacrifice higher level sacrifices. Tyrants. Holy Shield. Insight. As soon as Serdak learned the names of these three powerful blessings, he felt dizzy and then lost consciousness. Dak. Duck. What's wrong with you? An anxious call came from Serdak's ears. And then he felt a pair of cold little hands stroking his body. And someone even wanted to pick him up. He reluctantly opened his eyes. The light in the room was dim. After his pupils slowly focused, the first thing he saw was the beams on the roof. Then came Natasha's delicate face. Her originally pointed chin now had a bit of baby fat. She stared at Soldak anxiously, her big blue eyes filled with mist. Soldak stretched out his hand, tucking her long, loose blonde hair behind her ears. Um, it's nothing. I seem to be mentally exhausted. My head hurts. Help me. When Serdak spoke, he felt like he was hungover. His head was spinning, and he had a splitting headache. He couldn't help but want to moan. When he closed his eyes, it felt like the whole world was spinning. He could only say to Natasha, who was holding his upper body and trying to drag him to the bed, Natasha, give me that glass of water. Okay. Natasha took a pillow from the bed and put it under his head, then stood up and walked towards the desk. Don't worry. This kind of mental exhaustion is nothing. It will get better soon, Serdak said to Natasha. Natasha had already started calling Rita at this time. And then, there was the sound of the door opening in the main room next door. Rita ran over first, followed by old Sheila and little Peter. Everyone was shocked when they saw Serdak lying on the ground like a drunkard. Rita was a little stronger than Natasha. The two women held Soldak's arms respectively and lifted him to the bed. Serdak saw that it was almost dusk outside the window. And then he realized why the room was so dark. Serdak did not dare to lie down on the bed. As soon as he lay down, he felt that the whole world was spinning so he could only sit on the edge of the bed and wait for him to drink some water before his condition recovered a little. Old Sheila hugged little Peter and sat on a chair nearby. Seeing Soldak's face pale, she said to him, You should pay more attention to what you learned in the Night Academy. Natasha doesn't know much about it, and she doesn't know what to do if something goes wrong. So you have to rely on yourself in this regard. I don't understand the general principles, so I can only tell you, don't rush for success in everything. 
When old Sheila said these words, although she had a straight face, there was still a hint of concern in her tone. Soldat could only nod his head in agreement. After saying this, old Sheila took little Peter back to the room when she saw that Soldak's condition had stabilized. Serdak ate his dinner while lying on the bed. Under Natasha's arrangement, in addition to a wooden bed and wooden table, a row of small cabinets were added to the wall. Besides some of little Peter's wooden swords and bucklers, there were also Soldak's swords and shields. There is also a wooden shelf in the room specially used for hanging armor structures. And the earth shield magic pattern structure is hung neatly on it. With Natasha's meticulous care, Soldak found that it was a good thing to be sick occasionally. Under the candlelight, Natasha held a bowl of oatmeal and fed the porridge into Soldak's mouth. Her voice was very low. She patted her plump breasts with her hands and said to Soldak, It really scared me just now. Serdak smiled and said nothing, then stretched out his hand to touch her delicate and soft waist. She was a little ticklish and twisted uneasily. She couldn't avoid it and let him do whatever he wanted. After carefully blowing out the candles, Natasha laid down next to Soldak in a thin nightgown. Her body exuded a light scent of soap. The moonlight is like water, and the summer breeze is slightly cool. The moonlight outside the window fell into the floor of the room. Reflecting a large square grid, a delicate face came up to Soldak, touched his head with his hand again, and asked in a low voice with concern, Do you feel better? Soldak couldn't help but reached out and held her delicate face, kissed her soft lips, and the room became quiet for a while. After the sound of rapid breathing was infinitely amplified, the wooden bed seemed a little overwhelmed. Cool summer night. The sound of frogs croaked from the creek that ran through the village. A trickling stream flows past the wheat fields and through the starch rinsing workshops in the village. A row of large water tanks beside the stream are filled with clean water. The stream flows down through the arched waterway of row houses across the river. And countless streams smash into the iron fence in the middle of the waterway. Then it condensed back into a clear stream and flowed into the river bend downstream. Chapter 533 The Old Village Chief's First Order As summer approaches, cassava is no longer available in the free markets of Aranza City. The cassava trees in the mountains cannot be dug until autumn. Due to the inability to purchase raw materials, the starch workshop in Ware Village suspended the production of starch. In the village, only a row of neat water tanks were left next to the laundry pool, which was surrounded by walls. A flat cement platform was built and the women in the village squatted beside the cement platform in the shade of the trees while washing clothes. A group of half-grown children jumped into the clear water for a swim, which is a summer mecca for children in the village. In summer, the water in the creek becomes very abundant, and the clear springs in the mountains are like beating notes. Tinkling in the valley, only one gate of the secondary reservoir was opened. The stream flowing from the gate hit the water wheel, causing the water wheel to rotate slowly. The water wheel drove the huge stone mill and the mill next to it to slowly rotate. The old village Chombright also built a mill in the village. And villagers could carry wheat here to grind wheat flour at any time. The room where Serdak prepared gunpowder was some distance away from Wall Village. In a townhouse near a river, Serdak only prepared ten packets of gunpowder each time, and then guided the cobalt slaves between the mountain walls, dig a deep hole, stuff the gunpowder inside, and then detonate it. When the explosive detonates, the entire hill will tremble violently. These shattered stones are the main targets for the 600 cobalt slaves to mine the rocks. They will pry the loose rocks out of the stone walls. And the giant stones will be smashed into smaller ones. And some smaller stones. The cobalt slaves use chisels to remove the sharp corners and shape them into rectangular stone strips as much as possible. Cobalt slaves are very good at digging rocks. In order to build the townhouses in Wall Village, 600 cobalt slaves almost dug a large hole in the mountains outside the village. From a distance, it looked like a giant hole was punched out of the mountain wall. Big hole. Another busy month has passed. In late August, veterans who joined the militia camps from each village came to the security station again to receive rations. They lined up to carry away the whole wheat flour. The villagers in Wall imagined that they were training hard in the yard of the police station, but they did not appear. They still received the rations and left the village. Seeing such a scene, many villagers in Wall Village felt as if they had eaten sour lemons. They finally realized what they had missed. Many people regretted it and wanted to find the old village chief to intercede in front of Soldak and be willing to join the militia camp. But they were scolded and ran away by the old village chief Bright on the spot. A group of villagers stood on the construction site of the small townhouse with tools, watching with envy as the veterans left carrying food on their backs. It's not a big deal. A villager stretched his neck 
and looked at it for a long time. He looked back with complicated emotions and said to his companions, Those wheat flour may be infested with borers. Yes, it must be like that, said the villager next to him. In more than a month, the wheat in our fields will be almost mature. There will be no shortage of water during this year's drought, and the wheat will grow very well. It is expected that we will have a bumper harvest. We don't even need to store cassava and other grains. With these wheat alone, enough to last us all winter. Speaking of this, several villagers from Wall Village suddenly became energetic and chimed in. With all the money we earn, how much wheat can't we buy? The townhouses in Wall Village look the same every day, and they are being built at a speed visible to the naked eye. One of the earliest townhouses built has had its roof sealed. The first batch of villagers began to move into small townhouses one after another. The villagers who lived in this small building were the same people whose houses were destroyed when the rebels invaded Wall Village. Now they have become Wall Village. The first batch of beneficiaries in the village became the envy of the whole village. The walls of these houses are still slightly damp and have not yet been painted with white plaster. A group of carpenters are installing doors and windows. Everything is so new. All the villagers in Wall Village are very busy this summer. They have to build all the townhouses before autumn. The wheat in the field began to grow wildly, and many villagers in other villages were idle during this time. These villagers from other villages came to Ware Village to find work. Some people also brought their children to Ware Village. They sent their younger children to children's homes while they went to the construction site to move stones. With the participation of these villagers from other villages, the construction speed of townhouses in the village suddenly accelerated. The villagers of Wall Village felt the pressure brought by the competition from the villagers from other villages. They began to huddle tightly and squeeze the villagers from other villages. As soon as this trend showed some signs, it was quickly suppressed by the old village chief Bright, and everything anyone who hinders the development of Wall Village will be killed by the old village chief. According to the words of the old village chief, don't think that you are from Wall Village and everything you do should be taken for granted. If anyone dares to cause trouble, I will send him to the slave camp to dig rocks with such kobolds. With the words of the old village chief Bright, the villagers have indeed become much more peaceful during this time. Recently, there are always horse-drawn carriages delivering supplies to the village. So the entrance to the village has become very lively. In addition to the supplies agreed upon by the cargo owners, these carriage drivers who drove over from the city of Helensa also brought with them some dried meat, chickens, ducks, and daily miscellaneous goods. After many carriage drivers have delivered their goods, they are willing to set up a stall at the entrance of Wall Village to sell the private goods they brought over. These private goods range from various types of food to groceries and daily necessities. And the types are also diverse. The villagers work on the construction site every day, with some extra money in their pockets. They have more to think about. Occasionally, I will buy a dried chicken or duck to take home so that the whole family can have a good meal, as the price of sulfur or on the market continues to rise. There have been some adventure groups and mercenary groups coming from Alensa City in search of sulfur or in the village recently. These adventure groups also brought some caravans, and they search for sulfur deposits everywhere in the barren land. In this way, Wall Village has become the best place for adventure groups, mercenary groups, and caravans to settle. The adventure group rushes from Helanza City to the Paglos Pass, usually arriving at Wall Village in the evening. Most adventure groups will not go further. They will choose to set up camp at the entrance of the village. Many members of the adventure group still they will go into the village and ask the villagers about the deserted land. And some adventure groups will even hire guides. Usually at this time, the villagers in Wall Village are not too willing to talk to them. If it were in the past, the villagers would definitely not refuse. But now every family is eager to live in a small townhouse. And no one wants to live in this hot weather. In the summer, running into the depths of the deserted land to eat sand and staying in the village to build buildings are far more profitable than working as a guide. The old village chief asked some villagers to pick some seasonal vegetables from the tidal flats and sell them at the entrance of the village. Whether it is an adventure group or a mercenary group, a caravan or the like. In addition to wheat cakes and broth, some vegetables are also essential for dinner. Unknowingly, the village entrance slowly developed into a small market in just a few weeks. Sometimes some villagers from neighboring villages would bring some goods to sell here. Some businessmen passing by also saw this opportunity. They rented a row house from the old village chief as a warehouse and usually sold some goods that could not be sold out. Goods are stored in the townhouse. A small market slowly appeared outside the village of Wall and Paglos Pass. It provides necessary supplies for all adventure groups that go deep into Paglos Mountain and the deserted lands. 
ever since the ogre Gulitum decided to graze sheep in Bago pasture. The number of yellow sheep in the village began to shrink rapidly, so that Serdek had to purchase some yellow sheep every once in a while to supplement the sheep in the village. Middle. Gulitum had a high talent for cooking, and he quickly mastered the skill of roasting lamb. The whole roasted lamb was roasted on the charcoal fire until the skin was crispy and the meat was rotten, and he stuffed it into his stomach with wheat cakes. A large pot of vegetable soup will make the ogre's belly bulge. He would occasionally go to the lava river in Pussy Mountain to hunt salamanders. Usually new salamanders were discovered in the sulfur mines. And then Luke would send people to Wall Village for help. Gulitum had recently been the most what he likes to do is hunt salamanders so that he can eat the freshest salamander meat. Charlie and Luke believed that this river of lava must be connected to the center of the mountain. And these salamanders swam out of the center of the mountain along the river of lava. These salamanders are second-level monsters with tough skin and thick flesh and are not afraid of flames. Ordinary warriors basically have nothing to do with them. Only warriors like Gulitum and Andrew had the ability to kill salamanders. During this period, seven or eight salamanders were hunted and killed, which became an extra income for Serdek. Salamander meat is delicious and rich in fire elements. Some magicians who are good at fire like to eat it. Therefore, this kind of monster meat is expensive in the city of Halanza. After Serdek sold salamander meat several times in Halanza city, a magician flew to Wall Village on a magic harpoon to buy salamander meat. Sometimes a magician who is lucky will happen to meet the ogre Gulitum returning from the depths of the barren land carrying a salamander, and he can get some fresh salamander meat. The construction speed of Serdak's manor is very fast. After all, he is the main financial sponsor of all projects in Wall Village. Every day, more than 40 bricklayers build the main body of the mansion in Serdak New Manor, and trucks of volcanic ash and limestone are transported. Arriving at the reservoir, high walls on all sides soon appeared in front of everyone. By early September, a gorgeous three-story villa appeared at the uppermost reaches of Wall Village. Old Sheila would take Little Peter around this gorgeous villa every day. She would always secretly say to Little Peter, Grow up quickly! My Little Peter! Grow up quickly! My Little Peter! Peter! On the day the villa was built, Carl Casement from Hellanza City personally sent him a cashmere carpet that could be spread in the living room. The patterns and colors on it are said to come from the orc tribe of Pi Plateau. Female orcs are born with rug knitting expert. Tax collector Bird and Mrs. Hoyle sent a set of walnut furniture. The whole set includes the living room sofa slash coffee table slash desk slash display table slash wardrobe slash cabinet slash double bed slash dressing table, etc. These walnut furniture wooden furniture can almost fill three rooms. The walnut furniture in Halenza City is second only to indigo wood furniture. Serdak is not prepared to buy such high-end furniture. In the carpenter workshop of Alinsa City, the most common is oak furniture, which is strong, sturdy, heavy, durable, and fire-resistant. To fill such a large house with furniture, Serdak would have to spend at least nearly a hundred additional gold coins. In addition to the furniture, he also had to prepare carpets for the corridors, cashmere carpets for the living room, and cashmere carpets for the bedrooms, velvet blankets, various murals and ornaments, more than 50 sets of curtains, sheets for 14 beds, and some supplies for the kitchen and bathroom. The entire exterior wall of the villa is made of limestone, and the even stone gaps are filled with potsalanic cement. According to Soldak's requirements, the potsalanic cement is applied very smoothly, and it looks like a flat circular pattern from a distance. The entire house with stone walls feels extremely heavy. Carl stood in the empty garden of Soldak's house looking at the villa built on the mountains and rivers a few dozen meters away, looking a little jealous, and also clamoring to build a stronger one with volcanic ash cement and granite. The house must be at least as strong as the walls of the fortress of Lakhan in Derwa province. So the cement workshop that had not yet been established in Wall Village received its first order to build a villa for bearing Carl Casement in his territory that is stronger than the fortress of Rohan. In addition to the three-story main building, it also needs to have an attic and a watchtower as well as a dungeon and underground storage underground room. In his garden, Soldak asked Rita to bring a piece of parchment, and he drew an architectural diagram for Carl on the spot. The connection between the spiral staircases and corridors on each floor was handled just right. Carl stared at Sue Erdak asked him curiously, Dak, where did you learn this knowledge about architecture? Of course, Serdak couldn't say how many high-rise buildings he had seen in his previous life. He could only bite the bullet, and pointed to the small townhouses on the slopes of the valley and said, Look at how many small buildings I have built recently. I also made a model out of clay, 
and wood and placed it in the central square of the village. Almost all the small townhouses were built based on that model. Carl looked at Soldak with some suspicion. Although he felt something was wrong. He didn't go into details. He happily said to the old village chief beside him, Mr. Bright, I'd like you to pay more attention to my villa. Mayor Bright didn't expect to receive a commission to build a house in the village. Not to mention building a house in the village. Moreover, if calculated carefully, this project should be able to make a fortune. Thinking that he had no previous experience in undertaking construction projects, the village chief Bright said with a guilty conscience, Duck, none of us have ever left Wall Village and there are volcanic ash and stones. Uncle Bright, it doesn't matter. We will transport the volcanic ash cement directly from the deserted land. As for the stones, you can buy them from nearby quarries or use dry firewood locally. Just follow the way to build my villa. It doesn't matter. Big deal, Serdak said to the old village chief. Hearing Soldak say this, the village chief of Bright nodded. He thought that after completing this project, the money he could earn might be higher than the annual harvest of Wall Village. And his heart was filled with excitement. Chapter 530 For the Enemy Appears Again September in the deserted land has survived the hottest summer. There is a large temperature difference between day and night in the deserted land. During the day, the vicious sun can almost burn off a layer of skin on a person. But at night, the mountain breeze blows, and the coolness will penetrate into the bones. The members of the adventure group go out at night when camping. You need to wrap yourself in a blanket to sleep. Some adventure groups finally pass through the desolate land and touch the edge of Pudu Mountain. They wrap themselves tightly in linen cloth, passed through the dead area covered with volcanic ash, and came to the foot of Pudu Mountain where volcanic ash was falling from the sky. When I saw the crater with billowing smoke, I was ready to look for sulfur deposits along the smoke column. But no matter how they went around, they couldn't get around the boundary markers made of wooden boards. The boundary markers were written with the words, Boundary Markers of the Barony of Soldak, which seemed to be specifically designed to enclose the Pudu Mountain. The adventure group found that these boundary markers actually completely enclosed the entire Pudu Mountain. They wanted to get closer to the Pudu Mountain. There is no way to avoid entering the Baronage of Serdak. Passing through the noble territory is not a big deal for the adventure group. But the real purpose of these adventure groups is to discover new sulfur veins. Therefore, they must avoid the noble territory. Otherwise, opening a mine in the noble territory will definitely constitute theft. Yes, once it is brought to the noble court, in order to protect the best interests of the nobles, the party who committed the theft will be punished until he regrets having the shameful idea in the first place. After the adventure group bypasses the Pussy Mountains and enters the Paglos Mountains, they will find that the boundary marker ends abruptly among the Green Mountains. There are no other volcanoes in the southern section of the Paglos Mountains. But there are some mountain hot springs. Some hot springs in the valleys are also full of strong sulfur smell. However, it is very difficult to open a mine here. First of all, this place is located at the other end of the desolate land, deep into the Paglos Mountains. It is inaccessible and inhabited by monsters. To get here, you have to pass through a desolate land. Even if there are some sulfur mines in the valley, ordinary miners cannot survive in such a dangerous area. It is not realistic to clean up all the monsters in the mountains. An adventure group or mercenary group is required to be stationed in the mine for a long time, which will further increase the cost of mine operation. Even under current market conditions, the market price of sulfur mines has been rising all the way. The high operating costs that need to be borne by opening a sulfur mine deep in the Paglos Mountains are still unbearable for those businessmen. But even so, several small-scale sulfur mines still appeared in several valleys, with hot springs in the Paglos Mountains near Pudu Mountain. The closest sulfur mine to Serdak's territory is even far away from the boundary monument to the north of Pudu Mountain. Luke guarded the sulfur mines on this side of the Lava River. He could often see adventure groups walking knee-deep in volcanic ash. He sent people to deliver a message to Serdak and had people ride horses along Pussy Mountain. The baronial boundary markers patrolled to ensure that these boundary markers were still erected in their original positions. In late August, the task of patrolling along the boundary markers was handed over to the indigenous warrior Andrew. In addition to patrolling the 19 natural villages in the deserted land, the indigenous warrior Andrew also visited the Serdak territory. The indigenous warrior Andrew was no longer satisfied with the battle of wits and courage with the bandits in the desert, and perfectly avoided the battle of Wall Village. Andrew's body was burning with flames of war, especially after Soldak successfully implanted a magic pattern breeding suit on his chest. This desire to fight became even stronger. It's like an invisible flame burning my body every moment. Andrew rode the horse 
that had already adapted to the deserted land. He took off the water bag from the saddle and poured the last bit of water in the water bag into his throat. The cool water dripped on his face, and the moist coolness made him feel better. He wanted to find a shady place before noon to avoid the scorching sun at noon. If he remembered correctly, there were two huge rocks like door frames not far ahead. Andrew could find a touch of coolness under the boulder, have a nice sleep there, and wait until dusk was approaching before continuing to ride on horseback. He has been patrolling the deserted land for a whole summer and has already mastered the survival mode here. As expected, after turning around a hill filled with volcanic ash, we saw a huge boulder not far ahead. The warhorse under Andrew suddenly became energetic. It ran hard to the boulder. Andrew led the warhorse to a shady place and nailed the water gathering scroll to the stone wall. Drops of water condensed in front of the water gathering scroll. The drops fell into the iron plate below. And the horse quickly lowered his head and drank the clear water collected in the iron plate, occasionally licking the rock wall with his rough tongue. Andrew sprinkled a little dragon dung powder around the stone wall. This kind of dragon dung is not expensive, but it is a good powder to repel poisonous insects. In the deserted land, every shady place is where poisonous insects, snakes and ants gather. Many gray rock iguanas will also hide in deeper rock crevices. In order not to be disturbed by poisonous insects, Andrew sprinkled a little dragon dung so that I can sleep until sunset. It's near the edge of the desert. Last time he met a group of sand bandits near here. He chased a dozen bandits on horseback alone. It wasn't until the bandits fled into the desert that Andrew stopped chasing. The result was five sand bandits, the thief's head, and three saltasha horses. Now these three horses are already in the team in Wall Village. In just one year, the number of four-wheeled carriages in Wall Village has grown to 40. If it were not limited by the number of coachmen, this number would be at least more. At a base, Andrew used a shovel to dig through the dry volcanic ash until the rocky ground was exposed under the ash layer. Then he spread a wolfskin mattress in the pit. The pit was close to the huge rock. Just in the shadow of the huge rock, he wore a heavy armor lay on the mattress, closing his eyes to maintain his strength. This is the rule of the guard camp. If you go out on a mission alone, you are not allowed to take off your armor even if you are sleeping. He hoped to see some adventurous group sneaking into the territory to steal sulfur mines. And then he could legitimately start a fight. He raised his right hand. And with a thought, a trace of warmth flowed through his chest. And a flame appeared silently. This flame wrapped around his right hand. But his hand could not feel the heat of the flame. He just felt a ball of warmth envelop his right hand. This is the effect of the magic pattern breeding equipment rage flame. At present. Except that it can help him quickly raise a fire in the cold night. It has not shown any effect. However, the embarrassing thing is that in this desolate land, thinking of it is also extremely difficult to find firewood to make a fire. Andrew controlled his emotions, watched the flame on his hand gradually extinguish, then squinted his eyes and prepared to sleep for a while. There was a messy sound of horse hooves on the rocky ground beneath him. Andrew, who was sleeping, opened his eyes. He sat up suddenly from the wolfskin mattress and quickly pulled the warhorse standing beside him licking the rough rock wall, into the rock, in the shadows. He lay on the sand and peered out in the direction of the sound of horse hooves. I saw a group of rebel cavalry appearing on the Gobi. The rebel leader was leading a small cavalry team towards the boulder. Six people in total. Andrew didn't even think much about it. He only saw the posture of the rebels on horseback and knew that they were a group of hard bones. Their riding posture was a standard as a textbook, although he didn't know how long they had traveled but that the few war horses showed no signs of fatigue. I heard that there are about three squadrons of the northern rebels sneaking into the city of Halansa this time. Only one of the cavalry squadrons that attacked Wall Village last month means that there are at least two cavalry squadrons operating in Halansa, in the area of Sac City. Carl was very busy every day because of this matter, but he couldn't even touch the tail of these rebels, suppressing the raging flames of war burning in his heart. Andrew did not dare to take another look, for fear that after one glance, he would change his mind and turn around to fight with this group of rebel cavalry in the depths of the deserted land. He was not worried about anything else. I was just worried that no one would spread the news about the presence of rebel cavalry near Pudu Mountain. Andrew quickly put away the water collecting scroll on the stone wall, poured the water from the water dish into the water bag, and drank the remaining water in one gulp. After packing up and saluting, he pulled his horse to the other side of the boulder. It was already three or four o'clock in the afternoon and the most vicious and hot time of the day had passed. He mounted his horse and immediately ran south, preparing to escape from the sight of the rebel cavalry before they could react. 
But what Andrew didn't expect was that his horse had already run into the slope covered with volcanic ash. The rebel cavalry discovered his presence a little earlier than he expected. But the rebel knights did not even stop. He meant to stay. So he chased him on horseback from under the huge rock. The six rebel cavalry were like a giant net wrapping around Andrew. At this moment, Andrew's heart was also extremely hot. He touched the butcher's axe on his body with some excitement. He wanted to pull the rein several times and turn around to kill back. On your own territory, there is no reason to be chased around by these rebel cavalry. Andrew was a little excited, and he hit his chest twice with his fist. Less than 15 kilometers to the southwest, you can see the sulfur mine of the river of lava. But Andrew is not prepared to lead the rebel cavalry there. Although there are 400 cobalt slaves there, but facing such well-trained rebel knights, it was obviously useless. If it doesn't work well, it will bring disaster to the villagers of Wall Village, who supervise the cobalt slaves. So Andrew ran directly towards the south. And if he ran further ahead, he would reach the edge of the desert. This is also the outermost boundary of Alinsa City. Andrew is going to use his familiarity with the surrounding environment and use his horses to take advantage of their well-rested horses, and their physical strength must be better than those of the rebel cavalry. To pull apart, it is best to stay alone or act in pairs. Andrew took the opportunity to defeat the six rebel cavalry one by one. He remembered that there were several large sand dunes connected together at the edge of the desert. And he initially pinned the battlefield there. The large sand dune is easy to find. The most eye-catching symbol is a stone pillar nearly 30 meters high near the desert. This stone pillar stands so abruptly in the desert and is covered with sandstones left behind by the wind and sand. There are traces of stripes. And the entire stone pillar also shows a shuttle shape. The war horses ran all the way, not only not getting rid of the rebel cavalry, but also allowing those rebel cavalry to close the distance. Those rebels didn't know what kind of training they had received. In such adversity, the potential that broke out was actually stronger than Andrew's. Andrew was looking forward to running to the sand dunes as soon as possible. Anyone who comes to the sand dunes for the first time will get lost in the large sand dunes that surround each other. Just when Andrew wanted to escape to the big sand dune, he saw the stone pillar from a distance. In addition to the stone pillar, he also vaguely saw a man fighting on the top of the stone pillar. But the distance was too far. It seems that the figure is just a small black dot. Andrew couldn't think of anyone who would have the courage to climb that 30 meter high stone pillar. After being weathered for a long time, the stone pillar now looked shaky making it even more dangerous to climb on it. He was also worried that there was a group of rebels hiding there. It would be the most troublesome if he was accidentally attacked by two rebel teams. The thought went back and forth in Andrew's mind several times. As he approached the stone pillar, the figure on the stone pillar gradually became clearer. Just looking at the tight red leather armor and the hood that covered his face, Andrew was completely relieved of his mental arithmetic. Before Soldat could send a signal to Samira, Samira was sitting on a high stone pillar found Andrew who was on the run here. Samira made a familiar gesture to Andrew. Andrew rode swiftly into the sand dunes, followed by the rebel cavalry behind him. At the same time, they lost Andrew's figure in their sight, and several rebel cavalry felt a sense of crisis in their hearts. They stopped outside the big sand dune and hesitated for a while. The leader of the rebel cavalry led one of his men to chase down the direction in which Andrew disappeared. The other four rebel cavalry were divided into two teams going around from one left and one to the right. Prepare to catch Andrew hiding in the dunes in one fell swoop. The leader of the rebel cavalry was holding a spear in his hand. There was a scar on his face diagonally across the bridge of his nose. His face looked a bit ferocious. His face already showed a great fatigue, and he continued to use his riding skills. The secret method transfers one's physical strength to the war horse. After running such a long distance, the war horse is not only exhausted at this time, but even the rebel cavalry is extremely exhausted. Andrew guessed that these rebel cavalry broke into pieces and sneaked into the Padlos Mountains and the deserted areas. They must be looking for some secrets. The rebel leader was worried that if the news spread, it would attract more prying eyes. So he bit Andrew and tried his best to keep him. Chapter 535 Rebel The setting sun was close to the horizon, rendering a large fiery red cloud in the sky. The wind is not too strong, but when it blows over the large sand dunes, it will stir up some smoke like dust. The sand here is very fine and soft. When the war horse steps into it, the horse's legs will sink into it. Every time the war horse moves forward, every time he took a step, he had to work very hard to pull the horse's legs out of the fine sand. The leader of the rebel cavalry turned over and dismounted. The horse did not need to bear weight. 
so it was easier to walk in the sand. The pursuit target disappeared from sight, and a hint of gloom appeared in the rebel cavalry leader's heart. Over the years, he has experienced at least nearly a thousand battles, large and small. Many times, he has relied on a calm mind to get through difficulties at critical moments. Of course, some of them are considered lucky. In fact, luck is also a part of strength. His body is covered with various scars, and each scar records a glorious victory. The most dangerous one is the scar on his face. If the swordsman at that time stretched the sword forward more, one inch, if he takes it, his head will probably explode. And that swordsman will be the final winner. But now, he was standing on the sand with his horse intact. In addition to his strength, he also had some luck. The hard leather armor he wore was made of five layers of one horned bison skin. The works on the pipe plateau mastered this unique leather making technique. In order to purchase this batch of hard leather armor, at least dozens of rebel soldiers died. In the mountains at the eastern foot of the pipe plateau, the boots were filled with yellow sand, and he didn't want to pour it out. As long as you step on this big sand dune, your boots will be filled with yellow sand immediately. The war horses around him neighed in resistance. In this difficult sandy ground, such well-trained war horses would instinctively reject them. The rebel cavalry behind him followed him silently, with a pair of young eyes. His body was very strong, and he could still stride forward in the sand while carrying various supplies. He had killed many people in his life, and the sharp tip of the spear in his hand was stained with light blood. He also killed some kind people, but he never regretted the things he had done. But in order to survive, if you don't die, I will die. Of course I can't die. They need a local guide. This desolate land is too unfamiliar to northerners like them. Searching aimlessly in such a large land is far less comfortable than having a guide. Recently, many adventure groups and mercenary groups have appeared in the desolate land in order to cover up others' eyes. These rebel cavalry can only form small groups and scattered teams, scattered like scattered sand on this land. The leader of the rebel cavalry did not expect that the knight was so alert. Originally, they wanted to sneak around the stone gate and capture him in one fell swoop. The volcanic ash on the ground almost completely obscured the sound of the horse's hooves. But the other party still discovered them early. The first time he chose was to bypass the stone gate and escape into this large sand dune. The leader of the rebel cavalry looked at the yellow sand on the ground, which was covered with various shallow pits. He originally thought he could follow the footprints to find it. But now it seemed impossible. He wanted to climb to the highest point of the big sand dune, so that he could see farther from a higher place. The leader of the rebel cavalry looked toward the stone pillar dozens of meters, high a few hundred meters away. The stone pillar had experienced countless years and wind and sand, and was covered with carvings. The top of the stone pillar was unusually flat, like a lonely tree standing on the sand table. Flamulina, the tall stone pillars were empty. He was thinking that if he could climb up a stone pillar, the knight would immediately have nowhere to hide. The afterglow of the setting sun shone on his face, and he narrowed his eyes slightly. Boss. Why is that guy missing? Is he hiding with us? The young rebel behind him said to the leader of the rebel cavalry. How many times have I told you to call me captain? The rebel cavalry leader corrected. Young rebel is a very strong lad. He is also a mountain man whose identity is not recognized. The reason is that his grandmother was a female orc who joined the rebels after being rejected by human society. He is the new blood in the rebels and is good at everything. Young, strong, energetic, obedient and possessing good fighting talents. But the only thing they don't have is the belief in fighting. They are a group of rebels with faith. When this group of rebels was established, they aim to overthrow the centuries-old dictatorial rule of the Ali family in Sloit. They want the House of Representatives and the Parliament of Sloit Province to have greater authority, so that other lords of Sloit Province can have a certain say. However, this rebellion was eventually messed up. The Northwind Legion, which had always maintained a neutral attitude, became the Ali family's biggest trump card at the most critical moment. The Ali family has always controlled the North Wind Legion. It's just that they concealed it too well, or they were really too low-key. So much so that everyone thinks that the North Wind Legion is an independent force in Sloik province. All Northerners know that the duty of the North Wind Legion is entirely to defend against the barbarians on the ice and snow tundra in the north. They guard the galloping horses. The south bank of the river was turned into a great wall of flesh and blood in the Northern Territory, by the Green Empire people. And it was the backbone of all Northern Territory people. Now they, a group of rebels, have shown the world the fact that the North Wind Legion has always belonged to the Ally family. It has been like this since the first Duke of the Ally family, Duke Xiaotuan, change, 
even if no one in the top ranks of the North Wind Legion is a member of the Ellie family. This is probably one of the reasons why the Anjabal royal family of the Green Empire has not intervened in the political affairs of the North. Over the years, the Ellie family has never intermarried with members of the Angel Bold royal family. But the ladies of the Ellie family have been canonized as princesses by His Majesty the Green Empire from the moment they were born. This is not without reason. Now it seems that the Ali family has absolute control over Sloik province. But they have been running the northern border in a low-key manner, knowing how wrong he was at the beginning. The leader of the rebel cavalry also wanted to understand his old father's advice to him. Unfortunately, he was too young and energetic to listen to it at the time. And now, he has become a rebel who everyone wants to beat. Walking under the big sand dune, he felt a little confused in his heart. He didn't know why he thought of these messy things at this time. Maybe it was because he had been away from the north for so long that he felt homesick. The young rebel cavalry was chattering while vigilantly searching for any clues around him. Andrew lurked in the fine sand and heard the conversation between the two rebels. They led the horses and walked not very fast, walking over step by step. Their accents were somewhat similar to Captain Serdak's in some places, as if they were accents of certain parts of the imperial language. Step by step closer. 20 steps. 15 steps. 10 steps, 5 steps, 3 steps. Andrew emerged from the dusty yellow sand like a sand man. The yellow sand blocked the sight of the two rebel cavalry. An afterimage from the axe blade split the yellow sand and chopped it down towards the head of the rebel cavalry leader. The leader of the rebel cavalry hurriedly raised his shield and put his feet in a defensive posture, but did not take a step back. The spear in his hand was like a poisonous snake spitting out messages, secretly thrusting towards the opponent's belly which was often the weakest point of the armor. But before the spear in his hand could be thrust out, Andrew's other axe had already hit the tip of the spear. Sparks burst out. The rebel leader was shocked by the blow, and his palms went numb. Almost at the same time, the axe above his head slashing on the knight's shield. The iron sheet on the shield was instantly cut open. And then the hard leather under the iron sheet was slashed. And even the iron wood behind was smashed open. The sharp axe blade cut through the wrist guard on his arm. Although the arm was not severed, the incomparable force instantly made the rebel leader's shield holding arm lose consciousness. He staggered and was forced to take two steps back. Andrew let out a loud shout and took a step forward. The double axe in his hand slashed at the rebel leader like a mountain. The rebel leader groaned inwardly, knowing that if he couldn't block the first blow from the opponent's axe warrior, he would be completely passive and take a beating next time. Even though he tried his best, he was still forced to take a step back. It was impossible for Andrew to give the rebel leader a chance to breathe. The butcher in his hand could split a shield made of pure iron. This light shield had no defensive power. With three consecutive axes, the rebel leader was struck on the arm. The knight's light shield was smashed to pieces. And the rebel leader's arm was broken and hung down weakly. He held a spear in one hand and rolled awkwardly on the sand. Avoiding Andrew's pursuit, when the young rebel cavalry saw that the captain was beaten by the opponent and was unable to fight back, he put his hand into his mouth and whistled loudly, then grabbed his spear and charged towards Andrew. Andrew's body was always able to avoid the vital points of his body at the most critical moment, using his solid full-coverage armor to block the sharp spear in the hands of the young rebel. But Andrew chased the rebel leader into danger. The more Andrew refused to fight back, the more anxious the young rebel cavalry became. He even completely forgot the instructor's ardent warning when he held the whip during training. Completely gave up all defenses and launched an extreme strategy of full attack on Andrew. At the moment when the young rebel thrust his spear into Andrew's shoulder, Andrew turned around with a ferocious expression. The young rebel didn't want to lose the spear in his hand, so he was thrown away by Andrew. Then the young rebel saw the captain's horrified eyes. With this swing, Andrew's butcher's axe was already waiting in front of the young rebel. It was as if the young rebel himself had jumped on Andrew's axe. The heavy butcher's axe instantly opened a large gash in the young rebel's chest. The young rebel looked down at his sunken chest and let out an angry howl with his face covered in blood. He tried to hold onto Andrew's axe with both hands, but was kicked to the sand by Andrew. Behind the rebel leader, the shadow of a violent earth bear appeared, stabbing Andrew with a spear in his hand, making a crackling sound. Andrew casually pulled out the spear on his shoulder, and a pair of huge eyes appeared behind Andrew, staring coldly at the rebel leader. The two axes in his hands were folded together blocking the rebel leader's thunderous strike. At the same time, a searing flame emerged from the double axe, and the rebel leader instinctively ducked back, missing the best opportunity to withdraw the spear. 
Andrew took the opportunity to twist the spear with a pair of axes. The rebel leader, who had lost his arm, had no time to draw out the sword at his waist, and his head was chopped off by Andrew with an axe. The blood of the two rebels dyed the yellow sand under their feet red, and Andrew wiped the blood on the axe blade on the rebel leader. To be cautious, Andrew pulled out a skinning knife and cut off the heads of the two men. He glanced at the two war horses standing not far away. He was just about to mount the war horses and search for the other four rebel knights in the big sand dunes. A slender figure appeared on the top of the sand dune. She held four heads in her hand and waved to Andrew. Although he wore a hood on his head, Andrew could imagine how proud the winner's smile was on his face. Andrew and Samira brought back six more horses. For Serdak, this was not a good thing. It seems that the rebels have not given up the secrets in the Paglos Mountains. The rebels that Carl has been searching for have sneaked into the deserted land. These rebels have seriously affected the security of the deserted land. The war horses were tied outside the security station. But the rebels did not attack Wall Village rashly again. They even avoided all villages. The succubus Aphrodite glanced at Serdak and said, Maybe they are looking for the place in the magic crystal image. Soldak sat on the chair, looking at Andrew and Samira's tired appearance, and could only harden his heart and say, Now the deserted land and the Paglos Mountains are full of adventure groups and mercenary groups. It is not easy to find the rebels hidden among these adventure groups. We can only inform the villages to take more precautions and try to avoid when you go out alone and encounter rebels attacking a village. You should immediately pass on the news to the outside world. Andrew, you have to go to each village and hand these magic flares to the village chiefs, although it may not be useful. As he spoke, he took out a pack of magic flares from his magic belt bag and placed it on the table. Andrew was sitting aside drinking water. When Soldak said this, he nodded in agreement. Samira stared at Soldak with sharp eyes and asked him, Captain, do you want to summon the militia battalion? What do you think those veterans can be used for? Serdak asked with a look of astonishment on his face. Then why do you have to form such a useless militia battalion? Samira's big blue eyes blinked at Soldak. With this sentence clearly written in her eyes, Serdak could only explain, It may not be useful now, but that doesn't mean it won't be useful in the future. What's the use? The half-elf archer whispered, worried about offending Serdak. Samira just said this and stopped talking. Serdak ignored her and only said, now the support squadron has begun to conduct a large-scale investigation of the passing adventure groups and mercenary groups at the Paglos Pass, basically blocking the rebels from returning to Alinsa City. However, this is equivalent to forcing these rebels to stay in the desolate land. We have to find a way to deal with them all. Otherwise, the desolate land will never be peaceful before winter. Chapter 536 Sneaking into Wall Village A barricade made of oak was erected at Paglos Pass and knights from the guard battalion's relief squadron guarded the pass. Under the scorching sun, the armors on the knights were burning hot. Some knights kept pouring water on the armors. The knights hung their helmets next to their saddles. Their faces were reddened by the sun. They faced several teams waiting in line to pass through the mountain pass. The adventure group let out a curse or two from time to time. Standing on the mountain pass for inspection in such hot weather is indeed a nerve-wracking thing. Captain Sauron has scolded the support squadron six times in a row this month. And almost all the knights in the support squadron are sulking in their hearts. Last year, there was just a group of bandits wreaking havoc on the outskirts of Alinsa. This year, it was actually a group of rebels wandering outside Alinsa. The last line of defense of the knights in the support squadron was almost about to collapse. The rebel corpses hanging on the wooden crosses on the top of the mountain have now become a pile of bones. The knights of the guard camp are fully armed in guarding the mountain pass. Some mung bean sweet soup will be delivered to them from the distant village of Wall every day. This is probably the most anticipated thing of the day for the knights. Ludwig stood in the group of adventurers. He was carrying a large bag of luggage, and his skinny body was slightly bent. He was hired by an adventure group named Golden Oak. As a senior scout for the rebels responsible for collecting intelligence, he had excellent camouflage skills. In the city of Alanza, at least eight of the ten adventure groups are named after oak trees. He wiped his sunburned face with a towel, raised his head, and glanced forward. There was an adventure group in front of him undergoing inspection. A shrill police whistle sounded from the originally quiet Paglos Pass, and a group of knights from the guard camp quickly rushed towards the warning place. The four archers stood in the four directions of the mountain pass. They quickly attached their long bows with arrows and pointed the arrow tips at the mountain pass. Ludwig pretended to be panicked and raised his head just in time to see a companion being pinned to the ground by a group of guard camp knights. 
It was an old cavalry member of their rebel army. He did not die on the battlefield. But when he passed through the Paglos Pass, he was caught by a group of guard camp knights called Black Dogs and looked at him. His head was bruised by the hilt of the sword, and his hands and feet were tightly shackled. Ludwig wanted to rush forward and fight with the guard battalion who were walking in vain. The old cavalryman was pushed to the ground in humiliation. He seemed to see Ludwig as he passed through the crowds. But at this time, he turned his face away. Ludwig clenched his fists and lowered his head, resisting the urge to take action. Calm was finally restored over there. The old cavalry resisted explosively in the end and broke free from the shackles on his hands. However, he was stabbed into a hedgehog by a group of knights with their spears and died on the spot. The body of the old cavalryman was carried to the top of the mountain and trapped on a cross. With the harvest, these guard camp knights finally became more energetic. When it was Ludwig's turn, they also carefully checked his palms, elbows, shoulders and inner thighs. Any place where cavalry can easily develop calluses, they all check carefully. This kind of check does not involve women. The leader of the Golden Oak Adventure Group also gave a few silver coins to one of the guard camp knights, so that the luggage was not opened. Finally passing the checkpoint, Ludwig carried the heavy package and walked forward for less than a kilometer. The village of Wall appeared before Ludwig's eyes. When he saw the rows of brand new townhouses on the hillside, and the townhouses at the entrance of the village that looked like low city walls, Ludwig knew that his companions had really succeeded this time. Hardcore. He had previously ignored the desolate land. It was located in a remote mountainous area, and some of the mountain people living there posed no threat to the rebels. So he did not conduct any investigation outside the mountain pass. But now Ludwig discovered that the place they ignored was the most deadly. At least one third of the rebel cavalry who came to Holanza city this time died in this village. In just two months, the dilapidated small mountain village that could still be used by war horses to gallop freely not only built the walls of row houses to resist the raids of war horses, but also replaced the thatched houses in the village with stronger stone houses. With this strength alone, Ludwig was very curious about what kind of people lived in this village. According to the intelligence investigated, the knight Serdak in the guard camp is a villager in this village. And there is also information that Serdak is currently a baron. Ludwig was thinking about how to sneak into the village and conduct on-the-spot investigation. He had been staying in Helanza city to collect intelligence. Unfortunately, with the death of Magician Gurdon, the connection established by the rebels in Helanza city and the Dark Moon Gate was completely interrupted. Now it is even more difficult for the rebels to find a secret place in the Paglos Mountains. A small stream flows from the village. This row of row houses looks like they were just built not long ago. But there are traces of many people living there. Some grain vegetable porridge is being cooked in a large iron pot not far from the door. Several village women from time to time stir with a spoon to prevent the multi-grain and vegetable porridge from smearing the bottom of the pot. An oak board with a word wall village hung on a dead tree at the entrance of the village. A market was actually formed under the tree. Although there were only a few stalls, the variety was quite complete, ranging from grains, vegetables, meat, dried you can find chickens, ducks and some daily groceries. Some adventure groups have set up tents next to this small market, obviously using this place as a supply point. Ludwig was carrying a large package, and when passing by the market, someone came up to ask what was in the package. The leader of the adventure group immediately explained loudly that what was in the package was just a marching tent, something that the adventure group would usually use. And then, they slowly dispersed. Ludwig was sitting at the entrance of Wall Village, packing his luggage. From time to time, a four-wheeled carriage would drive into the village. These four-wheeled carriages were filled with volcanic ashes fine as powder. In addition, there are also truckloads of limestone blocks. Soon it was evening. The Golden Oak Adventure Group took out the prepared wheat cakes and bought a few tomatoes and onions from the market to make a pot of vegetable soup. Ludwig held the wooden plate in his hand, tore up the scones, and put them into the vegetable soup while watching a group of cobalt slaves walking in the distance. Each cobalt slave was carrying a stone hammer and a chisel, covered in dust. I walked to the stream and took a bath before returning to the townhouse all wet. There were no shackles on them. The cobalt slaves lined up to put the tools in their hands into a warehouse, took out wooden dinner plates from another room, and began to cook silently next to the large iron pot where vegetable porridge was being cooked. Rice. The whole process was so smooth that people were speechless. Two village women brought over a large pot of chopped cabbage. And these cobalts actually ate it extremely sweetly. Wall Village at dusk has another almost decadent aesthetic. 
all construction sites have stopped. Some cement pillars and exposed steel bars leave long shadows in the sunset. The upstream reservoir has also begun to resume work. The foundation for the third layer of the dam will be poured soon. The villagers of Wall Village and craftsmen from other villages walked down from the construction site and had dinner in the central square of the village. Various dinners were prepared here every night. And occasionally, they could have a meal of mutton soup. Of course, drinking sheep soup currently depends on the mood of the ogre Gulitum, because he is currently managing the sheep flock in Wall Village. Three townhouses have been repaired in the village, and Mayor Bright plans to have all townhouses in the village completed by the end of this month. Ludwig ate the vegetable soup on his plate, put down his plate, and walked slowly upstream along the cement road in the village. He carefully counted the townhouses built in the village, preparing to roughly calculate the number of walls. The current population of the village. The cement road is built very smoothly, with gentle steps on both sides of the road, and a drainage ditch on the outside. The village is now full of various building materials. Ludwig squatted next to a wooden box filled with volcanic ash. He reached out and grabbed a handful of volcanic ash. The volcanic ash was very fine. A gust of wind rolled up the volcanic ash in his hand. Far away. He wanted to know how on earth the people of Wall Village turned these volcanic ash into houses. Some finger-thick round steel bars were piled casually next to the volcanic ash. With a little forging, these steel bars can be turned into sharp spears and iron bars. Or they can also be made into iron cages. However, the people of Wall Village seem to be interested in the steel bars. These iron bars have different understandings. They hid the steel bars in the volcanic ash cement stone pillars. When Ludwig just passed by several small townhouses, he saw these steel bars mixed with cement. A group of women from the village walked up to these buildings carrying buckets from the river. They used ladles to pour water on these buildings. Ludwig didn't understand why they wanted to wet the dried building again, and his eyes fell back on the magical volcanic ash in his hands. Do you want some of our special magical volcanic ash cement? An old voice sounded from behind him. Ludwig was startled and quickly put the volcanic ash in his hand back into the wooden box. Chief Bright came up from behind, stood in front of Ludwig, and said to him with a smile, Originally, these volcanic ash were everywhere in the deserted land. But now the entire volcano is the territory of Baron Soldak. These volcanic ash also belong to Baron Serdak. If you want these volcanic ash, you need to buy it with money. What the old village chief said was what Serdak taught him step by step. Since he is going to start a Potsalanic cement business, he must first determine the ownership of the volcanic ash. Ludwig looked at the volcanic ash in the wooden box, forced a smile and said, I'm just curious, how did you think of using volcanic ash to build a house? It looks pretty good. He is not a fool. Can the volcanic ash all over the ground be sold for money? Your accent doesn't sound like a local? Village Chief Bright had no intention of leaving and continued talking to him. Ludwig gritted his teeth and said, Ha ha, I often run outside, and I don't even know what my imperial language is like anymore. He didn't want to expose himself yet. So he just casually dealt with the old village chief for a few words and left in a hurry. He knew that there would be many mistakes in what he said. If the people of Vol Village knew that he was also a rebel, the consequences would be serious. Rita and Natasha cooked a big pot of rice in the central square of the village every day. And old Sheila and little Peter also ate there every day. Soldak came out of the police station and walked towards the central square of the village without rushing home. From a distance, he saw the old village chief Bright chatting with a foreigner. But the foreigner did not after chatting for a long time. They left in a hurry. Serdak walked to the village chief of Bright and asked him curiously. Uncle Brett, who were you chatting with just now? Seeing Soldak walking down. The old village chief said, A foreigner seems to be very interested in volcanic ash. So I went over to ask to see if I could take another business. Speaking of business, Soldak immediately thought of agreeing to build a villa for Carl. He had been busy with other things these days and didn't bother to ask. So he asked, How are Charlie's preparations going? This time when they went out to build a villa, Soldak asked Charlie to lead the team. He was familiar with Carl. He was also smart. And he liked to use his brain when doing things. Charlie plans to leave the day after tomorrow. But do you think they can really do it? The old village chief asked worriedly. Serdak said to the old village chief, The construction of Wall Village is about to be completed. A villa should not be difficult for them, Chief Bright said with some worry. But it is not Wall Village after all. We have to prepare more carriages to transport the volcanic ash from the depths of the deserted land. We don't know how much volcanic ash is needed for a villa. Then build a few more four-wheeled carriages 
and not all the houses are made of volcanic ash. Otherwise, bring some cobalt slaves there so that you can mine rocks on the spot, Serdek said. The old village chief frowned and said, We need more carriage drivers. There are only so many people in the village. Anyone who can drive the carriages has been sent out, Serdek said. Otherwise, we can find some people from other villages. The two stood in front of the small townhouse and chatted for a long time before Soldak walked to the village square. Selina sent away the last child at the door of the newly built children's home. Signa got out of her skirt and waved to Soldak. Serdak stopped and saw that there were many people in the village square. There was a lot of steam coming from the stove, and the aroma of stew floated far away. Want to go to dinner? Serdak asked Selina and waved to Signa. Selina shook her head. Her smile looked like a blooming tulip. Her beautiful eyes were slightly provocative. And she said to Soldak, After moving to the new house, you haven't even come yet. But, do you want to come and sit at my house? Soldak wanted to walk over immediately and hold her hot body tightly in his arms. There were many people in the village square. He didn't want to become the talk of the village women tomorrow morning. So he had to restrain himself. Selina smiled slightly, held Zigna's little hand, and walked towards the upper reaches of the village. Chapter 537 Night Detective Selina's new home is on the westernmost side of the second townhouse in the village. The simple lines make the building look a bit square. Each townhouse houses six households. There is a small house on the south side of the building. There are small yards surrounded by wooden fences. These yards have not been completely cleared yet. And some building materials are piled up indiscriminately. The main body of the small building is made of limestone and volcanic ash cement. A herringbone frame is erected on the roof. A thick layer of oak boards is laid on the frame. The oak boards are covered with a layer of gray tiles. The terrace, attic, even the wooden doors, and windows exude a light fresh smell. The townhouses are divided into two floors, with a small attic and terrace on the top floor. In order to save time, the bricklayers who built these townhouses tried to remove unnecessary repeated decorations as much as possible when building these townhouses. From a distance, the three small buildings look a bit monotonous uniform and lacking in beauty. But this is nothing to the villagers of Wall Village. They will soon get out a thatched hut and live in a solid stone house made of cement. From then on, they no longer need to worry about the roof collapsing when a snowstorm comes. Nor do they need to worry about heavy rain outside the house and light rain inside the house when the storm hits. Their hearts were full of expectations for their new home. And their faces were filled with joy. Sometimes, I would laugh out loud unconsciously while holding a basin in the village square and eating a big pot of rice. When the four-wheeled carriage passed the wild lake 10 kilometers downstream of the river bend, they would run to the lake to pick up some beautiful pebbles and bring them back. After returning to the village, these cobblestones will be laid on the corridor of the townhouse before it gets completely dark. The gaps between the cobblestones will be filled with volcanic ash cement. And then the road will be washed with water until the smooth, rounded pebbles reveal their most beautiful side. The buildings in Alanza usually have tall, smooth marble columns propped up around the outside of the house. The villagers imitated the style of the nobles in the city and also built a row of cement stone columns around the small townhouses, forming a circle. Outside balcony, nobles like to use hollowed-out lady stone fences on their terraces, and villagers also built solid oak railings on their terraces and balconies. Selina held one corner of the long skirt with one hand. The soft and thin long skirt outlined her two slender, and straight thighs on the other side. She stepped up the outer stairs. Signa shook off Selina's hand and rushed forward first. Go to the stairs. Stand on the jogging platform and shout to Selina. Selina, I want to go to the attic to play for a while. It seems that the attic of every house can become a paradise for children. After leaving the thatched house with only one room, Signa finally had a room of her own. She couldn't wait to run to the attic and put the things in the attic. The wooden window was pushed open and he placed his hands on the windowsill and looked at the setting sun. Serdak saw that the rock cracks on the cement stone wall were very smoothly outlined, and the villagers' construction levels seemed to be improving very quickly. With a faint smile on her face, Dolina lowered her head and pushed open the door to let Soldak into the living room. The walls of the brand new living room are painted with white dust, and the patterned blanket sent by Soldak hangs opposite the fireplace. The living room looks very empty, except for a wicker chair placed beside the fireplace. A very old wooden table. Behind the living room is a small dining room, bathroom and kitchen, and two bedrooms are upstairs. Selina went into the kitchen to boil water. Soldak leaned against the door frame, folded his hands on his chest, 
and looked at Selena silently. When she leaned down, the soft long skirt highlighted her round buttocks. She had become plumper recently. Although her waist was still slender, she had a bit more of a young woman's charm. She tied her long, silky golden hair into a ponytail with a handkerchief and looked at the spacious kitchen with a satisfied expression. The kitchen alone was half the size of the original thatched house. And all the cooking utensils in the kitchen were brand new. Over the past year, thanks to the man in front of her, her life has undergone earth-shaking changes. Even the matter of preaching the teachings of the Dark Goddess has improved greatly. Those cobalt slaves still have a little bit of IQ. At least, I can still understand the stories Selena told about the blessings of the Dark Goddess. The green flames in the stove were licking the bottom of the kettle. Selena turned around and walked up to Soldek. Her pretty face was like a ripe apple. She stretched out her hand to help Serdak unlock the magic pattern armor of the Earth Shield, hanging on a wooden frame nearby. Dinner was simple. Selena prepared a plate of vegetable salad, chestnut pancakes, and some broth. Zygna hurriedly finished her portion and borrowed Cyrus from Soldak, the magical notes of Hickok's black magician. Soldak felt that the little girl still had some magic talent. If she could awaken the magic pool and become a magician when she was 12 years old, their life as a mother and daughter would become better in the future. Seeing Signa running upstairs in a few steps, Selena didn't forget to tell her not to look too late. Wall Village seems very quiet at night. Most of the villagers will go to the village square to eat a big pot of rice. After eating, they will go home in twos and threes. There are basically no entertainment activities at night in the small mountain village. After the villagers go home to wash and wash themselves, usually go to bed early. Soon, the entire village will be enveloped in darkness. In Wall Village, kerosene lamps and candles are luxuries, so few people are willing to spend money to light them. Ludwig was sitting outside the tent of the adventure group, watching the crooked moon slowly climbing up from the tops of the dead trees. Then he gently exhaled. There was even breathing sound all around. Opposite him, the members of the adventure group who were on duty all night were dozing off. He walked around quietly and found that everyone was already asleep. Then he quietly came out of the adventure group's camp, past the big dead tree at the entrance of the village, and groped his way toward the village along a road in the village. Several animals in the village the native dog heard the noise, barked a few times, then jumped out of the darkness and rushed towards Ludwig. He was well prepared. He took out a bag of broken bones with little oil and water from his arms and threw them out. The attention of the native dogs was immediately attracted away. Although the bones had no oil or water, the faint fragrance still attracted several native dogs. The dogs full attention. Just as Ludwig was about to pass by these local dogs, he saw footsteps coming from the construction site not far away. Someone in the village seemed to have heard the noise of the local dogs and was worried that people from other villages would come to the construction site to steal construction materials, especially the steel bars. Each rod was worth at least two silver coins. A villager crawled out of a shack in his clothes. When he came out, he walked around the construction site mumbling, and then moved towards the construction site next to him. Just when Ludwig was about to pass the construction site while the villagers on duty were leaving, he saw another village woman coming out of the shack. She smoothed her long skirt as she walked, which scared Ludwig and hurriedly hidden in the shadows by the corner. Looking at the direction the village woman was walking, he was a little speechless and could only choose to avoid the unfinished construction site. It's just that except for the three small townhouses that have been built. There are construction sites full of building materials everywhere in the village. If you want to avoid them all, you can only walk up along the edge of the river. Fortunately, there are many wheat fields beside the stream. The wheat in the fields has almost reached Ludwig's thighs, and the wheat has begun to ear. The flowing stream covered up the sound of his footsteps. Ludwig became a little more courageous and walked up the stems of the wheat field. He had already scouted the road when he entered the village during the day and knew that he would reach the reservoir construction site upstream along the stream. Before you get there, you have to make a detour in advance. Otherwise, if his whereabouts are discovered by the craftsman at the construction site, he will not be able to escape even if he wants to. Just as Ludwig was thinking about it, he heard a sound of bang, which startled him. During the day, he didn't see that there was a group of sheep here. With a faint moonlight, he saw that there were some yellow sheep in a wooden fence in front. Listening to the screams of those yellow sheep, the number should be small. Few? Ludwig wanted to go around the sheepfold. But he didn't want to cross the river to the other side. So he wanted to get closer to the sheepfold to see if there was a way around it. He emerged from the wheat field and saw that there was indeed a sheepfold in front of him. 
he leaned against the low wall and peered over there, wondering if any villagers were guarding there. A huge head suddenly appeared on the other side of the low wall. He stared at Ludwig unblinkingly with his bullseyes like copper bells and sprayed out a stream of water with a faint scent from his big mouth. The smell of garlic and the bald head almost made Ludwig scream. Gulitum was obviously also startled by Ludwig. He just lay down next to the low wall outside the sheepfold and fell asleep. As soon as he opened his eyes, he saw someone sticking his head out of the wall and staring face to face. Hold yourself. Under the night, the thin man in front of him was wearing tattered linen clothes and didn't even have a few ounces of flesh on his body. Gulitum looked at him with disgust. Normally, no one in the village would dare to approach him, and no one would take the initiative to talk to him. Everyone was a little afraid of him, even when coaxing their children. The women in the village would threaten those naughty children and say, Be honest. If you don't obey again, I will let you and Gulitum go to herd sheep together. The ogre Gulitum stole the only job of the older children in the village. So he was a heinous devil in the eyes of the children. He is an ogre who is willing to reason and likes to chat with people when he is bored. He also likes the food in the ogre tribe. It's a pity that no one in the village is willing to reason with him. And no children like to listen to his stories. Such as the carrot and finger story. Who are you? Are you not from the village? Gulitum looked at the stranger in front of him alertly and asked. Ludwig. Ludwig said without thinking. Facing the ogre in front of him. He was worried that if he hesitated for a moment. He would be eaten by him. Gulitum believed that the outsider in front of him was telling the truth. The reason for judging the authenticity was that this kind of unthinking answer was basically the truth. It's so late. Why are you here? Do you want to steal the sheep? Ogre Gulitum continued to ask. Ludwig felt that the ogre in front of him was putting more pressure on him. He quickly waved his hands and shook his head and said, No, I have not. Hearing Ludwig say this, Gulitum breathed a sigh of relief. Since he was not a sheep thief, it was no big deal. He thought Ludwig was a bricklayer from another village working on the construction site of the reservoir. His palms and jaws were covered with calluses. Although his body was thin, his eyes were full of energy and looked like a great craftsman. At this time, Gulitum's stomach rumbled and he remembered that he wasn't very hungry after eating the whole grain porridge at night. He had just slept for such a short time and his stomach felt empty. He missed the salamander broth a little bit. The human demon wiped the saliva from the corner of his mouth, waved his hand impatiently and said to Ludwig, Okay, get out of here quickly. Don't run around at night. And don't come here to wake me up. Otherwise, I will get hungry easily. It's not easy to sleep until dawn. Okay, hurry up. Go back to the construction side of the reservoir. Ludwig was about to go back the way he came. But he immediately stopped when he heard the ogre say this. He is full of question marks. I wanted to ask Gulitum if he made a mistake. But then he immediately realized that the ogre Gulitum thought he was a bricklayer from another village at the reservoir construction site. And he responded smoothly with a quick thought. Oh, okay, I'll leave right away. Ludwig walked forward without thinking. He had no idea that he would actually pass the sheepfold easily under the eager gaze of an ogre and even walk into the upper reaches of the river. The tents on the construction side of the reservoir are almost connected into one large area. There are several torches lit around the construction site and some villagers on duty are standing on high piles of materials. Although he successfully entered the upper reaches of Wall Village, he did not get carried away, seeing the only large house with lights on in the village from a distance. Ludwig immediately thought that Baron Soldak was probably at home, and those followers should also be with him. I heard that there was a very powerful archer beside him, whose eyes were not limited by night and day. It was that archer who shot and killed more than 20 companions. Thinking of this, Ludwig felt a chill on his back. He decided not to take the risk, and went straight to the direction of the police station in his memory. A trace of dark cloud completely covered the hook-like moon, and the small mountain village fell into absolute darkness. Ludwig walked along the flat open space where the fourth-level reservoir was leveled out, towards the Wall Village Police Station. He wanted to take the risk to go there and have a look. After all, the magician Gurdon died here, and he should have died in Wall Village. Some clues were left in the village. According to the information obtained from the magician of the law enforcement group of the Magic Union of Alinsa City, the mysterious magic crystal did not fall into the hands of the magician. This means that the magic crystal is likely to be in Wall Village. A row of chestnut and hawthorn trees were transplanted outside the police station. Ludwig hid beside the low wall of the lantern fruit tree and secretly peeked into the police station. Through the dark bushes, he felt that the inside of the police station was quiet, 
It was a bit scary. He squatted in the bushes and waited for a long time. When he didn't find anything unusual, he decided to go around to the back of the yard and sneak into the police station. Chapter 538 Caught In the silent night, Aphrodite opened her eyes. Her black-purple eyes were like the two brightest stars in the galaxy. The corners of her mouth were slightly raised, forming a strange arc. But it was definitely not a smile. Her almost perfect face had a kind of coquettish beauty in the night. She tossed her long hair back casually, sat up from the wicker chair on the second floor, and silently walked onto the terrace. In the quiet night, the succubus Aphrodite did not have any shadow. Her body was like a drop of thick ink spreading in the basin, instantly blending into the surrounding darkness. When it condensed again, the succubus Aphrodite had already appeared on the terrace. On the edge railing, Aphrodite's body turned into a ball of faint smoke again and disappeared on the terrace. After nightfall, Aphrodite didn't sleep at all. For a succubus, lying lazily on a wicker chair every day will bring her to the fullest mental state. At night, she was also in this state of false sleep. The slightest movement would wake her up. Ludwig sneaked close to the police station. As soon as he stepped onto the outer lawn of the police station, he was already touched by Avro. Dee noticed. But she didn't pay much attention at first, thinking they were the local dogs running around in Wall Village. But then Aphrodite discovered that the intruder was silent for a long time, which was a bit unusual. So Aphrodite opened her eyes and walked out of the room on the second floor of the police station. For the succubus Aphrodite, she can cast a lot of black magic at night that has no effect during the day, such as the fading spell. She squatted quietly on the branch of the tree, looking down at the snooper squatting under the shrub wall at her feet. The snooper seemed not to be aware of this. He was sticking out his buttocks and curiously looking towards the dark security guard. I waited and watched inside the station for a long time and found that there was nothing unusual in the police station. So the snoopers below began to become bolder. He gently pushed aside the low wall of lantern fruit bushes. Aphrodite frowned slightly. She and Samira transplanted these lantern fruit trees from the forest outside the village. She spent a lot of effort on each one. Now the spies opened it with both hands. There was a low wall of shrubs. And those green branches made a snapping sound. Ludwig quietly climbed over the low wall of shrubs. The succubus Aphrodite glared at the man who dared to destroy the low bush wall. With a slight movement of his body, he jumped from the tree and jumped behind Ludwig. Unfortunately, Ludwig was unaware of this. Ludwig stepped over the low shrub wall with light steps, like a tabby cat, and quickly hid in the shadow of the flower pond. He shrank his body, wondering whether he should climb to the second floor terrace and sneak into the security center from the second floor of the building. Ludwig pushed his feet hard on the ground, stretched his hands upwards as much as possible, and just reached the rainproof eaves on the second floor of the police station. After his body quietly wandered in the air twice, he used inertia to prepare to climb up to the second floor. Terrace. Just after his body swayed, he grabbed it with both hands, and with the help of inertia, his elbows were supported on the floor outside the railing of the second floor balcony, and the upper part of his chest was exposed to the balcony. Ludwig was about to step onto the terrace when he saw in front of the dark night, the tip of an arrow with a cold light almost touching the tip of his nose. A hooded archer was squatting on the terrace with his knees bent, looking at him through the railing. The archer was holding a blue longbow with an arrow on it, and the sharp arrow tip was almost touching his nose. In an instant, Ludwig was so frightened that the hair on his body seemed to explode. Without thinking, he pushed hard against the balcony with both hands, and his body fell over towards the courtyard of the police station. Just as he was overturning, he suddenly saw a figure in the same posture, with his elbows resting on the terrace beside him and he didn't even notice it. When Ludwig turned over, the succubus Aphrodite turned her head and glanced at him. Ludwig only felt that a beautiful woman appeared in front of him. The woman glanced at him, and Ludwig felt in a trance. He suddenly lost control of his body and fell in the yard in embarrassment. His back hit the raised stone platform of the flower pond in the yard, and half of his body was immediately numb from the impact. His whereabouts were revealed, so he dared to stay in the police station. He endured the severe pain and got up from the ground, gritted his teeth and rushed outside the yard of the police station, when the succubus Aphrodite's body turned into a plume of smoke, and then condensed into shape. She made the same movement as Ludwig, running side by side towards the outside of the courtyard. Ludwig was so frightened that his legs weakened, and he did not dare to make any counterattack. He put a little force on his feet, and his body suddenly turned back and rushed in another direction. 
before he could take a few steps. He saw the dark side next to him. The shadows suddenly appeared, and the succubus Aphrodite stood side by side with him again. Boring. There was a cold snort in the night sky, and an arrow hit Ludwig's thigh. Ludwig lost the use of one of his legs, staggered and fell to the lawn. And then the second arrow hit him directly. It shot through his calf, and two arrows shot through his arm. Hey, Samira, it's not easy to get such a big toy delivered to your door. You are so boring. The figure of the succubus suddenly appeared next to Ludwig. She squatted aside and watched Ludwig take out a sharp dagger from his leg without stopping him at all. But when Ludwig wanted to stab the black figure next to him with the dagger, he found that the dagger had somehow ended up in the opponent's hand. Ludwig finally saw Aphrodite's appearance. That almost perfect face in the darkness. So beautiful that it made people feel suffocating. When the succubus Aphrodite smiled at Ludwig, Ludwig felt in a trance and lost his intuition in an instant. On the terrace outside the window, a bird kept chirping. The gentle breeze blew into the room through the gauze curtains, and Soldak felt empty on the bed next to him. She opened her eyes drowsily and found Selina sitting by the window putting on her skirt. She turned around and saw Soldak, who had just woken up. He was supporting his body with one hand, twisting his waist and leaning down, without covering up his prominent chest. The peaks and ridges of the mountain touched his forehead with soft lips. A strand of soft hair fell on Serdak's face, making his face itchy. She tucked her hair behind her ears and said to Soldak, You can sleep a little longer while I make breakfast. The morning sunlight shone in from the window. Serdak sat up from the bed, stretched out his hand to put on the armor, and asked Selina, Why did you get up so early? Selina picked up her messy hair and answered casually, Recently, there are always some nice children from other villages waiting outside at the children's home. I can't go too late. Soldak walked behind her, helped her fasten the buttons on the back of her dress, and said with a wry smile, Well, I realize it was a bad decision to let you run the children's home. Selina looked back at him with a smile and walked out of the bedroom. The early morning sunlight slowly climbed into the attic and onto the desk beside the wall, shining on the magic notes on the desk. Cigna stretched out a little sleepily and said to Celia Cooper in the magic notebook with a tired look on her face, Is it morning so soon? Celia Cooper rolled her eyes angrily. Isn't it obvious that the sun has climbed so high? Under the sunlight on the page, the cage and Celia Cooper's figure began to fade, and Celia Cooper quickly hid in a corner of the page. Cigna put the magic notebook up to avoid direct sunlight, and said to Celia Cooper on the page, Then let's learn here for now. You go back and have a good rest. We will discuss these magics next time. After speaking, Cigna closed the magic notes. Then, she was like a nimble deer wearing only a thin nightgown, stepping on the oak floor with her bare feet. First, she tiptoed to the bedside, then slipped into the bed with her head. Her long chestnut hair spread out on the pillow, and she closed her eyes. Serena opened the wooden door of the attic, seeing Zigna lying on the bed and sleeping soundly. He couldn't bear to wake her up so early, so he gently closed the wooden door and turned downstairs. Zigna's long eyelashes trembled slightly, and a sweet smile appeared on her young face. Then he yawned tiredly and fell asleep sweetly. An hour later, Selina prepared breakfast and called Signa downstairs, who had just fallen asleep. Serdak sat at the head seat of the dining table. There were multigrain scones and vegetable porridge on the dining table. This was the most common breakfast in Wall Village. Selina, like other housewives, put the fried eggs in the pan, put it on Serdak's plate, and put another one on Zigna's plate, wearing an apron. She placed the frying pan on the rack by the fireplace and sat down across from Serdek. It was rare for the three of them to have breakfast together. Selina cherished this opportunity. She wanted Signa to experience the atmosphere of a normal family. Signa huddled on the chair like a little quail, looking like she couldn't wake up. Her curly chestnut hair was messy. Signa, can you understand that magic notebook? Signa blinked, her big innocent eye showing a blank expression. Serdek scratched his head and gestured wildly. I don't know what to say about those magic runes above that are not imperial characters. Signa shook her head and nodded again. Serdak didn't know what she wanted to express. So he glanced at Selina. Selina didn't understand either and looked at the two of them doubtfully. Signa likes magic books so much. Next time Lance comes back, I can ask him to guide you. Soldak felt that he usually didn't care enough about Signa. At least for little Peter. She was much more attentive than Signa. So he wanted to find a chance to make up for it. Zigna looked at Selina timidly. Only then did Soldak think of their special status as mother and daughter. 
he could only pat his forehead and said, Sorry, I almost forgot. Then when I have the opportunity to go to Alensa City again, I will find a way to bring a magic book to you. Signa then lowered her head again and began to deal with the fried eggs on the plate. Selena sat across the dining table radiantly, looking at such a warm scene on the dining table. Her vision seemed to become blurred all of a sudden. Ludwig felt that his head was becoming dizzy, and he had a splitting headache. He groaned and turned over. He suddenly woke up, sat up from the cold concrete floor, and found that he was locked in a stone prison, with his hands and feet shackled by iron chains. It was very quiet inside the stone prison, and no one was guarding him. He tried to pull on the chain on his hand. The chain looked very strong. He wanted to stand up from the cold concrete floor, but found that the chain seemed not long enough. He could only half crouch beside the wall. He tugged hard on the chain and found that one end of the chain was buried in the cement wall. He tugged twice. Except for the squeaking sound. The chains on the wall did not move at all. It looked stronger than expected. I tried to recall how I ended up in the prison. But my memory seemed to be blank last night. I only remembered that I followed the adventure group to Wall Village. Where I was going to find some useful information. What happened next? I actually can't remember it anyway. He touched the dagger hidden on his body and found that the dagger was also missing. Ludwig sat on the cement floor a little slumped, thinking about how to get out. Suddenly a huge head poked out of the prison. With a whoosh, the ogre Gulitum retracted his head again. He stared at Andrew with some regret and asked, Is it true that you can't eat it? The indigenous warrior Andrew said firmly. No. Gulitum asked again unwillingly. Aren't we going to kill him? It's too hard to bury him. Shouldn't we use some cruel punishments for those who commit heinous crimes? For example, let him see his thighs look like isn't it cruel to be eaten like a crispy radish? The ogre deliberately showed a terrifying expression. His rotten teeth were now in improved condition. At least they looked clean on the surface. Do you think he is extremely guilty? Andrew turned to Gulitum and asked. The ogre was stunned for a moment. He thought about it seriously and then said bluntly, It doesn't seem that bad. But after all, he is with the rebels. He should be executed. I just came to see him executed. For this matter, well, I didn't even take care of the sheep this morning. We have to wait until the captain comes to make a decision on this matter. Andrew said leisurely. The ogre looked at the sun outside and said anxiously, How about I drive the sheep to Bago first? If he is executed, you have to tell me. I want to observe the execution as a member of the security team. I have this right. Andrew snorted and muttered. Hey, don't talk about rights with me. I still have the right to eat sheep. The ogre's ears are very good. When he heard Andrew talking about eating sheep, he immediately retorted, No, you didn't. Andriki hummed and said, Gulitum, in recent days, I have been eating vegetables all the time, which made the indigenous warrior Andrew feel very bad. The ogre Gulitum clenched his fists hard, stared into his big copper eyes, and said angrily, Would you like to have a fight? Whoever wins will have the final say. He was prepared to defend his flock staunchly. Samira appeared at the door and said casually, If you want to fight, it's best to stay away from the security station. He is still of some use to us for the time being, and he cannot be executed casually like this. When the ogre Gulitum heard that there was no chance to eat meat for the time being, he immediately said, That's it. I just remembered that I have something to do over at Bago Pasture. So I'm leaving. After saying that, he left the police station without looking back. Chapter 539 Reason To the north of San Carlos Province Across the vast burning plains is the endless purple-green mountains at the northernmost end. This mountain range spans the San Carlos and Schloit provinces, and the westernmost end is closely connected with the eastern foothills of the Pi Plateau. Together, the dangerous peaks deep in the mountains are surrounded by poisonous swamps all year round. It is said that the purple-green mountains were formed from the spine of a great demon in ancient times. It is said that this ancient great demon was beheaded by the angel of destiny Israel during the eternal war, just when his body was on the verge of destruction. His the body triggered a huge space storm in order to prevent the ancient great demon from causing the plane to collapse. The angel of destiny used divine power to seal the remains of the great demon and forcibly calm down the space storm. Time has changed. And after tens of thousands of years, the remains of the ancient great demon have turned into a purple-green mountain range. The purple-green mountain range is filled with spatial fissures swimming around. And the demonic energy diluted in the mountains continues to demonize all kinds of demons. Wild beasts have caused this mountain range to be rampant with monsters. 
Even the most elite royal constructed knights in the Green Empire dare not enter the Zeching Mountains easily. This mountain range is like a fishbone. Piercing deeply from the eastern foothills of the Pai Plateau into the northern region of the Green Empire. It also became the natural boundary between the provinces of San Carlos and Soit. After the failure of the operation, the rebels in Soit province were forced to hide in the Purple Green Mountains under the pursuit of the constructing knights of the North Wind Legion. They have been moving around in the mountainous areas on the edge of the Ziching Mountains. The environment here is dangerous. The western part of the Ziching Mountains borders the Pai Plateau. Many villages are inhabited by orcs and humans. Therefore, it is not uncommon for humans with orc blood in mountain villages. In order to maintain their combat effectiveness, the rebels continued to recruit young mountain people from the mountainous areas to join the rebel army. Even so, the rebel army continued to reduce its numbers in this Seeching Mountains, which has a very harsh living environment. Some veterans of the rebel army died one after another. The new troops who joined the rebel army no longer knew the original beliefs and purposes of the rebel army. And, the leader of the rebel army, has always wanted to reverse this predicament. Unfortunately, in this harsh environment, even survival seems so difficult, and other aspects are even more difficult to solve. The rebels will inevitably compete for living space with some high-level monsters entrenched in the mountains. In recent years, the rebels have migrated thousands of kilometers along the edge of the Ziching Mountains, and they still cannot escape the monsters deep in the mountains. It was under this situation that the top leaders of the Dark Moon Gate approached the northern rebels. The president of the Dark Moon Gate made an irresistible offer to the leader of the rebels. And, if the rebels were willing to help the Dark Moon Gate, if the gate finds a red dragon treasure in the Paglos Mountains, then the Dark Moon Gate will gather the power of six great magicians to create a temporary portal to other small planes to allow all the rebels to leave Roland, mainland, to this end. And, the leader of the northern rebels, agreed to send nearly 500 cavalry to Bena province to cooperate with the magicians at the Dark Moon Gate to obtain all clues about the Red Dragon treasure. After a series of twists and turns and bizarre investigations, they finally arrived in Bena. The province found the descendants of the great hero Bradbury. His descendants actually settled in Bena city and became old nobles with ancient inheritance. It's just that the Bradbury family has not produced any great figures in the past 200 years or so. Therefore, this old family has gradually declined and will soon become silent in the dust of history. The magician of the Dark Moon Gate led the rebel knights in the north to sack the Bradbury family in Bennis City and obtain the Bradbury family's most precious treasure, a red dragon with records, from the family's oldest showroom, treasure of magic crystal. In addition, a fragment of a magic sheepskin map was also snatched from the current heir of the Bradbury family. On the second day after the Bradbury family was sacked, a traitor team appeared among the rebel knights. They took away the map fragment overnight. And there were a total of 22 rebels in this traitor team. At that time, they were divided into 11 two-person teams and fled in all directions from Bena City. One of the rebel escape duo chose the escape route from Bena City to Haranza City, then passed through the deserted land of Haranza City and left Bena province along the Paglos Mountains. Unexpectedly, while they were walking through the desolate land, they were captured by Serdek. Not long after the knights from Halansa City picked up the two rebels, and on their way back to Halansa City, the two rebels were hurried to the Dark Moon Gate Archmage gear in Halansa City. Gordon killed them, but the great magician Gurdon did not recover the map fragments from them. Therefore, magician Gurdon prepared to go to Wall Village to investigate clues about the map fragments. However, the great magician's investigation method was a little rough. He summoned a squadron of rebel cavalry to rush into Wall Village with him but encountered Soldak and his security team. The magician Gurdon seriously underestimated due to the loss of Serdak's personal strength. The entire rebel cavalry squadron and the Gurdon magician perished in Wall Village. In addition to the map fragments, Dark Moon Gate also lost a great magician and lost precious magic crystals from this great magician. Suddenly, the top talker of the Dark Moon Gate in Bina province died. This news needs to be passed to the Dark Moon Gate headquarters and the Dark Moon Gate headquarters will resend a magician responsible for this matter. As a senior investigator of the Rebel Intelligence Department, Ludwig needed to learn as much information as possible about Val Village and Baron Soldak before the new person in charge of the Dark Moon Gate arrived. So he infiltrated an adventure group and sneaked into Wall Village. The above is all the information that the succubus Aphrodite learned from Ludwig. The succubus family's hypnosis made the Rebel Intelligence officer spit out all the information he knew. Serdak sat on the chair and listened to Aphrodite 
telling all the information he had gathered. Only then did he realize how hot the magic crystal was. If he had known this, he would have handed over the magic crystal no matter what. Out. The half-elf leaned against the window and sat on the wide windowsill. She thought about it seriously before saying, There must be an inevitable connection between the so-called red dragon treasure and the sword of Quelsera hidden in Paglo's mountain. You guys could it be that after the hero slayed the dragon, he buried his epic sword in the mountain together with the red dragon treasures? Serdak touched the handle of the blood red crescent in his hand, shook his head and said, I think it's unlikely. If there was such a treasure, maybe the Bradbury family wouldn't have declined so quickly. Besides, what's the use of burying the treasure in the mountains? He felt a little headache when he thought that it might not be long before a great magician of the same level as Magician Gurdon came to Wall Village again. The Magician Gurdon was killed with the help of Count Fornak, but he couldn't ask Count Fornak for help every time the Magician from the Dark Moon Gate came to Wall Village. Serdak rubbed his forehead and said, Now is not the time to talk about the Red Dragon treasure. What we need to discuss now is how to solve the big trouble at hand. We can't just sit back and wait in Wall Village, waiting for them to come again and again. Maybe next time the ones who come to our door will be strong men like the two Kirsten Magicians. Aboriginal warrior Andrew said, Then what should we do? We can't move away. The succubus Aphrodite, who was lying on the wicker chair, supported her body with one hand, sat up from the wicker chair, and said to Soldak, Otherwise, it will be useless to hand over the magic crystal when you find an opportunity. It was Aphrodite's unwillingness to hand over the magic crystal that kept this hot potato in her hands. Serdak frowned. He didn't want to have a bad reputation for hiding something. Once this kind of thing spreads, it will be a stain on his life. He said, After such a long time, I have to find a reason. The last time we handed over two rebels, we almost turned the city of Valencia upside down. Once the news about the magic crystal is made public, we don't know what kind of storm it will cause. This was also his last concern. I want to go to Benna City and return this magic crystal to the Bradbury family. It can be regarded as returning it to its original owner. Serdak decided to send the magic crystal back to Benna City and added, I'm just a little worried that when I'm away, something will happen in the village that you can't handle. The succubus Aphrodite sat opposite Serdak and said casually, If you are only worried about this matter, then there is no need. Because of the equal symbiosis magic contract, as long as I stay in Wall Village, no matter where you go, I have a way to summon you back. And whether you encounter danger or I encounter danger, we will all feel it. You only need to step through the void door to come to me. Aphrodite, I always feel like there's something wrong with this magic contract. Serdak is still a little bit worried about the original magic contract. Aphrodite smiled sweetly and said to Serdak, What's wrong? I think it's okay. If you learn to summon the magic circle, you can summon me at any time no matter where you are. We are equal symbiotic, yes. Hearing what the succubus Aphrodite said, Serdak suddenly felt that he really had nothing to say. At noon, the ogre ghoul item went around the police station again and found that Soldak had no intention of executing Ludwig. So he gave up completely and ran back to Bago Pasture. The nearest pasture was the water and grass on the edge are luxuriant. In addition to the yellow sheep in Val Village, it also attracts a group of wild camels from the desert. However, the wild camels lurk during the day and night and are hard to find. He wanted to squat in the Bago grassland for a while, catch a wild camel and try it. Ludwig was originally waiting for Baron Soldak from the Wall Village Police Station to come forward in person to interrogate him. He also thought about revealing some irrelevant information, maybe telling some about the situation at the Dark Moon Gate. As long as it didn't harm the rebels, it would probably be fine. It would be best if he could get freedom in exchange for it. If he couldn't get freedom back, also allow them to be kind to themselves. But after waiting in the dungeon for three consecutive days, he found that the other party had no intention of asking him. Except for two meals a day, there was almost no one in the dungeon. Ludwig's mood gradually became irritable, and he lost weight again in just a few days. Occasionally, there are bursts of heartrending howls in the dungeon. After Soldak decided to return the magic crystal to the Bradbury family in Benis City, the next day, he rode Gubwa's war horse and rushed to Helanza City. He first went to the airport terminal and bought an airship ticket. This time, he was lucky. There happened to be a magic airship that was going to Benna City the next night. Serdak currently has a noble status. So he can easily buy a ticket. And he also has a ticket for a separate room on the deck. Then he settled in the Garden Plaza Hotel. Still living in the attic on the top floor. 
Carl has been out on missions these days. He couldn't find Carl at the guard camp the next morning. So he asked for a two-month leave from Captain Sauron, saying that he was about to go to Benna City and might be there. If you stay for a week, you will have to stay in Benna City for about a month and a half. Captain Sauron did not ask Serdak for details. He just used a quill pen to sign his name on the parchment with a few strokes. Serdak's vacation was officially effective. Then Captain Sauron took out another piece of magic parchment and carefully wrote a line on it. Baron Serdak is my capable subordinate. This time, I went to Benna City to handle personal matters. Please take care of me. Then he took out a private seal from the drawer and stamped it carefully on this line. Captain Sauron tore it into a note, folded it, and gave it to Serdak, and told him, If you encounter any trouble that is difficult to solve in Benna City, take this note to visit the 5th Earl Sauron of 13th Street. Serdak didn't expect Captain Sauron to give him such a precious note, and said goodbye to Captain Sauron with a moved expression. Alanza City is very lively these days. There are lights and colorful flags everywhere. And some colorful flags are hung on the roofs of various high-rise buildings. I learned from the hotel proprietress, Mrs. Cohen, that a young lady from the Christie family was going to have a wedding. Marquis Bernard Christie invited many nobles and celebrities to Alinsa City to attend his daughter's wedding. Speaking of this, Mrs. Cohen, the proprietress, seemed to have a good topic and began to talk endlessly about how many nobles and celebrities will be invited to this wedding and that the Christie family's castle will hold grand balls for a week. So much. It is said that on the day of the wedding, all workshops and shops in Alinsa City will be closed. Only then did Suldak remember the red-haired Miss Darcy. She didn't expect to get married so soon. The last time they met was at the entrance of the Alinsa City Hall. And her fiancé even said H, low to him. With, calculating the time. It seems that I will not be able to make it to the wedding. But it sounds like I haven't received the invitation yet. In the room on the top floor of the hotel, Suldak opened the glass window in the attic and looked at the magnificent castle at the highest point of the mountain city from a distance. Chapter 540 Above the Sea of Clouds As the war in the Maka Plain comes to an end, the busy scene at the airport terminal in Halensa City has gradually returned to its original state. Without the mountains of war supplies, the area around the airport terminal tower became particularly empty, and there were no coolies lining up outside the airport terminal waiting to carry bags. A group of nobles, surrounded by their attendants and maids, boarded the platform of the high tower of the airport pier. A magic airship with flying fish written on both sides of the ship was parked quietly on the pier, with lifelike words painted on the outside of the bow. The flying fish head looks like a giant sea fish floating in midair. Serdak followed the crowd and boarded the airship along the railed steps between the ship and the dock. Several aristocratic ladies holding folding fans gathered together. They were wearing the most popular imitation palace summer dresses at the moment. Their exquisite and graceful bodies were looming under the thin fabric. They wore big hats with flowers on their heads except for some precious pearls. Apart from the hat and feathers, it looked like a grand fruit basket. Soldat couldn't figure out how their slender snow-white necks could hold up such a hat. This group of noble ladies walked at the front of the team. They were chattering non-stop along the way, as if they were full of expectations for this journey. A group of maids followed them. Several young nobles held simple salutes with one hand and followed the women. The servants around them were all armor-piercing knights. Each one was fully equipped. There was a murderous look on their faces. Although they the equipment was better than that of the knights in the guard camp. But he didn't think that these armor-piercing knights had much fighting experience. Two noble ladies were walking in the middle of the team with two attendants and two personal maids. They seemed taciturn. Their faces were covered with a black mesh veil. And their hands were wearing white gloves with hollow patterns. It seemed that their figures were well maintained. Good. At the end of the team followed a few silent nobles. They boarded the ship with their horses and knight spears, and they looked like they were about to go to the battlefield. In addition to these nobles, there was also an old nobleman who quietly boarded the magic airship accompanied by an old butler. Perhaps there was a group of noble knights who were about to embark on a journey. Serdak was inconspicuous in the crowd wearing a magic pattern structure. A group of crew members stood on the left and right sides of the deck of the magic airship, led by the captain of the airship. They sincerely welcomed the nobles who boarded the ship. There were also dedicated crew members responsible for arranging the rooms of the nobles who boarded the airship, carefully explained the benefits that can be enjoyed by flying in the airship. And of course, there are some services specially prepared for nobles. Only then did Serdak find out that breakfast and afternoon tea can be prepared separately on the airship. You can also order three meals a day at will. There are also a variety of dishes. 
There will be a chef on the airship every day who lists them on the menu. Recommended dishes? Of course. You can't eat these dishes if you have money. In addition to being able to afford the money, you also need to have aristocratic status. In fact, all the oatmeal and hard-baked wheat cakes on the airship, which are as unpalatable as marching rations, are for civilians. Even if ordinary businessmen are rich, they can only eat white bread and red sausage ale at best. And there are far fewer dishes to choose from. Nobles are so rich. The cabins on the airship deck provide hot water for bathing every morning and every evening between 8 and 9 p.m. Of course, to enjoy this service, you need a small bathroom in the room. However, not all rooms have bathrooms. The ticket price for a room with a bathroom is nearly double that of a room without a bathroom. Soldak happened to buy a room with a small bathroom, which is right on the deck, in the innermost corridor on the right side of the ship on the first floor. He felt that the crew must have regarded him as a group of noble knights who were about to go on an expedition. So they received such special treatment. In fact, he had just participated in the Maka Plain War, and was therefore canonized as a third-class baron in Helanza City by Emperor Charles of the Green Empire. A civilian knight who could hold this honor would win every year with one hand in the Green Empire. I can count them. Pushing open the wooden door of the room, what comes into view is a clean and tidy wooden bed, covered with a thick mattress and snow-white sheets. The room is probably less than six square meters. There is a circular opening on the wall opposite the wooden door. There are shaped glass windows. And there is a folding table on the wall next to the bed. It is usually folded together and can only be put down when needed. In addition, there is a bathroom of more than one square meter on the left side of the entrance. In addition to a bathtub, this bathroom only has a wash basin at the door. Serdak untied the heavy upper body armor and hung it on a wooden rack in the room. He took out five copper plates from his arms and gave them to the crew member at the door. The crew member thanked him and took them. Ku reminded, Thank you for your generosity. Lord Baron, the chef accompanying us to Benna City this time is Chef Antonio. His best dishes are smoked Meraki fish and stewed white rock rhinoceros spine. I hope you can if you have a chance. You can try Chef Antonio's specialties. Soldak nodded, indicating that he understood. However, he was not prepared to eat these delicacies made of Warcraft meat on the airship. In high-end restaurants in Helanza City, the prices of these dishes need to be settled with gold coins. Now that they are brought to the airship, it is initially estimated that they will not be cheap. Serdak was not the kind of wealthy aristocrat who casually squandered more than a dozen gold coins and didn't feel bad about it. The crew member recommended the high-end dishes of Warcraft meat to him, probably because he was wearing a top-notch magic pattern structure. Pack. He wasn't even going to have dinner at the restaurant. Mrs. Cohen prepared a food box for Serdak this time, and Serdak put it in the magic waste bag. The food prepared in the food box was quite rich except for a few pieces filled with butter and luncheon meat. In addition to the sandwich, there was a grilled sausage and a few apples, which was enough for Serdak to eat for two meals. After the crew member left, Soldak closed the cabin door and sat alone on the wooden bed, looking at the city of Aranza after nightfall through the clean glass windows. The colorful lights on the streets gave the city an atmosphere before a grand festival. Especially the castle at the top of the city was brightly lit. After the civilians boarded the ship, the crew retracted the ropes, hanging on the airport pier to the deck. Sixteen magic devices made a roar, and the magic airship broke away from the control of the airport terminal and slowly rose into the night sky. The two crew members constantly adjusted the direction of the airship's bow and tested the rising height. They needed to accurately determine the strong wind zone in the sky. Only when it enters the strong wind zone can the airship sail far. The cabins where civilians live are all below the deck. Of course, even civilians, those who can afford to ride on the magic airship are the middle class with a small fortune. A group of civilians put their luggage into the cabin and ran to the deck to enjoy the gorgeous night view of Alanza City from high altitude. They chatted non-stop on the deck. After two experiences on the magic airship, Soldak no longer had the same sense of novelty as before. For the first two days, he almost stayed in the cabin to feel the dark stars in his body. Because he brought enough food, he did not need to go to the airship restaurant to eat. But unfortunately, I still can't figure out the method of cultivation. And I have gained almost nothing. After being cooped up in the cabin for two days, Soldak finally walked out of the cabin and walked around the deck a few times. The airship entered the channel. The three masted sails were inflated. And the spinnaker and jib at the bow were also raised high. The ship was indeed like a flying fish. Moving rapidly in the wind. 
The airship it is just a medium-sized and thin magic airship. But the hull is very long. Serdak held his hands on the right side of the ship, looking down at the gap between the two flotation devices. After being cooped up in the cabin for two days, standing on the deck and blowing in the cold wind made me feel particularly comfortable. Two ladies in black cloaks were standing on the bow of the ship, looking up at the guiding jib. Several crew members were constantly fiddling with the nooses that did not need to be adjusted in front of the ladies. Several young nobles were standing there, not far from the bow of the ship. They were talking in low voices and laughing loudly, apparently trying to attract the attention of the two ladies. Serdak gave up the idea of walking over to look at the red copper corner of the ship's bow. He circled around the main mast and saw that there was an open observation deck on the top of the ship. There didn't seem to be many people on it. Then they climbed to the top floor along the zigzag staircase of the ship building. Two crew members stood guard at the door of the ship building and persuaded the two civilians to leave. When they saw Suldak, they quickly saluted and let them go. Watching the two civilians leave with sullen expressions, Suldak stepped onto the observation deck on the top floor of the ship. The observation deck on the top floor is not large. When I walked up, I found that there were quite a lot of people on the observation deck. Due to the angle of view on the deck, I did not see the crowd on the observation deck. The few noble ladies I saw when boarding the ship had changed their cloaks to keep out the cold and were huddled in the left rear corner of the top floor of the ship. Admire the ever-changing sea of clouds beneath your feet. Opposite them, an old nobleman stood facing the wind, accompanied by his butler. The cold wind blew on his wrinkled face. He stood quietly by the railing and looked at the sea of clouds in the distance. Serdak walked onto the ship's roof. I saw the butler whispering a few words in the ear of the old nobleman. And then with the support of the old butler, he passed by Suldak and slowly walked down the stairs of the ship building. At this moment, a strong whirlwind suddenly blew from the side of the ship. The entire sail swayed violently, followed by the hull swaying left and right with a creak sound. And the huge mass seemed to fall down at any time. Serdak leaned forward and grabbed the railing next to him. I heard the captain in the bridge shouting to the crew on the deck. Turbulent current. Lower the sails quickly. Then the ship's hull suddenly shook violently. Soldak felt his body bounce up and quickly grabbed the railing on the side. The old nobleman, who had not gone far, missed the handrail on the ship's upper floor and hit the railing with a bang. His body fell out of the railing. The butler was caught off guard and lost his hands. Seeing that the old noble was about to fall off the roof of the ship, Serdak took a step forward, put one hand on the railing, leaped out, grabbed the old noble's belt in his hand and instantly pulled him out of the ship building. Return. At this moment, the old nobleman's face turned red with fear. His body hit the railing. His breathing became short, and his lips turned purple. The turbulence came and went quickly. Soon the airship returned to calm, and the deck and roof were in chaos. Fortunately, this turbulence did not cause serious casualties. If this short-term turbulence lasts for more than a quarter of an hour, it will be called a windstorm. If it is not handled properly, the ship may be destroyed and people may die. Suldak and the steward helped the old nobleman to the corridor on the third floor of the ship building. The old nobleman was speechless. The housekeeper thanked Serdak repeatedly and respectfully asked Serdak's name. Serdak smiled implicitly and said to the housekeeper and the old noble, No need to thank me. I just did what I could. I believe every young man will be like me when he sees this situation. Seeing that the old nobleman's breathing gradually calmed down and his body was fine. He declined the butler's warm invitation and turned to return to his cabin. Soldak was tired of eating the cold food he had brought with him on the airship and was ready to see the restaurant on the airship. So he ordered a dinner for that day on the recommendation of the crew. When it was dinner time, Serdak walked into the restaurant on the second floor of the ship building. The waiter in the restaurant took Serdak to a seat by the wall. The waiter brought boiled peas and fried steak. And Serdak took a bite. I think there is really nothing wrong with the chef on the airship. The steak is fried at just the right temperature. And the sauces are paired with a unique flavor. Two ladies were also dining in the restaurant. And two young nobles sat opposite them. It seemed that the four of them were talking happily. And they let out suppressed laughter from time to time. Serdak wiped off the gravy on the bottom of the plate with a piece of white bread and stuffed the last piece of bread into his mouth. He was about to wipe his hands with a napkin and leave when he saw the restaurant waiter coming over with a bottle of golden cider and speaking to him. He stopped beside him, placed a crystal goblet on the table, lowered his head, and said respectfully to Soldek, Count Alexei would like to treat you to a drink. Soldek raised his head in surprise, and happened to see the old Earl sitting in the middle of the restaurant. He must have just arrived, 
and the restaurant waiters were placing plates on the table one after another. Seeing Serdak looking towards him, he quickly raised the goblet in his hand and shook the golden wine in the cup to pay tribute to Serdak. In this situation, Soldak couldn't refuse, so he asked the restaurant waiter to pour him a glass of wine. He toasted with Count Alexia from afar, drank a glass of slightly sour golden apple cider, and then left the restaurant, probably because he drank a glass of wine. After taking a bath, Soldak lay on the bed and slept particularly soundly that night. Early the next morning, Serdak stood on the deck of the bow to practice basic sword skills. Not long after, those nobles who seemed to be preparing to go on an expedition also ran to the deck to exercise. They stood on the deck in pairs with wooden swords in their hands. And the heavy wooden swords in their hands often performed fancy sword styles to defend one side. Instead of using a shield to block, he had to hold a wooden sword and dismantle those sword moves in a very fancy way. As if he would lose if he couldn't dismantle them. They practiced sparring on the deck for a while and saw Soldak still squatting half-crouched on the bow of the ship, repeatedly practicing the basic movements, with some sarcastic expressions on his face. But no one took the initiative to provoke him. It wasn't until Serdak left with the blood-red crescent moon that the nobles chuckled softly. When Serdak returned to the cabin, he saw the butler waiting at the door. Seeing Serdak returning, he took the initiative to extend an invitation to Serdak. 